Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're, we're back for another one of these. Yeah, another one of these. Uh, gonna give you a little peek behind the scenes here because it seems like some people are interested in the uh, production, what goes into this. So, uh, for your information, uh, I'm recording this the morning after I posted the previous podcast. So, I posted the previous one basically just before I went to bed and I basically just woke up. And I'm now recording the podcast as I wait for my breakfast, which is chicken, to cook. So, yeah, I pretty much, that's pretty much how I do it. I just start the next one as soon as I finish the previous one. Although, there's sometimes gaps in between because uh, there was a big gap where I kept recording podcasts and then deleting them because I was going a bit insane. Uh, But anyway, that aside, I want to start a new tradition. I want to start a new tradition. For these slice of life podcasts and that new tradition is this to uh respond to comments on the previous podcast in the next podcast that is my that is my idea because i don't do much comment interaction i'm better at it now than i used to be i used to just never interact with comments ever nowadays if someone asks a question i'll answer it and so on uh but yeah so I, i'm gonna gonna go to the comments section and see see anything interesting uh we got Kurz, who tells me... Shut up for notification. Kurz tells me that I uh, I misspelled separatist in my gem log. That's funny. I'm bad at spelling. <laughs> I don't know what you want me to tell you. Spelling is a tool of the bourgeoisie to keep the, keep us down, man. It's, there, it's, trying to, it's a tool of the bourgeoisie, man. No, I'm very bad at spelling. I have misspelled many titles for many things in my life. I just never figured out spelling. But also... If people can understand what word I mean, I don't think it's really very important. Uh, it's a little embarrassing, though. But no, I, I'm just generally pretty fucking atrocious at spelling. Anime Sama says that generic isekai sounds great. Would watch in response to something I said about uh, where I described the generic isekai scenario, and I agree. I don't think there's anything wrong with the generic isekai scenario necessarily. I think it can be done well or be done badly, but. Uh, Scenario, plot, premise, rather. Plot is different, but premise, I think, doesn't determine whether a show is good or bad. It's execution that does. You can have a show with a premise of anything, and if you pull it off right, it can be good. Uh, I already responded to this one, but Janus asks, how do you have the stamina to talk for eight hours? Is it just practice? Um, First of all, pretty much every Twitch streamer talks for longer than eight hours in a day. But I am not a Twitch streamer. Uh, so I cannot do that. I get very tired talking constantly for more than like two to three hours if I'm streaming. Uh, no, I record these in chunks. I, I record, you can probably tell from listening to it that I sort of bounce from topic to topic suddenly. Uh, I, yeah, so I, I record for a segment and then stop recording and then when I come up with something else that I want to say, I hit record again. Uh, yeah. Uh, les tonsieux, les tonsieux. I'm assuming, I'm just going to say that's French. I don't know. My browser can't play this video, sad face. To which Kurosawa replies, use MPV. Based. MPV user. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, that's the comments I've gotten so far. I have a comment. I'm thinking of deleting this Huel video because, uh, I don't, I don't know if I agree with what I said in it. Well, I, I, I guess I do agree with what I said in it, but, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I think some people seem to not think that I need, maybe I don't need 2,500 because I'm not very active, but I am very big. I, I'm, I'm six foot three. Uh, I'm a big guy for you. You know, I need, I need a, a lot of calories just to sustain me. Do I eat too many calories like most people in the West? Yes, almost certainly. Uh, but it's not crazy. I'm not, I'm not eating crazy amounts of calories. You know, I've done daily calorie tracking without like, to like, track my standard diet I, I normally hit about between 2000 to 2000 maybe 800 on a on a particularly uh filling day you know max max out at about 2800 on ra- rare occasions but normally between like two, 2000 calories on a, on low occasions somewhere in the middle of that is about where i balance out uh which is weird because i've been gaining weight for a long time even though i don't think i'm eating a crazy calorie surplus so uh Maybe I'm just tracking my calories poorly or something. I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, 2,000 calories or maybe just below as a sort of 
minimum if I'm not trying to diet and about 2,800 as a sort of maximum if I'm just eating without thinking. Uh, I don't know what's happening these days with the Huel. I'm, I'm not keeping count of how many calories I'm eating per day, uh, but I feel fine. Uh, I'm probably eating fewer calories than I was before because Huel has a lot of fiber in it and uh, that's going to do uh, some satiety. It's going to do some satiety at you. Uh, so it's likely that I'm eating less because I'm feeling more full from my meals. Which is good. It's time for the TF2 segment to begin. My hyperfixation. There's a video on the internet. YouTube.com, actually. That particular website. Called uh, TF2 Swords and Shields. By someone I'm forgetting the name of right now. And I can't look it up because I'm currently pushing the cart on PL underscore upward. Uh, <clears throat> oh, the air shot! Oh, the iron bomber. Uh, get me out of here. Get me out of here. Sorry. <laughs> bad content. Bad content. But I, uh, I, hit, I hit, hit the air shot on the rocket jumping soldier. It didn't kill him though. No clip. Fail clip. Oh, I fucked up. And now I'm going to die. Okay, now I can talk. So, uh, the, uh, the video, Swords and Shields. Uh, it's a good video in general. Um, but there's a couple of things I think are missing from it. One is that... Uh, I think he thinks the Islander is way... I mean, I, I agree with him, right? That the meta is boring for, like, full demo night because the Islander just dominates. Um, but what I think he doesn't get, right, in, like, complaining about the Islander being too strong is how bad it feels to play with, in my opinion, in my personal humble opinion, how bad it feels to play with the Islander. And that is because... You know, for the you have to spend ages gathering heads in order for the weapon to be effective, right? You have to play pretty cautious to gather heads for... Oh my god. Yeah, you have to play pretty cautious to gather heads for a while. If you don't know about Team Fortress 2, the Islander is a sword for Demo Man, and uh, it gains... Every time you kill someone with it, you gain a, a... You collect a head, and that gives you more speed and health and... Um, makes your sword stronger every time with every head you collect so you start off uh really weak and then but because it scales you can eventually like scale up to become ridiculously overpowered uh and so it's basically the meta and with demonite is to play with that sword because with you have five heads you are uh faster than a scout if you depending on which web which if you're using like certain other things in your loadout, you're faster than a scout, you can take more damage than a heavy from explosives and fire, because the sword give the, it gives you resistances, and uh, you can one-shot a lot of light, lighter classes. It's, it's very powerful. Um, and so people, you know, I think he's right to complain about it being sort of dominating the meta and making it a bit boring. Oh, I, uh, I died. Uh, but there's another thing, which is how bad it feels to play with, because you spend half your time playing really cautiously, picking off the str like stragglers and having to sort of play like spy in order to collect the initial few heads it takes to actually re be powerful enough to get aggressive, uh, which sucks. And you often die in bullshit ways that you have like when you're weak, you're really weak. Right? You have you you have no recourse against a bunch of about, uh, like pretty much any ranged attack. Uh, <clears throat> if you can't close the distance. But then, even more annoyingly, once you get the heads that you need, d it feels terrible to die because you spent so long gathering heads and you worked so hard that, that like, getting backstabbed or something, you know, getting backstabbed never feels good. But, man, it feels like some bullshit. When you, when you die from some typical TF2 dumb reason, uh that you can't really account for after spending ages gathering heads. Yeah, that sucks. I hate it. That's the, the that's why I don't use Islander. I use when I go full demo night, I generally use the half Satoichi cuz the overheal is kind of kind of pog. Uh, I don't think the Islander needs to be nerfed. I just think the other swords need to be buffed a tiny tiny bit. Like specifically, I think a faster draw speed would be really useful. Uh, okay, let, let me uh, maybe hit some shots once in a while. Uh, not good, not good, man. Uh, yeah, but the, the Islander doesn't work super. I've, a lot of people, well, not a lot of people. Some people use the Islander on Hybrid Knight. I don't use the Islander. I don't. I, I think the the generally accepted best sword for Hybrid Knight is to clear the more, play the more, 
Yeah, I, I just get, I find it fun to say it, it with correct pronunciation, okay? I, I know it sounds weird, but I, I, I find it fun to say it like that, so I will continue to say it like that. Oh, okay, sorry, God, bad content, because I'm just playing Team Fortress 2 at the same time. Uh, the other thing that, that he says in the video that I don't agree with is he spends the whole video saying why would anyone use the charge and charge, or sorry, sorry, why would anyone use the tide turner with a weapon that doesn't random crit? That the only thing the tide turner is valid with is the Scotsman's skull cutter because it can crit. Whereas, you know, when you uh, do a charge and then swing with any other uh, shield, it gives you a full crit. Whereas the charge and charge only gives you a mini crit. And so it's way, it's not powerful enough. Uh, I think he really underestimates how powerful the uh, added mobility is. Not just for trimping, but for. Uh, just for general usage, like especially with the clay the more with the extra charge duration, it means you can adjust on the fly. It's so useful. The thing about the Tide Turner is it's really good on Hybrid Knight, in my opinion. I, in terms of full Demo Knight, I can see how it's, it's not as good. Like you just have to, yeah, whatever, sure. But Hybrid Knight has mid-range abilities. You can still do damage and keep distance uh, to get kills. Something is making a weird noise in this computer. Why is this so... hold on. Sensors. It's not even hot. What the hell? Uh, but sorry, um, yeah, so Tide Turner uh, on Hybrid Knight is really effective because, um, yeah, I think the best Hybrid Knight loadout is um, Iron Bomber, Tide Turner, Claymore. Uh, I think that is just the best Hybrid Knight loadout because the, the maneuverability is insane. The fact that you can see a sniper, like this is the thing, as a demo knight of any kind, snipers are going to be one of your number one targets because you kill them really easily, they're generally not super aware of what's going on. Snipers are like arguably your best matchup. It's a little tricky if they have Jurati, that kind of fucks you. Jurati counters you a little bit, um, but generally speaking, snipers are going to be a really good matchup for you. Uh, the problem with the sh shields other than the tide turner is that you can only really charge in a straight line or a straight-ish line, which makes your movement really predictable. So if a sniper is like looking at you, they just fuck you. If you ever charge directly into a sniper in a straight line, you're not going to get to the sniper. There's no, unless it's a, a, a new player, you know, it, this is an easy thing to hit. It's a guy coming directly at you, you just click the head, it's not particularly difficult, and then you're done. The Tide Turner lets you be unpredictable in your movement and lets you dodge those that w the one attempt the sniper has to hit you as you're charging towards them. Which means you can get the picks on snipers and then get the fuck out of there as quick as possible. Um, I mean, I haven't even mentioned trimping because, you know, as the guy says in the video, trimping is like a kind of a flashy, showy thing, but as, in terms of like how effective it actually is for getting kills, it's questionable. I think I want to push back on that a little bit too. Which is that trimping is, I mean, again, as, as demo knight of any kind, you're kind of, you, you, you're not, you, you want to pick off stragglers, right? And the best way to do that is to get into the enemy's backline, and that's what trimping is useful for. Sure, it's very heavily map dependent, but on upward, for example, upward gives you so many opportunities to trimp directly behind the entire enemy, pick off their medics, and then run the fuck away. Like, that is exactly the thing you should be doing as demo knight. You can't do that with any other shield. You have to use the Titan to do that. I think that's a pretty powerful thing, you know? I, I don't think that's that should be, you know... Maybe it's not as flashy as, like, the super cool trimp kills that you see on YouTube. Uh, but, uh, you know, it doesn't mean... Like, you, 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 even if you're just getting two kills off of it, that's still pretty good, especially if you're taking out medics, which are, again, a good matchup for you. It's a good way to surprise the enemy team. They're not expecting a, a demo knight trimping at an extremely high speed to, to show up out of nowhere. There's not really anything. You're, you're going too fast to really uh, air shot, Mr. Beast combo, if, you're, you know, if you know what you're doing. Um, and on top of all of that, it's fun. It's just fun. Even if you don't get kills off of it, it's just fun. Which is ultimately what matters in gaming. I literally just had a perfect example of why the Tide Turner works really well. And I was, I was fighting a soldier. You know how it is when you're fighting a soldier. They're, uh, you know, <laughs> they're there. 
They're full of uh, rockets and stuff. <laughs> what the fuck am I doing? Uh, but yeah, fighting a soldier. I'm like, I need to close the distance. I can't hit my pipes right now. How many yet? Okay. Yeah, can't hit my pants right now, need to close the distance. So I charge towards him. And then, lo and behold, he fires a rocket at me after I charge. There's no way I could have predicted this. Right? If I if I was using a different shield, I would have had to just just not charge, right? Or or I would have just had to tank the damage from the rocket, which would have left me vulnerable when he attacked me back. Um damn, I'm kinda of playing well today. Uh but instead I just, I just moved around it. I just did a little, did a little curve, did a little uh, maneuver, you know, a little bit of a curved maneuver. Just squiggled around it in a, in a serpentine pattern as I charged towards him. What's he gonna do about it? Nothing. He can't do shit about it. Close the distance, get a couple of slices on him. Yeah, I managed to survive with six health, but I managed to survive. And remember, Tide Turner, you, you get a uh, charge back on a hit, that means uh, I could charge, charge away instantly back to the health pack, survive. That's what it's all about. That's what the tight turn is all about, motherfucker. It works. It's a good. It's a good shield. It's the best shield, actually. So I had that period where I thought I have to. I thought I. I thought that I had hit the end of the going from beginner to intermediate player skill ramp. And was now sort of at the intermediate player plateau. It's like you get diminishing returns on improvement. Which is obviously true. But uh, no, I, I have not stopped improving at the game. I just had a few bad days. Uh, the main things that I'm better at now are choosing, uh, switching back to the Claydemore from, from the Islander was a fucking good decision. Uh, I, I am now like fully against Islander on hybrid and fully pro Claydemore. I, I was not taking full advantage of the extended charge range later You can fucking charge... If you're on a King of the Hill map, you can charge people down, like, halfway across them. Like, it is insanely far, and that's without trimping. Like, you, you just have so... People cannot escape you. If you hit someone with a pipe and they try and run away, they are done. Even scouts, you can... Like, no one can escape you. And then you get the kill and you immediately will get out of there. It's such a great move because no one because they don't expect it. People don't have a good idea of how far Demonite can charge, and especially not with the Claydemore. People people underestimate how how far you can charge. Managing your charge meter is another thing. It's obviously always tempting to use it on the rollout and get to the front grid. Because not doing that is boring, and you feel like you're losing time and not helping your team. But you know sometimes I I end up charging in. By the time I get to the front, I have no charge. And then I get caught out in a bad situation then to escape or I miss out on a kill because I can't follow through, you know. So learning to conserve the charge meter and manage that resource more effectively is going to be a continual thing for me. Uh, but I'm, I'm slowly improving at that. But one big thing I've improved at is surfing damage. I, I noticed that I've been doing this, like today I realized that I've been doing this without even thinking. Like this is one of the thi things that I have been thinking about it consciously also. Like, it's crazy how many more options you have once you start. Because I already have good air control movement because surfing and general source. Energy. So I have good control in that department. It, it's just a matter of like learning the time. But surfing damage is such a powerful mechanic. It's so cool that it's in the game. Uh, like, now that I am slowly improving at surfing, my matchup against soldiers has improved so much. I still underestimate the amount of health that soldiers have a lot. Soldier has the second most health of any class. I going in a kill that would be two sword hits on any other class, which I could knowing I could survive that. But then on heavy three sword hit. I die and then the heavy's like four health, which is kind of annoying. But oh well. Uh that's something I need to learn more. So yeah, that's been going fairly well. As for like general aim and skill, like hitting pipes, I think I'm better at hitting air shots now but not that much better i still need a lot more practice on that uh that just comes with time and i really need to get better at dealing with sentry but i am improving and the other thing that i actually wanted to mention is i played a uh, a pyro game on pl pier today my best pyro game ever played combo pyro it's like suddenly halfway through the round i unlocked 
the fucking flare gun and just figured out how it works and demolished like the the the, the enemy team there was a guy literally typed it told me please stop using the flare gun it's mean i was just hitting crits man it's very satisfying to play combo pyro and uh I mean, I don't know what else to add to that. It's just very, it's quite satisfying. You have such high burst damage potential and hitting flare shots on like, uh, up in the air or like on a moving target is very satisfying. Uh, it's a good, it's a, you know, playing pyro made me so much better at dealing with pyros. Like I remember in the first podcast I was talking about TF2 in, I was just complaining about pyro and air blast constantly. I like have it's my matchup is better now mainly because I just avoid them because I know I have a bad matchup against them so I just like generally try and avoid taking that fight unless I have a big advantage like they're not paying attention uh but uh when I do have to take the fight or want to I'm I have a way better understanding of just like how what pyro's range is, like how where I can stand to be safe, um, air blast timings, how to bait out an air blast, uh, so that I can get a pipe off. Just just general stuff. I can I feel like playing pyro was a really good idea to to get get an idea of like how to counter it. Uh, but it's also fun just on its own. Uh, so I think I should probably play more soldier so that I can get better at countering soldier. Uh, uh, I think. I don't know. In terms of matchups, like I'm, I'm, I'm obviously Pyro has various tools to counter me. Scout is probably my worst matchup if they know what they're do- if they're not like a complete noob. Scout, I mean, you can't hit them, man. They're too fast. Uh, I I played some Scout today and could not hit my meat shots. I was playing against good play and yeah, losing losing Scout v Scout mirror matches a lot. Just could not hit the scatter gun shots at all. Um, heavy. I feel like I, for for a while, I just assumed that I could never do anything against a heavy, because it's a heavy, and then I suddenly realized that it only takes four pipes, it, direct hit pipes, I think it's three or four, depending on the amount of overheal, to kill a heavy, which is only, what, you know, like, that's, do- that's doable, because they don't move very fast, and they have a big hitbox. And after taking out a couple of heavies, I have become overconfident. And I now I'm like, this guy can't do anything to me. I'll just hit my four pipes. And then inevitably, I do not. And if you do not hit all four pipes, you have no pipes. And then you are dead. Uh, so I, I got a little cocky dealing with heavies. But yeah, I I just... in Like, the most powerful button in your arsenal in Team Fortress 2 is the space bar, it turns out. Like, being able to surf projectile damage is so powerful. You can use it to, like, I, I can Im- I can only imagine the fear on, a, like, a soldier must feel when they shoot a rocket at my feet and it propels me directly into their face with my sword drawn. <laughs> uh, they, the, the thing I'm also trying to get a bit, like, trying to, to get ingrained into my, my mind is the fact that you can, you can pipe jump you can you can you can do like a you you can if you're up close in an enemy's face you can shoot a pipe at them and use that to launch you immediately like a rocket jump uh and this is really good for getting out of bad situations uh the problem is it also takes a bunch of your health right so it's like you have to know when to use it but it is it can be very powerful and that's something i'm trying to i've i've only ever successfully used it to escape a bad situation once or twice um I'm trying to remember that it's a tool I have in my arsenal, but it's definitely a thing. You can also use, uh, like shooting a thing at a, like a, like a random dispenser or to do the same thing. It's definitely a powerful movement technique that I'm not super good at yet. TF2 is so fun. Such a good game. Took me way too long to start playing this goddamn game. Uh, I feel like I was going to say something else. Oh yeah, Dragon's Fury. I was playing against a guy using the Dragon's Fury for a while today, and that's an interesting weapon. Like... That's not many pyros use it, so I haven't really got that much training against it, which I think is actually one of the reasons why it's so powerful. Like it, because because it's kind of a niche weapon, but it it also it, like it has the potential to be really good, but it's just not meta. Most pyros don't use it for some reason. Uh, 
it's like you don't have much practice so like i don't have the the range of the dragon's fury ingrained in my muscle like i do for the the normal flamethrower uh so that that causes a couple problems for me sometimes if if i run up against the dragon's fury pyro but uh you know both dragon's fury and flog pyro aren't that hard to deal with because their air blast is significantly nerfed which means you just have to land your pipes i want to i think ai is actually gonna be bad in a boring way i think it's just gonna mean loads of really effective scams it's gonna make scammers even more commonplace on the internet than they are now and i don't know how i mean cgp gray make video cgp gray video be hey you are now no longer allowed to comment unless you are a patreon donor uh you are not allowed to comment on my video uh <clears throat> if in order to future proof against AIs. This is gonna happen more often. We're gonna see more shit like this. It's gonna suck. Um, and there's gonna be a whole host of situations where real humans are just replaced with an AI that is actually not that good. Uh, because AIs, you know, large language models are very, very impressive and extremely cool technology. Uh, but they also suck at a lot of things. Uh, you know, as an example, I can ask, you know, none of these G GPTs or Bing or any of them are capable of, uh, when I try to look up stuff about, uh, I was, I was showing it to Osaka when I first got Bing and I've occasionally tried to run Osaka's videos, like, uh, like say like, Hey, could you summarize this? Or, or like, who is Osaka syndrome? And the AI just hasn't, it just makes shit up. It has no idea. It also doesn't understand my videos or anything like that. It, it makes an attempt. It knows a little bit. It knows that I'm a musician, but that like it's in uh, the rest of it, it just makes up. Um, you know, a lot of it is, uh, there's also a pretty interesting thing in terms of how it's filtered, where it's basically been revealed that uh, GPT, it won't, um, it can give arguments in favor of any political side but it will never give arguments against the liberal side. It will only give arguments against conservative sides. Not on every issue, uh, but this is gonna be just ha like, these AIs aren't above human bias is my point. Like if Mike was, like for example, when you ask Bing about anything to do with AI, it always gives a positive answer. It always says like, it always tries to put it in a way where it comes across that like, AI technology is actually, or at least to say like, yeah, there are serious, you know, there, there are problems that need to be taken seriously. But in the end, you know, I think those problems shouldn't take away from the fact that this technology is really powerful and, uh, you know, so on. It, it will never give a argument that is anti-AI or even close to it without undercutting it by saying, but, you know, on the other hand, it's really good, you know, like there's a, the, the, what I'm saying here is, uh, AI is not immune to ideology because <clears throat> these aren't really AIs, right? They're, they're just because they can't learn anything. I mean, maybe they can at some point in the future. Someone will figure that out. I don't know what will happen then. But uh, right now, they can't learn any new past their data. Not really. Uh, what I'm worried about is that you'll, they'll end up... Rep like, I don't really care that much if they replace... What I'm saying is, right, they'll, they'll replace people with AI and 90% of the, like, it's just going to be annoying because, because sometimes the AI just won't work very well because that's just how, how it is. And sometimes humans don't work very well, you know? I don't know. I don't know what the fuck I'm saying. I'm just, I'm just, none of this is going to, there's no, there's no glorious de destruction of, of the, the present state of things, unfortunately. It, it doesn't happen. It'll only be used to reinforce. You know what I'm fucking happy about? I'm, I'm happy that... Like, you can complain about the, the state of modern anime as much as you like, okay? I, I don't think it deserves complaining about, but, I mean, sure. Complain about whatever you want to complain about, right? But, but thank fucking God we don't have to deal with goddamn Love Live anymore. Holy shit. It was like years of nothing but fucking Love Live and Love Live. Fa Holy shit, I'm so... Back when I worked at, at that bar... There was a uh, a bar that I used to work at. Terrible job, shitty job. Uh, I've never really told people what a couple of stories. So on, I think my second or third day at the job, 
uh, I got called into the manager's office and they had security camera footage of me at the till up and uh, they were sort of they asked to like check my pockets and check my wallet. They thought I was stealing money from uh, And then in the end, they, I guess, realized that they, I don't know why, but the manager sort of called me in. He didn't accuse me of stealing money. He didn't say like, we know you stole it. Cause I didn't, by the way, I should clarify. I never stole any, that would be really stupid to do. Uh, so I think I know why this happened. Uh, first day at the job, I get my lunch break. And so I'm like, oh, well, I gotta go buy a sandwich. So I. I leave to go buy a sandwich from the shop, come back, eat the sandwich, and then continue. I think that's normal to do, right? Uh, what I didn't count for, but I didn't think it would matter, which is when you go in, there's a guy who counts how much money you have. Like, you're supposed to give your wallet to this guy, he counts how much cash you have, and then when you leave at the end of the night, they count how much cash you have again to make sure no one's stealing. Which, you know, is a little intrusive, but I get it. I imagine they only have that because probably someone was stealing at one point. So, you know, I understand why they do that check to make sure no one's stealing all the way. That makes sense. But because I had bought a sandwich halfway through the day, the money didn't match up. And the guy on that first day, I didn't know what was going on because no one told me what, like, no one told me why he was stopping me from or like why I had to give this guy my wallet to count. I didn't think it through very well. But I also thought, I mean, I never thought it would be a problem because obviously I would have less money, you know? So I didn't imagine it would... Anyway, he tried to sort of stop me from leaving and then was like, at whatever, bro, you can go. So I think it's that. I think it's because of that on my first day that then, because there was that discrepancy, that's why they called me in. So they called me up to the office. The guy's like... Let me count how much money you have. Like, show me your pockets. And you, like, let me, like, empty all your pockets and stuff, which I do. It's everything's fine. And then he's he seems kind of mad at me, but he doesn't. He's not like there's nothing to be mad at me about, right? <laughs> so he's just like in the end, what he does. So what I used to do is I used to come in with like a zip up hoodie on. It's cold outside, but then inside the club, it's hot. So I would take the hoodie off and sort of wrap it around my waist. You know, tie tie it around my waist. And I think just because he, I, I don't think he really knew why I was in there. Um, and so he just told me to stop doing that. He said, it's not normal. I remember he said, don't, don't tie your jacket like that. It's not normal. Uh, so I did, I stopped, I would put it in my locker instead. I thought it was a little bit of a weird thing to complain about, but I guess he just wanted, wanted to have some reason to have called me into the office in the first place. Uh, <clears throat> so that was one incident. Uh, nothing super exciting, I guess, but it's just funny that I got called into the office like almost immediately for stealing, even though I didn't steal. So from then on, I bought sandwich before I went into work because um, apparently you're not allowed to leave. You're not allowed to leave um, ha halfway through your shift to go get a sandwich. You have to stay in the place the whole time, uh, which I didn't know. So yeah, from then on, I, I, I bought in my sandwich. I bought my sandwich before I went in. Like, remember, these are 13 hour shifts that I was doing. So it, n not being able to leave that whole time is kind of a, I don't know if it's a, a big deal, but it's kind of, it's not like it's like, oh, well, I just stay here for six hours. Or, you know, it's a, I just didn't assume it would be like that. Uh, so that's one thing that happened. Then um, there was a couple of autism moments I had. So they told us on the first day, like, you have to wear black, plain black clothing. You're not allowed to not... All of your clothes have to be plain and black, which was fine. I had plenty of plain black clothes. Uh, but one day, my... I actually only had one pl pair of black jeans. Uh, so one day, I'm like, oh shit, I only have blue jeans. So I text the manager, uh, or like the... I don't really know what the higher... Like, the there was the owner who was... Okay, yeah, I'm getting a bit confused. So the owner is not the manager, right? The owner was this Pakistani guy. That was the guy that called me into the office and talked to me. Um, but the manager was this, uh, I, I think she was Spanish from her accent, woman. Uh, and uh, so I, I texted her on WhatsApp. With, like we, we all had to be in a, a group WhatsApp thing for, for work. So I, I, when I didn't have the black jeans, I was like, oh shit, well, she told me to wear only black. So I messaged her and said, listen, I'm sorry, I don't have any black jeans are gonna have with blue jeans and then she was like i don't know what she, i don't remember what she replied but then i remember at, at work she came up to me and she was like trying to she was like 
laughing at me. I don't remember exactly what she said, but she she was kind of making fun of me, like uh, about the fact that I thought it would be a problem. So like, why wouldn't I think it, if you told me explicitly <laughs> to only wear b- black and then I don't have black, of course I'm gonna message you and make sure that's okay. But yeah, she came out to me and she was like laughing and saying like, I don't, fuck, I wish I could remember exactly what she said, but she said something that was like poking fun at me and I just sort of mumbled and didn't really respond. Uh, yeah. And then a couple other things. Firstly, I would always be dancing basically the whole day. I would be like, not like straight up dancing, but like, you know, shuffling back and forth to the to the beat. Um, which I don't think the guys were super happy about. The management guys were super happy about, but they couldn't really do anything about it. Because it wasn't like I was going crazy. I was just sort of like vaguely sort of moving along to the beat of the songs. And uh, a couple of times, some patrons of the, the bar slash club were like, hey, it's good to see you guys are having fun here as well. So that wasn't true. The reason I was dancing is because I had to be standing up for 13 hours a day. <laughs> and standing up without moving for that long is extremely fucking painful. So I had to just keep moving to keep the blood circulating in my legs. And so I would just sort of do that. And also, it was incredibly fucking boring. Uh, yeah, and it was the same songs over and over again. It sucked, honestly. Terrible job. Uh, then, uh, the also, especially bad because I was... I was in the process of breaking up with my then girlfriend <laughs> while I was working this job. I was having very strained relations with my girlfriend at the time. So I would be like sneaking off to the bathroom to have an argument in text chat. <laughs> uh, yeah, that that sucked. Um, uh, every night they would play, you know, the the poker set. Molly poker set. That song. Yeah, that song was really big at the time. Although it was a little past its prime. They just played it every every night. They would play it, and every night when they when it said chase a check, never chase a bitch. I would I would sing along very vigorously because I was not doing well with my bitch at the time. Glad I got out of that relationship. Uh, there's other interesting stuff that uh, I there was there was a couple of times. Well, there was there was one time where there was a really drunk belligerent, maybe even more than drunk, maybe on something. Actually, probably on some a uh, guy who was trying to start a fight and uh, he was trying to break into the staff room he was trying to go into the woman's bathroom I don't think the guy was like I think he was just on something he was probably just like taken too much of whatever he took and he just was disorientated and didn't like didn't know didn't really know where he was or what was happening and he was just sort of lashing out violently because that's what normies do when they're confused is they just they just try and be, they just become violent so yeah he, he was just like I think he was just sort of not sure where he was and he'd ended up sort of wondering because the the woman's bathroom was right next to the staff room which was really strange as a guy right because every time I would have to go to the staff room I would have to go past the line and the only thing there is the women's so if like if you don't know that I work there it's like why are you going up there that's also when I got groped uh, was by women waiting in line for the bathroom uh, but yeah that's where the guy was he was like in this place that was the only places there are uh, it's like a little corridor and there's just the women's bathroom and the staff room in that corridor and he was just there and I guess he'd been trying to get into the women's bathroom it, yeah I don't think he really knew what where he was or what was going on but then he ended up trying to get into the staff room and then like one of the security guards was like you can't do that bounces and then they ended up like choking him out basically and dragging him outside where he then tried to fight them again and i was right there for the whole interaction i was one i was thinking of like stepping in to help but i didn't know what to do i was very calm like this whole time i'm like you know uh, what's the word disassociated i was i was having a lot of dissociation at that time in my life uh you know actually thinking of it i used to have a lot of dissociation that i don't have it's been replaced with brain fog I want. I want to go back to the dissociation. I think I don't know, but I yeah. During that time, I was I was incredibly dissociated, and so it I wasn't freaked out or anything. I was just thinking like, I wonder if I can help in the situation because I think it would be fun to restrain a guy. But there was already two security guards dealing with him. I didn't think there was really anything I could do, so I just sort of stood there and watched. Uh, he was pretty like I I don't want to say that the guy is like pitiable like I don't really think he knew what he was doing like I again I think he was probably very disoriented but he was trying to hit people <laughs> like he did he started the fight uh and he looked he looked there was something about him that looked off I can't really describe it like the way he was acting his mannerisms look at something about the, the way he was acting looked like something something was off about like 
I don't, maybe he had some sort of mental, like, it, it looked like he wasn't seeing the same world that everyone knows, if you know what I mean. I don't know if he'd taken something or if he had, was really, really drunk or had, had some mental health problem or something, but, uh, yeah, that was a, that was a, there was a couple of fights, but that was the worst one, because he, I mean, I, he literally got choked out right in front of me by the, the, the bouncer, um, hitting people. And, um, most of my time was spent just fucking seething at the whole dynamic of the club because most of the time what I was watching was just men being so pathetic just I would just see man after man after man just trying to fucking hit on women so embarrassing that's when I realized that it's like it's it I don't think that there's some magical thing that like normies know how to do that autists don't know how to do when it comes to women I think that everyone involved is just really stupid because because sometimes like it was just random like the men would just keep being really pushy towards these women and the women would be very dismissive but then once in a while the women would be like oh hell yeah yeah that's nice let's let's go do it let's go hang out and kiss and stuff right like there didn't seem to be any pattern in it uh like sometimes i would see over the course of a night like a guy trying to hit on a, a bitch and then like the bitch would like turn him away but then by the end of the night they'd be making out and the bitch would be clearly into it so it's like you know I, I don't think these guys have any I don't think anyone involved has any real idea of what's going on I don't think there's some crazy nampa going on you know some some crazy tech that, the, that, that anyone knows and the thing is like sometimes you'd see groups of girls who clearly that group just didn't want, they just wanted to hang out, they didn't w want anything to do with any men, and the men would keep coming up to them, and I could tell that it would, like, that seems really annoying to, if I was in the situation. But then sometimes you'd see groups of girls who were clearly there to fuck, right? Which, you know, fine, if, if you want to do that. But they would still do the same thing, where they would be, like, very dismissive, and then sort of give in under pressure. And then I figured out what was happening, is that at the beginning of the night, they would be dismissive because they were looking for like, they were trying to weigh out their options. It's very like Machiavellian, the way these people think. Like they would, they would be dismissive of all the, in order to try and like find a better looking guy. And if they couldn't, then they'd be like, okay, yeah, cool. We can hang out. It's like, oh, that's a bit, uh, I don't know how I feel about that. But, but mainly, you know, it was mainly the men who came off as looking very pathetic as engagement because they just all looked so desperate for pussy. It, they just looked like none of, no one, no one ever came off, came off as suave or smooth. They were all just like drunk and bad. It was just bad. But th there were plenty of women who were the same way. I mean, you know, there were women who kept trying to fucking flirt with me. And I'm like, I don't want anything to do with this. I'm, I can't hear you over the music, you're ugly, you're drunk, what do you think is going to happen here, I'm, I'm at work, what are you fucking doing? I was like, I, they, they just could not understand that, I, that, that was, I was not interested, like there was one woman who kept trying to kiss me, like she kept, give me a kiss, give me a kiss, no, fuck off. Um, there was one time when I did something pretty bad, which is one time a guy asked for a beer, and you're not supposed to give them the cans, you're supposed to take a can and then pour it into a plastic glass, because I guess, or, or like a plastic cup, because I guess people maybe get hurt with the cans, I don't, I don't really know why, but you're, you're supposed to take the can and pour it into a plastic before you give it to them. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, I fucked up the pour real bad. Uh, I was kind of in a rush, because there was a bunch of people waiting, and so I was like trying to pour it too fast, and it just got really foamy and heady. And the guy just got mad, which is... Re I think for reasonable and I knew I'd fucked up and he clearly knew I'd f like he was kind of drunk I was just not willing to deal with it and so I just I just basically told him to fuck off and then he wouldn't fuck off and so I like told the security to come over and get him to leave which was kind of a mean thing to do but also I don't give a fuck about these people you're coming to this dog shit club to like do whatever it is you want like come on you shouldn't expect good service here fucking me a minimum wage worker who's being exploited come on now <laughs> so you know i should i have done that again what am i supposed to do i can't i can't get him another beer i'm not allowed to if i fuck up the poor which in a, you know I, in a high stress situation i've not poured that many beers in up until that point and even then it's like you can't you have to do it slowly you get a crazy head right? but that wasn't really an option for me because people were waiting <clears throat> you kind of have to be quick uh so 
and he kept complaining, which was stopping other people from getting their drinks. <clears throat> so it's like the really the real problem is the fucking I don't know. There's who cares? It, I don't think I did anything too egregious. Just having a lot of head on your beard is not going to kill you. Uh, there was some actually egregious stuff, and this was mostly on the bar's side. So one of the things was the orange juice that they had on tap was definitely off. Uh, I tried it one time, and it was definitely very off. <laughs> it tasted disgusting. It was not, not fit for human consumption. Uh, and they were serving that shit to people every night in vodka, orange screwdrivers, you know. Like, that shit should not have been served to customers. There was, that was not okay. <clears throat> but the real truth about this this particular club, uh, if you're really interested, I, I it was a place called Fabric, and um, I but I was curious to see like what was going on uh, with this place because it was clear that something was going on with this place. I I can't really explain why, but like I I had a suspicion that like the management was doing something fucky, and it turned out that what had happened is that this club used to be really good. I talked to. Uh, because at the time I was at school, right, and I talked to my music teacher, well, I was at school for music, so I talked to my teacher, I, I mentioned offhand that I worked at Fabric, and he said it was a great, oh, that's a great club that plays like underground techno and dance music house and stuff, and I was like, no, it isn't, they play like shitty pop music, they, what are you talking about? And that was when I was realizing something had, strange had gone on. <clears throat> so I started to do some digging, and what I found out was that the manager or the owner of the place, this guy, was like a guy who owned a bunch of strip clubs in the area and, and a few other clubs in the area. He owned like five bars and strip clubs and he had basically just bought fabric. He, he had swept in and, and bought it out when the rent, because uh, it's in a place that had been like gentrifying over the, it, over the course of the past like 10 years. Um, and so I guess when the rents went up, he swept in and, and bought it up. And this guy was definitely a cokehead, the owner. Just tell from the way he acted. He was definitely on coke all day. Uh, and so, yeah, he bought it up, ramped up the prices on all the drinks, hired a bunch of, like, disposable minimum wage workers with a ridiculously high turnover rate, and was trying to just squeeze as much money out of the place as possible. Um, which I guess is what happens, but that is, I guess that is interesting. So, I, yeah, um, there was another couple of controversies that happened to me. One of them was, uh, obviously, I did not like this job, nor the people who ran the place. They were very, they weren't nice to the staff. I mean, they didn't talk to the staff that often, but they, when they did, it was never to say something nice. It was always rude, right? Not necessarily that much to me. I mean, they, they were rude and dismissive to me because they were rude and dismissive to everyone. But uh, I could just see that they were, like, that's just how they always acted. And they were working, you know, they'd call me in really early, uh, for 13 hours to do fucking nothing for the first four hours, just stand there. And it was like, it was not good. Like the whole, the, there was a whole, <clears throat> right, like you, you can imagine. I was still not exactly in favor of, of this place existing. So of course you got to do whatever you can to get back at your workplace, like pooping as much as possible on company time, which I definitely did. I would literally go into the bathroom and when I wasn't having angry, stupid text arguments with my at the time girlfriend i was literally reading the coming insurrection by the uh, the invisible committee on the toilet at work which was kind of funny at the time to me and i think it's still funny uh but yeah i would take as many toilet breaks as i could get away with um but then also the other thing i would do is i was always because i also hated the customer because they were all like giga normies who i just saw embarrassing themselves over and over and over again trying to fuck with me, being rude to all the staff, you know. The first day, I should, wait, I should have said this. First day, literally my second customer ever tried to scam me. So he does this thing where he takes the card reader and then he like, put the, he drops his card and he goes to pick it up and then um, is like, oh, thanks. And then one of the lower level managers sees this over my shoulder and then like grabs the card reader and goes back through the history and sees that the guy has like, basically changed it so that instead of paying whatever he should have been paying for the drink, he was paying like like one P or something. Uh, while he had gone down to like pick up his card, he had like fucked with the card reader so that it, it was paying less. Uh, and so then, you know, he told me, hey, never give the card reader to the customer, they'll fuck with you. And to be fair, the drinks were ridiculously overpriced, which is another reason I didn't like this. The drinks are, 
Like the whole place is a scam. They make you pay a bunch of money to get in, and when they when you come in, they give you like a uh, a little bracelet or something. <clears throat> I don't I don't know, but they make you pay a bunch of money to get that little bracelet to come in. But then they don't let you come back in. Like if you ever leave, you're not allowed back in. So they make you pay a whole bunch up front so that you're sort of locked in because you can you never want to be like oh this place is too expensive let's go somewhere else just in case you want to come back right so it's like well i've already bought in for like you feel like you're wasting your money sunk cost for lackey right so they make you pay i don't remember how much but it was a bunch on the door and then all the drinks are so overpriced it was like um 12 pounds for a beer which is absolutely ridiculous and or a cider and i think 18 pounds for a cocktail with a double shot which is just absurd like it was so ridiculously overpriced like they would complain about it all the time i would say look i don't make the prices i it's fucking ridiculous i know and then you know we'd get along on that but like they were paying ridiculously but then they wouldn't leave right so it's like i don't really have any like they're getting ripped off by the guys who own the bar obviously but then instead of doing the sensible thing of just fucking leaving and going somewhere else, they're like, eh, fine, I guess I'll stay here and give the... Like, I saw these guys rack up, like, multi-hundred hundred pound bills every time I would go there. They, these guys must have made so much money running this, right? And and everyone who get, who went would spend hundreds of pounds on fucking alcohol. It's ridiculous. And there's nothing... Like, the music is too loud. There's no way you can go where it's quiet. You can't, like, relax or hang out any... You can't talk, right? It's it's too loud. The on, only thing you can do is buy drinks. There's nothing else to do in this place. There's no seats. There's nothing you can do. The only thing you can do in this place is buy drinks and listen to dog shit pop music. So it's, which is how club... That is the business model of clubs. It's why I don't fucking go to clubs, because they suck. So... You know, I, I, I have no respect for people who are helping this business or running this business. Um, so what I would always do is I would always overpour drinks by as much as I could feasibly get away with, which uh, is always funny because, you know, I was like, well, look, th these guys can afford it, right? Like, I, I want to waste as much of their money as possible. Spirits are going to be their main source of cost besides staff, and they're barely paying us. So, uh, you know, I'm... I'm overpouring drinks as much as possible every time I pour them. And the customers would think about, they would come, they would always come, to, once they saw me do it once, they would always try and come back to me because they knew I would give them massively overpoured drinks, right? And they would always give me a little, you know, a. But I was sitting there fucking laughing my ass off because I knew what happened to people when they drank my drinks. <laughs> right? When they drank my, these guys would not be at the end of the night feeling good. I was doing this because I was like, I am fucking your day up tomorrow. I am, I am gonna make tomorrow the he the most hellish fucking morning of your life uh, by giving you by giving you like as much alcohol as I can. Um, <clears throat> and everyone just got so drunk. Like none of them looked like they were having fun. It's a terrible life to be a normie, man. They they come in. They they just have they don't have real friends. They're just like really pathetically trying to flirt with women, and just everyone's get and the women are like equally desperate and they're all getting just way too drunk beyond the point of it being fun because there's nothing else to do at this and dancing to the worst music ever it's like man it's a, it's they're, they're all just pathetic it made me so misanthropic to be there it just made me hate every and uh so i would do that and then one time i did get caught by by the manager doing this and she was like whoa 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 that's way too much out it's way too much pour it back pour it back and then i looked at the customer and gave him a little like what can you, hey, I tried, I tried, and he was like, I, I see you, buddy, uh, but I still continued to pour as much alcohol as I could feasibly get away with, uh, and I also tried, to, they gave you, like, if you worked there, you could have free soft drinks as much as you wanted, like, free anything that they had that wasn't alcohol, you could drink for free, and so I would drink as much fucking, I, I, I was, I was drinking cranberry juice as much as possible, because I like cranberry juice, and also, it was the only thing that tasted halfway decent machine, and it would make me pee a lot, which meant the more times I could go to the toilet, the more breaks I could get, essentially. I also took up smoking again while I worked there, again, so I could get as many breaks as possible. Um, yeah, is there anything else particularly interesting that happened at this place besides being sexually assaulted? <laughs> uh, I already totally said that. Uh, I think that's about it. There was one time when on the way home I took the wrong bus by like half an hour, but that's not... I swear there was one more thing I was... Oh, so I would always bring my ThinkPad in to this place so that I could watch anime on my break. And I would do that because all the other 
people would all talk to you and i would just in a corner or just watch uh i don't i don't know what the other stuff my my co-workers thought of me i just sort of kept myself they talked this is why i would uh yeah i just I just watch anime like one time it was raining because the break area was outside um and it was raining so i was like well, there's a little, like, storage room over here I can get in. Just sit here. And then the manager that came into the storage room and was like, what are you doing in here? You can't be in here. Get out. Get out. Fucked up. Uh, so, yeah, then I quit at some point because I had to go back to school for the next term. And I quit because it just sucked. I quit, like, one month before I technically had to. But it was nice having a bunch of money while I worked there. Um, it was kind of nice. It wasn't really worth it. Not worth it. If I was not living at my parents at that time, I would not have been making enough money to live on. No question about it. That wouldn't have even paid for rent. The, no shot. It wouldn't have even come close. It wouldn't have even been half of non. Yeah. Maybe with like three roommates in a really shitty apartment somewhere, I could have paid for it. Maybe. It's a... Uh, yeah. But there's a reason that there's a... They would always hire people who are under 18. Because I was 17. Uh, which is that you don't... There's there's two tiers of wages in London. Uh, the, the minimum... You're not actually allowed to pay minimum wage to people who are over. Oh, wait, unless I was... I'm, I'm forgetting, actually, how old I was. <laughs> I think I would have been about... Uh, oh, uh, the minimum wage now is £9.50 per hour. Oh, no, this is the... the Yeah, uh, I'm not quite sure what the law is here, but the, the living wage right now is £11.95. I think it was a slightly... Yeah, basically, I was... Be- like, they, they hired people who were below the age sort where you had to pay them the London so that they could get away with... Pay, which is a bit scummy, but that's actually the law's fault for setting it up. Anyway, now I'm a neat, I don't have to work anymore, which is great. It's good not having to work. I hate working. Who would do that? I had, I had, I had a job before that where I worked at that job sucked as well. I don't think there is such thing as a good job. Maybe there is. I'm not aware of it. So there's been a few things noticed. Is my voice quieter? Am I quiet? Why am I quieter? Hold on. There must be a sound in loud. Okay, now we're louder, maybe. <clears throat> there's been quite a few things for Counter-Strike 2 that seem to be new avenues for Valve to sell you shit. So, if you don't know the history, CSGO added skins for the guns, right? Everyone knows that. Then at some point, <clears throat> they added gloves that you could get. The other things you can gamble for are gloves, stickers for your guns, graffiti, um, and you can buy custom player model type they're not, not custom but different player models uh and it seems like cs2 is adding more stuff from data mining they're like they uh, or at least creating the option for them to do so this is one of the big things people noticed the second that people realized you can see your legs in counter-strike 2 they were like oh they're gonna sell us shoes and shit i think people are saying it as a joke but <clears throat> Tyler McVicker um, data mining shows that there are lots of strings in the game's code that seem to be related to cosmetic clothing items. So you're probably and also taunts. Um, now this is gonna be cre- this is gonna be very unpopular. I think I don't think anyone wants this in in CS. People were very mad about the agent skins, which is what they call the the player model skins. People gem- people bought them for some reason. They look ugly, they look terrible. I don't know why anyone bought them, but people did. Um, but but there was a lot of pushback against the agent skins. A lot of people still think they shouldn't be allowed in tournament play. Um, I, you know, there's definitely a couple of agent skins that, that just are actually bad to fight against. In particular, the scuba looking one, the hitbox of like what you can, cause he has a bunch of shit dangling off of him, like, like scuba gear. But if you shoot that, it doesn't do damage. So it's not clear where the hitbox, like, <clears throat> obviously up close you can tell. And you can always just aim center mass or, like, aim for the head. Most of the time it doesn't matter. But there are some times where it does matter. If, if they're far away, you can't quite tell what's going on. Maybe if you have a shitty cheap monitor. There's a lot of examples where not being able to instantly read what you can shoot and what you can't shoot that will damage the enemy is really bad. And... <clears throat> That is definitely in the game with with some of the player models, which I think sucks. I, I hate the fucking player models. They look, I mean, most of all, they just look really ugly. Um, so it seems, yeah, but the thing about adding these strings to the, the, the game's code is it doesn't, 
I don't know. It, 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 I think they're just doing it to future proof, like in case they decide to add that. Like, I don't, I don't 100% know what's going on with that. It's, uh, it's, hopefully they don't add that bullshit to CSGO or CS2. But here's my question. If you, if you want to do that, you have a game where that's appropriate. You have a game called Team Fortress 2 that you own and has a cosmetic system. Why not just shill t- like TF2 is, is still really popular. It's not as popular as CSGO is right now because CSGO has had a big boost recently in player count. It's hit its highest player count ever. But TF2 is still really popular. Like, give me a second. Let me look up top 10 most popular Steam games. CSGO number one, Dota number two, Apex Legends number three, PUBG four, Destiny two, five, Source SDK base six, not really a game, but sure. And then TF2. So depending on whether you want to count the Source SDK as a game, it's either the sixth or seventh most popular game on all of Steam. And that's now. That's not like <clears throat> lifetime. That is that is right now. So why not put the goddamn fucking cosmetics that you want to sell in the game where it makes sense to sell those cosmetics? They could so easily be shit. Like, <clears throat> they had a terrible experience with trying to add competitive into the game. They really fucked up, and it's, it's, it's their fault. It is 100% their fault that they fucked up. They fucked up because they didn't really look into the competitive community in TF2 at all. They didn't really give a shit about it. They sort of threw it in. They didn't do it very well. And when they threw it in, it sucked, right? They, they put in competitive mode. It, it fucking sucked. And then they didn't really fix it. Uh, uh, instead, they focused on other games or whatever. And so the community just sees that competitive mode existing. And I think they're scared of trying to fix it. The thing is, there is no reason why they couldn't fix it. Modern gaming is much more competitive focused. It would be so easy for Valve to just talk to someone who's a pro TF2 player, hire Banny briefly as a consultant, revamp TF2 competitive mode, revamp the matchmaking system. You, you already have a good matchmaking system in CSGO. It's not good, it's broken, but you have a at least barely usable matchmaking system in CSGO, right? So copy the, like you have that code, you have programmers who know how to program that sort of thing on stuff, fix that in TF2, make it better, hire Banny as a consultant to tell you how to, the correct rule set and map pool and stuff. Competitive TF2, look, I, I don't particularly like sixes, not fun for me, but I think it could be super popular. I think it could be really popular, but they just fucked up. They fucked up the first time and then got too scared to try again. They could so easily try again and fix it. I think they're scared of doing it because I don't think they want a competitor to see us go. I think they want to funnel all the um, competitive FPS players into their game that is built around competitive FPS gaming. And then the casual FPS players into TF2 where they just ignore them, <clears throat> which is a strange decision. Why not have two of them? <laughs> like, there are, uh, Riot has multiple different competitive games. Blizzard has multiple different... Com- like, it's a weird decision to make. Maybe they just don't have the staff to upkeep that? I don't know. But they could, they could definitely... I don't know why I'm trying to tell Valve what to do. Any Valve employees listening? <laughs> I, I don't know. I think it's, a, I think it's such, a, such a, like, obvious thing to do. Because you can... You can sell cosmetics in TF2 way better than you, like, the CS2 skin market is already, like, world domination, you know, you can't, there's no room to expand it or shove more stuff into it without, like, impacting gameplay or taking away from the spirit of the game or something like that, I think. Because the re- one of the reasons that this stuff works so well in TF2 is because Counter-Strike doesn't have characters. TF2, none of these other, most other games, like uh, some of them, you know, Valorant tried, all of them copied TF2, Valorant, Overwatch, they copied TF2. But TF2 has incredibly iconic, well-liked characters. No other game has this. Like, no one really gives a shit about the characters in any other game. I fucking get incredibly 
I, I do not give a shit about, like, who cares about the fucking people in Valorant? Who cares? Does anyone actually care? Is anyone invested in their personalities? Or, like, every time they act, they do, like, these sorts of things. They always just make the character some racial stereotype, which is a really weird thing to do. <laughs> TF didn't do that. It has characters that the whole internet loves, literally, like, well over a decade of memes and continuing memes about them. Which is why taunts work in TF2, because there's a little bit of a roleplay element there. No one's RPing in CSGO. I don't, no one wants taunts in CSGO. That would be so cringe. Like, I've, it's, sometimes it's, I've played on a server which had a a Fortnite taunt plugin, so you could do Orange Justice. And that was funny for like five minutes when I played on that server, but it's not, it shouldn't be in the game, right? I don't know, it's a weird, weird fucking decision, man. I really hope they don't, like, how many more cosmetics can you put in fucking Counter-Strike? You can't fit any more. You can fit loads more in TF2. You can't fit a CD, like, um, I don't know, man. I guess small indie dev, small indie dev. <sighs> My internet is fucked right now. Man. These bastards over at my ISP, they're fucking me, man. I have to be on a mobile hotspot, but can't can't play video games on a mobile hotspot. It's okay, I have a Renai X Royale to play, to play my visual novel. I uh, <clears throat> finished the common route. I'm doing Nonoka's route right now, and it's good. It's it's, it's nice. It's a good game. Good VN. Good LG. Recommend. Uh, in the painfully brief intervals today where my internet was actually fucking working, I tried playing some uh, Dragon's Fury Pyro and actually had a lot of fun. Uh, obviously, I still need, you know, I'm not going to instantly be goaded at the class. I do find it funny how it took me probably at least 50 hours to start going even KD ratio with with Demo Knight or, or Hybrid Knight. And every time I try out another class, I pretty much go about even on my first <laughs> attempt. Hybrid Knight is just really hard, man. I, I know I've said that in every fucking video I've made, but uh, man, Hybrid Knight is hard. I am so fixated on TF2, it's not even funny. My entire life just revolves around this this silly game now. It's great. Um, but yeah, I didn't get to play that much because the internet's fucking fucked uh but uh yeah no had some had some fun playing dragon's fury pyro i think uh i heard someone suggest that dragon's fury pyro is basically a subclass i don't know about that it's not it's not quite as playstyle changing as the other subclasses in my opinion but it depends on your own definition uh but yeah super fun definitely not not as fun as you know the other day played some good combo pyro degreaser that was a uh, also really fun uh yeah i don't know pyro is actually fun you know pyro is pyro is a really fun class uh, as as long as you don't just w m1 like the thing is i play on uncle topia right players there are generally good enough that w m1 just doesn't work you you kind of have to have to be a little better than that um <clears throat> yeah, I've tried I've 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 only ever had like one successful flog uh game really where I actually played well. I feel like the the flog is is bad, man. It's bad because it will it will burn out your dopamine receptors. If you if you play flog pyro for too long, you can get you can get hooked on that shit. I can imagine. Yeah, I wish I had a a friend who would pocket me. And then play Flog Pyro, because, man, I've been demolished by Flog Pyros with Pocket Medics before, and that is not fun to play against. So, you know, you know it's fun to play. Uh, but yeah, Dragon's Fury, I think, is, is, it's surprising that you don't come across that many players using it. I also find it interesting that, like, the thing about Pyro, as opposed to some other classes, is that getting good at, like, Engineer or uh, Soldier or anything is about getting good right it's about being able to get more kills being able to move more effectively across the map these sorts of things being able to help your team and support your team better every other class is about trying to get better you know 
in terms of like winning the game. But getting good at pyro is is actually just about getting the same kills you would normally get, but in a cooler way. Like once past a certain point of pyro, I think that you just can't really get any more kills. So instead, it's just like pyros just focus on getting flashy kills, uh, which I think is fun. I th I think that's a cool thing. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, game game good good game. <sighs> I was going to say something, but I forgot what it was. Oh yeah, Dragon's Fury. You have such insane ability to just dish out damage with the Dragon's Fury. You can just, like, demolish people, man. When it works, it fucking works like crazy. I need practice with it to understand a couple of more things about it. But, yeah, the fact that you can just, just switch to it and without even having that much practice be kind of goaded with it or not goaded but sorry but be 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 average with it is is wild that's the case with most classes like i switch to sniper i'm do and i go positive every time i switch to pyro i go positive every time i switch to scout i go positive every time depending on what map it is but normally i switch to medic i don't go positive because you don't really get kills as medic but i do maybe okay <laughs> uh <laughs> I switch to Spy, I, I die a million fucking times. I don't like playing Spy. Not, not fun. Too much waiting around. Uh, uh, and I've never really tried to play Soldier. So Soldier's not really fun t for me. I, I mean, maybe, maybe I think I, it's not fun because I don't have the rocket jumper. I think I would enjoy playing Trollger because movement class. But uh, yeah, s Stock Soldier isn't very fun for me. Same with Stock Demo not really fun. I should put a couple of hours into stock demo just to like vaguely learn the how, how the sticky one launcher works. Maybe? I don't know. I have thousands of hours ahead of me in this game so plenty of time to figure all that stuff out. I just took part... oh wait I gotta go check something. I just took part in in my first autism psychoeducation session. Now I was not sure what that really entailed based on the name and I've been waiting to see what the fuck it was and now I understand what it is. The idea is that they get a bunch of people who are diagnosed with autism as adults and then they sort of teach you in a group setting with like communication what it, what it means to have autism and coping mechanisms, sharing experiences, these sorts of things. Um, but I think... Uh, I'm, well, there's, there's a cut, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if it's very useful for me, because I feel like it's just all stuff I already know, because, because it's like, if, if you're autistic, you're gonna be researching it autistically, right? But I don't know, maybe the other people seem to find it helpful, but, um, I'm the only male in the group, and men and women experience autism quite differently, so I don't really know how much of a similar experience I have. I mean, it depends, obviously. Autism is a spectrum. But, uh, yeah, there's definitely going to be differences in experience of male or to the, how autism presents in men and, and women. Because, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was mostly boring. I spent half the session just tabbed out watching a, a complete air blast and reflect guide for Pyro TF2 because I, I do have autism after all. <laughs> um... I managed to get the 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 therapist person to say Team Fortress Two out loud, which was funny. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know I don't know why I just said that. this is just a dead diary diary entry in the slice of life podcast. Uh, autism moment. Uh, yeah, really long, overly long. These sessions could be at least half an hour shorter. That's my main complaint. Doesn't need to be as long as it is. Uh. And that's probably not something that most people would say. Like generally, you want therapy. Like if you're get, you know, I can, I could see why someone would say that them being lo as long as they are is a good thing. Uh, maybe in later sessions, once the group gets to know each other better and we're talking to each other more, more friendly, it might be better to have longer sessions so we can hang out. Uh, but I don't know if that's gonna happen, especially not with me. I I feel like there's just a a big divide between you know not just because because of the male and female thing but also 
everyone else in the session is like um, a member of society, whereas I'm a degen hikini. So I think they're kind of, you know, like their problems are going to be and have been like problems at work, problems at college, these sorts of things, right? Problems with families, you know, some of them have kids, a couple of them have, you know, much older than me, some of them, a couple of the, the, them are much older than me. Yeah, so it's like, I don't necessarily, how much is my advice of like, just become a neat <laughs> and surround yourself with fellow autists? How much is that actually going to help? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I can't, I, I don't know. All I... I, I don't I don't think I can the problem is this is not a setting where I can give my genuine advice my genuine advice is is that I am an unironic autism supremacist and uh you you need to you need to to to, to drop out you need to distance yourself from holistic mass society and uh, dive headfirst into as much autism stuff as you possibly can but I, I like um you know we are we are the world's database animals you got to be you got to be databasing but I don't know. That's not really practical advice for people who need to make money to live. So I just had a pretty interesting experience. Um, I'm playing Team Fortress Two, and then a guy starts starts talking in the the voice voice chat. He starts talking, and the guy is called Research Flat Earth, all caps. And he says, "Anyone in the server believe in the flat Earth?" And he's this guy is completely unironic trying to convert people to flat earthism in the goddamn chat. So, you know, the only guy responding to him is someone who I think didn't speak the best English and didn't seem to care. Not a debate bro like me. So of course, I'm like, I can't let this guy get easy pickings on this this other guy who doesn't really give a fuck and he's responding because someone's talking to him, he's being you know, polite or whatever. Uh, I, this guy clearly doesn't know how to fucking shut down disingenuous arguments from flat earthers. I'm not amazing at it, but I'm not going to let this guy get away with having no pushback. So I plug my mic in and then try and debate him about Flat Earth. Now, I'm not a super educated Flat Earth debunker. I'm, I'm not particularly educated. I have, I have, this is the first Flat Earth I've ever argued. Honestly, I think I held my own pretty well. Uh, it's really hard to argue with Flat Earth because, uh, firstly, it requires a bunch of really specific knowledge um which most people don't have and to the flat earther brain this is like oh most people don't have it because you know the knowledge is being withheld or or whatever so saying you don't know about like some really specific experiment from experiment from 100 years ago like that is like you know uh they're gonna know everything they but you're not gonna know anything because they'll pull whatever 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 tiny piece of evidence that no one has ever heard of is really important in the flat earther community so um, you know, that's, that's already tough, is that they're gonna have a bunch of, a bunch of really specific topics they wanna, they wanna, like, push you on, um, and you're not gonna have knowledge of that, but you have to push back. Like, you can't just say, I don't know, or that's just how they, that's their entire point. Their entire point, like, the reason that they do this is that they come in, they spout a bunch of really specific, like, plausible sounding stuff, or, like, semi-plausible sounding stuff, and you don't know any of the really specific stuff that they're talking about, and that's how they win. Right, so it's really hard to argue against flat earthers for that reason, because they're going to come out with you with a bunch of hyper-specific facts, and if you can't instantly debunk or offer counter-examples, then it's going to feel like you've lost. But the thing that makes it even harder is that half of the shit is just made up. They will just make stuff up, say it as if it's true, and refuse to accept counter-evidence, which is why it's really hard to debate against flat earthers, because you're not allowed to make stuff up, and they are. Um, so, uh, for example, this guy said, uh, the first thing I, he said, he, he was asking the question, why do you believe that the earth is round? And so I chimed in and I said, well, an easy way to see it is that boats, when they go over the horizon, you can see they go over bottom first. To which he, I think, was waiting for that, right? He, obviously, he's waiting for any particular response. Um, and so he, um, you know, says... Actually, that's just an optical illusion. I already know that this is what he believes, right? He says, actually, that's just an optical illusion. And I have a video on BitChute with 100 million views that says that you can see that it or whatever, right? So instantly what he's doing is lying. He's obfuscating because that optical illusion does exist, but it's not the same thing as what I'm talking about. Um, 
Um, and he should know this. The only reason he's like saying this is to make his argument stronger. Like if, if you've done any research about this, you, you know, I, I forget what the optical illusion is called, but you like that is a real thing. It's basically the same thing as a mirage, but it's not what I'm talking about. Like that, that only happens under specific conditions. Um, basically, it's lens, it's atmospheric lensing, right? Um, but that's not the same. Like you can see, uh, you know, boats disappearing bottom first uh, in conditions without atmospheric lensing. Um, and so, so you know, instantly he's trying to he's trying to confuse one thing for another. He's trying to say like, oh, that thing, that's this, but that's not that. That's not what I'm talking about. I forgot the words atmospheric lensing while I was debating him, but I I said. Like, you're obfuscating, that's not the real thing. And this guy, he's so slippery, because he knows he's got 50 flat earther arguments that he can just bounce between, and one of them will be something I've never heard of. So he ba instantly bounces off of that. The second I start saying, like, pushing back, he instantly bounces off to, like, crepuscular rays that, like, when you... Oh, well, if the sun is really that far away, all the rays hitting the earth should be parallel, but when you actually measure them, they are not pertinent, they're convergent. They're not parallel, they're convergent. And I said... Well, obviously, because they're bouncing off the atmosphere. They're bouncing off. They're not going to. be. Their light rays are going to be scattered by the atmosphere. They're not going to enter the Earth perfectly parallel because they're scattered in the. Again, he's like, he says, no, they're focused on a point. I said that's not true, and then he's just like, no, that is true, and I said that's definitely not true, <laughs> and then he just bounced to another thing, like this. It's so hard to argue with flat earthers because they're this this particular guy. He's slippery. He's goddamn slippery. So we go back and forth like this a few times, where every time I put, I, I have some sort of counter-argument to what he's saying, he just switches to another topic instantly. And it's like, I, I, I don't know, I didn't really want to hold him, to, I, I probably should have held him to what he was saying a little stronger. But the thing is, I also know, we both know that he knows more about this than I do, right? Like, once, once you get to the, the point of, like, you, he's just lying, right? Because obviously you can't go anywhere on Earth and look at look at like sun rays and say like oh they all converge on a single point because that's not true right you you can't do that uh so he's making that up but i have no way of he has no way of proving to me that he's not lying and i have no way of proving to him that he is lying that he will listen to so it's not going anywhere the only reason i did this is because i don't i don't want this guy to feel good you know i want this guy to feel like he's i don't i i i I don't want the, anyone on the TF2 server to be sitting there thinking like, even for a second, this guy's making some, some, some salient points or anything like that. Oh, that's the sound of the police. Uh, but then I see in the chat, um, someone says, uh, stop using mic so we can hear spies decloaking. And so I just stopped talking because I was like, yeah, you're right. So I just said the TF2 isn't the right place to be talking about this. Um, and then I, then I stopped talking and then he went away. But anyway, I'm just excited. That was my first time talk, debating a flat earther. And honestly, I think I did pretty well. It's one of the, it's like a, it, that's a pretty final boss debate because these guys are super, like all they do is debate, right? They, they, they this guy's entire life is going, like I said, why are you in TF2? He said, I've gone everywhere else. So this guy's entire life is sitting on a computer, going to random places online and trying to argue for flat earth whereas my entire life is not doing that so he knows everything about this subject and he's there's no he's not ever going to be convinced of anything other than that um you know i can make as good a points as, as i want he can make as, as dog shit points as he wants like at one point i said uh you know it's really hard like something like any counter evidence you just dismiss as propaganda and then he said well you know nasa means the deceiver in Hebrew, right? Which I think he thinks is a really good point, but I'm just like, I don't see how that's relevant. You know, uh, lots of things mean lots of things in Hebrew. Also, if there was some grand Jewish conspiracy, and I specifically said Jewish conspiracy to see if he'd push back on it, and he didn't, which is how you know where he's actually going with this. Uh, some grand conspiracy to, uh, you know, pretend that the earth is round, why would they call something so obvious and then he had some retarded point about the best place to hide something is in plain sight which just doesn't make any goddamn sense obviously and i think that's when he kind of uh he knew that he'd he'd been off a little i don't know he knew that i wasn't gonna be i don't know it was stupid the whole thing was stupid 
arguing with a flat earther is stupid. You should never do it because you'll never win. Um, it's, it, you know, one in, one in a thousand of them can be convinced of anything other than what they already believe. But you're not going to get lucky. Um, and if they're to the point where they're jumping on random Uncletopia servers to convince people of flat earth, you're definitely not going to win. I just wanted to, to, literally the only reason I did it is because I wanted, I was like, I need to make sure the other people on the server know that, like, this guy's making retarded points. There's the, the, there's nothing even, rem I mean, everyone already knows that Flat Earth is dumb. Maybe I'm autistic for doing this. Maybe, I don't know. I can't pass up a debate. I'm the sort of guy that will debate with street preachers. But, anyway, there was a point to me bringing this up other than just to tell you that it happened. I think it was to just point out how impossible it is to debate flat earthers. Um, and this guy was incredibly slippery, man. This guy was so goddamn slippery. I want to talk about how, how lucky I am, but at the same time, it's not, it's not pure luck, and it's also unlucky in terms of school. So when I went to... I dropped out of sick form the first time I tried it, right? And I went back the next year, so I was one year older than everyone else. Um, and I went to a music specific music focused uh sick form uh <clears throat> now uh wait what actually happened hold on now i'm confused where am i who am i my history is confusing wait what was that place <laughs> wait i went to a place hold on now i'm just fucking no that place is like there and then you go out there the geography is all messed up in my head anyway music specific sick form um and uh, a lot of the, so there, there was music stuff, but you also have to do like core classes, <clears throat> right? And the music specific stuff, you know, the thing is, I had, I already like knew all of it. Yeah, I already knew all the music specific stuff. Uh, to be honest, I knew all the music specific stuff, basically going all the way through university, um, which isn't a brag for me. Uh, like, I want to make this clear. This is not me saying like, because I'm the bestest or whatever. Uh, this is really an indication of how low the standards are in music education. It's actually crazy. Because they always assume that you're starting from zero. So the, the sixth form I went to assumes that no one knows anything about how to use a door or anything like that. And you go to uni and they also teach you from scratch. So it's like anyone who has any experience also already has a massive leg up. And someone who already has like six years of experience, which I had at the time, has is at like basically free so i didn't really need to try for any of that stuff um so yeah i would just do the coursework and ignore the classes and watch anime in class um and then i'd watch anime at break time and then in my other lessons um that weren't music related i don't even fucking know what the lessons were because i was in the back of class and you know what i was doing you're never gonna guess i had my thinkpad out and i was watching anime uh, I did this into uni as well. I, <laughs> I went to uni, again, I would have my ThinkPad out and I'd be watching anime through the lessons. Because none of it's, like, again, this is not a brag. It's just that they te they're they teaching you really basic fucking stuff that anyone who's, like, intermediate experience with music creation n knows already. You know, like, I think, yeah, it's it was pretty surprising how, you know, back to basics all of it was. I mean, it makes sense for a sixth form, but for uni... You know, you'd imagine that in uni they're teaching you the advanced shit, but then they're not teaching you the advanced shit. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, through, through, through all of, uh, you know, I, I, th through all of the sick form, I just didn't do a lot of the work that I was supposed to do. And then you, uh, it comes to the, to the end of, of the, the, the term, and I'm supposed to be looking for unis. I go to a few unis and one of the, you know, I show them there's like an interview process where they, like an audition process, they, they ask to like listen to some of the music that you've made and I showed them some of my music and they were just like, oh yeah, that's cool, we'll give you an unconditional offer so you can just come in here, no, no precondition. I don't know why they did that, that seems weird, maybe I got lucky, maybe my music was particularly good, but given the standards of the other people, there are people in my class who, I mean... You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe they had particularly good grades in other subjects. I, that's how they got in. I don't really know. But either way, they gave me an unconditional offer. Maybe they just gave everyone an unconditional offer to try and convince them to go to this particular uni. But once I got that, I just dropped out because it's like, well, what's the fucking point of going to sick form anymore? 
if I can just get into, like, the point of going to sick form is to get enough grades that l to let you into uni, but I'm already accepted unconditionally, so I just dropped out. So it didn't matter that I didn't do any work the whole year. So I guess I got lucky. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I think I've decided I'm just going to become one of these uh, skill-based matchmaking ruined gaming guys. Because there's no... Like, TF2 Casual is so much better than matchmaking in CSGO. Because you never feel like you're... like Okay, so in CS, there are 1v1 servers. Community uh, 1v1 servers that you can find. And it is really fun to do... To play on these 1v1 servers. Because the way it works is that everyone's uh, when you press tab to see like you're scored normally right everyone is listed like from top to bottom okay so that the 1v1 servers right there's a, there's going to be a bunch of different 1v1 arenas and when you first join the server it puts you right at the bottom of the scoreboard and you're going to be in an arena with the guy who's just above you right and then every time you win you move up one position on the scoreboard um and you're always going to be fighting either the guy who's just above you or the guy who's just below you. Uh, and so what's fun is joining these servers and slowly um, making your way up to the top of the leaderboard and then seeing how long you can stay there. And you'll end up often fighting the same, you know, if you're at the top or in a certain position, you end up sort of fighting the same guy over and over again. You start to learn their 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 patterns. It's It's a really, really fun... Um, you know, little side quest in the game. Honestly, if you play CS at all and you've never done this, yeah, I know a lot of people never play on community servers, and if they do, they maybe play Surf or Hop. But try one v one servers. It's it's way more fun than the the warm up one v ones that that are in official matchmaking. Like it's it is genuinely a really fun time. It's and it's a good way to warm up before you actually jump into comp. Uh, so. Uh, you get this sort of satisfying feeling of progression of making your way up the scoreboard trying to stay as high as you can where losing puts you down a spot winning puts you up a spot um, and TF2 with the way that casual match casual works or Uncle Topia any server that doesn't have any any game that doesn't have skill based matchmaking is just a long term version of this where when you first play, you're going to be bottom scoring, you're going to be getting shit on, and then over time, you're going to be now in the middle of the scoreboard every match, then like slightly in the upper half of the scoreboard every match, and eventually, you're pub stomping every match and you're carrying your team. Uh, you know, I assume that happens, <laughs> I'm not there yet, but I assume in a couple thousand hours of gameplay, I'll get there eventually. Um, so There's like a long-term version of making your way to the top of the leaderboard on a 1v1 server. This, this is, it just makes more sense, honestly. Like, I've heard people complain about this. Like, oh, when you go into Valve Casual, which is true, I played, you know, when you play Valve Casual, it's normally, uh, you know, a bunch of people who just rush into the enemy team every round and don't, don't play the objective, and then one guy who's just dominating the server. Like, that definitely happened. Uh, that's fine, though. Uh, I, I mean, it depends. It's not fine if that guy's a fucking sniper, but other than that, I think it's fine. Uh, why shouldn't it be like that? You know, like, that doesn't, f it doesn't feel bad to play against that, in my opinion. Uh, it just is like, get good. If you want to, well, if that annoys you, then you should just get better at the game. What do you get with, with rank-based matchmaking? You don't get that. You never get to become that guy. Unless you smurf, and that's why smurfing is a problem in basically every game that has, I mean, especially Counter Strike. Um, but people smurf because otherwise you never get a chance to be rewarded for your skill and practice. You you never get a chance. I mean, yeah, sure, you shouldn't like hop on if you're if you're fucking like insane you know, the soldier main or scout main or something playing sixes and you're just like absolutely cracked at that TF2 and then, you, you you know, every day you just hop on a 24-7 a, a, a two-fort server to destroy noobs. It's probably not the best use of your time. Um, but, you know, having a variety of skill levels in each match helps because you learn, you learn by looking at the better players in your team, you know, when I was first 
like didn't really know anything about TF2 and still what what I do is when I die I spectate the other players and I see how they're playing and that like you can't do that if you're only playing with people who are equally bad as you you can only do that if you're playing with people who are better than you and worse you know and then if you're really good you actually get rewarded for that because you actually do better consistently rather than just like having some games where you top frag having some games where you're in the middle or whatever in in skill-based matchmaking because you're never actually you're always going to be fighting against people who it's like uh, obviously you're always going to be fighting against people who match your skill you don't get to actually demolish a server uh, now I've never demolished a server because I am not that good at TF2 uh, but I've witnessed people do it um, I've I've witnessed a sniper do it and not had much fun uh, but I've also watched a pyro do it I've watched a spy a crazy trick stabbing spy just fucking destroying my team uh, you know, it's 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 annoying to die to the crazy trick stabbing spy, but also, you know, the, you know what that teaches you. It teaches you how to fucking deal with trick stabbing spies because you're gonna come across them eventually, and the way to deal with them is actually very simple. You just stand still. Um, but it's just counterintuitive. They're just trying to use you. You just learn it eventually. Uh, I got trick stabbed today though, and it was on stream as well, so so people saw it. I got stair stabbed. It was embarrassing. I, I I I forgot that stair stabbing was even a thing in the game. So I just ch yeah. And then after the, after I got stair stabbed, I was fucking schizo spy checking for the rest of the entire day, and I I don't think I got backstabbed even once. <laughs> I, I I I got stair stabbed. I switched to pyro, uh, and then like fucking spy checked every ten seconds. Uh, anyway. But yeah, I, I don't understand the point of skill, but like, what's what's the point of being matched against people who are... The idea is that there's always going to be someone who is high-skilled in, in a random server if there's not some sort of matchmaking system. There's always going to be people of lots of different skill levels because there are going to be more players who are lower-skilled, but the people who are higher-skilled are more likely to be playing at any particular moment because they have to put more hours into the game, of course. So there's always going to be you know, like maybe, uh, let's say, two to four high skill players in a server, and then those guys are fighting each other, right? And it's like, and, and farming the rest of the noobs, and you don't learn to play against better players by playing against players who are the same skill as you. You learn to play against better players by playing against better players. Um, it's like it's like when, when, uh, when, when, when an anime shonen protagonist takes the the training weights off in and you you know that's what it's like when you when you spend all your time playing against really good players and then you go you know what i'm saying that's the experience you want to have you don't want to have an experience where of fucking silver 2 csgo where just no one knows what they're doing you, you're not going to learn how to do like team coordination and, and proper communication uh you're not gonna you know none of the like because the, like all of this is really what skill based matchmaking does is it gets you into bad habits because the stuff you're not going to have the skill when you first start playing CS to play properly as in like even if you were to play really strategically well in, in like the meta sense that the a pro would use you're not going to have the mechanical skill to actually execute it like even if you're holding all the right angles there's a couple of reasons why it won't work the first is you just haven't got the aim, you haven't got the spray control, you haven't got the economy knowledge, you etc. Right? So you might be in a good position that you've seen, but you might not know why it's a good position. You won't have the game sense to know when people are pushing, etc. And the second reason is because you're in fucking silver, and no one plays like quote unquote properly, like right in silver. Like no one plays the meta in silver. You're gonna be having to deal with P90 rushes. You're gonna have. To, you're gonna be dealing with a. Uh, teammates who aren't communicating properly and aren't calling properly you know you you, you can't like those um, meta plays don't work very well and so instead that's why silvers are known for like using the auto shotgun using the p90 and run and gunning you know uh, uh aggressive super super aggressive uh pushes these sorts of things the reason why is not because they're stupid it's because they're effective those techniques actually do work in silver games. They don't work amazingly, but they work better than 
sitting there staring at an angle with an AK that, you, you, you know, some someone's going to run past you with a, a million miles an hour with a P90 and spray you down and you don't even have any recourse. Uh, right, you're, you're, and then, sure, but then you build these bad habits, right? You build the bad habits of, of uh, you know, using the P90 and, and similar sort of newbie guns. You're uh, building bad habits of positioning and a million other things, right? Just general newbie behaviors. Lots of rushes, not much team coordination, not much calling, uh, these sorts of things. And that means when you do eventually rank up, half of the stuff that you're going to be doing is unlearning the bad habits you got by playing against fucking silvers for the first like 100 hours of your life in the game. It's just going to build bad habits because the strategies that work against silvers don't work against better players. So instead, how about you just play against good players from the start? You just remove this skill-based bullshit and play against good players from the very beginning so that you don't get have to go through the whole process of learning the bad noob strats and then unlearning the bad noob strats. Now, granted, CS is much less flexible than TF2, right? CS has a lot of depth of skill, but there is not much breadth of, of strategy uh, compared to TF2, where there are so many different, you know, there's obviously nine different classes, and each of those classes has a whole host of different loadouts and play styles that can ch completely change how you play them. So <clears throat> sticking with, like, the competitive 6v6 meta won't even necessarily get you kills in a 12v12 casual lobby or um you know there's there's a bunch of stuff that is like viable for pub stomping that isn't actually good in a competitive scenario i understand that um i think every yeah everyone likes the the 5v5 competitive counter strike games because they've never played counter strike source on a 12v12 or the uh, 10v10 uh you know server and they don't understand they don't know how fun it is to 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 play with <clears throat> bigger teams in a casual setting and the wacky strats that can come from that uh yeah i i don't know it's the whole focus on like competitive is the only viable way to play the game uh it just ruins it because i like you wouldn't want you you, you wouldn't because there's just so few players per team in counter-strike you don't want like there's one global elite on the other team and you're all silver like the, the it's not going to be fun for anyone so i under, i understand but the problem, the reason for that is that you've decided to make the game super limited and focused on this very particular competitive game mode that isn't even historically how most people played the game until csgo uh so it's like yeah in that scenario it makes sense uh <clears throat> But if it, it, especially if you're playing against better players, it just feels even better to get a kill. You know, I, I think this, this skill-based matchmaking is maybe not a, maybe it didn't ruin gaming, but it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a problem when it's seen as the only viable way to do any sort of online play, right? Competitive or multiplayer versus play it has to be skill-based matchmaking. It can't just be bunch of people from a bunch of different skill levels all up together in one server again tf2 is particularly good for this because it's kind of a chaotic game inherently uh but you know there's i don't personally see any reason why uh you know i i think the focus i the focus that cs has on this very particular game mode is detrimental like i i just think that one of the reasons why counter-strike lasted so long is is that it wasn't just competitive 5v5 ultra sweat it was deathmatch it was big servers with a bunch of fucking people where people do crazy shit it's movement game modes it's zombie mod it, you know it's all of these different things and when you narrow it down to most of the game is focused on this one very very particular game mode and that's how almost everyone plays it i just think that the game's not going to last very long frankly like, I, I just think you're killing... Because people are eventually going to get bored. Like, it doesn't have the variety. Like, those community servers are still there, and they're still going to be there in CS2. At least, it seems like they are so far. There's no indication that they're not. I think people would be really mad if, if they weren't. Community servers didn't work in CS2. People would be fucking pissed. But still, having so much focus on 
this very particular game mode I, I, with skill-based matchmaking, I think, fucks. It, it, it fucks up the new player experience. It fucks up your ability to, to actually learn the game in a good environment. Yeah, and there's, there is definitely uh, a drawback. Like, there's drawbacks to both systems, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, when I went to play uh, Half-Life 2 Deathmatch, no, Half-Life Deathmatch, not Half-Life 2, Half-Life 1 Deathmatch, when I tried to play that, like, you can't get into a lobby without just ridiculously cracked players. Or Rats Instagib is the same. Like, you, pl- you play Rats Instagib on a public servers, and there's always just, like, two, three players who just fucking dominate the everyone else because they're they've been playing these sorts of movement fps's and quake and stuff forever and they're just ridiculously good uh and that can be that's just not fun to play against sometimes i think can be fun to play against you know i still put a bunch of hours into that game and had fun uh but it can be it it definitely adds to the learning curve at the beginning because it can be almost impossible you know i remember complaining about it when i first started playing tf2 i was complaining about the fact that i knew i was doing something wrong because i kept dying all the time but i didn't the players were so, everyone else was so far above my skill level that I couldn't even have time to figure out what it was that I was doing wrong. Uh, but fortunately, the internet exists. You know, I don't need the necessarily to, like, I, how do I, how do I put it? I think it's better that I didn't know what I was doing at all and then was like, well, clearly I'm doing something wrong, so I'm going to go do a, do a bunch of research on my own on the internet, watch as many videos as I can find, and and so on. And then also, I'm going to try and, in real time, analyze my own gameplay. Every time I die, I'll try and ask myself, why did I die? How could I have avoided that situation? Uh, which turned out to be almost entirely overextending, that like I was not used to the fact that I was playing a game where you don't die instantly if, you, if you're in the wrong position. Um, and I was completely uh, going overboard with it, right? Like, I, I was like, oh, well, if you don't die instantly, if you can take multiple hits, that just means you can uh, trim directly into the enemies and uh, kill everyone, right? Uh, whereas, no, you still have to go for picks and try and force 1v1s and so on. Uh, and so, you know, you, you keep dying from overextending, and eventually you realize, hey, okay, maybe I shouldn't uh, be trying to jump directly into the a big group of the enemy team every round maybe i try and stay a little further back try and pick off individual players instead maybe that's a better strategy and then that starts getting you some kills and you think okay well that well that's working and then you get the little ding in your brain which is like oh i was rewarded with some dopamine for playing in this way so i will continue playing in this way uh i think it's better that you learn like that even though it's a bit frustrating at first when you don't even know what you're doing wrong it's a bit i agree it's frustrating at first but I think it's better to go about, and maybe there's players who would stop playing because of that, but I think it's better than um, ingraining a bunch of really bad habits because you're playing against other really bad players and you learning the strats that work against them and then having to unlearn all of that stuff once you move up to playing against better players. I, I think it's better to start off by learning the generalized basics that are going to be effective no matter what skill level you're at. I'm going to be honest, it's really weird to me what people say about the Uncle Topia servers. Look, I, I, I acknowledge that Uncle Topia is not the necessarily the, the purest or best TF2 experience in a num- numerous different ways. It definitely is more competitively focused than, than a lot of casual servers are. Um, and the community is a little strange. I will, I will grant you this. Uh, all of this I will grant you. However, um, I I find a lot of the criticism a little weird. Uh, specifically, people say Uncle Topia is full of tryhards exclusively. Um, now there are a lot of tryhards in Uncle Topia. I'm I'm not trying to d- deny that, and that, that is annoying. Um, as when you're not able to have fun, uh, you know, sometimes it is fun to really try to win a game very hard. But fundamentally, you know, the 12v12 format is sort of chaotic and casual innately. Um, but I have had many different times. I mean, there's there's friendlies on Uncle Topia all the time. There's times where the whole server ends up doing conga. All the classic TF2 stuff, like suiciding, like anything you could imagine, the sort of thing that happens that isn't 
ultra competitive sweat mode always fucking happens. You know, I, I don't know why, I, I, maybe it's, I think people just don't have a comparison point like I do with, with CS. Like, if you think that the, the Uncle Topia people get mad when you don't play the game competitively, play one game of Counter-Strike ever. Maybe it's different in the NA servers, I don't know, compared to the EU servers, but Uncle Toby is not a fucking sweat fest, ultra competitive, insane place. I don't really know what people are talking about when they say that. Uh, as for the community being a little strange, some people say that Uncle Toby is over moderated. Um, I kind of agree uh, a little bit, I think. Uh, but but also, there are people who say edgy shit in Uncle Toby all the fucking time, first of all. And, yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like if you're... I, I think it's a fair criticism. It would be a fair criticism if there wasn't so many alternatives that won't moderate chat. But there are so many alternatives that won't moderate chat that it's a little... I don't know. I feel like if you're playing Uncle... I, I, don't, I don't really understand why you need to be saying anything edgy while playing tf2 anyway maybe maybe that's just me but i i don't normally have the urge to do stuff like that uh uh, uh, excuse me um but you know that aside i see people saying edgy shit all the time yeah people i think that it's just people who get mad because they got banned um i i don't know maybe it's a valid concern i'm 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 not sure i don't really care not really something i'm particularly invested in uh, but yeah, the community is a little weird. Um, like, uh, they they definitely have strong opinions on maps that are annoying to me. Like, the fucking, they only want to play... They These guys love Bad Water, man. Like, Bad Water's a, a good map, but, like, they it, it will pick Bad Water over any other map. If, if it ever comes up, they will always pick it. There's no question about it. Like, it's even a common strat, if if, the, if your Uncle Tobia server is dead, you just RTV it to Badwater or Upward, and then it will fill up instantly. And it's it's not even a meme, it's actually real. Uh, and they will get super fucking mad if you vote for 2-4, like, people get mad if you vote for 2-4 or Dust Bowl, even though 2-4 and Dust Bowl are fun maps. I don't know, I like both. I I like the... You know, I, I'm i not a big fan of the 5CP maps. Not the biggest fan of 5CP. It's fine. It's not terrible. It's not like I, I'm impossible to have fun on. But sometimes those games drag on for way too long and they just sort of stop being fun. It's also way too easy to just get absolutely rolled. Because uh, they're normally like not choky really or anything like that. So it's, it's very easy for one team to just absolutely steamroll on 5CP. And then... Alternatively, like it seems like the, there's only two two modes in in most of the five CP maps. Either like absolute steamrolling, or the game lasts for ten fucking years, uh, and it, it gets kind of boring. Frankly, uh, that's just my opinion. I don't really mind playing these maps, but they're just not my favorite. Uh, but uh, you know, I also really like Dust Bowl. Dust Bowl is very fun, in my opinion. I, I like Dust Bowl quite a lot, and a lot of people in Dungletopia fucking hate Dust Bowl. Uh, and especially, you know, I've had a lot of fun playing on 2 Fort on Dungletopia when when I am with a team that is okay with it, or like a server that is okay with it. And then there's fun. But people will mold super fucking hard if sometimes they get so mad about 2 Fort. I don't know why. Like, I, I like Upward, and I like Badwater. Uh, but then, you know, have a little variety, maybe. So, yeah, I think those are the, the biggest problems, but, like, honestly, it, it's just a game. Like, it's, it's fine. I just I just want a reliable server that's always up, always popular, and I have good ping and doesn't have bots and cheaters. Like, that's that's why I play Uncle Topia, because it's, 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 it's easy to... It's, you know, it's reliable, you, you, there's, there's, no, there's no bots, and yeah, it has low ping for me. And it's generally full. That's all I care about. Look, I'm sorry for only talking about Team Fortress 2. What do you want me to talk about, man? Do you want me to talk about politics? Really? You want that? You would rather have that? What would you rather have? I mean, look, I'm fucking fixated on this video game. 
I'm highly fixated on this video game. I do nothing but play this video game these days, right? I don't know what you want me to do. I, I keep talking about it. I keep talking about it because it's most of what I'm doing. Most of what I'm doing. And it's still novel to me. But at least right now it is. Alright, what do you want me to do? What do you want from me? I don't know. May as well give you guys a daily update. Since I'm going to be going to bed soon. Tell you what I've done today. Uh, which is just basically play Team Fortress 2 and nothing else. So nothing very interesting. Just Just a lot of TF2. I know you're probably very bored of hearing about it, but this is 100% my fixation in life right now. So, therefore, it's the fixation of these slices of my life. I'm afraid uh, if the TF2 talk is boring, then I don't know what to tell you, buddy. It's a fun video game, man. Uh, I'm not going to go into specifics, because who fucking cares. But yeah, played a lot of TF2. And ran out of content to watch in the background while playing TF2. And so I ended up just going on YouTube and searching for really long video essay. And I found a playlist called Video Essays to Fall Asleep To or something like that. And the first one is a video by Quinton Reviews called The Fall of Victorious. Uh, which is a five and a half hour long video essay about a children's sitcom show called Victorious, which I never watched. I never watched iCarly or any of these sitcom shows growing up. I, I, I never liked them. I, didn't, I either didn't have access to the channels they aired on or I just ignored them when they were airing because I found them just incredibly fucking boring as a kid. And I still find them incredibly fucking boring to this day. So I don't know why I'm watching this other than the fact that it's five hours of background content. But now I'm no longer backgrounding it, I'm foregrounding it. So I don't know what's going on in my life right now. Uh, but this guy, Quentin Reviews, look, he seems very, he seems very set. Look, I don't want to play defense for this show. It looks like a terrible fucking show. It looks like the worst show that I, like, could imagine. Okay, I'm, I'm not playing defense for Victorious. But it does seem like he really wants to focus in or, like, he really wants to hammer home this idea that, like, not only is the show bad, but it's also creepy in, like, uh, like, sexualizing minors kind of way. And some of the stuff he brings up, I think, is legitimate. There's some stuff that he mentions that is, like, yeah, that's fucking weird. That is weird that they did that. Like, uh, I don't know. Um, there, 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 there was a, an actor in the show who was underage dating another actor in the show who was 24 at the time and they were dating on the show and they started dating off the show and that is like not that's not normally check him pc i, I don't know why i said that but like i understand why people would think that's weird uh you know but a lot of the stuff he brings up is either just like something that he's interpreting as lewd but isn't uh or just random like he he Okay, the the scene in particular, the, the 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 thing in particular that made me realize he was doing this is he's he's been keeping a running counter of what he refers to as statutory rape jokes, except that most um, the fact that there's any in the show is weird, and I you should I, like yeah, but most of these aren't that. Like one of the things he counts is that he's there's there's a a character is like, hey, do you have a boyfriend? And then the girl is like. Uh, I'm 16, and then the character says, oh, later, and walks away. Which he, just for no reason, decides to interpret as the character saying, I'll, oh, I'll date you later, which is so clearly not what's meant. The guy's just saying later, as in, like, he's gonna go off now and go away somewhere else. That is literally the opposite of a statutory rape joke. It is him saying, oh, you're 16, I don't want to be involved with this, I'm going to leave. And he decides to, like, willfully misinterpret the scene to make the show out to be creepier than it already is for some reason. He also has a... he's a, He has a big problem with with anything, even, like, the teensiest, tiniest bit fan y Like, if a character wears a swimsuit, he has to bring this up as, like, a weird sexual thing, even though they just wear swimsuits in times when people would normally wear... I don't know. He he seems very into this idea that the show is not just bad, but also, like, super creepy. 
and weird. And it's like, the show has some weird stuff in it, but it's, it's, it, it, like, come on, calm down a little bit. And the other thing that, that Quentin Reviews does is he takes obvious jokes from the show and then re- says the jokes in a way where it's like supposed to be as if you're laughing at the fact that someone would write that into the show when clearly there's just a joke from the show that is funny. It's not amazingly peak comedy or whatever, but like, okay, for example, there's an episode where Ariana Grande, who is apparently in this show, uh, her phone keeps getting, is like rewired so that she's getting emergency calls from people in car crashes, and she keeps just letting them die, which is actually really funny. <laughs> I, I personally find this running gag at quite funny. And he says it as if, like, it's this insane, like, oh, my God. And then she just keeps getting, she just killed three people. Oh, my God. Yeah, that is the joke. You're watching a comedy show. This isn't supposed to be, like, I I, I don't know. Like, I've seen people do this before in in a lot of different things where that you're trying to, like, a lot of the, 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 the less good video essays on YouTube do this, where they take things that are supposed to be jokes in a show that they're reviewing or a game or anything and then reframe it as if it's not a joke and they're making fun of how funny it is without acknowledging that it's supposed to be funny. Maybe he's pointing out that it's like surprisingly dark humor for a, for a children's show, in which case that he doesn't say that. He, he doesn't say like, this is surprisingly dark humor for a children's show. He just repeats the joke that they say he just explains what happens in a sort of like, in a sh- in a way where it's like, a, this sort of tone of voice, like, uh, and then she takes the call and the guy asks for help and he, she says, uh, I don't know how to do that. Goodbye. So I guess she just let another person die, like that kind of tone of voice where it's like, as if it's this is like some wacky ridiculous thing that the show isn't aware is wacky and ridiculous. Whereas it's very obvious that the show is aware that this is wacky and ridiculous because it's a fucking joke that they're making in the show. He's done this for a few different bits. Like, um, uh, there's a throwaway line where um, one of the characters is like, that is try- they're trying to like, uh, he- he's trying to like see what's going to ha- happen with something, I-, I don't know. But he's like, oh, I'll just hide in the bushes outside your house and he'll never notice me. And then uh, the main character is like, what are you talking about? He'll definitely notice you if you're hiding there. And then the guy's like, well, you've never noticed before. Which is just a funny joke. Like, look, I, it's, and he takes this as if it's like, he puts like a really big emphasis on this joke in the, the way that he's reading the script. Like, he tonally emphasizes the fact that this joke is, is particularly strange. Whereas in reality, it's just a bit like, it, it's not actually implying, like, it's not supposed to be a bit of serious characterization that, like, this character is stalking and hiding in the bushes or whatever. It's just supposed to be, like, a throwaway gag that doesn't actually have any impact on the world. No? Am I crazy? Like, I don't think that's bad. Like, the show is badly written. All the dialogue that I've heard from this show is terrible. But having jokes in a comedy that are absurdist and don't necessarily fit literally into the world isn't bad writing it isn't even very unusual like i don't it's strange to me that that is strange to people sometimes characters will make like if you ever watch a comedy show how can you do anything how can you even conceptualize it because like you watch a comedy something funny like i i I don't know always sunny in philadelphia always yeah right you watch always sunny the characters are make are saying funny, wacky things to each other that are obviously funny to the audience, but are not funny to the characters in the show. Even though, in real life, if someone did that, it would be fu- You know what I mean? Like, it's accepted that characters in comedy shows act in comedic ways without realizing they're in a comedy show. In the same way characters in musicals just burst out into song sometimes and it's considered normal. It would be weird if you were watching a musical and you were like, um, 
isn't it weird how the characters burst into song and no one ever comments on it as if it's just normal? Yeah, because you're watching a musical. That's how they work. So sometimes a character is going to make a joke in a comedy that doesn't necessarily make literal sense in the canon of the world. It doesn't necessarily form some sort of concrete action that actually took place. It doesn't necessarily imply some event. Like, this is one of the things about, um, yeah, bringing it back to TF2. We're bringing it back to TF2. There's a throwaway gag in, in an item description or something in TF2, which says that a scout uh, got kicked out of a high school uh, because he was like 35 and he was just going there to look at the girls uh, or something like that. And it's, and so people have, I mean, they're saying it jokingly as well, I guess, but people have taken this as like scout is canonically a pedophile. Whereas in reality, this is just a throwaway gag. It doesn't, it's not supposed to be a real piece of characterization. Uh, I don't know if this is hard for people to understand or maybe I'm just retarded and I'm, I'm not getting it. Maybe maybe it's normal to expect that all of the that every every single line in a comedy is supposed to make also be literally factual about the world. Sometimes jokes can just be jokes that don't have to play into the universe. Do, am I crazy for thinking this? It, do I have low standards for writing, or is that just normal? I think that's just normal. I think that's just how how comedies sometimes work. It, it sometimes. A character in a comedy show will say something and it's saying it for the purpose of the line being funny above... Okay, take, you know, um, Monty Python. The, which one is it? The Holy Grail? I can't remember. If, yeah, it's the Holy Grail, right? You know, there's the scene where the guy is running towards the castle, towards the guards, and the camera keeps cutting towards him. And he's far away, and then it cuts back to the guards, and it cuts towards him, and he's far away. It cuts back to the guards, it cuts to him, he's far away, and it cuts back to the guards, and suddenly he's right in their face. This gag, it doesn't make any logical, literal sense in the world, but it's... F- do, you, do you know what I mean? It's, it's not... The implication isn't that he teleported. The implication isn't, this character has the ability to teleport now. The implication is just, it's a joke that is a, a, a play on cinematic language uh, it's 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 not uh supposed to make sense literally in the world i think quentin reviews is probably aware of the fact that this is how how cinema i'm not calling fucking victoria cinema but that this is how writing works sometimes this is how writing works sometimes i think he's aware of this and i think he's willfully ignoring the fact that that's a, a thing so that he can find stuff to talk about for five hours. Buddy, you don't need to do that. Look, I really don't want to play hard defense for Dan Schneider, okay? I, 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 I can't emphasize enough. I do not like these. I never watched them as a kid. I have no nostalgia for these shows. I never liked them as a kid, and I have obviously don't like them as an adult. They're bad. I don't like any of the people involved. I don't like any of the companies involved. It's all bad. They're badly written. They're, they're bad. They're as close to objectively bad as you can get. I think we can all acknowledge this. And there are definitely times when these shows are creepy in a bad way. In a way where I'm like, these actors are underage. This is a strange thing to be doing. Okay? There are definitely times when this happens. But, and I want to be careful with what I say here, I think there's a little bit of a, uh, maybe a misinterpretation willing will willingness to believe things are creepy when they aren't in that way when it comes to these particular types of shows the dan schneider shows that like it's it's a a really easily believable narrative that seems to you know fits with things that people already believe about hollywood and and so on but doesn't i don't know i'm I think people make a little bit of a a mistake or a weird thing in judging this. Well, it's like, there's, just because something can be a fetish doesn't mean that it's being done because of that. So let me give you an example. So, like, there are sometimes scenes that are, that are brought up in discussions of how creepy and sexualized these shows are. 
which are scenes where a character is sort of doused or, or squirted with a viscous fluid. And people are like, oh yeah, bro, they, they squirted that fluid all over her face. This is definitely supposed to be calm and it's sexualized and whatever. I just don't really agree with this. I think, like, Nickelodeon made their name dumping slime on people. It's a long-standing sort of traditional funny ha gag in kids' shows to cover people in viscous fluids because apparently that's funny to kids. It can sometimes be funny to kids when people get dirty and people get messy in a gross-out way, which is, especially in the 2000s when these shows were made, gross-out humor was more popular than it is now. I I don't think it's that sus when they do it, honestly. Like, I, I don't personally see it. I just see it as, like, a kind of unfunny joke that's aimed at kids where the joke is, haha, that guy got covered in gunk, right? Haha, she got covered in gunk. That's the joke. I don't think it's supposed to be cum. Right, I'm just gonna be real. Another example, you know, you, you go back and watch watch cartoons and, and so on. Oftentimes, you know, there are fart jokes and there, there are jokes about stinky feet because, again, for kids, and especially during this era of, of TV programming, stinky part of the body humor was definitely a thing, right? That it's like, it's funny because it's kind of gross and smelly part of the body. I don't think it's always a foot fetish. I think there are times when it probably is a weird, creepy thing. But I also think sometimes it's just supposed to be either funny because it's absurd, because feet are not normally involved in everyday activities, and it's just a weird part of the body that that kind of looks funny, right? I think that's probably one thing, and it's kind of gross, and gross-out humor was a thing. I don't think it's always a fetish. I just don't. I don't think it's always a fetish. I, I'm, look, I don't, I don't want to play, I don't want to do this. I don't want to have to be the guy that, that, I don't want to die on this hill. But, but, honestly, I think people, people overreact to this stuff. I think, I think, uh, a lot, there are definitely a lot of cases I've seen of supposedly sus clips where I, I don't personally see the susness of it. There are other clips where I definitely do see the susness. Again, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I think the problem is overstated. I think there are way fewer examples of susness in these shows than people make it out to be. People make it out like the whole genre, era, process of production of these shows was just weird and creepy from the get-go constantly. Whereas I think it's more accurate to say there's a couple of weird moments, but not it's not like a in my opinion it's i don't see it as a through line that is like an endemic to the behind the scenes process of these shows that's that's how that's the vibe i get now again i haven't sat down and watched you know i don't care i don't care about these shows i'm just going by you know being on the internet you see you see all the clips of 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 iCarly and and so on that are like supposed to be these crazy creepy sus things and I'm gonna be honest most of them seem fairly innocuous to me most of them fall into the camps that I just described where it's just it's just people mistaking 2000s gross out humor aimed at kids as being fetish material I don't I I personally I think people are a little too maybe a little too online once you get online for too long you start to realize that a lot of people have a lot of weird fetishes. But that doesn't mean, you know what I'm saying here? You're going to start, like, there's a movie, there's a movie, uh, animated movie. I think it's it's called, is it called Monsters vs. Aliens? I remember it has a, a blob voiced by Seth Rogen in it. Is it called Monsters vs. Aliens? Yes, it is. And, uh, and in this movie, there is a giantess girl. Right, the main character is a, a a giant woman. Okay, now as we know, this is a fetish that some people have. But I wouldn't say that Monsters vs. Aliens is a fetish movie where this was, you know, designed by someone who found that hot for people who found that. You know, I think it's just t- 
ha- just happens to also be some people's fetish. You know what I'm saying? I think that's the sort of situation we're in here. It's like, do you think that every Disney animator is a furry? Some of them probably are. But do you think that every Disney animator from back in the day was a furry when they made those characters? There's also a bit of interesting timeline stuff going on here, which is maybe a little bit more of a schizo part of this theory, which is that what if people looking back at it now, seeing this stuff as fetish material, are only seeing that because a whole bunch of people who are now online got those fetishes in the first place from watching this show, went on to go online and post about that stuff, which was then seen by other people who are now retroactively applying it to the show, when in fact it was the show that caused it in the first place. Hey, I'm just saying, I'm just putting it out there, I think it's possible. So I've done some of my own research, specifically, I haven't read the book, but I read some summary articles discussing Jeanette McCurdy's book, who was a character in iCarly, or actress who played a character in iCarly, where she talks about how bad being a child star is, and a bunch of other stuff, most of which is probably very interesting to read about and tragic, but not relevant to the discussion of this video. And I'm gonna say that Dan Schneider is definitely a piece of shit, um, but I still stand by what I said. I still am questioning how much overt sexualization is actually in these episodes. I think he was mostly just verbally abusive and not a very good person uh, and a kind of a control freak and he did some other fucked up shit, but I am not super convinced about this sexually abusive thing. I'm just not. Well, maybe I am to some extent, but I don't think it's to the extent that the internet thinks it is. That being said, I didn't know how much of a piece of shit Dan Schneider was outside of the stuff I've seen about the, like, suspicious amount of feet in iCarly. Um, Dan Schneider, definitely a piece of shit. Massive piece of shit. I'm not here to, uh, I mean, not here to defend the guy, okay? Another thing that Quentin Reviews does, he's never commented on this before until this exact moment. He called one of the actresses hot. He will say, like, this actress is super hot and it's weird that the show pretends that she's not. I'm pretty sure that actress is, like, 18 and the actresses that she that he has a big problem with the show having any sort of, you know, acknowledging them as hot are, like... What I'm saying here is that the age difference is, like, a couple months at most. It's, like, a few months of difference between when... It's super problematic for the show to have characters, I don't know, dance in a, in, in Santa costumes. And then two months later, bro, this, this, this girl, she's so, she's so sexy. Oh my God, she's so sexy. It, it reminds me of that, that meme. There's a, there's a, a 4chan post. It's like a, it's something like. She was 17 years old, 364 uh, days, and uh, <laughs> you sick fuck. Something like that. Uh, she was 17 years, 364 days, 23 hours, 59 seconds, 999 milliseconds old, you sick fuck. Yeah, it, it, it reminds me of that. I think this is a powerful meme. I think this is a powerful meme. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to, I don't know what that's a powerful meme for, but I feel like it's a powerful meme. I'm gonna say something that's gonna sound kind of strange, uh, coming from me, and I really hope it doesn't sound, uh, like, particularly, how do I put it, pretentious, maybe? Uh, or, or maybe, like, narcissistic or something? I hope it doesn't come off as, like, a humble brag type of thing, because that's not how I mean it. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I hate, I, I realized just now that I think I, I kind of hate being... I don't want to say famous, because obvious, like, far from, <laughs> right, like, that, that would be insane. But, like, even the tiny, tiny, little, tiny bit of internet notoriety that I have, which is very small and almost entirely from the 100 Gex thing, 
um, I, I want to clarify, like I'm not trying to big myself up here, but it's, it, I find it just very uncomfortable when I go into some new community and people know who I am. It's really weird because it's like, I don't know who any of you people are. There's this weird, like, and people always feel the need to compliment me, which is like, thanks. Like, I'm, I'm happy that you like my music and whatever. But it just, it creates a very awkward situation because immediately I'm entering a conversation and the first thing that comes up is the other person saying, oh, yeah, I really like your music, bro. And it's like, well, wh where do we go? F do you under Do you get what I'm saying? It just creates a weird imbalance at first where it's like, immediately someone starts off by compliment. I don't know, it just feels really weird and awkward and it, the conversations are never fun to have. I don't like it. I, I, I don't like being being the level of, I don't, li I don't like any of it. I mean, it must really suck to be actually famous. But like even the fact that in certain niche internet communities, people know who I am, it's just, it's really weird and uncomfortable. I don't like it. Uh, I don't know what to do about this, but yeah, I do not like it. <laughs> I don't know how to. I've realized just now that that I I act like I've 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 never really thought about it while it was happening, but yeah, I've realized just now that that it, it is weird uh, when it happens. And I I think I kind of hate it when it happens. Like it's very. I don't. I don't. I'm I'm already not. It it's not like you'd imagine. It's like a social catalyst, <coughs> but it's like the th it creates an awkward thing in my mind. Well, like, I don't have a good sense of how, I don't have a good sense of if I am, like, I don't know, well-known or whatever. So it's like, I don't know in any given interaction going into it, you know, given the sorts of places I hang out in are the sorts of places where people who would like my stuff would also hang out in, that it's like, it's, it's always quite possible that someone there knows me, which is really weird. <clears throat> and I can't say I like it. Because then it's like, I don't know, I don't know how much someone knows. I don't know if, I don't know, I don't like it. Obviously, it's, it's not a, a, a big problem in my life. This doesn't happen very often. But when it does happen, it's weird. <clears throat> That's all I want to say. I'm not, I'm not trying to big myself up as some, e even to the level of niche internet micro celebrity. I don't even reach that. The people who get called niche internet micro celebrity are still 10 times more well known than me, I think. <clears throat> I just have, I'm a one hit wonder. It's, it's very strange. That's all I can say is it's weird. You know, I feel like I could so easily copy Quentin reviews. Like, but I just have never. Okay, so there's a style of, of like analysis video which would, uh, now are called video essays. But back in my day, they used to be called analysis videos um, because I discovered them via a, a person by the name of DigiBro, um, who basically was a progenitor of the medium or the, the genre, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> and I once, in the earlier days of this channel, made a video called DigiBro Doesn't Understand What Analysis Is because... I had noticed a running pattern where a lot of Digi Bros anime analysis videos were actually just describing what happens on screen uh, with with very little actual input, like just just recounting the plot of an episode or analyzing cinematography by just describing the cinematography and not really anything deeper than that. Uh, <clears throat> Little did I know that this would then become an entire genre of YouTube video where people do video essays about a subject where the essay is 90% recounting the plot of an entire show or something, right? Just recounting the plot, just a, just a plot summary with, with nothing. And then, uh, you know, they just occasionally give their opinion on what's happening. Uh, which is very much what Quentin Reviews does. And I, I've i always had a problem with this, right? Because it's not really a, an analyzing... It doesn't feel like you're really analyzing anything. It just kind of feels like... I mean, you understand. It, I, I didn't like it when Digi did it because they were talking about being an analyst 
and like a, a critic, when in reality they were just mainly doing some plot summaries uh, and describing things that happen on screen that anyone could see. Uh, hold on, I'm fighting a heavy. Oh, I'm going to die. Okay. Um, I could easily do this. I think anyone could do this if you just can be bothered. Because because all you have to do is just describe things. <laughs> it's not like a... Oh my god. I'm getting demolished right now. Holy shit. Uh, <clears throat> I was gonna fucking say something. I lost my train of thought because this pyro too good. Too good at game. Uh, I had something else to add on to it other than it's just a plot summary. But I don't remember what it was. I think what I was, I think what I was gonna say was I could do this. Um, I could be the Quentin Reviews of anime, because Quentin Reviews is just the digibo of things that aren't anime. Um, <clears throat> like, if you go back and watch the Asterisk War Sucks, the, the, the compilation version where it's all, all compiled into one video, you know what I mean? It's the same sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, I've, I, I've never particularly liked this, because it's too... It's, I don't know, but then I realized, like... I'm enjoying watching. I mean, I wouldn't watch this if I wasn't using it as background content to do something else. I say that. It's good falling asleep content as well. Uh, it's not necessarily good full attention content. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I feel like I could do this, is my point. Like, I could... I, I, I could definitely make a video... Like, I could watch every episode of every season of Nanoha and just just do basic plot summaries with opinions about that. It would take a long ass time to make, but I could definitely do it. Um, and it would it would be a good replacement for Digi's Nanoha series. <laughs> you know, I, I could I could be standing on the shoulders of giants, except in this case, I'd be standing on the shoulders of just average sized people. <laughs> I could definitely be standing on the shoulders of average-sized people and uh, do, watch every episode of every season of Nanoha, which, I, I mean, I've already watched a lot of it. I could re-watch some of it. And then, I don't know, I guess I, I can pay more attention to the other stuff that this guy talks about. Um, and just try and... Do, do, do you know what they call this? They call it the yoink and twist, right? They call it the yoink and twist. I yoink it, and then I twist it. For some reason, while I was in the shower, I was thinking about this thing, and I think I wanted to do a rant at you about it, but I don't have a starting place. I don't have a thing to rant about. So I have a vibe. Uh, and the vibe, the vibe is capitalism and schizophrenia. Not, I mean, it's Deleuze, but specifically from the, the guy who founded the Huffington Post and BuzzFeed. That guy uh, wrote a thing, which you probably know about, before he did that. And... Fuck, I don't know where I'm going with this. At some point, the bloke's over... Um, I guess I'm... What I'm trying to tell you here... I'll give you a... I'll just do do history. Do I start with history? Or do I start with, with the thing? Do I start with the thing? How did I get on this topic in my own head in the shower? Is I was thinking about something. I, w I was thinking about internet subcultures. I was thinking about how... The 4chan Tumblr wars did not take place. If you don't know about that, by the way, there's a sort of internet mythos about this legendary war between 4chan and, and Tumblr, which just didn't happen. Uh, it was maybe, like, it was it was, it was, was almost entirely just, just a raid that 4chan did on Tumblr. It wasn't a war. There was no counter-raid. No one from Tumblr really gave a shit about it happening. They'd been raided before. In fact, people raiding Tumblr is pretty normal it happens all the time as people posting gore and most people just ignored it tumblr didn't really give a shit is, is my point there was maybe a couple of people who were a little weirded out by it but 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 in majority it wasn't a big deal in tumblr history like there's big events in tumblr history and the the 4chan war isn't one of them no one on tumblr remembers it or cares about it it basically didn't happen um, because it's not just, it's not really how Tumblr works. Uh, yeah, no, no one really cared about it. What it, what actually happened is people got the idea 
that Tumblr was this place full of SJWs and whatever. And then a few 4chaners tried to write bait posts on 4chan where they posed as Tumblr people to try and just just bait, just do trolling. And everyone fell for the bait because of course they did. That sort of thing still works to this day. I literally see it every day on 4chan. Someone will go into a thread and just write the most obvious bait post ever and everyone will fall for at least, you know, four people, five people in the thread will, will respond to it and fall for it and end up derailing the thread. It's super easy to do. 4chan users are fucking idiots. So are Tumblr users. Uh, everyone in this scenario is an idiot. But I was thinking about this, how, like, this there's this mythos about the 4chan Tumblr wars, about how Tumblr people were so triggered and 4chan so ownage and epic style that they, they went over and they raided Tumblr so hard. I think people don't understand is that, uh, sure, there's lots of SJW types on Tumblr, but, and that is probably the majority of the, of the, the user base, but there's also loads of edgy people on Tumblr because the main user base of Tumblr is, or was at that time, teenagers. So there was already loads of people posting super edgy shit. Having a couple more posts didn't really bother anyone. Um, no one remembers it, is what I'm saying. This, like, it didn't happen. It didn't take place. It was just a, a thing that 4chan made up where they invented a, a war that they won. Because a lot of the 4chan mythos at the time was, heh, don't fuck with us. We're the cool guys. We're the cool hacksaw edgy guys. Because they had done some stuff in the past that was neat. Like, I remember in the 2016 election, there were loads of people who were like, yeah, we did this, 4chan did this. Like, these guys are delusional. It, that, that is not the case. Maybe they helped, but I don't, I don't, I mean, yeah, pretty obvious. Nowadays, it's a little different, I guess, just because of how, and I don't really know. I don't know what this is about. I was thinking about that, and that got me thinking about this thing, which is like brand loyalty to whichever website you grew up on, which everyone sort of has. You know, I still have, and I, the reason I was even thinking about that in the first place is because watching this Quentin Reviews video, or videos, it's very obvious that he comes from Tumblr. But I can't tell you why it's obvious. Maybe it's just the focus on gay stuff as something that is always notable. It's the style, it's the way he talks, it's the stuff he chooses to focus on and the stuff he d chooses to not focus on. It's the way he looks, it's the way his background looks, it's the way the video is shot. Like, it's hard to describe, but you can just tell immediately. So when he mentions Tumblr by name at one point, or when he also assumes that most of the audience is from Tumblr, you can just tell, like, it's not surprise. it doesn't come as a surprise. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't come as, like, oh, huh, this guy's a Tumblr user. Like, you just, you just know from the get-go when you watch this guy that it's like, oh, he, he's a, a Tumblr YouTuber. There are Tumblr YouTubers, there are Reddit YouTubers, there are YouTube YouTube... Uh, uh, here, I'll go through them. So there are Tumblr YouTubers, and ex some examples are uh, they, they're Jenny Nichols, um, Sarah Z. Uh, let me see. They're, they're, they're that kind of guy. That's the Tumblr YouTubers. Then there's YouTube YouTubers. Uh, this is pretty, you know, all of the like, Mr. Beast... These, these types, right? The, the, the YouTube YouTubers. There are a couple of 4chan YouTubers. So, uh, like, Mental Outlaw is a 4chan YouTuber. Um, uh, let me see. M. Plemon is a 4chan YouTuber. There's a couple of those. And then there's a few Reddit YouTubers. There's quite a lot of Reddit YouTubers. Um, let me think. Who's a Reddit YouTuber, as an example? Um, I was going to say... Hank Green or or them in general, but I feel like they just were Reddit YouTubers a few years ago and are now just kind of YouTube YouTubers. I I don't know who who counts really as a uh maybe Kurskazagd. Kurskazagd is definitely a Reddit YouTuber. Um, there's they exist, right? What I'm saying here, there are not really Twitter YouTubers. I guess there are some, but it's kind of a it's a, it's a weird weird thing. Uh, maybe because no one grew up on Twitter who's doing YouTube, right? I don't know. That's an interesting thing. Maybe because Twitter doesn't really have a defined culture that spreads to YouTube very well. But, so I was thinking about that, and then I was thinking about the 4chan Tumblr wars and how they didn't take place. And that just led me to thinking about, like, the, the very concept of, like, how we tie our identity to these websites, like, their nationalities, and how they've grown their own culture. And thinking about, you know, that there's, there's a big reason why 
I think 4chan is, uh, maybe particularly proud of their heritage, other than the fact that they are generally right wing, <laughs> which is that 4chan is, is, the, is the only one of these places that isn't owned by a corporation. It's just owned by a guy. Uh, I think that does lend itself to some sense of pride that is valid, in my opinion. Uh, but in reality, this just got me thinking about identity in general. And then I was just like thinking about capitalism and schizophrenia, how, uh, you know, there's, there's phenomenon like we often hear about how young men have, are having like a crisis of identity right now in the West, where it's like, there are people taking advantage of it on every side. Everyone's trying to push young men to go in certain directions and you end up with, with incels and Andrew Tate and femboys and, and there's this like big, big problem of like disenfranchised, uh, identity crisis of young male masculinity type stuff. Right. And I was thinking about how like, this kind of just is, for, I, I think this is just kind of for ev a thing with everyone and everything. That it's not just that we have a crisis of identity or a crisis of masculinity and like struggling to define that in the modern era. That's real, I think. I've never personally struggled with it. It doesn't really affect me. I don't, I've always thought it's very strange when people like put their gender as like a, a any sort of big deal. I mean, I understand that it is a big deal to a lot of people, but it's never, like, it's never... And some people like to pin this on just being cis. Like, oh, yeah, of course you've never had to think about your gender. You're cis. And it's like, yeah, maybe when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, that there was definitely some, some stuff where I was, like, worried about coming off as, as effeminate. It was basically just internalized homophobia. I think lots of people have that when they're kids, especially, you know... Maybe less so these days, but there was definitely stuff where I was like, I I noticed that I used to I used to stand with my hand on my hip a lot as a kid, and I like m remember sort of forcing myself to stop doing that because I thought it looked gay. Um, but other than like that, like that's when I was a kid. That's when I was like, you know, early puberty sl slash prepubescent. Not when I was like a real human being is what I'm saying here. Like expressing my gender has never mattered to me and I find it weird that it matters to other people but like I've just accepted that this is something I'm just never going to understand and I'll just let people do whatever they want to do like I, I I've never I don't know it's never mattered to me never never not an experience I can relate to where I'm like oh yeah I am super exp I'm a, such a dude right now I'm such a guy like, oh, I have to do this so that I can be a masculine man. I th doesn't, doesn't happen. I don't understand it. But there's not any, like, it's not, like, the opposite either. It's not like, I don't want to do that because I feel like uh, doing this feminine thing fits me more better and it lets me express my feminine side. Or Like, I don't understand what those concepts even mean to me, like... What what is what does it even mean to express something masculinely or femininely? I don't. It's it's never made any sense to me. Is what I'm saying here. It's never. Or it's it's ne yeah. It's never been something that intuitively. I'm just like ah uh, yes. I am currently performing this gendered thing. Like I I don't get it personally. I it, it, it just it just completely goes over my head. I don't understand what people are even talking about when they say that thing. I've just accepted at this point that I'm just that that apparently I'm I'm the weird one, and everyone else does understand this. But I I don't know. I still I think I still secretly somewhere in the back of my head don't believe them. <laughs> I'm just like no. I think everyone's actually just pretending that it, that it's like a big deal. I don't know. But hey, what do I know? Uh, and I was thinking about identities in general and how like. This, this identity crisis thing is, is a, I don't know, it's a strange, it's also a strange concept to me in general, because everyone seems very tied to and attached to their, their personality and identity and, and how they view themselves. Whereas I've, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I am also like that in certain aspects, but maybe just not the same aspects as everyone else. I, I don't know. Not everyone else, but 
like there's definitely lots of people who uh, okay let me let me just put it like this so it, at some point in like the there was a, some blokes that worked in Marlboro and they were like all right what if instead of advertising a product we advertise a lifestyle and then uh that kind of changed the game and then everyone started advertising lifestyles instead of products you know most of the time you watch ads these days and you, the product barely shows up until the end and they're just showing happy people and that doing things that they the yeah and like don't you want to live like these happy people buy our product which has always been weird and never i don't think it's ever i don't know it's a, it's, it's a strange thing and then so rather than selling you uh products people are trying to sell you uh identities now like you're not just trying to watch a movie you're a a disney fan you're not just trying to uh play a video game you're a a, a particular gamer of this franchise and you have to have a connection to the 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 characters and you act and it means you have all of these traits and no one is immune to this okay i am not immune to if you're sitting there right now thinking to yourself like oh phew, yeah those normies watching watching marvel movies and playing call of duty and identifying with all of these things it's like ha, those normies and meanwhile i watch french movies and i listen to a hours long rambles by autistic internet men i'm so without an identity it's like bro none of us are immune to this but this is the only way to exist in the world the only people who aren't like this are, would have to have like grown up away from civilization and never come into contact with it but even then you know people uh, whatever but like there's this 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 thing where your identity is sort of taken from you right like the things that people typically use to identify with uh like uh in the past so um examples of this would be strict social roles either through class division like i am a serf and i work this land and this is my 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 particular role in life and my religion is this particular religion at this particular church with this particular community um and I live in this particular place with people that look like me and we all form this group together and we have this identity, this understanding of our position in history, we have traditions that we hand back, you know, and we can trace our history and our lineage from this, this particular place with these particular people who look all like me and all worship the same God and all have the same social role to fill out right people in the past had this this very clear sense of self and then gradually all of those have been stripped away from us we got uh the glorious revolutions of social mobility if you're poor you don't have to be poor anymore in the past if you were a peasant you were just a peasant and that's just who you were now if you're a peasant it's your fault for not working hard enough or uh it's society's fault because you're black or something like this right like there's there's suddenly the option to not be a peasant anymore which which means that being a peasant is no longer really an identity except it is an identity because people will sell you that right people will say hey fuck the millionaires they're so different from us fuck the you know we're the the poor fags and we like have our own sense of identity like this is a thing in lots of rural communities it's a thing in lots of urban communities but they don't intercommunicate like the experience like poor rural people look down on poor urban people and poor urban people look down on poor rural people um uh but then there's also like you know people religions some people try and bring it back and if they do they're still falling for the meme but that's all stripped away from us nationality and yeah I, well like the real the real form of like community identification has been stripped away in forms of nationalism how like you know countries didn't used to exist Con the nation state is actually a recent invention um people forget this so it's like now you're supposed to identify with an a whole nation rather than just a, a small local community um multiculturalism means that there are you're living near people who don't share any cultural or don't share much similar culture with you the only similar culture you have in common you know i see a lot of american democrats and liberals try and say like uh, uh you know that we may be all sorts of different colors and creeds but at the end of the day we're all american and to me this is like abhorrent because it's saying i will strip away everything that like in service of this 
this grand national pride which we have control over as the government. I'm not a fan of nationalism, if you couldn't tell. Um, but that, that doesn't mean I'm better than any, you know, because I'm still here having, like, nationalist pride of being a Londoner and being a 4 chaner and being a Higikomori and being an otaku and, you know, being autistic. Like, no one's free. We, we all have to do this. Like, we, we're all trapped in this 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 thing where none of us have a, a real identity. We, we're forced to actually look out like enter the world where identities are are given to us and then re- reject or accept them right which which makes everyone kind of schizo and of course like none of these identities can ever really be fixed they're always changing um you're always bouncing from identity to identity so it's like what it means to be do you, do you understand what i'm saying here people people ev- everyone's always bouncing bouncing from 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 self to self that are, that's all sold to them and us and none of us are free from this where where you can you can be part of the the there is no long like there was a little bit of a a, a a revolt against this when people invented subculture and counterculture but then that that very quickly got recuperated uh, and now subculture and counterculture don't really exist anymore there is there is and if you noticed this you probably have there is no counterculture there are no subcultures there are fandoms now there there are uh, different whichever platform you you happen to inhabit on the internet and which political alignment you are but there's no there's no and everyone thinks they're the counterculture like for example i found a one time I stumbled across a forum, I forget what it's called, but it's a forum that's themed, it's like a Vaporwave themed forum that's also themed around like darknet markets. And everyone on there is really into like basic bitch, chaos magic, occultism, hermeticism, a little bit of Gnosticism thrown in there for good luck. You know, they, they, they're really into this stuff and they really look down on anyone who doesn't like have the, the secret knowledge that they have, right? Because they're Gnostics and that's what they're all about. Uh, and they really look down on everyone outside the site. They think they're super cool. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, we're the real ones who really know what we are. But in reality, they're just as pathetic as everyone else. You know, like I'm not looking down, like, sure. I think they're stupid, but I'm also no better believing whatever I happen to believe. It's all just a matter of circumstance and fortuity and whatever. Like it doesn't, none of it matters. None of it's real. And you can't do anything about it, right? You're like you're probably sitting here thinking like to yourself, like either you're you're still trying to cope and you're sitting there and like actually I'm different, I'm just built different and I'm not like this. You are like this. Stop lying to yourself. And or you're sitting there and thinking like, well, how do we escape? Tell me, oh Lord, no, thank you. Tell me how how do we get out of this prison? Uh, how do I, what do I do? What what can I do to 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 do this? How do I? Oh, I'm, I have to go le- less mainstream. I have to to unsubscribe from all of the popular YouTube channels and stop watching TV. And You probably don't watch TV, you're a Zoomer. But um, you can't escape this. You can't do anything about it. This is just how it is now. And um, that's the, the, that's just a fact. If you're, there's, not, nothing, there's nothing you can do. And there's definitely nothing you can't... It's not a problem you can consume your way out of. You know, there are some problems that you can consume your way out of. Like, uh, if you are, if you're having having problems with uh, with with dandruff, you can simply purchase an anti dandruff shampoo, and you have now consumed your way out of a problem. If you uh, you know, have clothes that don't really fit you very well, you can buy better fitting clothes, and and then you have successfully consumed your way out of a problem. Uh, however, this is not a problem like that. There is no brand that will save you from this. There is n- not me, not anyone. You cannot do anything about this. And even if you could, you you probably wouldn't want to because it would require a lot of pain and, and suffering. It would require a, a complete overhauling of how you look at the world and you would have be constantly... It would be impossible to do it, is what I'm saying. You wouldn't be able to do it. You would need a large group of organized people... Um, but that large group of organized people would somehow have to not have a coherent identity. It's impossible, but they would still have to get collectively get shit done. It's a very clever technique is what I'm saying. It's not something you can easily just, just, just exit by being smarter than the system. 
you can't outsmart the system. Capitalism is a super intelligent AI from the future manifesting itself in the past, and you're just a cog in this machine. You can't. You're you're nothing. Don't 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 get ahead of yourself here, buddy. Okay, don't stop thinking you're the hero. You've watched too many movies. We've all watched too many movies. We all think we're the hero. We all think we're gonna, we're destined to be uh, some sort of built different guy, or we identify specifically as like oh i'm built different from the built different guys but none no one's no one's just sitting here like actually you know what i'm just a there's no there's no there's no anything you can't escape it because even when you do try and escape it you're still framing it like people when they're trying to describe themselves as like antithetical to, to main character syndrome they, they're like you know i'm just a background character but they're still framing themselves in terms of movies in terms of like the the the, the media they consume like there's no we don't have the tools available that people in the past had that would help us frame ourselves like that and a lot of times the the reasons those tools went away is probably a good thing you know like I'm I'm it's 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 I don't know it's just is what it is <laughs> I, I don't know what to tell you so we're all, we're all kind of schizo jump but without identity we don't we don't have identities instead like identities are given to us and taken from us by by the whims of capital uh they 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 sort of flow through us right they they like there's there's always like some some bursting of intensity over here that we like chase after right and if you really want to see this like you can look at the fashion world like go look at like whatever balenciaga campaign is is the newest one and you'll see them trying to like capture this 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 intensity in a particular space and culture and they pay a lot of people really well who are supposed to do this um because they're not actually trying to sell you most of the clothes that they show they show in these shows right they're just what they what the, the point is 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 for them to show off like we invent culture and we are fucking on the button of culture like we know what's going to be popular in two to three years and we're already doing it now so if you don't get it it's just because you're not smart like we are smart and we hire all the best people who know what's going to be trendy in a year from now and we're ahead of the curve so start wearing this and you'll be ahead of the curve but you're not wearing the the crazy haute couture fashion from the runway that's just there to to prove to you right that like oh you see this you see how you think it's weird and you don't get it that's exactly but you will in three years you'll look back and you'll be like oh yeah that trend that's what they're trying to prove to you but none of it's real but it's also all very real because they make it real um yeah i don't know what to tell you i don't know what the point of this is it's just that like it, the, thinking about this for too long will make you go fucking insane and there's no, there's, it will make you doubt every element of yourself. And in the end, you just have to be like, well, that's just fine. This is just okay. This is just how it is. And I just have to accept it. That's, that's the conclusion that I always come to is like, there is, there's maybe whether this is a, a good thing or a bad thing shouldn't be relevant. It's just a thing. There's no, there's nothing a human being or even a group of human beings can do about this. This is just, this is just it. You either accept it or you unwillingly accept it <laughs> you you either uh, you know you know what i'm saying you either you either accept it with purpose or you don't accept it with purpose but the result is the same either way um you you you, you know how it is i'm sorry to do this but we're talking about more team fortress 2 right now uh i just played comp for the first time pubs pugs for the first time with uh people from casual tf2's discord server and honestly, I feel miserable. <laughs> I am not. I mean, there's 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 a few things to note here, right? There's a there's a there's a, a good few things to set up, which is firstly, I just hit four hundred hours in the game yesterday. Most of these people have like, well, let's say three to five thousand hours, right? So, I'm not even going to be close to as good as these guys. Secondly, I've never played a pug before. I don't know the callouts on maps. I don't know strategy. I, I've had to pick that all up on the fly. No one's there to like tell me, like, here's what your role is and here's how you do it. And this is why, why we push when we push. It's like, so I have zero, like, let alone game sense. I don't even really understand how the game works, at least going in. I had to pick that all up over the course of the, the games we played. So it's like, I know fuck all, right? People are like somewhat optimistic about me at first. 
But no, I'm just bottom scoring every fucking game. Bottom scoring. And then, to add insult to injury, I have 140 ping the whole time. So, I can't even play... Like, you know, I'm... I'm Okay, so firstly, the thing about about sixes is that it's just a completely different game from casual. It's not even... A re- it's just like a related game. Five CP sixes... It's just, it's not, it's not the same video game as 12v12 Payload. It's just not the same video game. They're just too, comp- being good at one doesn't really translate to being good at the other. What works in one doesn't work in the other. You know, it's just, a, it's just not the same thing. So that's the first thing to note, is that, like, I have, I, although I have spent 400 hours in, technically in the game, I have spent zero hours actually in this particular game. Um... And one of the things about sixes is, is a lot of classes just don't work. So, you know, uh, a lot of my time has been spent, or, or a reasonable amount of my time, you know, has been spent playing Scout, uh, or sorry, playing, playing uh, Pyro. Right? Pyro doesn't exist in sixes. No one plays Pyro. It just not, doesn't work. You can't play py- like Pyro, Spy, doesn't exist. Um, Heavy doesn't really exist. Sniper doesn't really exist. Um, you half the class. It's basically just. I already knew this. Like I'd heard about this from from doing looking at, at TF two videos. That it's like it's basically medic, scouts, soldiers, and one de- one medic, one one demo, two soldiers, and scouts. Right. Those are the only classes that are actually viable in comp. And demo is not demo night. It's uh, being, again, like being good at demo night and being good at normal stock demo are two very different skills, right? Being demo night is all about flanking, getting individual picks on uh, light classes pretty much and being sort of a assassin type play style. Whereas demo man is a completely different, you're all about doing damage to groups of energies spamming the chokes and, and it's just a completely different thing being good at one doesn't translate to being good at the other except for hitting your pipes which i should be fine at like not good not terrible uh, except that remember this is in 12v12 you know you're fighting a couple of scouts once in a while but mainly you, they're not the people you have to hit pipes on most of the time you if i'm fighting a scout 1v1 i pretty much uh, if I if I'm not in a in big advantage in positioning, I just I just fucking run away if I can, because I I don't stand a chance of hitting that guy with a sticky. There's just no shot, which is why scouts are good in sixes, because they're too nimble to to or hit them with a pipe, right? They're too, so I'm already fucked going in, because I'm playing against way better players in a game mode I've never played before, and I have 140 ping, so I. And my main, my main isn't viable in sixes, so I can't play my main, or even my secondary, which is Pyro. I have to play Scout, which is like fourth on my list. <laughs> you know, in terms of classes I'm good at, it goes like, or like I've spent time with, goes like Demo, or like Demo Knight, Pyro, Sniper, Scout, right? So it's not the worst, right? They wanted me to play Soldier at some points, but I, I have literally never played Soldier. I, I, I clicked on Soldier once to learn how to rocket jump, and then, and then I'm completely not interested in playing Soldier. Maybe I should pick Soldier up so that I can play these games in the future, but, uh, man, that's miserable. I just had to, I had to play Scout because it's, the, it's a hit scan class, so I can play it on high ping. And I'm not, that, I'm not good at Scout. Like, I'm... Uh, man, it was miserable. Like, I tried my best to help my team in every way I could, like, p- trying to protect the medic, trying to give call-outs as much as possible. So I hope no one was, like, super mad at me. I hope, because they're all nice people, right? They're not going to, like, tell me to fuck off. Um, but, yeah. I feel like I kind of, like, low-key ruined their games. Because <laughs> I'm just dog shit. Man, now I'm depressed as fuck. And you know what I want to do right now is load into a casual server and just demolish. But the problem is I won't. I'll know what will happen is I'm already tilted. So I'll load into a casual server and I'll just get destroyed. And I'll just be like, kill myself or something. I don't know. Man, I just fucking did very bad in video game. I don't know. How do I get better at that? I mean, I don't want to get better. That wasn't fun. I'm going to be honest with you. 
I understand why everyone hates sixes now. It's just a completely different game, and it's not fun. It doesn't have any of the fun chaos elements. It's just like, hey, what if you played Team Fortress 2, but everything, fu everything fun about it isn't actually viable in a competitive setting, so you can't do any of it. Now it all makes sense to me. Now I understand why no one, no one does this, because none of that shit is possible to make work. I want, I want to, I want to, you know what I need? I need, I need to find someone who will be a pocket medic. I'm going to, I'm going to go and how can I do this? Who will do this to me? If I can find someone to pocket medic me and I go flog pyro on like dust bowl or something and just to, just, just to get some dopamine, man, that was a, that was a fucking miserable time. Why does anyone play that game? It sucks. It's dog shit. It's, it's not just cause I mean, look, I bet playing on a server with low like close to me so i can actually have low ping i mean look having 140 ping against everyone else on 20 ping is a massive disadvantage like let's put that out there that was not helping that was not exactly helping i was already going to be bad but that wasn't helping so it's like a combination of my lack of skill and knowledge about the game and zero game sense because i've not spent any time playing sixes and then just like as a little bit on top, just to, just to fuck me up a little more. Also, you have massive ping. Um, so yeah, that was not fun. I don't. Why does anyone play that? Like, I understand. It's it's very intense. It's extremely intense when everyone's giving calls all the time, and it, I can I can see the, how the, there's like thrill to it, right? But I don't understand why anyone plays a class. Like, how can it be fun to play anything other than soldier? in sixes because soldiers are the only ones that are actually doing anything really like demos mainly just like are there to deny people from coming to a certain point so that like they to deny pushes and stuff medics just run around obviously scouts are just like basically just doing chip damage and distracting people so that like and all of that is just so that the soldiers can come in and actually get kills like that's pretty much how it is I don't know, man. And I, I don't, to be honest, I don't understand the, the scatter gun. I don't understand Scout's gun. Like, I don't understand how much damage it does or when it does, like, the damage fall off is kind of crazy and hard, hard to wrap my head around, like, what sort of distance I'm trying to keep from people. Because I feel like when I'm playing against Scouts, I get deleted in two shots. And then when I'm playing Scout, it takes me, like, five shots to finish anyone off. It just, it's just miserable. I don't, I don't really understand why, like, I, I, yeah, like, my movement is obviously not great, but it's also not terrible. Oh, fuck, man, that was just, that was just a miserable experience. There was, I mean, look, if, you, if, I, 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 I bet if you're, like, good, I bet on a low ping server, I would have had more fun, and playing with people who are more equal skill level to me, I probably would have had more fun, but, yeah, honestly, it's not even that I feel bad because I keep dying, like, because that's fine. I don't mind being bad at a game because it's then it's like, well then the 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 dopamine cut like means every time you do get a kill you get extra dopamine and that's true that did happen right like every time I actually did do anything right like I had to really fucking learn to play around walls man that's all that's what you have to do you ha you have to play around around corners but who fucking cares about strategy and six like. It's not, it's not that I necessarily feel bad because I played bad. It's that I feel bad because, like, having... I feel like I ruined the experience for these other people who are just trying to have a fun game. And then it's like, well, whoever has me on their team is just, like, basically playing 5v6. I, like, the, the, I can't really do shit. I don't have the... <clears throat> I just don't have the... Ex like, yeah, I just don't have the experience, which means I don't have any game sense. Like, like having zero game sense is just going to put you at a massive disadvantage no matter no matter what what you're doing it's not even this like my aim is not great but it's not terrible my movement is is like the lower end of average i'd say for like a casual player a, a scout yeah i'm not an expert scout evasive movement but like just general source movement i'm fairly average at so let's just put me in the the, the lower end of the average cut lower just below the the peak of the bell curve yeah my aim you know my head scan aim is like mid again probably just like a directly on the bell curve it's not terrible not great but i just have zero game like i don't understand like i kept getting i kept losing my teammates i didn't know where they were i didn't know whether we were pushing or not everyone else just seemed to know intuitively like when to push and when to hold 
So it'd be like, we, like, oh, well, they just tried to attack second and they got completely pushed back. Or it's like, we got a bunch of kills and, you know, they got pushed back. So, right, we should push in, right? Because that's normally when you push in and then we try and get... No, no, some, so for some reason, we're all just standing there waiting for them to come back. I was like, I don't understand why we why you do that. Because isn't that just giving them time to respawn? But it seemed to work sometimes. I don't really understand why sometimes people would just intuitively be like, oh, of course we don't push forward here. But I would go and then and then there'd be a bunch of people. And I'd be like, well, how, how was I supposed to know that? I, I just don't have the timing down in my mind of like when players are going to respawn. But... I don't know. I don't want to get better at sixes. Sixes is f f fucking sucks, bro. You can't even play any of the fun classes. Not like none of the fun aspects of t like. I bet if you're a a soldier main, sixes is really fun. But but I am not that. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go on a. This is how we. This is how I get my mojo back. I'm gonna go on a, a higher tower, a, a a higher tower um server. I'm gonna go pyro, and I'm just gonna air blast people off the side of, of high tower. That's what I'm gonna do, and that's gonna give me dopamine. In the end, I tried to play some more TF2 for a little bit, and honestly, nothing really made me any less miserable. I played some sniper. Sniper is so easy and effective that it's impossible to even get dopamine from for me. It's not even that. I don't know how to the, playing sniper is too it's 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 like a guilty pleasure because like sniper is the only class that I'm actually good at and yet it's also the worst class in the game um but in addition to that like I'm good at it but I'm not that good at it I'm good at playing sniper against um light classes because obviously coming from CS:GO I'm used to a kind of quick scoping playstyle a sort of stop scope flick shoot or a stop flick scope shoot kind of scope stop scope flick shoot kind of kind of muscle memory which i am genuinely pretty good at uh but that doesn't work against heavier classes who have more health you you have to charge your shots for that which i'm also not terrible at but it's just a different thing it's also way more boring in my opinion um but the pro main problem with sniper is that you can't really push with your team, so it's it's always I always wonder if I'm actually helping at all. I tried to play some high tower servers, none of them were fun really. Um, all are either empty or weird game modes that I don't find particularly fun, like a hundred x or thousand x, just kind of boring to me. Uh, or just full of bots and not real players. Um, I tried playing some pyro, didn't have that much luck. I tried some flog pyro, flog scorch shot pyro, because I was like, something's got to give me dopamine. But honestly, I wasn't on a very, it was on a bad map to play that. And then, and the, I tried playing some, I was like, fuck it. What about class wars? So I tried a class wars server. Played played as spy spies versus snipers. I'm not good at spy. Never played spy. Got a couple kills, but mostly was just boring. And then I just stopped playing. So then I was like, well, I'm just gonna go to the shops and buy some alcohol, which is what I did. And now I am no longer on the computer playing Team Fortress Two. That 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 is. I'm done with that. I think I'm. I might even take a break from the game because. I feel fucking terrible right now, and I've just felt terrible ever since that game, which is feels pretty pathetic, honestly. Like, how can a video game... Like, to be fair, I was playing for a, a solid few hours, right, of just getting demolished and letting my team down, but uh, it doesn't feel good. It does not feel good at all to, to, to have that happen. And I, again, I want to clarify that this is this is nothing against any of the players any of the the players from the uh the casual tf2 server in fact the problem is that everyone on the casual two tf2 server is is nice so it's like i feel particularly bad letting them down you know what i mean like everyone there is is pretty generally pretty chill i mean they take the game seriously ish but mostly seriously in this context as expected 
So it's not like they're just making, I mean, you know, they're being serious, but they're not being necessarily, you know, they're being passionate, as you would expect a, a gamer to be. But they're not bad people. They're good people, is what I'm trying to say here. Which means it feels even worse when you're just throwing. But I think, you know, after thinking back and analyzing it more, I should just never have done engaged with this in the first place, honestly. Like, the second I saw my ping was so high, I should have just dipped. Because, I, I mean, this was never going to go well for me, right? I, I don't know. I don't know what I thought would happen. I thought I would play kind of badly but still have fun, which kind of happened at first, but but it did not continue happening. Uh, whatever. I'm o- I'm over this now. I'm going to stop thinking about it. Oh, I bought I bought more fuel. I bought I bought I run out of fuel and so I've bought more. I'm excited for that. I bought um different flavors this time, partially because I want to try different flavors and partially because um some of the ones that I got before were out of stock, so I got all different. I got chicken and mushroom pasta, spaghetti carbonara, and Thai green curry. Uh, so well, I'm interested to see how those taste. So that's exciting, at least. That's one thing to look forward to. The other thing which I didn't consider is just how tiring. It's just that, like, I think I'm not just feeling bad because I lost a video game. I think I'm also just kind of out of energy. I don't know if you've heard what it sounds like to be in a game of sixes but it is five people give it like csgo is like people give info and whatever but it's like very i don't know it's it's much it's not as constant like in in tf2 everyone is constantly coming and you have to constantly pay attention to it like there are no breaks there's no like like uh they're pushing mid, they're pushing mid, okay, rotate, and then everyone just rotates, it's not like that, it's like, five people saying like, uh, two pushing lobby, uh, how much help do you have, it's just fucking, there's no, like, hold on, let me, uh, let me play this for you, I, I got a clip for you, I got a clip for you, listen to this, I'm gonna get started, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get, yeah so imagine that for like three hours <laughs> that's what the entire game sounded like the whole time except it wasn't quite that intense but it was pretty intense it depended on who like which who i was playing with but yeah imagine trying to pass that amount of inform- i don't know man these guys are built different but then, in addition to that, I don't know what the callouts mean, so I'm, like, trying to learn the callouts at the same time, and I'm trying to calm, not, never having even calmed before. Like, I went from not knowing any callouts in any maps to, like, because I'm like, well, look, I can't, I can't learn to play a good scout in the amount of time that we have right but maybe i but like at the very least i can just be helpful to my team by just giving info as much as i possibly like well when it's helpful obviously so i'm like also trying to call out i don't know man i think i'm just i think it's just like because it's tiring in general and it's tiring to try and pass that much information that's what i think happened i think it's actually more so that than i'm just sad because i lost video game now that i think about it I think that's def. I think I'm actually just having like post adrenaline calm down and like overstimulation type thing. Yeah. Okay. Time to talk about something that isn't Team Fortress Two. I I feel like I'm becoming way more anti-war than I have been in the past. That like I've just had this phrase. There's no such thing as a just war. Just sort of going in my head and trying to figure out like what it means. And I think it's true. But I haven't I haven't really like strictly thought about it that much before because I've always been like you know, most people would, would call themselves anti war, I suppose, right? Like there's very few people who are like pro war, <laughs> you know. Uh but there's still like the big one is World War Two, right? <clears throat> that like 
everyone is anti-war except World War Two. Like that one was fine. We were fighting the the goddamn Nazis, right? Like that one was okay. But but I I honestly like think about the actual logic here. It's like millions of of German te- teenagers and kids who I mean you learn about it in school, right? The German system they were indoctrinated since childhood to have these beliefs, right? They they there was no external sources of information. The entire education system was indoctrinating people into Nazi beliefs. There was no free press. There was nothing you could do to escape it. And even if you did disagree with it, you can't speak up against it because the Gestapo is going to get you. And then you're drafted into a war, which you can't escape, right? These people deserve to die. This was a justified war. Those guys deserve to die because they were they were drafted by a government that was terrible and for what like that's generally the the main thrust is they're like well look the american soldiers they may have had to suffer terribly but it was in service of squashing the the spread of fascism and it's like well before the war the most of the allies had pretty similar policies to the germans i think this is something that people really don't like to think about like this wasn't an ideological war. Let's not forget that. Let's 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 actually not forget that. The Nazi party the na- the, the Nazi party explicitly took inspiration for their policies from the American segregation system. Like they didn't they weren't secretive about it. They were very open about the fact that they got the idea from America. Um and uh you know, you look at the the policies that the British were instituting in India. And it's easily on the level of the Nazis. You look at the policies that a lot of European colonial powers were implementing in their colonies, and it's it's. I mean, they say fascism is the the what do they call it? The governance of the colonies colonies brought home or something like that. They're like there there really, you know, wasn't this big ideological distinction between allies and Axis powers before the war. And, I mean, look at Russia, for example. Like, the only reason that <clears throat> the Nazis lost is because the Russians threw 30 million people at them <laughs> to fuck them, right? 30 million Russians died in World War Two, And the Russians tried to join the Axis. <laughs> they, they they tried to join. And they were like, the, the Axis were like, no, you can't do it. And that's the only reason they fought with the Allies. And that's the only reason the Allies won the war, pretty much. So it's an, it it was a territory dispute. I mean, it had it had very little to do with ideology. So arguing that it was like good because it crushed this ideology, it's like it's not even what the war was about. And even if it was, it crushed. It did it. Did it crush like far right extremism? Doesn't doesn't feel like it. If you were if you were a black guy in America after the war, did you did you feel like racism had been eliminated? I don't think so. These people died for very little. They died for some land, is pretty much what happened. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we need to get rid of children on the internet. There's no reason for anyone under the age of, like, minimum 16 to be on the fucking internet. These motherfuckers should not be here, man. Get them off. Make them go away. I don't care how you have to do it. I should not have been on the internet at 14. None of us should have, okay? We all know this. We all know this inherently. You, when you were 14, you were like, this place is cool, I can make new friends. In reality, what happened to you? You got groomed, you got fucking, uh, you, 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 were the, you were there like 13 years old, you had some 16-year-old friend who was like constantly suicidal, you had to talk them down from killing themselves every night, you remember that? That happened to all of us, right? Like, this shit wasn't okay. Get that shit, we don't, we don't need to be here. And like, <laughs> what, what are you doing? There's of quality, that deserves to be, don't, no, no, no. Get that, get it, get, get those children off the goddamn internet. These motherfuckers, get them away from here, man. I'm telling there's no, there's no valid reason. There's zero valid, like, they should have their own little walled garden where it's like fucking YouTube kids, they can watch Spider-Man fucking Elsa 24 hours a day, right? They can have their own little, little place where, where they're not allowed to see, to, to do nothing interesting, right? So they get bored and they fuck off. And then, and then, and then, no one should be allowed to be on the internet if you can't drink alcohol already. 
like whatever your country's minimum alcohol age is is probably the age that they should have a minimum you know what i'm saying like one is way worse for you and it's, i'll tell you what they say alcohol is bad for you because it kills your brain cells B bro do you think the, the, the <laughs> which one do you think kills more brain cells right a, a, a little sippy a little sippy of a little beer or uh or the entire internet I'll tell you, I know, I know which one I'd pick if I had to, if I had to weigh them up. These, you know, they're like, oh, do we, we have to have a, an age of consent because people who can have kids, you know, like they, they're not responsible enough to, if they, if they get pregnant young, but somehow these motherfuckers are responsible enough to be posting. No, these motherfuckers ain't responsible enough to be posting. Get them out of here. Get them out. It's taking so much effort not to talk about Team Fortress 2. I've talked for, like, most of this podcast exclusively about TF2, and it must be so boring for everyone who doesn't play the game. But I am just so fixated on this game that I can't stop thinking about it, and it's the only thing I want to talk about. Uh, I've played a lot more Pyro recently. Pyro, I think, is definitely becoming one of my favorite classes. Even though I'm not particularly good at Pyro, um, I'm just generally fanning out from just pumping hours into demo. Uh... You know, I'm reasonably confident in demo as long as I'm on a server with decent ping. Uh, and playing against average players, you know, Hybrid Knight isn't super effective against, like, really good players just because they have better game sense, which makes it really hard to pick them off in a kind of ninja uh, assassin style with the sword. At which point the sword basically becomes useless and you should probably just be playing stock, uh, which I'll probably learn at some point. Uh, but irrelevant. Um... Yeah, I've been playing around with many more classes. For example, I recently I've been switching to NG to hold last on a few maps. Uh, I'm not particularly good at Engineer. I'm not even really sure what it takes to be good at Engineer. Uh, just been doing it to sort of help my team, really, without any expectations that I'm going to do well. Uh, but yeah, just generally becoming more confident with Engineer. It's, it's a pretty fun uh, class, honestly. I, I like Engineer, although kind of useless without a Pi Bro. Like, it, you... I don't know, it's it's very hard. Obviously, spies are supposed to counter you. And, uh, yeah, I'm just not... I, I still... I, at this point, I can generally tell when a disguised spy exists. Like, at this point, I'm fairly good at noticing a disguised spies. Not every single time, but generally, I'm I'm fairly good. Uh, but it's, it's more so, you know, invis hiding spies that sneak up behind me. Mainly because I'm normally listening to podcast or music or video at, at the same time. I don't have my games on turned up very loud. It's kind of hard to hear them decloaking. That's probably my main problem. But it's on it, the game would just be boring if I didn't. I I'm I yeah. It's fine if I get backstabbed a couple of times. That's pretty annoying when there's especially when there's good spies on the other team who kind of know what they're doing. It's very annoying. Today I was on Uncle Topia and I was playing against a team with like three really good spies on the other team. And everyone was just getting really mad in, in chat because, uh, of course, playing against three good spies is just going to be annoying. Uh, um, so, yeah, that that's obviously going to be your your worst matchup as NG. It's not surprising. I don't know why I'm even mentioning it. But, yeah, NG's kind of fun. Uh, Pyro. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm mainly having fun with Pyro right now, experimenting with detonator jumping a lot more. Uh I think the Detonator is definitely Pyro's best secondary, even if it's not actually that effective compared to like the sh the the Scorch Shot for for killing people. Uh, it's it's the best in terms of fun. Like Pyro having the extra movement from Detonator jumping is just so satisfying. It's such a good mechanic. Like Pyro really needed a move. It's 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 crazy. It took the, like a really long time for Pyro to get a good mobility option. Uh, yeah, and the thermal thruster is so dog shit. <laughs> Honestly, I, I I think the problem with pyro, right? The real problem is that air blast is too strong. But without air blast, pyro becomes a completely useless class. He'd be by far the worst class in the game. Um, and the problem with air blast is that it's really hard to be super good at air blast, but it's really easy to be good enough with air blast, right? Like just annoying the enemy players and just pushing them back, denying ubers denying any sort of pushes, just generally annoying people and spamming mouse 2 is way too easy to be to be good enough. 
but it is really hard to be super like effective uh you know like 2v1ing two soldiers for example is really hard um but yeah the air blast is is it's too easy to be like semi decent with air blast and the problem is if you took air blast away from pyro he basically becomes a melee class like he any decent player knows the range of the general flamethrowers is just going to stay away from them and flamethrowers on their own are actually pretty shit they feel good when you first play the game because it's easy but then you realize that they actually don't really do much damage at all and obviously the main way pyros actually deal burst damage is through combos but combos have been kind of nerfed too which is kind of annoying uh yeah, I feel like, you know, the, 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 there's there's two ways that Valve has tried to, or maybe three. The, the, the stock, stock pyro dog shit, right? Um, without air blast. We're assuming in a world without air blast. Stock pyro is basically dog shit. Um, and then you have, like, the, the combo options with, with the degreaser, arguably, and maybe the, the flare gun. But the flare gun's been nerfed. It, it's, it's, the problem with the flare gun is it's too... It's it's a it's a fairly high skill. It's not like super high skill, depending on the level of players you like. If if people know how to surf damage properly, it's it's, it's pretty hard. But the, hitting hitting flares is relatively difficult, right? It's the flare gun is is an appropriate level of difficult for what it should be. But the problem is you're only doing ninety damage when you hit a a, a crit flare, which is just not enough. It's just not enough reward for to make the playstyle worth it. Uh, I can understand why, because I think it would be really annoying to play against combo pyros who are actually good and could hit flares every time, um, if if it was doing a crazy amount of damage. But yeah, I think 90 is too little. I would like to see it up to 100, but obviously, who cares what my fucking balance opinions are? Um, but it, again, combo pyro without air blast is kind of useless because a lot of the combos were, rely on uh, controlling the other player's movement with by uh, air blasting them, you know, up into the sky. Um, and you know, these days actually effective combo pyros don't even use the flag on anymore they use the panic attack which is really boring to me uh so that's really only a swag strat it's not really uh i don't know it's it's meh uh but then the other way valve has tried to compensate for the fact that the flamethrower is shit so the first way they've done it right combos is the flamethrower only exists to light people on fire so that you can use actually effective weapons uh against burning enemies that's the first way they've tried to compensate about it it's it's meh and it wouldn't work without air blast really so that doesn't really do anything to, to move pyro away from just an air blast based class um and then the other way is by turning pyro into a more of an offensive class with the dragon's fury and the flog now the flog is really fun i got a whole team wipe with the flog today my first ever full team wipe with the flog uh it's in it's it's you know the flog is really annoying to the problem with the flog is if you have a pocket medic, it's too effective. Uh, it's I think it's appropriate. I think it's 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 good enough. Like the balance isn't isn't broken. If you even with scorch shot, scorch shot is OP. But even with the scorch shot, the fact that it takes a while to build oomph uh, and you're still vulnerable while uh, you have crits, you know, it's uh, it, it it means that I think the flog is fine, even with the scorch shot. The problem is, if you have a pocket medic who's, like, Ubering you all the time and pocketing you all the time so you can build them really quickly um, and really effectively, and then when you when you actually have crits, they can even pop Uber on you. And then you're, like, an Ubered crits pyro is just, too, like, ridiculous. <laughs> They're literally invincible and kills everyone in, this, in an instant. That's ridiculous. Uh, obviously, they knew that the flog was very powerful because of this, so they removed air blast. Um, which means that the, the, I don't know, you know, that's, that's fine. And Dragon's Fury also has really nerfed air blast. Problem with the Dragon's Fury, in my opinion, is that, um, like, I, I just, I don't know. I need more time with it. Uh, and I, 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 I think it's very underrated as a weapon. I think everyone kind of secretly knows that it has a lot of potential, but no, people don't really give it that much of a try. Because it requires learning an entirely new playstyle. I mean, I saw a video the other day that basically suggested that Dragon's Fury Pyro is essentially a subclass. I don't know if I'd go that far, but it, it definitely requires quite a different playstyle from any other, uh, from the normal way of playing Pyro. Uh, yeah, py Pyro is such a class with, like, I don't know, it's such a weird fucking deal. Uh, yeah, the, the, the real problem, right, is that none of these solutions, like, either aggressive, flog, slash, um... 
or, or uh, Dragon's Fury Pyro, or Combo Pyro, or even Backburner, like, th that's the other, the other way they've tried to make the Flamethrower not dog shit without Air Blast, is to, is the Backburner, where, where it's like, oh, well, if you get behind enemies, like, a, you suddenly turn into a spy, you, you, you just turn into a shitty spy, <laughs> <laughs> you can get behind the enemies and then do crits, but the problem is that they'll just turn around the second you're behind them and then shoot you in the face. So it, it kind of sucks, in my opinion. I've never been able to make it work. I know there are people who are able to make it work, but I don't think it's worth it. You just, again, you just kind of turn into a, a shitty spy. It's just a melee weapon that crits from behind like a spy. Uh, except you don't have any of the things that make spy effective. And Spy is already the weakest class in the game, so against good players. Yeah, the real problem is none of these are actually better than just air blasting enemy projectiles back at them. Which is really annoying, because it's such a good idea. And Pyro, yeah, Pyro without air blast is just useless. So I, I don't know what the the balance fix for that is. I, I think it's fine, you know, I, I don't think Pyro is broken. I just think that the, the reliance on air blast makes him kind of less fun to play. Uh... Because why would you go for the flashy, cool, exciting plays like reflect jumping and like actually aiming your reflected projectiles really well, detonator jumping, cool movement, axe extinguisher combos and all these sorts of things like when it's only slightly more effective than WM1 and just mouse two every so often so that you don't die. It's just too effective without really trying to encourage people to go for crazy sketch sketch check combos. Uh, yeah, but I'm not a game designer. I don't. I'm not here to tell you how to, how to fix it or whatever. I'm just noticing. Look, this is the thing: is that everyone else is who, who. If you don't play TF2, then none of this is interesting to you. And if you do play TF2, all of this you've heard a million fucking times before. So I don't. I don't know. This is. But fuck you. You know, this is my podcast. I talk about whatever the fuck I want. It's a slice of my life, not a slice of your life. You want a slice of your life, start your own goddamn slice of life podcast, motherfucker. Sorry, I'm very caffeinated. I haven't had caffeine in a while. Well, that's not true. I, I, I cut down, I told you this before, I cut down my caffeine from 200 milligrams in the morning to 100 milligrams in the morning without theanine. And then I never drink caffeine during the day. And today I had a monster for the first time in months and months. So I am highly caffeinated and kind of fucking, you know, pumped because that's because I'm on drugs. Uh, anyway, monster is great. So I've been playing more pyro and trying to go for flashier combos and stuff because it's just fun. And doing a lot of detonator jumping, even if it's not effective, just because it's fun. Because uh, that's this is the the reason I've been doing that. I think is because I figured out that to actually be a like the reason I started the I picked up TF two in the first place is because of trimping. I thought trimping looked like the coolest movement mechanic ever. Uh, I have since you know after pumping like one hundred and fifty hours into uh, that class. I have found out that trimping is not actually super effective in real games. Uh, it's it it mainly all it does is put you on low health right in front of the enemy, <laughs> with uh, no real recourse, and so you end up jumping directly into a group of enemies and just dying immediately, or you end up behind a group of enemies and also you're you get fucked by sentries. It's just not super good. The only thing it's actually good for is rollouts on some maps. And it's it can be effective. The only map city is even like there's a bunch of maps where it's basically completely useless. Uh, like the maps are too closed off. There's just a whole bunch of problems with it. There aren't enough slopes to that will get you anywhere interesting. Um, so the only real maps where I think or like actually the only map where trimping is really effective is harvest. Harvest like good trims will get you kills which is why I tend to do, like, all of my best matches have been on Harvest. Harvest is the, I, I tend to, like, be near the top of the scoreboard these days on Harvest, um, because I've spent a lot of time learning trimping well, and then it's a good map for that. Uh, upward is the other good case. Honestly, I find it's best defending on Upward, because it allows you to get to the back line and pick off snipers and stuff, who are too focused on pushing to really notice you. Um... If you're on offense upward, it can be effective depending on how... It basically depends on... Uh, you're basically relying on the other team being bad and having not many engineers. But if, you know, it, it can be effective to get a med pick once in a while. But honestly, it's kind of a very niche thing. Uh, the much more effective way to play Demo Knight or Hybrid Knight 
is to mainly <laughs> mainly use your pipes and then use the sword to either chase down and finish off enemies that you've already hit with a pipe or two uh, or to like go for sort of uh, assassin style kills which is is kind of fun but it it requires a lot of restraint like you actually don't want to be playing near the front line and you don't really want to be aggressively flanking at all you you want to be kind of playing passive flanks and kind of s- s- occasionally spamming over walls and stuff because that's your main advantage is you're the only class that can do damage without seeing any seeing the enemy directly um doing chip damage like that to help your team hitting your pipes on some classes running away from scouts running away uh yeah i don't know it's it, it the the actually effective play style i'm tr- i'm finding like a, a balance right between something that will actually like not just suicidally trimping into the enemy every round but also not playing like boring cautious tf2 where you don't die but and you do a lot of chip damage but you don't get any flashy kills or really use your sword at all because then it's like why am i not just playing stock demo uh so i think there's still a balance to be found and honestly the the balance that i found that works best is kind of closer to the boring side than i would like which is a little sad which i think is why i've ended up trying out like trying to expand to playing more other classes where i feel like the funner play styles are more viable uh and the main reason for this is just because i refuse to use any shield other than the tide turner like honestly if i was if i was more willing to to use the splendid screen i could be way more effective but who cares about that who cares about being effective as long as you're having fun so the main yeah i would say my main classes is uh gonna be demo hybrid knight pyro and sniper uh the problem with like sniper is that i'm i I said this right at the beginning of when i started playing tf2 like i'm good enough at sniper that it kind of isn't fun uh i i i demolished someone in a 1v1 with sniper the other like kind of an mge situation accidental mge situation to the point where it just felt like bullying but i still did it because i don't know i just i don't know what else to do the guy didn't want to do anything else other than sniper duels because I was just on a, alone on a server with one other guy and I was just fucking demolishing him and it was it was just felt like bullying like I just started to feel bad at the end of it because he was getting so mad <laughs> um, and yeah I, I don't know I snipers kind of it's not really super fun to play you know like a lot of the time a sniper is just like clicking heads until you get killed by a spy and then doing it again it's Especially if you're playing against a team with competent spies, sniper just becomes really boring to play because you just don't you just too scared to even be effective because you're constantly spy checking. Uh, but which, yeah, I don't know. And also, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't feel fair to play sniper because all you have to do is click a head once, which is like not that hard if you're a CS:GO player, and and you can just completely. Like, I feel bad killing medics because it's like this guy has spent like a half of, you know, he's spent ages building Uber and now he's dead. It's like, it doesn't feel, I don't know. It feels, it feels good killing heavies. I like killing heavies because I never get to play a class that's good against heavy. Uh, so being able to play the, one of the like couple of classes that are actually effective against heavy, that's good. I like being able to delete heavies in one click. Uh, that's very satisfying. Um... But yeah, so sniper's only really fun be- because if I'm like sick of dying and just want to be effective, uh, and then pi- yeah, I don't know. But uh, and I play NG mainly because it just to hold out from a final push rather than necessarily because it's one of my favorite classes. Like I don't really play NG for a full match. I'll just switch to NG right like on last. Uh, as for the other classes, I still haven't really given Soldier a proper shot, but honestly, I find Soldier pretty boring, uh, even with rocket jumps. I th- I am waiting to unlock the gunboats or the rocket jumper so I can do a little bit of market gardening more effectively, because that seems kind of fun. But since I don't have any of either of those unlocked and I haven't been bothered to buy one yet, uh, yeah, Soldier's not super fun. Spy is just absolutely not fun for me at all. I'll play medic if my team needs a medic, but I don't find medic super fun. Uh, yeah, pyro is one of the most versatile classes in the game. You have so many different playstyles that I that I think is really fun. Um, 
but it's very easy to play to accidentally be playing pyro in a boring way like you have to you have to be trying to make fun for yourself if you're going to be playing pyro you can't let yourself like fall back on just wm1 and then air blast air blast air blast you have to like specifically go out of your way to play in a less optimal more fun way but when you do that it is very fun uh what other classes exist? Heavy? I, yeah, I've switched to heavy when my team needs a heavy. I'm actually really bad at heavy. Uh, so I don't really do it very often. But I have done that a few times. Like, I've noticed that my team doesn't have a heavy. And instead of just typing in chat, someone switched to heavy. I've decided to be the change that I want to see in the world. And switch to heavy. And uh, kind of depends on it. I mean, again, I'm not super good with heavy. I don't really know what it would take to be good with heavy. But it does kind of depend on um how good your medic is that's definitely a part of it like if you have good coordination with your medic which i don't have a good sense for that um because aiming as heavy is not hard i remember like when i was first playing the game back in the day i found tracking enemies kind of difficult in its own but you know nowadays with a, a few thousand hours of fps experience tracking enemies as heavy is not very difficult honestly Heavy is kind of like the the effectiveness of heavy is massively depleted by the fact that even though he's very tanky, he can only ever fight one enemy at a time, uh, which I don't know how you'd fix that. But it it means that like I don't know, it just it just is a strange it's a strange class. I don't think it's bad. I don't think it has like it's unbalanced or anything. I think it's fine. Um, it's just something that I I don't know. It's it's a little weird. It's not super fun. I I like movement. The I like play video game where I go fast. Heavy go slow. That's no fun. Um, yeah. My next goal in the game is I've decided tomorrow what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and get good with the sticky jumper. It's my goal for tomorrow is to go into a practice server and learn to do like proper sticky jumper pogos because I I can like I've I I I know how to vaguely do it but I I've never done it very effectively. I want to be like jumping around the map with the sticky jumper and just going crazy for no reason um yeah that's that seems fun to me uh and uh let me see anything else yeah scout S scout is i i feel like i'm traumatized after that that sixes game i'm traumatized away from playing scout like it's just i don't yeah, I don't even know. I I feel like I'm. I feel like if I press that button to select Scout, I'm just gonna want to kill myself because I Scout is so boring, man. One of the most boring fucking like it's somehow simultaneously very intense because obviously you're very fast and you're all flick shooty and and meat shots and hit scan and getting up in enemies' faces and jumping around them. Like it it it's very intense, but it's also very boring because you only really have one thing you can do. Like, there's not a bunch of really interesting options for you to do as Scout. You kind of have one role that you... It, I mean, this is the same for a bunch of the, the classes that I think are, are bad or less fun for me. Like, the reason I'm so drawn to Demo and Pyro is that those are the classes with the most variety in playstyle. I think I just figured this out live. Like, Sniper, you can only really do one thing. I mean, there's Huntsman Sniper as well, so that makes it kind of fun. But those, it's kind of, I don't know. Huntsman's cool. Uh, I like that. Uh, but medic, you can only really do one thing. Battle medic isn't a real class. Don't don't lie to yourself. NG, you can only really do one thing. Uh, since I don't have the um, I don't have the the fucking thingy unlocked. The one that gives you mini sentry. Uh, I forgot what they're called. Uh, I forgot what the the weapon's called. Gunslinger. I don't I don't have that unlocked, so I can't can't play aggressive like. Battle NG, not that I would want to. Battle NG doesn't look fun to me at all, so I don't think I'd play it. Uh, but yeah, I've, you know, gem, basic NG playstyle, there's like not really that much variety. Um, heavy has zero variety. Scout has zero variety. Sniper has zero, I already mentioned. Spy has zero variety, in my opinion. Uh, I don't count trick stabbing as variety. I don't count the your eternal reward as variety. Still basically the same thing. Try and get behind the enemy and stab them in the back. That's literally that's literally the entire thing. Like compare that to Pyro, where it's like you can uh, ambush the enemy, right, with a with a flamethrower and try and do big damage by playing as an ambush type class. You can uh, try and go for a sing single out uh, classes on the flanks and go for combos by getting them stuck in a corner with the air blast and hitting them with the flare gun and the axe extinguisher and, and stuff like that. 
you can try and uh, jump into a group of enemies by detonator jumping who are on the point or on the on the uh, cart and uh, you know do do a bunch of damage there or try and get behind them with the back burner and surprise them like that or you can play as a super aggressive power class with the uh, dragon's fury or you can uh, play as this sort of rhythm where you uh, sit back with the scorch shot and try and take pot shots to build oomph and then go in with crits at the, try and time your crits at the right time to uh, get a bunch of enemies and then back off and do this like this kind of rhythm like that's a com those are th completely different play styles from each other and then demo it's like you can be a, an aggressive power class who is focused on area, area denial or you can be a melee only class <laughs> who like is like an assassin play style or you can uh, be a, a hybrid of the two where you have a good 1v1 ability in mid range basically no ability in long range but you can take out you can be really good for getting picks on medics and snipers who are fucking your team over uh, with the sword and then you also have the fastest movement of any class in the game basically if you know what you're doing uh, at least in certain areas and you can use that to your advantage in various ways uh, you know there's there's a whole bunch of variety there uh, you know compared to the other classes I feel like where they maybe have two playstyles at best, maybe even just one. In the case of like heavy, I feel like has just one playstyle. Scout, I feel like has just one playstyle. Medic, I feel like basically has just one playstyle. I don't. Again, battle magic isn't real. Yeah, NG has one playstyle unless you have this one particular weapon, in which case he still just kind of has one and a half playstyles. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I I prefer the more versatile classes. I don't know. That's just that's how I like it. And the more movement focused classes, although I still don't play, th which is strange because like the 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 classic movement option in TF two is rocket jumping, but honestly, rocket jumping isn't that fun for me. Like maybe if I got like there's definitely certain maps where I feel like I would want to learn rollouts for, uh like uh CP process. I feel like the roller on that map looks really cool. Uh, but there's nothing of, like you can do that rollout almost exactly the same with trimping. And it's honestly more fun. You wanna know what the best bro moment I've had in Team Fortress 2 is? There was a one time I was playing on Badwater and there was a medic on my team who said to me in voice chat, Do you have the Islander? And I said, Yes, let me switch to it. Because I normally play with the Claymore as my second. So I switched he switched to Islander and then he critched me at the start of the round so that I could charge in and build heads really easily because when you have crits you one shot like most classes with the islander so he crits me and i'm going around at the beginning of the round collecting four heads basically instantly with zero effort and then i got four heads on my islander straight away now the problem is i threw this all away instantly but i feel like you have a like crits medic plus demo knight with the islander is actually a, a really good combo <laughs> that was a bro moment Thank you to that guy, because that was, a, 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 I felt powerful, man. Guys, guys, I gotta be honest with you, okay? I bought more fuels. I bought spaghetti carbonara, chicken and mushroom pasta, and Thai green curry. I don't remember if I already mentioned this, but I just had the spaghetti carbonara. Bro, that ain't it. That is the least it of anything ever. It's sweet. I didn't, why did I think that that would be nice? I guess I was pl so pleasantly surprised by the the bolognese, which was definitely the best one that I got before, that I was like, more pasta must be good. I would have just bought more bolognese, but it was out of stock when I went to buy it. So I was like, carbonara and mushroom pasta are the other two options, so I'll get those as, as, instead. I, I don't know, somehow it had not occurred to me <laughs> that carbonara is the least vegan meal ever and secondly very easy to make for yourself and i'm a fucking god at carbonara and if I, i've definitely told you this before but one of my signature dishes carbonara okay i'm a beast at it it's not difficult but mine is good generally uh <clears throat> man that sucks it's sweet it tastes like vanilla what how did they fuck it up so bad like i i understand you know like I guess it's hard to make vegan egg, but just don't <laughs> make different shit. Why make carbonara an option 
if that's how vegan egg tastes, it just, it tastes like drinking, it ta- I tell you what, it tastes like someone just poured vanilla Huel into uh, a, a pasta with, with a bit of, a little sprinkle of salt in it. There's no cheesiness, you know, I don't know how they do it, what sort of crazy flavorings they have, but the bolognese flavor, it has some, I mean, it probably has MSG in it. And it has some meatiness to it, and it also has like a little funky cheesy flavor, like subtle, but it's there, and it's really nice. Honestly, it works really well. It's not as good as a real bolognese, obviously, nowhere close, but, you know, for the trade-off of not having to do any prep time, and it has all your nutrients in it, I, I, it's good enough, good enough for me. This, I don't know what they were thinking. Why is it sweet? Why did they put sweet in it? <laughs> what were they thinking? Like, I, I can kind of taste a little of what they're trying to make, like, like an eggy taste. But it's, it's, it's off. It's not really close to an egg. It doesn't really, it's not really even, it's like if you were trying to describe, like, there's a tiny hint of a flavor, which is like, I think they're trying to simulate some of the sulfur compounds of an, uh, the eggs have, but that are, like, very subtle. But if you take them away, it would taste bad. But if you had too many of them, it tastes bad. It's the thing that makes a lot of people not like eggs is they have these sulfur compounds in them, right? But generally speaking, when it comes to taste and smell particularly, because they're volatile, you know, obviously, like, taste is just not actually most of flavor. Smell is um, retronasal olfaction. And when you get those, like, volatile sulfur compounds, like, in very small amounts, retronasally, you... It, 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 like, enhances the flavor. That's my, that's, I mean, obviously flavor is going to be subjective, but, uh, <clears throat> that's how, you know, you don't really taste, like, bad sulfury taste when you eat eggs normally. You just taste egg. But what I'm, tra- what I'm trying to get at is I think they've tried to simulate that kind of flavor where there's a, the, the tiny bit of a uh, sulfury compound type flavor, but it just doesn't work. Like, it doesn't, the other shit that's in an egg isn't there, so... <laughs> It just tastes kind of weird. It doesn't taste like off or bad because they're being very subtle with it. But it's definitely, I don't know if that's actually what they're trying to simulate. It's like someone who, it's like trying to describe egg to someone who's never had an egg. It's so bad. And it's sweet. It's really sickly sweet. (laughs) Like, why is it so sweet? And it tastes like vanilla. I don't know what they were thinking. And it's kind of grainy. It's, it's really bad, man. (laughs) It's really bad. Uh... And then they have these like chunks of fake meat, which are honestly, you know, no one would fa- I, no one would mistake that for pancetta or whatever they're going for, or bacon. But like, it's a, I'm, I'm, I would be okay with it if it was in a nicer sauce. Honestly, I would. It, obviously, it's not anywhere close to as good as real bacon or pancetta or just the cured pork, right? Guanciale. That's obviously gonna be better in every situation. But I understand why they don't do it. I, I don't know, man. I feel like this one they just did. They just did not hit the mark at all. I don't know what they were thinking. Why is it so sweet? Like, that's the main thing, is it's it's fucking sweet. It should not be sweet. It, 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 it there's no, you, like, it, you, you fucked up from the get-go. You can't fix that by any means. You can't fix the fact that it's not supposed to be sweet and you made it sweet. I mean, the whole, I don't know why I thought it was a good idea. Like, with a bolognese, it's fine to have a, like, a carbonara is not supposed to be super heavily sourced because the sauce is supposed to be very fatty. I don't know. Even treating it as its own thing, like, you know, for example, the korma that they advertise as a korma doesn't taste like korma. The bolognese doesn't really taste like bolognese, it just kind of tastes like a pasta sauce. Um, like, even saying that this is just its own thing, as it as its own meal, not judging it from the perspective of comparing it to a real carbonara, it fails. Because it's, it's bad. <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. It's, the sauce is dog shit. Like, when I first thought that the bolognese sauce was bad, it was because it was too liquidy. But in this case, it wasn't too liquidy. I mean, it was a little too liquidy, which I could have... I didn't know how much water to put in because it's the first time. I didn't know if I was, like, going to over or underestimate it. Next time I'll put a little less water, but it's not the texture that fucked it. Like, even when I first tried the super liquidy bolognese-style sauce, I thought that it was, like, just tasted really weak and didn't really taste of anything and was and the texture was all fucked up but that the actual flavor was like just too weak uh, right not particularly good or bad just kind of flavorless but this one you know the flavor wasn't weak 
even though the texture was a little waterier than I would have liked it, the flavor itself was, if anything, too strong. And the part of the flavor was too strong was the f fucking weird vanilla sweetness that it tastes like. It kind of tastes like default flavor Huel, like the drink. Like, it almost, it has like a oaty, oatiness to it, which I know they use a lot of oats. I, I don't know if I'm actually tasting that correctly, but it, I, it wouldn't surprise me if what I was tasting there was oats. Like, I know they use oats in their Huel recipe, which is just weird. I don't know, man. I feel, I feel like they missed the mark on this one. I mean, I, I mean, the other ones grew on me, so maybe this one will grow on me too, but I, I don't know about that. I feel like, uh, <clears throat> I, yeah, <laughs> I feel like that ain't it. Maybe, maybe there's some way to save it, but I feel like if you've put sweetness in your sauce, you've just kind of fucked it up from the get-go. Like, why, why is it sweet? I, I don't know what they're thinking. I guess the sort of thing they're trying to emulate is just something that you can't really replicate without animal parts. That would be my guess. That it's just they just they just shouldn't have tried this in the first place but like you know there's there's these like fake shitty carbonara recipes where you use like cream and ham right which are like a completely different sauce but sometimes people call them carbonara where it's like egg like a one egg and then a bunch of cream and then some ham i feel like i've had i've had carbonara like that before and it tastes okay i i, I kind of feel bad even calling it carbonara but that kind of thing the creamy based carbonaras and it tastes meh right if it's not, not great, not terrible kind of comfort food vibes, uh, I feel like it would be good in certain situations. And I've also had vegan cream before, by accident, when I, I bought it without looking closely enough at the label, just not wanting normal cream. And I ended up accidentally buying vegan cream, and honestly it was good, like it was fine. Obviously it's not quite as good as the regular cream, but frankly, like it wasn't too bad, it, it, it worked fine for the recipe I was making. It, it, it wasn't even that noticeable that it was different. Like, I feel like if they can do that, and there's this complete version of a carbonara that's very creamy, why not just use that cream, which has a, a, about the right texture, maybe because it's too much fat, maybe because it, would be, it wouldn't, wouldn't have all the nutrients they need. But then, I don't know, man. They really fucked this one up. <laughs> they really fucked this one up, man. Now, now I don't know, I don't know, man. I need to, I need to reevaluate. Hopefully the chicken and mushroom one is less bad. Like, honestly, the, the bacon chunks that they have in there, the fake vegan bacon chunk stuff, is, like, not good. But, like, I can see that, an, an, like, someone tried, at least, right? Like, it's definitely not good, but it's, like, someone tried to make something that, and it, it like, I stayed, they, <laughs> you know? Like, if it, it feels like, if, if someone handed that to me and I, they were, like, eat this, what do you think it is? I would be like, it tastes like some kind of like vegan bacon thing, right? Like I can tell what it's supposed to be and it kind of tastes okay. You know, it has the umami-ness, the salty umami-ness that bacon's supposed to have and it has like a loose approximation of the correct texture. It's not great. It's not even particularly good, but in a, in a, in a better sauce, it would be possible. Just like the uh, you know, the, the fake tofu bits or whatever they are, pea protein bits in the bolognese that are supposed to represent ground meat. You know, they don't really taste or feel like ground meat, but like it kind of replicates the same overall vibe that it's like, it, it passes, it's fine, it works. It's not great, but it, it's, you know, uh, for the advantages that Huel gives me, I, I'll accept it. But with this, it's like, you know, if it was in a better sauce, I feel like it, I would be the same, right? I'd be like, it's not, you know, really good, but it's possible. But the sauce is just so fucked. <laughs> they just fucked up so bad. Like, I don't even, I don't even understand how it's possible that they fucked up that bad, you know? And it's, I, I don't know if I would describe it as disgusting, but it's definitely not good. And now I got to, yeah, I don't know, man. Hopefully the other ones I bought aren't that bad. And hope maybe maybe this will grow on me like the other ones grew on me. I don't know. But uh yeah, not a good start. Not a good start at all. Okay, we got a couple of updates. I tried the um the next Huel flavor. I tried the uh the Thai green curry Huel flavor. Now, once again, I have to say they got some fucking nerve calling this Thai green curry. Okay, like Thai green curry is a very complex deep dish with a lot of ties back, no pun intended, to culture, uh, you know, it is not, it doesn't have the complexity of flavor, the depth of flavor, anywhere even 
remotely similar to you know you give this to a Thai person they're gonna be like this this ain't it this is just a different thing but obviously you can't complain the two they got some balls calling it what they're calling it but you know as a as a food judged on its own merits it's fine it's what you expect from these sorts of fuel things it's what i would want it doesn't really taste of that much except sort of vaguely healthy that's fine by me. I'm okay with this. I'm, yeah, it, it works. It does the job. Um, so that, yeah, that's fine. Uh, and then the other thing is I, I said that I would spend today trying to get good with the sticky jumper, and I did do that. Uh, I would not say I'm necessarily good with it, but I spent all day playing Kaber plus sticky jumper and jumping around and dive bombing people. And it was incredibly fun. And then I, 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 I took all of my clips from that and uploaded them into a YouTube video, which you probably can find on my channel right now. Uh, and some other clips I had saved. You know. <sighs> Sorry. And some other clips I had saved as well. Some funny moments. Some epic kills. Uh, yeah, good game. How come TF2... Sixes competitive struggles in my opinion and a lot of other people's opinion as well with a stale meta whereas CSGO has never struggled with this and Counter-Strike in general doesn't necess I mean maybe Dust 2 maybe Mirage two maps out of the whole pool one of which isn't even in the competitive pool right now because the meta is so stale TF2 a game with Hundreds of items, different classes, you know, you have all of these way more options compared to CS, where everyone plays the same character with the same four guns, AKM4, AWP, and then maybe a pistol or uh, SMG on an Eco Force or, you know, but pretty much everyone plays with, with AKM4, AWP, and Deagle in older games. Uh, everyone plays the same, like, six maps, and yet... CS isn't stale, but TF2 6s is, is stale as fuck. Everyone complains about it. I, it's a good question, honestly. I don't know what the answer is. I'm just trying to think about it. And I think a couple of things I've, I've thought about that might contribute. The first thing is round time. That CS has this particular pressure and flow to it where uh, decisions... Each, each, I mean, it's just the fundamental difference between a tax shooter and a twitch shooter, right? They're like, in CS, you can die in one shot all the time, and each round is very short. So every single decision you make carries a lot of weight, hence tax shoot. And that means that strategizing is just inherently going to be a more important part of the game. On, that's the on purpose. So having this playing field where everyone's using the same sort of loadout, means that the game actually plays out in the the realm of strategy before it ever really hits the playing field because you know exactly what's going on and then add on to that the complexities of utility and i think very importantly the fact that each map has two two different points i think the simple fact that you can have rotations and fakes in cs keeps the meta alive because any time a play becomes meta, you can then use that fact to debate an opponent, right? Like if, you know, you can throw smokes on A site and then push B type thing, right? Uh, anytime something becomes like, oh, well, this is what you do every round, which it never does. But if there's like a, a set strategy that like default A execute, for example, there's always going to be the option of like well hey here's a smoke you can throw from halfway across the map that makes it look like you're about to do execute on a like these smokes exist people learn lineups that are that are meant to look like a different lineup just to fake out an opponent because anytime some meta gets discovered you can immediately use that to trick people and so it's constantly i mean is the meta actually evolving in cs I mean, teams will look for anything to give them an advantage. So, like, extra boots, boost spots and stuff. Uh, there's nothing in TF2 that necessarily 
you know, I feel like in TF2, there's there's nothing stopping people from doing similar stuff, you know, finding crazy rocket jumps to do, or, uh, I don't know, but I, I feel like, yeah, the, the fact that, that there's only really, there's not really much, there's nowhere near as much tactical play in TF2, and it's almost all raw mechanical skill, I mean, obviously, and team play, but not, like, uh, tactics, I think that's one of the big things, right, because there's no, there's no rotates, like, the fact that there's no, that everyone is always knows exactly what you're doing, you know, there's no, like, brain games, there's no, uh, like, there's no rotates, I mean, it pretty much just comes down to that, so I think that's definitely a problem, and I think another problem is that, well, another problem is definitely the community, that people who play competitive are annoying, everyone knows they're annoying, but they're also particularly bad, like, for example, in Melee, when someone wins with a suboptimal character, like Amsa and Axe, running with Yoshi and Pikachu, respectively, everyone rallies for them, right? Everyone loves these guys for playing off-meta characters, like, slightly lower-tier characters, and, and the fact that they can win, everyone cheers for them, everyone loves them. Even if you're the world's biggest Mango fan, when, when Amsa beat Mango, you fucking cheered for Amsa, because he beat Mango with a Yoshi. Right, like that's just fucking based. In TF2, if you play off meta, you get like bullied. Like, like you're, people think you're trolling. People think you're BMing. It's considered BM to play off meta. That's so cringe. <laughs> that's so ridiculously cringe. People really need to freshen. Yeah, the the meta needs to be freshened up. People tr- need to try insane strategies, and that's what makes these sorts of things fun. You know, we still all remember, you can't watch a single video about CSGO history without someone bringing up Olaf Boost, right? Like all of these weird broken strategies are things that make a game. And TF2 for a game that's that wacky has none. It has literally zero weird broken strategies. And if it ever did, people just get mad. No one remembers it fondly. No one's like chill about it. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's annoying. And then there's the fact that the game mode that they play has a lot of potential. Like, it, it looks like it, it could be good, but it's clearly bad. And I honestly think it's it's at least in part because of bad map design. Uh, I think a lot of 5CP maps are just badly designed. Uh, I'm not sure what a better way to design it is, but I feel like there needs to be a big rethinking in how maps are designed for 5C, for, for like 6's competitive play. Um, you know, they're, they're definitely, like, the fact that the meta is so centralized around the medic and building uber to break stalemates is so annoying, like, it's just boring, to be honest. It's not really interesting gameplay, like, the only thing, it, yeah, I don't, I, it's like, it's just not good, <laughs> it's just not a good format. Like, hey, we made a format that makes scouts and soldiers, like, the best classes, mainly scout. Sca- like, sixes is defined by scout pretty much. It's like, well, how about you make a form, like, and then their alternative was Highlander, where it's like, well, we'll just force everyone to play every class. And then Sniper just becomes the centralizing meme. And it, everyone knows it's not fun to play against good snipers. It's, it's just not fun to play against good sniper players. So, you know, you have literally, when you, when you have sixes, you literally have a medic, and then you have a scout and a soldier whose only job it is is to protect the medic. It's And it's like, that's how, there's just this one, like, if you have the medic, you win. If you lose the medic, you die. It's just all about this one centralizing thing, which is just really doesn't allow for much variety in, in tactics and strategy. I don't know, I feel like the game mode, is, like, there's so much potential. Everyone sees the potential. And the potential is just that TF2 has really deep, high skill ceiling mechanics. Um, the problem is, I think just like from the very beginning, people have been going about it wrong in how to make a competitive format for those mechanics to shine. And maybe what it will take is just for some, I don't know, I think I think a couple things need to happen. L- let's ignore any action from Valve. That would definitely help, but let's ignore that. I think first things first, if you're a competitive player, if you're a TF2 player who plays in sixes, start a goddamn YouTube channel. 
Like there needs to be more content because you can't have the meta changing and evolving without growing a community around it. Like put it like this. No one gave a fuck about the Trackmania competitive scene until Virtual blew up on YouTube. And now it's like everyone knows a bit about it. No one ever gave a single shit until one guy decided to make YouTube videos about it. And now, you know, Trackmania is the most popular racing game in the world. I don't know. And it, it was very much, you know, in part because Virtual took advantage of the, you know what I'm saying? There needs to be more. If you want your competitive esport to gain changes in the meta and, and popularity and become less stale, uh, yeah, it needs you, you need you need to have uh, community leaders besides Banny, people who are gonna be making YouTube videos and streaming on Twitch uh, and so on, spreading this sort of message. And then the other thing is the the ban the like the need the 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 real fucking problem is that i mean a, a big problem is there are there are a few weapons in the game that break the meta and they're all banned and competitive now some of those items deserve to be banned of course there are definitely some that deserve to be, like the wrangler has no place in the game as it as it exists right now it shouldn't exist in any format you know, maybe, you know, I feel like maybe in competitive it could be viable, it could be fine, but, but I really doubt it. I don't, I don't, right, there are definitely some weapons that should stay banned, but there are too many banned items, way too many. But the real problem, like, I keep saying the real problem, like, the more I think about it, the more I realize that the reason it's so stale is that there's no room for specialists. Most TF2 classes are specialists of some kind, but in sixes, there just aren't enough players to, to there's only six players. You can't have a, a, a guy who's just a specialist. You, you, you can't have that unless it's a medic because their specialism is the most powerful thing in the entire game. So th other than that, you, you're, you, like, you can't give up an entire character slot for someone who's, who's not going to be able to perform generally in every situation P attacking defending holding etc breaking stalemates you have to be able to do a little bit of everything in order to even be worth using and most classes in the game aren't like that which is why the only off-class picks normally are to hold last where it's you're suddenly only defending and so you can actually switch classes or you know, sometimes he will pick Sniper. Yeah, I mean, the the real problem is just that there's only six people. The game is not... It doesn't work. When the, I, don't, I think it's just a fundamentally flawed game mode. I, I think they fucked up. And honestly, I don't give a fuck. Like, it's fun to watch other people who are enjoy it and, and are good at it. But honestly, it looks like it's, it's just actually dog shit. I think not every game has to be a super competitive sweat fest. TF2 has survived this whole time completely fine being a casual game and i've tried the final heel flavor that i have which is chicken chick apostrophe n and mushroom i gotta say definitely the best one in the batch <clears throat> because it just tastes kind of like a mushroom pasta and i like mushroom pasta big fan of mushrooms uh love mushrooms just tastes kind of mushroomy chickeny i wouldn't say so but there's definitely some element of like umami but like I would eat, I mean, I have eaten many, like, vegetarian mushroom pastas in the past, so that's a good one. I like it. I think in the future I might experiment with mixing in some cheese to it, and that could be good, but, uh, no, generally a good huel. So, just to remind you so far, the, uh, the good huels, uh, the spaghetti carbonara is pretty good, the Thai green curry is good. Uh, the Mexican chili is a little boring, but tastes healthy. I uh, uh, haven't tried the mac and cheese with a Z. Oh wait, sorry, I fucked up. The spaghetti carbonara is dog shit. The spaghetti carbonara is the worst one. Uh, Thai green curry is good. Mexican chili is good. Mac and cheese haven't tried. The pasta bolognese is pretty good. Chicken and mushroom is solid good. Pasta bolognese might be in the solid good. Uh, maybe I should give these like ratings out of 10.
The Palmanala, I'm going to put it at a 3, maybe a 4. No, I'm going to put it at a 3. The Thai Green Curry, it was just in terms of taste. Thai Green Curry, I'm going to put it like a 5, maybe a 6, light 6. Mexican Chili, going to put it at a solid 6. Uh, mac and cheese, I haven't tried. Pasta Bolognese, we're going to put it at a, also at a solid 6. Chicken and Mushroom Pasta, put a high 6, low 7 maybe. Bolognese might also be a high 6, not sure. Madras, haven't tried. Korma's going to be, again, a solid 6. Sweet, and I haven't tried any others. Uh, these are my opinions. Something that's really interesting to me is... <clears throat> there's, there's... Okay, so you know how every popular sport, pretty much every popular sport, originated in the UK or the British Isles, right? Like, uh, obviously, football's the biggest sport in the world. It comes from the UK. Cricket, I believe, is, like, the second biggest sport, if you just count number of fans because the Indian Premier League is the biggest sporting league in the world because India is just fucking massive. Uh, rugby is pretty popular in Europe. Um, um, and then obviously, you know, American football originated from rugby. Uh, baseball and cricket have a common route from England. Um, all of these sports, some of them have evolved and not all of them are from England. Basketball isn't from England. It's an original American sport. Uh, yeah, there's there's others, I'm sure. Ice hockey, not not English. But most of the popular sports come from England, or not necessarily from England, but from from the British Isles. Let's just call them that. Uh, and what's interesting to me is I like all of the lesser known because it's like it's kind of hard to explain. There's a bunch of other ones. <laughs> is what I'm trying to get at here that aren't really known outside of outside of here. I, I'm being careful with my language because I'm trying to include Ireland. I should just call it Britain and Ireland. I'll just call it Britain and Ireland. So there's 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 some of them that are like, there's like all these regional variations, right? Like you get the sort of concept of rugby and that evolves into the NFL in America, it evolves into Aussie rules in Australia and... Uh, you know, rugby isn't one sport. Rugby's actually two sports, rugby union and rugby league, which is very confusing. Uh, and there's there's other variations as well. But there, there's, there's other ones is what I'm getting at here. So, like, cricket, I feel like everyone's missing out on cricket. Cricket is such a good sport. Uh, but there's also, like, you've heard of football. You've heard of Aussie football. You've heard of American football. But have you heard of Gaelic football? Now, there's a fucking weird one. Like, Gaelic football is, like, this weird mishmash of, like, football, basketball, and rugby, where it's, like, a full contact sport. You're allowed to pick up the ball, but you're only allowed to score with your foot, and you're not allowed to run with the ball past a certain length without the ball touching your foot, so you have to, like, bounce it off of your foot. There's a whole bunch of interesting um, different rules, and it's way uh, faster than normal football. And it's full contact. It's it's a weird, interesting sport. Uh, and then there's also um, one of the most fascinating sports, in my opinion, which is, it's just pretty crazy to watch, which is uh, hurling. I, I don't think most people outside of Ireland even know that hurling exists. There's not really much of a comparison for hurling other than itself. It's just because it's it's kind of a mishmash of all of these different things, right? Like it's full contact, like rugby. Uh, you score in goals, like football. Um, but the big sort of thing about hurling is that the ball is small, and you hit it with a bat, like hockey or or lacrosse or something. And the field is big. The field is like the size of a football field. It's a fucking fascinating sport, and it's it's super cool. Uh, I, I these these sports just fascinate me, like all the ones that didn't become massive, or even even like like Aussie rules football. No one no one plays it outside of Australia, right? Most people probably don't even know that it exists, and that's like this weird kind of like I don't. It's like a bizarre world. Like you what knowing nothing about it, it feels like bizarre world rugby but it's like played on like an oval pitch and uh it's massive as well uh and you have to bounce the ball like basketball 
it's it's a it's a pretty cool sport and you're not allowed to throw it like this is a big thing the rules about throwing in these in these different like in in the NFL you can just chuck the ball whenever as far as far as I understand right honestly I still think that American football is the worst sport ever invented I don't know why anyone watches it but I guess what do I know like in rugby you're only allowed to throw the ball backwards that's an interesting little twist and in Aussie football you're not allowed to throw the ball at all you have to like hit it so you, you there's like an an interesting technique where they like they like hit the ball with a with a closed fist it's, it's just like a unique little thing that doesn't exist in any other sport and then obviously hurling you're not allowed to touch the ball you have to keep the ball on your fucking bat the whole time which is insane like and it's, it's it's crazy cool uh i mean you, you can you can catch it what a what a what a cool sport i i find these these ones that are like the I, I don't know, like, I don't feel like they're any worse, you know, these are sports that are very, very, very popular where they are, you know, rugby is incredibly popular here and in France and stuff like that, uh, hurling is, like, the national sport of Ireland, like, they fucking eat that shit up there, they love it so much, Aussie football is massive in Australia, um, and cricket is fucking massive in the place, in the Commonwealth places that play cricket, and basically unheard of everywhere else which is kind of fascinating to me and what's interesting is right because obviously this all happened because of the british empire but other countries had empires it's just none of them had sports this good <laughs> like none or none of them really care i don't know maybe all the other empires that have exported their culture across the world right like the only other thing i can even think of is american baseball and basketball like basketball is big in sp- Spain and baseball is fucking massive in Japan but I, that's like it no one outside of America and Canada plays American football because it's a fucking trash sport uh so obviously no one does uh but I feel like the, the it's it's like no other empire thought it was a good idea to give your colonies the ability to beat you at your own game and yet Britain just was like, okay, we're going to give you this sport and then you could just like take out your frustration on us by destroying us in everything. And oh boy, the world was very happy to do that. Uh, although the current English cricket team is uh, pretty good as far as I know. Uh, so last time I, last time I watched a, a test match, England literally set a world record for the amount of runs in a test match. So uh, I feel like we're doing pretty well, but I haven't checked up on the cricket in a long time. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how that's going. I don't know why I said that rugby was only popular in France and England. I don't know why I said that. That's obviously not true. Ignore that. One of the best Jan Meesley videos is a video called How Many Super Mario Games Are There? It's a really good video if you haven't seen it. You probably have seen it. I feel like Jan Meesley audience and my audience has probably got a high crossover rate. But I, I feel like I want to do my own... I want to I wanna go through the Super Mario game possibilities and talk about which ones I agree with. A part of the mainline Mario series. Uh, I'm, I'm going just in order of the responses to Jan Meesley's original survey, which is ordered by percentage so we're gonna start with like the most consensus ones and work our way down so is super mario bros obviously yes super mario world yes super mario galaxy yes super mario odyssey yes sunshine yes new super mario bros 2 yes super mario 3d world yes new soup the first one yes super mario land that's the Game Boy one. Is it part of the mainline series? I guess so. It's a terrible game though. <laughs> I've, I've played that and it's not good. Super Mario 64 DS. I've just noticed that Mario 64... Where was Mario 64? Wait, why is the DS version here? Where, where's the original version? Okay, wait, something's wrong here. I knew something was wrong. The list looked weird. Why is DS here but not Mario 64? Okay, that's weird. This is brokey. This is Brokey. Hold on. Every Mario game. List of video games featuring Mario. I think it's fair to say that a game has to feature Mario to count. Uh, Donkey Kong is not a part of it. Donkey Kong Jr., no. The original Mario Bros., no. 
uh, we'll start with Super Mario Bros. Super Mario Bros. Yes. Um, Super Mario Bros. Special. I don't know what that is, but no. And versus Super Mario Bros. No. Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels. I think it is part of the mainline series. Um, none of these. Uh, uh, I am a teacher. Super Mario sweater. No. All Night Nippon Super Mario Bros. No. Uh, Family Computer Golf Japan course. No. Family Computer Golf U.S. course, no. Punch-Out? No. Mike Tyson's Punch-Out? No. Famicom Dr- Grand Prix F1 Race? No. Famicom Grand Prix 2 3D Hot Rally? No. Super Mario Bros. 2, which is the American version. Uh, yes, that is part of the mainline Mario series. Donkey Kong Classics? No. Super Mario Bros. 3? Yes, that is a part of the mainline Mario series. Kaitekita Mario Bros.? No. Baseball, no. Super Mario Land, yes. Alleyway, no. Tetris, no. QX, no. Dr. Mario, no. Punch Out, no. Super Mario World, yes. Super Mario Bros. 4 for the Game & Watch, no. NES Open Tournament Golf, no. Super Mario Bros. and Friends When I Grow Up, no. Mario the Juggler, no, it's a Game & Watch game. Yoshi, no. Mario Teaches Typing, no. Super Scope 6, no. Mario Paint, no. Super Mario Kart, no. That's part of the Mario Kart series, not the mainline Mario series. Super Mario Land 2, 6 Golden Coins. Yes, I think this is part of the, Mar- the mainline Mario series. Yoshi's Cookie, no. Super Mario Race, no. Mario is Missing? No. Mario's Time Machine? No. Super Mario All-Stars? This is just a re-release. I wouldn't count that as a separate game. So no. Yoshi's Safari? No. Mario and Wario? No. Wario Land? Super Mario Land 3? No. I don't think so. I think this is... Even though it says Super Mario Land 3 in the title, I think it's a subheading. I think the fact that it's Wario Land makes it a part of the Wario Land series. Not part of the mainline Mario series. Hotel Mario, no. Donkey Kong for the Game Boy, no. Uh, I'm just going to skip some of these that are really obviously nothing. Super Mario All-Stars plus Super Mario World, no. Uh, Mario Tennis, no. Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island. This is the first one that's a hot take, maybe. I do not think that Super Mario Bros. 2, Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island is a part of the mainline Mario series. I think Yoshi's Island is its own thing, a part of the Yoshi's Island series of games, not a part of the Super Mario mainline series. You don't play as Mario, the art style is very different, I know other games also have art styles that are different, but I feel like that's got to play a part of it. The vibes are different, it just doesn't, it's hard to describe, but it has the vibes, it doesn't have the same vibes. I feel like this is a contentious one though, and it could go either way. But I personally don't think Yoshi's Island is part of the mainline Mario series. I think it's kind of a spin-off. Mario Super Picross. I'm gonna gonna call that a no. Mario Clash for the Virtual Boy. I'm gonna call that a no. Uh, Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. No, that's a part of the Super Mario RPG series. Mario's Time Machine Deluxe. No. Super Mario uh, Mario's Fundamentals. No. Uh, but then Super Mario 64, yes. Donkey Kong Land 2, no. Picross 2, no. Mario Kart 64, no. It's part of the Mario Kart series. Mario Teaches Typing 2, no. Game and Watch Gallery, no. Dr. Mario BS version, no. It's part of the Dr. Mario series. Excite Bite, Bun Bun Mario Battle Stadium, no. BS Mar- Mario Paint, You Sure Nice or Ban, no. Game and Watch Gallery 2, no. 64 de Haken, Tamago- Tomagachi, Tamagotchi, Minat de Tamagotchi World, no. Yoshi Story, no. Wrecking Crew 98, no. Famicom Defective Club, The Girl Who Stands Behind, fucking no. <laughs> what, does this even have Mario in it? What? No. Uh, Mario de Photopi, no. Mario Party, no. Matt's part of the Mario Party franchise, it's a different spin-off. Super Smash Bros. Smash 64? No, it's part of the Smash series. Different thing. Game Watch Gallery 3? No. Super, Mario's, Super Mario Bros. Deluxe? No, it's a re-release. I'm not counting that as its own game, part, a separate part of the series. 
Mario Golf? No, that's part of the Mario Golf series. Donkey Kong 64? No, that's part of the Donkey Kong series. Um, I'm going to skip some that are really obviously have nothing to do with anything. Paper Mario? No, that's part of the Paper Mario series, not the mainline Mario series. Um, uh, duh, 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 just skipping some that are boring because we'll be here forever. Um, Mario Kart Super Circuit? No. Dr. Mario 64? No. Th- those are part of the Dr. Mario and Mario Kart series, respectively. Luigi's Mansion, no, that's part of the Luigi's Mansion series. Super Smash Bros. Melee is part of the Smash series. Animal Crossing is part of the Animal Crossing series. Super Mario World, Super Mario Advance 2. Uh, I don't know about this one. Hmm. Super Mario World, I don't think so. Oh no, this is just a, a re-release of Super Mario World on the Game Boy Advance. So no, it's just a re-release. Sunshine, yes. Sunshine is a part of the mainline Mario series. Yoshi's Island Super Mario Advance 3, that's just a port of Yoshi's Island for the Game Boy Advance. Uh, Mario Party 4, nope, it's part of the Mario Party series, not the mainline Super Mario series. Um, WarioWare Inc. Mega Micro Games, nope, that's part of the WarioWare series. Um, Dobutsu no Mori, oh, that's just uh, Animal Crossing, nope, it's part of the Animal Crossing series. Super Mario Advanced 4, Super Mario Bros. 3 is a port of Super Mario Bros. 3 to the Game Boy Advance, so that's just a port, it doesn't count as its own separate game, not part of the mainline series. Um, Mario Golf, Mario Kart, Mario Party, are all parts of different games, not part of the mainline Mario series. Uh, there are some re-releases, I'm going to skip until we get to something interesting. Um, Super Mario 64 DS. I... You know what? I don't count this as a part of the mainline Mario series, even though I think there's a good argument you could make for it being a separate game that should be counted. Because 64 DS is not... I don't know if you guys know this, but 60 that was my Discord notification, by the way, not yours. Um, 64 DS is a very different game from the original Mario 64. It's It's got a lot of... It's got some of the same levels, but it's also very different in a lot of ways. So I think... Counting it, saying it's just a port is probably a bad argument because it's it's got so many, like a lot of, it has original levels, it has completely reworked boss battles, and it has a whole bunch of other shit that's not in the original Mario 64. Um, there's definitely a part of me that wants to say it's on a handhold so it doesn't count, but that's a bad argument. It just doesn't, it, it feels, it doesn't feel to me like part of the mainline Mario series, and I can't really explain why. It just doesn't feel like it. It feels like kind of a a, a, a gimmicky spin-off, but, but I don't know why. I don't know if I can justify that very well. Maybe because it's bad, or because the controls are bad? I don't know. That doesn't make any sense. It could just be a bad entry. Maybe because Mario is only one character you play, you can't even play as him as the beginning of the game? That's definitely a part of it. Um, but I, I don't personally count this as part of the mainline Mario series. Uh, this feels like a, a part of like a sub sub Mario series, like one of the smaller games that gets released from time to time. Um, you know, it could have been a situation where like Sunshine could have got ported to the 3DS as like a new game with new, st- you know, like it could have been its own thing like the advanced games were. Um, it just is only it's just a spin off series with only one entry. That's that's kind of how I view it. Skipping some of the ones that are really obviously nothing. Um, Super Princess Peach is not a part of the Mario series. That is a part of the Princess Peach series, which is not the same thing. Um, New Super Mario Bros. is a part of the mainline Mario series. Uh, Super Paper Mario is part of the Paper Mario series, not the mainline Super Mario series. Mario Strikers Charge is part of the Mario Strikers series, not the mainline Strikers series. I mean, not the mainline Super Mario series. Mario Party 8 is part of the Mario Party series, not the mainline Mario series. Uh, Super Mario Galaxy is, yes, a part of the mainline Mario series. Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games is not a part of the mainline Mario series. Mario Party DS is not. Smash Brawl is not. Um, Mario Kart Wii is part of the Mario Kart series. Um, Super Mario Sluggers, or Mario Super Sluggers is part of the Mario Super Sluggers series. Not a part of the mainline Mario series. Um... Mario and Luigi Bowser's Inside Story is uh, not a part of the mainline Mario series, it's part of the Mario and Luigi series. Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Winter Games is not a part of the mainline Mario series. 
New Super Mario Bros. Wii is, in my opinion, a part of the Mainline Mario series. Yes. Uh, Super Mario Galaxy 2 is a part of the Mainline Mario series. Uh, Super Mario 3D Land is a part of the Mainline Mario series. Mario and Sonic at the London 2012 Olympic Games is not a part of the Mainline Mario series. Uh, New Super Mario Bros. 2 is a part of the Mainline Mario series. Paper Mario Sticker Star is not, it's part of the Paper Mario series. New Super Mario Bros. U, um, I think I would say it is a part of the Mainline Mario series. Yes. Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon is a part of the Luigi's Mansion series, not a part of the Mainline Mario series. Uh, Super Mario 3D World is a part of the Mainline Mario series. Uh, Yoshi's New Island is not a part of the Mainline Mario series, it's part of the Yoshi's Island series. Uh, Captain Toad Treasure Tracker is is not a part of the Mainline Mario series. Uh, Super Mario Maker is not a part of the Mainline Mario series, it is a part of the Mario Maker series, that is my opinion. Uh, it's part of the, the Mario Maker series is, is not the Mainline series, in my opinion. Uh, continuing, Minecraft Wii U Edition is a part of the Minecraft series, not a part of the Mario series. Um, Super Mario Maker for Nintendo 3DS is part of the Mario Maker series, not a part of the Mar- mainline Super Mario series. Super Mario Run, uh, is the mobile game that Nintendo made that almost no one has played, including me. Uh, and I think, honestly, I, I, I... I don't think I can count it. It doesn't seem to make sense from a cultural standpoint. Like, there's no culture built around Super Mario Run being a part of the mainline Mario series. Um, But, you know, if it had caught on, I think if Mario Run had become super popular, I think you could end up counting it. I think the only reason it's discounted is because it's not, like, it doesn't have a place in the conversation. It It doesn't set the vibe in any way. Uh... It's also mechanically quite different from a lot of the other games, uh, mainly in the fact that, like, your control over Mario is much more limited than in any other Mario game. Uh, Continuing on, uh, Mario Odyssey is a part of the mainline Mario series. Uh, Luigi's Mansion 2018 for the Nintendo 3DS is a part of the Luigi's Mansion series, not a part of the mainline Mario series. Uh, Super Mario... uh, New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe... um, is 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 not not a sequel it is a port of new super mario bros u to the switch so i'm not counting it as a separate game therefore no super mario maker 2 is not a part of the mainline mario series it's a part of the, the mario maker series um continuing on um is super mario 3d all-stars is a bunch of re-releases doesn't count as its own game mario bros 35 is not a part of the mainline series, but I wish they'd bring it back. Um, Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury. I personally count Bowser's Fury as a separate game that is part of the mainline Mario series. This is a contentious subject. I think Mario, I think Bowser's Fury is 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 on its own. Even though you can only buy it in a bundle, I don't think that that means it can't be counted as its own game that is part of the Mario series. Um, And that's it. That's the last one that stands any chance of being a part of it. So please feel free to argue about that in the comments. I don't know, I kind of haven't recorded for this in in ages, in like a week. Because I, I, for some reason, I was like, oh yeah, that one, that's just the one that's all TF2 stuff and nothing else. Uh, And I, I, yeah, so I was like, that's a bit, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. What do you want from me? What do you want from me? What do, you, what do you want from me? Tell me. What do you want from me? I was like, that's just all... That's the one that's all... That's like five hours of Team Fortress 2 ramblings and and nothing else. Uh, but but it, I, I don't know. Maybe it's not just that. Fuck. And I've forgotten what I was going to say. I think... The, oh, I remember. I was going to say the worst discovery. The most hazardous discovery to my own health that I've ever made. So, like, you know how, like... They discovered that if you put lead in in petrol, it stops stops it from stops engine knocking, right? But then that, that turned out to be a very hazardous discovery for for the uh, mental faculties of boomers, which is why they're all fucking retarded because they all have lead poisoning. Don't forget that, by the way. You know, it's easy to forget that. It's easy to forget that um, pretty much everyone born 
before the the 1980s has lead poisoning and suffered lead poisoning growing up which provably has a permanent detrimental effect on your intelligence which is why these people are so so stupid um so there's that but just like th- that generation all got lead poisoning i'm going to get fucking scurvy or something because because dotes might introduce me to this fact that which i already knew in the back of my head but i just never put into practice pasta you know whenever i used to make a pa- make pasta i would always make it with a sauce tomato sort based sauce you know something simple just you know some sort of sauce right but pesto even other things uh, uh, there are there are many kinds uh, but but it turns out that pa- pasta with just just a little drizzle of olive oil a little bit of black pepper and a little bit of grated parmesan on top it still tastes pretty good <laughs> like it's still pretty it's not inedibly plain or or disgusting or anything sure is it as good as pasta with a sauce no but it is is it a whole extra pans worth of washing up and a whole extra fact that you have to attend to the sauce worth it honestly for a lot of times no not really which is a uh, yeah so i'm definitely losing out on on nutrients there because every time i you know most of the time i eat pasta these days I, I don't even fucking bother with a sauce i just i just be i just be raw dog in that shit with just just some olive oil and some some fucking cheese i just be raw dog in that shit and it still tastes pretty good especially if you put msg on it so yeah that was that was a, a discovery that was very detrimental to my health but i eat huel now for like a bit of the meals that i have per day so i'm going to just going to just going to say that i'm i'm probably fine that's that that that's the cheat the world cheat for eating healthy just just have huel um I, yeah you go on the internet and you see you see people getting shit wrong all the time man there's one thing that makes me mad about living in the west and that is you go to you go to asia right you go to asia you ever heard of this place asia you go to singapore you go to japan you go to malaysia you go to china you go to actually korea is kind of an exception uh, but a lot of these countries and people will tell you this isn't true about japan these are people who've never been to japan eating out is so cheap and the food is so good this doesn't exist in the west we have good food you know depending on where you live obviously but like you can you can you can go out to a nice restaurant but that's not the same thing we're talking about you know every fucking corner has like a ramen place or a a a, a gyudon place or a, a soba place and it's the best shit you've ever had right you go to the the shorten guy you get you 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 pop into the random fucking um kaiten sushi joint at the at the local shorten guy and it's 10 times cheaper than a high end than like a, a a decent a decent sushi restaurant in the west right it's 10 times cheaper and 10 times better and these are like the shitty or not necessarily shitty but they're not the high end sushi places right the, these these are like the the common fucking you know what i'm saying motherfucker and this shit's cheap and this shit's good you know ramen ramen shouldn't be expensive you go out for ramen here the shit is crazy expensive for no reason nothing about making ramen is expensive you don't there's no expensive ingredients in i mean it's really simple <laughs> there simply are no expensive ingredients in ramen um it's expensive if you want to make it in the portions you want to make it at home right you don't really want to be making ramen at home uh because you know you have to have a stock and it boils for a long time and so on it's the sort of meal that's best made in bulk right it's a, it's a meal that's designed for restaurants really it's a meal that's practical for restaurants or if you're like serving a large group of people it's not really practical to cook for like one or small groups of people right uh but it's i mean it's just fucking noodles and broth and maybe a, a little bit of fucking meat chase you like pork right like you don't even get much you get like a a little thin slice of pork maybe an egg one egg and then just broth and fucking noodles and they're charging so much money for this shit it's insane it's actually absurd and you go to japan and the shit's just 
they, 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 they may as well be paying you to eat it, you know, it's so cheap and it's everywhere. And this isn't just the case in Japan, you can go to a lot of Asian countries and see the same sort of thing, because people don't have, like, big kitchens in their house, the culture is different. And people will tell you all sorts of different reasons, right? They'll say, like, oh, you know, you, you ask why, the, why is the street food so cheap in Thailand? It's just because Thailand is a cheap country, right? It doesn't explain Japan, it doesn't explain uh, China, you know, lots of big, like Beijing, Shanghai, big cities in fucking China have amazing little restaurants on every corner that's, that are super cheap and that most people go to every day or at least a lot of days rather than cooking, you know, not everyone cooks at home all the time, right? And is it technically cheaper if you were to buy vegetables in bulk and cook for yourself in Japan? It's cheaper, yeah. Or in China or whatever. Yeah, you can, you can always do things cheaper yourself because you don't have to pay for labor costs, of course. But the level of cheaper is not comparable. It's not like, you know, here, it's like, well, you can make a meal yourself for two pounds or you can get the same meal at a restaurant for ten pounds. It's more like, you know, a difference of a dollar or two. Right? It's, it's, it's not even, the, like, comparable to the same sort of thing. And there's all of these people online giving retarded fucking answers as to why this is. Like, I saw someone literally say... Oh, well, the reason restaurants in Japan is cheap is because there's not as much competition. There, what, that is the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard in my life. Firstly, competition would drive prices down, so it doesn't even make any sense from the get-go. And secondly, what the fuck are you talking about? There are restaurants everywhere. I mean, at least in, like, Tokyo and Kyoto and, uh, uh, fucking Nara, where I went, right? Nara had a few, had slightly fewer restaurants, but... Um, you know, I remember there there just restaurants everywhere. Little fucking izakayas, little ramen ramen yasans, kare restaurants, fucking everything, and it's everywhere. And the thing is, they're all like, as far as I could tell, they're not. Some of them are brands. They're a brand. They're a brand ones. But as far as I could tell, most of these were just independent restaurants, right? And they are super cheap. It just doesn't exist in the West. And the, people make up all sorts of excuses. People will make up all sorts of excuses. There's only one answer to this, which is restaurants in the West are ripping you off. That is the fucking answer. They're charging too much. I know how much food costs. It's not rent. You're telling me rent in Tokyo is cheap? Are you nuts? Are you insane? Tokyo has like the highest rent in, in the world. Some of them, right? One, one of the highest rents in the world. And, like, everyone will tell you, oh, yeah, the cost, everything in Japan is really expensive, everything in Tokyo is really expensive. Not compared to fucking London, mate. Like, may, maybe compared to, to bumfuck Ohio or whatever, wherever you're from, where, where like, you know, two people live. Uh, you know, may, may, maybe things are cheaper there. But for a major city, Tokyo's, you know, rent is expensive, but specifically restaurants are cheap as fuck. I mean, you can go to the high-end ones. Obviously, there are going to be high-class, expensive restaurants. That exists everywhere. Um, but, but, but these little, like, ramen places and, and soba places and stuff like this, they're cheap. They're so cheap. And they're so good. I, I'm, I, I'm convinced that it, it's, there's nothing to it beyond greed. Like, <laughs> I don't... If you... I don't understand. I don't understand. Like, you go to... Sometimes restaurants even do this, right? Like, there was a place I found out about in London which is, it was like, it's like an Italian pasta place run by, I don't, I don't even fucking remember, but it's, it's like an Italian place, and it's like a high-class restaurant, this guy's got, like, cred as a chef, and I think the story is that he went to Italy, and he saw how, like, pasta in Italy is, is often, outside of the touristy areas, considered, like, a staple working-class meal, and the pasta dishes that you're paying exorbitant amounts for in fancy restaurants are basically, like, staple working-class meals in Italy. And he came back to... And he was like, I'm gonna make a restaurant where everything's fucking cheap. And this restaurant pops off, and it continues to pop off. Because you, you can go there and get, like, really good pasta dishes for, like, two pounds. Why don't every restaurant just do this? Pasta isn't expensive. You know, I've, I've paid way too much for pasta in restaurants. Pasta is cheap. It's literally just carbs and sauce. I'm, tell, I'm, I'm fucking seething about this, right? All of this fucking shit you get from a restaurant. You go to Subway, you're paying, like, so much for a sandwich. For a fucking sandwich. It's bread. Like, I'm telling you, all of us are getting fucking ripped off at these places. And and, and no, I don't tip. I don't tip, motherfucker. You're from the UK, you shouldn't tip. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. 
That's not something to like even mention. I mean, lots of people tip. I mean, if you're not in a super fancy restaurant, you shouldn't tip. Yeah, I don't tip. Yeah, you should not. Fuck them. Fuck them, motherfuckers. I mean, you straight, me up. you straight up just shouldn't tip, though. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, it's a, it's a good thing to do in the UK. I don't do it. Yeah, that's good. They don't deserve it. They're ripping me off already. They're not taking any more of my fucking money. The fuck is this? You go, you go to Asia, it's so cheap and so good. It's way better. Like, that's the thing. It's not like you're paying for shit quality food because the food you're getting is already poor people food. If you're eating ramen... You know, motherfuckers will go out to a ramen place in, in, in the West, at, 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 like it's some high class fucking shit. What are you, these, these fucking people, I don't, I don't understand, man. I don't fucking get it. Like, what are you paying for? What am I paying for? I'm not paying for anything good. And this is the whole, like, you know, Uber Eats, DoorDash culture has, has made people realize that it's actually fucking retarded to cook for yourself every day, right? Like, most people... I feel like order from those sorts of apps more often these days because cooking is a lot of fucking labor. It's a lot of work that you don't have to do. It simply shouldn't be as expensive as it is to avoid that. It's And I there's no other reason for it than greed, in my opinion. Like, I've seen all of these bullshit explanations. It's not rent because Tokyo has it. It's not the raw price of the ingredients because ramen is going to be cheap no matter where you're making it. Like, it's just noodles and broth and a, a tiny bit of... I already went over this, right? These meals are not expensive. Pasta is going to be cheap no matter where you're making it. As long as you're not doing retarded shit, right? I'm not talking about, like, your your super fancy truffle and A5 Wagyu fucking pasta or whatever. No, I'm, I'm talking about normal shit. It's not expensive. I know because I make it. I cook it. So what's the what's the answer? Is it because labor is way cheaper in Japan? Or in Asia, I'm sure in some places in Asia it's because labor is cheaper. Maybe. But maybe labor can get away from being cheaper because they don't have to spend a million fucking all of their money on food. I don't know. I, 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 what do you think? What do you think? Why, why is you it so expensive? Cook for I, I do. Yeah, it's not a big deal to cook for yourself. I'm mad. I know, but it's not a big deal to just cook for yourself. It's a big deal when I'm lazy. <laughs> 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 have you considered that? I suppose, I yeah. suppose. What if I'm lazy and I don't want to faggot identified? Yeah. I mean, I don't mind cooking for myself. I enjoy cooking from time to time. I just don't want to always cook for myself. And I don't. But I'm paying out the goddamn ass for it every time. Yeah. Why is pizza so expensive? Explain this. No, it's just bread. It's just fucking bread. It's greed. I'm telling you, it's fucking greed. It's these, these fucking corporations stealing our money for no reason. That's why I'm going to open my own restaurant where I serve bread and nothing else. And everything is cheap. <sighs> okay, I should warn you guys. I'm pretty manic right now. For the past, like, three days. Um, so, don't take everything I say seriously. I can't really tell if the things I'm saying make any sense right now. I feel like, why, why, what, what's, what's the deal with poor people? <laughs> What's the deal with poor people? Let me clarify. I got drumsticks. Check out my paradiddles. I don't know if you can hear that or not, but... Drumsticks, bitch. Smoke a dope. Smoke one single tiny gram of dope. And by gram, I mean milligram of dope. <clears throat> anyway, my question is... Okay, so London, right? There is increasingly, you know, in every place around the world, but let's take London as an example, a drive... There's a drive of people flocking to urban centres, right? And leaving the rural parts of the country. Specifically... London, in this situation. Increasingly, more and more people <clears throat> are moving to London. The problem is, uh, there are simply not enough houses for all of these people. And <clears throat> there are a couple of reasons for that. There are, there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, one of the big things is, like, property developers don't have an incentive to build affordable housing. So the government steps in and sort of forces them to build certain amounts of affordable housing. It's like a big thing. Um, they don't like that. They try and get around it. 
it's more profit because because property in London is such a good investment. It makes more sense for developers to build luxury apartments for foreign investors to just buy up on mass and let them accumulate in value than it does to actually build apartments for people to live in. This is obviously retarded, right? But let me give you a something else interesting that I'm thinking about. So obviously, if we think about this from an econ 101 perspective, it kind of makes sense, no? Demand for property in London. Oh, I should clarify some stuff about London, right? So London has a thing called a green belt. Actually, every city in the UK, every major city has a green belt. But London started it, uh, which means there's a certain area around London, which you're not allowed to build in unless you're building a park. There's a there's a big belt around the city that is designated as a green space and you're not allowed to do anything to it. Right. Or at least it's really difficult to get permission to do anything to it, which is honestly one of the best fucking things anyone's ever come up with because it stops urban sprawl. <clears throat> So London can't really expand outwards the way a lot of other cities do. And that's by design. Um, Instead, it's supposed to become more dense, maybe, or something like that, which sort of happens. But as I said, a lot of these mid-rise apartment blocks are being built. Right, I already explained this. Anyway, there's a lot of demand. There's high demand for property in London and low supply, right? Or a a supply that isn't really keeping up with demand. And so prices are going to increase simple as there are also increasingly uh you know there's a higher concentration of wealth in the capital which means um gentrification to put it plainly right um people living in london demand i mean this is i know this is again a hot take a higher standard of living a higher quality of environment around them which is basically what gentrification is right they want luxury brands and all of this nonsense right <clears throat> uh higher end food chains rather than or higher end restaurants rather than lower end fast food shops or whatever the fuck, right? This is, this is the sort of thing that gentrification is. Uh, basically, people, rich people demanding nicer neighborhoods to live in because they're rich, right? Wh- whatever the fuck. The point is, I feel like, wh- why why is this a, a bad thing, <laughs> right? Like, I've, I've, I've seen neighborhoods gentrify and I've seen neighborhoods that don't gentrify. And I'll tell you, I'm happier to live in the gentrified neighborhood than the well my neighborhood isn't gentrified but um what I mean is I've I've been I've I've lived through places in London gentrifying right I've lived through seeing places go from kind of shitty you know rough areas into hipster you know trendy areas and some of that sucks right some of it sucks but in general you know you feel safer it's not, and by the way, I know I was definitely going to be people listening, lefties listening, whatever. You might think this is racist. Let me just clarify. There's no way you can go in London that doesn't have races in it, right? <laughs> There's always, like, white people are the minority in London. There's no, ra- like, a place being more upscale is not like America, where that just means white. It's not the same thing. You, you, you can't go to anywhere in London and not see a bunch of non-white people. That, that, that location in London doesn't exist. And nor is it desirable, in my opinion, right? But it, it's it's entirely a class thing, is what I'm getting at here. <clears throat> uh, the point being, eventually, it's got to get to a point where people who can't afford to live in London just choose to move to rural areas, no? Why is that a bad thing? If London is this financial hub, I mean, sure, there's some level of sort of service jobs and stuff like that, low-level jobs that are going to fund the main... In- or support the main industry but that's not honestly that much you know what i'm saying here what those people really need is food i need people to grow that food you know and the people who grow that food you know there's not enough of in the goddamn country no matter where you live by the way this is true in america it's true in the uk it's true everywhere in the world you go into you 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 go into rural areas you know there's not enough of electricians there's not enough electricians enough plumbers not enough of any of these people right the sort of trades people that are fucking everywhere in a major city are hard to come by in a rural area. There's there's not enough of them. And these are the sorts of jobs that a lot of working class people are having trouble making ends meet with in London. Those same jobs could be extremely valuable in more rural parts of the country. I don't personally understand the logic. I mean, yeah, it's expensive to move. I understand that. But eventually it gets to a point where property in London is so expensive and the cost of living is so expensive 
that it becomes worth it, right? And in that case, isn't that just fine? If you're moving out of the city into a place where your labor is more valued and you can afford to live, like, isn't that just fine? I'm not saying I don't want to, like, oh, all of these disgusting pores need to get out of the city. I don't think that can, would, or should ever happen. But I think there's a level by which there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of concern around something that I don't think is as concerned, is that concerning. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm not seeing something here. But to me, it, it seems like, isn't cities normally where all the rich people hang out? Isn't that normally how it works? And then poorer people end up in the more rural places? Isn't that normal? Also, you know, <clears throat> a lot of these, I don't know, listen, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know about that, but isn't that just how, how it always works? That the, the wealthier people end up in the cities and then, right? Why, why don't, I don't, I don't personally understand it. Or I don't understand why it's a bad thing if that happened. It doesn't seem to be happening. I guess the idea is that all the jobs are in London. But that's all the, like, high-paying expertise-level jobs, right? Not the normal jobs, necessarily. I feel like everyone... Like, there's there's never not going to be a demand for real jobs, no matter where you go. Unless I'm crazy, which I could be. Okay, so I just watched Minority Report, the 2002 movie based on a short story by Philip K. Dick. Um... I feel like when it comes to, I suppose this is a cyberpunk movie, I'm not really sure what to call it. Uh, Maybe you can call it, maybe not cyberpunk, maybe, uh, I don't know what to call it, but whatever it is, it's a movie, (laughs) I'll tell you that much, and uh, it's fine. It has some, there's, it has some pretty glaring issues. I see why it's not talked about very much, because it does have some glaring issues. It has some odd... I mean, the first problem with the movie is that Tom Cruise is very miscast in the main role. I I feel like he does not suit the role of the protagonist of this movie at all. Um, So the bad, bad casting, just just right off the bat. And then uh, the next thing, the movie has some... definitely has some strange pacing issues and some tone issues. Uh, So, as a a big example of the tone issues, there's a lot of stuff that is like, you can't, particularly towards the the sort of front end of the movie, there's there's a few scenes where it's hard to tell if the movie is taking itself seriously or not, because they're very goofy, but I can't tell if they're goofy on purpose, um, which is just a bit odd. And specifically, I'm thinking of uh, spoiler alert for a, a movie from 2002, uh, there's, there's a scene with cops with jetpacks, a big fight between Tom Cruise and a group of cops with jetpacks, and that scene is incredibly fucking goofy, because they're cops with jetpacks, and they're flying around, it's very goofy, and there's stuff in the scene which makes me think it's goofy on purpose, as in they fly into an apartment and then the lady in the apartment is like swatting at them like they're a fly and saying, get get out of my house. It's a very odd scene, but the weight of the scene, like what comes before it, is a fairly, you know, grounded moment where the cops are saying to Tom Cruise, who's their, you know, up until earlier in the day was, you know, knows all of them and works with them. They're saying like, don't do it, like, don't run. Like, please don't run. We don't want to do this, right? You know, so it's kind of like an authentic emotional scene. Followed by fucking, you know, Looney Tunes cops with jetpacks flying around in a house. It's very goofy. And it and then the music the whole time is the same sort of generic intense action music that plays in the other intense action scene. But this one in particular has goofiness built into it. It's very hard to tell whether this is, like, intentionally goofy or unintentionally goofy. Like, am I supposed to be finding this goofy or am I supposed to be taking this seriously? Or, as a secret hidden third option, are they... Did they film the scene seriously, then realize these guys flying around on wires is impossible to take seriously, and then try and undercut themselves with humor so that you could sort of look at it as, like, a campy thing but didn't com- hard commit to it or really pull that off in the rest of the movie it's very strange that scene completely took me out of it 
and it, it kind of lost me. So big miss casting of, and and then there's there's a whole. I mean, all the dialogue in the movie is dog shit. No one speaks like a human being. They all speak in weird stuff. There's times where the movie will exposit something to you, and then ten minutes later it will exposit the same thing to you again, which is very strange. Like the the big reveal at the end of the movie. Spoiler, I, I, I say a second spoiler, but even bigger spoiler alert. There's you know a whole sequence at the end where there's you know Tom Cruise is sort of narrating how the big bad did his murder, right? As like like you would see at the end of a detective movie, right? Where they're like, and then you took him took her to the the lake and lured her out to the lake where you dressed as the same guy, right? Like that. Except we already know all of this because we we were already told this by the other guy, you know, ten minutes ago. We we already know exactly how this happened because we already heard a guy talk about this. So you're just listening to him explain something that you already know, and you ha- and it goes on forever. It's very strange. And then there's other problems with the movie. Pacing wise, the movie is like kind of broken because it's set up with this big ticking clock premise, right? Tom Cruise sees himself murdering someone in the future, and is like, oh fuck, I'm not gonna do a murder. They know the exact time it happens, and there's a ticking clock countdown. The whole movie is set up with this premise of, like, once this clock hits zero, is he gonna do the murder, or is he not gonna do the murder? What's gonna happen when this clock hits zero? And then once that happens, the movie just keeps going, and it feels like all of the entire... nothing mattered. The ticking clock didn't really matter, because he just escapes. Nothing even... The, it doesn't even affect anything, really. I mean, it does. It reveals a very important piece of information, but but it wasn't what it was built up to be, which feels a little strange when you're watching the movie. And everything after that, after the the sort of murder, not murder, Tom Cruise scene thing, feels a bit weird, tacked on, even though that's kind of the meat of the plot, weirdly. There's a lot of fucking weird shit like that, pacing-wise, that kind of messes up a lot of the stuff. And then, you know, there's a... There's some really good stuff in this movie too, don't get me wrong, or some pretty good stuff. But uh, another thing that, again, another goofy-ass scene, where it's like I can't tell if it's supposed to be goofy or not, is is the, the, the weird plant lady. That whole sequence with the weird plant lady, it's like some Harry Potter shit. Like, I don't, that doesn't seem to fit into the world of the movie. It, it completely steps outside of the world of the movie, becomes a, a completely different, becomes a Harry Potter film for a few minutes while that scene happens, and it goes back to being normal. It's very strange, completely tonally disconnected from the rest of the movie. Even, like, the fiction kind of starts breaking down with the, the the weird plants that are, like, moving and shit, and they're all distractingly 2002 CGI. It's very strange. So there's a lot of moments like that where it's, like, something will just be... Like, I can imagine maybe in a, in a, in a book format, this stuff was kind of, you know, psychedelic feeling, right? Like, it was supposed to be kind of trippy. All of the stuff that I'm describing as goofy was maybe supposed to be kind of psychedelic in the book, but they didn't, they didn't go for that angle at all in the movie. I've not, I've not read the short story, um, but, you know, other Philip K. Dick stuff's kind of out there. I'm imagining this, but it just, the, the way they did it in the movie doesn't have any of that abstraction to it. So it doesn't really work, in my opinion. Um, there's also a big, really big, goofy fight scene that I completely forgot about. Holy shit. There's a big, goofy fight scene in a car factory that is incredibly goofy. Like, it's like a car, it's like Tom and Jerry. It's so bad. It's not even, like, 80s fight scene campy coolness. It's just, I was watching it and genuinely thinking, oh, maybe no one talks about this movie because it's, like, for kids. Like I, it feels like a like a kids like something out of a kids film. It feels like a cartoon. It's it's incredibly wacky. <laughs> and it doesn't belong in the movie at all. It doesn't really add anything to the movie. Like they could take that scene out and nothing would be lost. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that shit was about. But then sometimes when it works, it works. Like the entire sequence with the the getting 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 his eyes replaced. The main guy getting his eyes replaced. Like that whole sequence was good in my opinion. Um. And, you know, there's, there's other good sequences. It's not that the whole movie's dog shit. It's just a bunch of, like, individually pretty interesting sci-fi ideas 
that are basically strung together with sort of a shoestring plot with a pretty clever twist, don't get me wrong. The twist is cool. It relies on, I mean, there's definitely some stuff in the fiction, like in the, the mechanics of how how it even works. It's like, they say they don't read in, like they, they set up, because right at the beginning when they introduce this pre-crime concept, they're trying to, you know, you're going to instantly think about a bunch of reasons why it doesn't make any sense. And so they're trying to address those all right at the beginning. Like, what if you just think about how you really want to kill your boss, but you never go and do it? And then it's like, oh, well, they're not reading about intentions. They're looking into the future and seeing what actually happens. So it doesn't matter. But then there's multiple situations where someone killed someone and the precogs didn't know or care. So it's like, is it about intention or is it about what actually happened? To what level is free will involved here or not? It's like, I just want... Either you'll tell, like, I would much rather the movie just be like, nope, free will is nonsense. Because if it's not going to do that, then the premise doesn't make any sense. It's trying to have its cake and eat it too. It's trying to be like, ooh, let's make you think about free will. But in the reality, there's no doubt. The characters very clearly have free will. Like, in every scenario where it's questioned, it's always the answer is, yes, the characters have free will. So what the fuck is even the point? In which case, the, what power do the precogs even have? just what they just know when someone might murder someone like what what the fuck which i guess is the point that like that's why it gets shut down because it turns out it's not accurate and it was just a lie but it it did actually work it did stop all the murders this is very strange it's a very i mean look that's fine they just they just vibe it out to when a murder might happen but all of the the, the pre-crime cops have been arresting every single time on the assumption that that it meant it was certain to happen, but it's actually not certain to happen. I guess is the point. Which is kind of, I don't know, it's kind of lame, <laughs> in my opinion. It's kind of like, what, what do they even do? What are, it's not even that impressive in that case. Um, yeah, I don't know. More things, more things. Yeah, there's some, there's some good scenes, you know. There's, there's a bunch of really bad acting in this movie, from Tom Cruise especially. Also from a bunch of secondary characters. Just run in the movie. Oh, he runs. He runs. He runs a lot. Does he do the Tom Cruise run? Does I think I think there's there's I remember <laughs> at least one scene of him doing the Tom Cruise run. Nice. Yeah, he does That's do it. Run from it. But he's it it doesn't even uh, yeah I guess so. Tom Cruise can't play a drug addict. He's too clean. He's too squeaky clean as a guy. Also, what is the what is the bloom effect in this movie? The bloom effect in this movie is insane. Like, I know it was 2002 and they just discovered computers, but damn, chill. That has not aged well. Surprisingly, you know, a lot of the, the CG has aged, you know, is possible. Some of it's really bad, but most of it is, like, surprisingly good for 2002, um, which I guess is impressive. Yeah, what a weird fucking movie. It, it also kind of feels like they set up this world to be pretty different from our world right like the way the entire cities are designed very differently and there was all of these sort of cyberpunk apartment blocks and stuff like that but and, and the, the main police headquarters is all designed with a very futuristic architecture but then halfway through the movie i guess they just give up and things are just happening in like normal everyday places that you would like just normal the real world stuff places it's a little odd especially towards the end the, yeah, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of stuff like that. A lot of weird stuff that doesn't really gel together very well. But, you know, I I still think it's a fun movie. Like, I'm shitting on it, but I think there's a lot of interest... Like, there are interesting sci-fi concepts. The, the main twist works really well, but it doesn't work really well, but that's because of the movie is badly paced. Because they expose it, the twist, twice. They reveal the twist twice. They reveal it, and then they, they go away for a bit, and then they reveal it again as if you never heard about it in the first place. Which doesn't make any fucking sense. It kind of completely ruins the pacing. But, like, the concept of the twist work is clever, is what I'm saying. The concept is clever. The execution is bad. The concept of the the the, the final results are, are interesting. Um, there's a lot of interest. That's basically what the movie is. It's a bunch of interesting concepts, I guess, you know, created by arguably the best sci-fi writer ever, just being kind of mashed together by a bunch of, by Tom Cruise. And the people who would make a movie starring Tom Cruise. That's Minority Report. You want to get black pilled? Come, come over here. Come closer. I'm gonna black pill. We're gonna we're gonna do a black pill. And what's crazy is 
The black pea fully heard many times, and didn't even realize what it was saying. Um, so the the you may have heard lefties, progressive types talking about a lot of historical examples of sort of societies which had progressive attitudes towards various minority groups. You know whether or not what they're saying is accurate or gives the full picture. Let's let's put that aside. And just take it at face value, right? So, like, they might bring up the ancient Greeks for homosexuality. They might mention the treatment of disabled people uh, in uh, like early civilization or even pre-agricultural times. And they might mention, you know, various indigenous groups around the world which have had very different, uh, much you know, more egalitarian attitudes towards women. For example, in in various Native American societies and other indigenous societies of you know, or they might mention uh, traditional uh, again indigenous societies which had uh, different gender categories like transgender or non-binary categories um, and and sort of you know sort of. Uh, I don't want to say I'm, I'm, my brain's trying to say rights, but but rights isn't the right word. But I, I guess we can just substitute rights and you know rights for those people. Basically, they had a, a place in society. They 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 weren't you know massively oppressed. And they point to this this as like this positive example to sort of lend credence to their argument, right? Like this is an insane look. There's all of these historical examples of all of these things existing, right? The black pill built into this is that this means these things can be taken away. This negates progressivism. It it completely counteracts their entire narrative, which is that, like, humanity progresses in this straight line where everything goes up and is, and gets better. It negates this, this idea of progressivism completely. Because what it's saying is, in the past, things for gay people were fine, and then at some point, they weren't anymore. And then for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, they were, they, for thousands of, you know, they were fucking terrible until recently. And it all came basically because one empire collapsed. What are you arguing? You're saying that no matter how much pro- progress you make in the US or in the West, uh, in terms of progressive policies, this doesn't mean shit <laughs> in the long term. And it can all be undone just as easily as it can be done. Because here are all of these historical examples, and yet none of those cultures still exist, or some of them do, but only in small pockets. It's a a bit of a black pill. Okay, here's my plan. Here's my plan. I'm going to get some food, and then I'm gonna watch Fight Club. I haven't watched Fight Club since I was a teenager, since I was like 14. And when I, it was the first, I'll tell you, right, the first film I watched that gave, left me with a sense of not just being entertained, but that I had just seen something important, was a film called The Artist. I saw it in cinemas when it came out, um, which was, uh, in 2011, and it's a good film. It won, uh, it won a bunch of awards, and it's about the, the end of the, the silent film era, and it yeah it's it's pretty good it's a cool I mean yeah but that was the first film that I left it and I was like oh that's what cinema is. like that's that's what a good film that was the first good film I'd, I'd ever seen and so you know me and my friend from school at the time sort of a few years later started to vaguely get into film now obviously young Sai had been into film at this point, right, his, he, he had already gone way past me, right, he's still way past me, he'll talk, he, he, you know, he's a, a cinephile genius who knows everything there is to know about movies, uh, but, at the, you know, I was a fucking 13, 14 year old, whatever, and me and my, my school friend at the time were trying to get into some of the, the movies, you know, and I remember we watched, we watched Fight Club, we watched Pulp Fiction, and we thought those were the two greatest movies ever made. And so we just watched, like, both of us independently had just watched those movies, like, a few times because we thought they were really good. And then we also 
watched the Blair Witch Project and were kind of unimpressed. And then this was also the beginning of my being a hater on, on The Shining. We also both watched The Shining and neither of us liked it at all. We both found it really boring and not scary. And I continue to hold that opinion about The Shining, uh, which maybe shows a lack of... I mean, I no longer think that Pulp Fiction and Fight Club are the best movies ever made. Uh, <laughs> the, I'll tell you that much. Uh, I mean, they're, I'm, uh, they're good movies, don't get me wrong. But, uh, yeah. So I haven't rewatched Fight Club since then, since the, it was literally one of the first, like, good movies I'd ever seen. Uh... I, I don't remember the, the other ones that I was watching at the time, but it'll be interesting to see how how my attitude to the film has changed being an adult now who's watched a lot more movies, um, including other... Da- it's, it's David Fincher, right? Uh, other David Fincher movies. I think I've watched other David... What other movies does he has he made? Uh, where's the filmography? Alien 3? Haven't seen that. I've seen 7... Uh, I've seen The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, which was not that good, to be honest. I've seen Gone Girl, um, and I've seen Fight Club. I haven't seen so- Zodiac, I-, I think. I should watch Zodiac. That's probably a good movie. Uh, I think everyone hates Alien 3, though, right? How the fuck did he get work after that? I guess Seven's a pretty good film, so... But Seven's a pretty big-budget film. Weird. I guess they took a risk on him. Yeah, Seven's, Seven's pretty decent. Uh... The Game. What's The Game? I've never heard of this before. Seems interesting. People say it's underrated. I'll have to check out The Game. It seems interesting. What? Is... Maybe I should watch this instead of Fight Club. I could watch both. Back to back, The Game and then Fight Club. Let's do that. I'll get some food and then I'll watch The Game and then I'll watch Fight Club. It seems interesting. I should say, with regards to Finch's other films, uh, I thought The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo was kind of whack. It had some good memorable moments, but overall I thought it kind of, um, sucked. <laughs> uh, fuck, I'm forgetting the exact reasons why. I I think I might have even talked about it in one of these podcasts or something. I, I feel like I might have talked about it at some point on this channel. But yeah, I, I was, I was on like a mystery film bent for a while and I watched, I watched The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. I, yeah, there were some good bits, I thought, but... Okay, I'm not going to try and remember what the fuck happens in that film. It was very, it, well, that goes to show it wasn't very memorable. I also watched Gone Girl and also thought it was pretty mid. <laughs> like, I know a lot of people really like Gone Girl for some reason. I think, like, people think Ben Affleck's performance is really good or something. Honestly, the movie didn't really speak to me very much or it just sort of just passed me by. <laughs> I, was, I was watching it and it just sort of, like, it all happened. And and there were I experienced very few emotions or connections during the movie. It just sort of happened at me, and then I, when it was over, I was just like, "Huh," you know. It wasn't. Yeah, I I, I don't know why people. I mean, may, maybe people are seeing something in the movie that I'm not, but I I didn't think it was particularly good. But anyway, I'm now gonna watch the game. Okay, so I watched the game, and um, you know, I've got a. I'm gonna tell you what what David Fincher himself said about it uh my wife was right we didn't figure out the third act and it was my fault because i thought you could just keep your foot on the throttle and it would be liberating and funny uh yeah i gotta agree with that except i feel like they didn't figure out any of the acts like it's a it's very well made i mean it's david fincher so like from a technical standpoint it's it's good it's solid all around there's some there's some really good sequences And it does manage to maintain suspense effectively in lots of different ways. Um, And secondly, I want to say that the the lead actor, who is it? Whoever the fucking, is it it Michael Douglas? He's great. He's great, right? He fits the role perfectly. He acts, I mean, his performance is amazing. It has to be to carry the movie, and it does. However, um, uh, I think that the movie itself is maybe not underrated and forgotten for no reason. Uh, there are some pretty glaring issues with the film. Um, and I, This is a movie where I feel like spoilers are pretty important because it does have kind of a twist ending. It's kind of a got a central mystery to the plot. So uh, I don't know if I re- necessarily recommend the film, but I'm just going to give you fair warning that I'm 
probably going to spoil the ending in talking about it. Um, I think the movie just left me overall feeling pretty unsatisfied, uh, mainly because there's a sort of there's a sort of twist ending. But the problem is that going into the twist, there's only two options. Through the whole movie, there's only two options. It's kind of like Total Recall, right? And to- Total Recall is a fucking amazing film, right? And with that, you're constantly asking yourself, or, well, not really, right? I mean, I feel like anyone who watches Total Recall knows the whole thing is just like the implanted memory simulation thing. Uh, but like... You're also kind of asking yourself, like, is it? Is it real? What's what's real about it? What's not real? Like, and you're kind of flitting back and forth between, like, is is Arnold Schwarzenegger just having a, a, a whatever the fuck it is? I forget what they call it in the movie. Is he just freaking out in the recall machine? Or is this really happening? And you, you it kind of pushes you either way, and you're not sure. In this movie... There's, to me at least, the parts that are supposed to be like that, there are some moments where it's really effective, but it, at, at being creepy, of like a you can't trust anything kind of vibe, it's effective at that, but also, it's never in any doubt that you can't trust anything. Like, there's not any moments where you're like, so for example, I think I think one of the big like shit gets real moments is when the main character gets fired on, when when a bunch of people with, with guns show up and start shooting at him. Except to me, it's just, it was really obvious that they weren't going to be real guns. Like, it it never, I, there was never a moment when I was like, oh, and now there's like some grand conspiracy. Because the problem is, if it was true that, that it wasn't part of the game, it would be a boring movie. And then you get to the end, and the ending is another, like, thing happens, but is this thing part of the game, or is it actually real and the problem is that no matter what the answer is it doesn't actually matter it it doesn't matter i don't care either way <laughs> whether it's part of the game or whether it's real at this point i just want the movie to be over and then you know the ending it, it ends on this sort of happy note and i'm just sort of left there like i guess the main character has sort of you know grown from the experience right you see he's had sort of a, he he does something at the end of the movie that he wouldn't have done at the start of the movie and he sort of appreciates life in a new way. But also, he's literally a, a, a like, multi-millionaire. Like, he says he has, like, 700 million in his bank account, in his Swiss bank account. He's not doing badly. It's not like I feel sorry for him at the beginning of the movie, and I'm like, oh, this is a, a guy that really needs to get his life together, or whatever. No, like, I don't, I, it's hard for me to feel bad. It's, it doesn't feel like a particularly satisfying character arc, Especially because there wasn't an arc. He just he just he just went through sh- the hell. <laughs> like that's literally it. Like he didn't. It's not like you know, in, in a, a in another sort of story that might be like this, where like a, a a random guy is pulled into an extraordinary circumstance and has to survive and figure his way out. It's like you'd watch the movie and he'd start off being sort of like dragged along, not really knowing what was going on, being incompetent. And as the movie would go on, you'd see that he started to take charge more. And then by the end, he could have some sort of, you know, heroic thing, maybe. Or like, you know, have some like agency. But in this, the whole point is that he never had any agency. All that happens is he snaps. He just just goes a little nuts. But he like, he already was kind of going, he was kind of a... It doesn't. It's not like oh, a kind, a kind soul driven to, to anger and violence. Because he was already a, a a fucking grumpy guy who was like mean and rude to everyone all the time. Because he's a fucking rich cunt. So it's it's not really that crazy that he would you know be grumpy and angry when people fuck with him a lot. He he's grumpy and angry basically like really early in the movie. You know he's he's fucking. Like, like, there's a scene where his briefcase won't open, and then he, he there's, you know, you see a shot of him sort of, like, fucking smashing the briefcase against the wall and, and like, kicking it in anger because it didn't open to get a document out. And it's like, this is, of course, this, so you've demonstrated right near the front of the movie that this guy's gonna get mad. So, of course, he's gonna get mad. I don't know, man. The movie felt pointless. It just felt pointless. Like, what, what am I supposed to take away from this? What life lesson am I supposed to take away from this? I don't understand, it's, it, it, it's a very odd film, it didn't, 
I mean, the, 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 the sense of paranoia is, is effective, right? There are scenes where, like, there's a scene where he goes into a house and it turns out the whole house is like a, a setup, right? Like, like it, there's, if he looks around closer and there's nothing in the fridge and the bookcases are just fake and stuff is empty and stuff, and it, it was all just set up for him. And that's like a pretty effective scene, in my opinion. But until it kind of, I don't know, I don't know, man. I never bought for us. Sp- there was never a second in my mind where I was like, ah, yes, that that reveal that this was all just to steal his money must be true. Like, I never I never fucking bought that for a second. I, I don't know if you're supposed to buy it, but it seems like really obviously fake because that would be a, just because that would be a boring story. Like, I know they wouldn't write a movie like that. That would just suck as a movie. Um, yeah, I don't know. He gets he gets fucking like you know, left for dead in the middle of Mexico, for what? He's there, and then he just comes back to the US. It's like, what purpose did that even, nothing even, it didn't even really matter that that happened to him. I mean, maybe it did. I guess maybe you could argue that he had to sell his his dad's watch, and maybe that symbolizes him moving on from his dad's death. And that's what that scene is for, which I guess maybe that is, it's a pretty ob- obtuse way of going about, like, I, I guess that is kind of, interesting if that's what they were going for i'm not sure there's also like i feel like a lot of pretty there's there's a lot of stuff in the movie that is very hand wavy kind of like you're supposed to not think about it but i can't help but think about it well it's like um i don't know there's 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 a whole load of stuff where it's just sort of like well how did they know he was going to do that in order to set this up like, how did they, how did they know that he was going to go to this place at this time, exactly? How did they know that, like, like, how did they break into his house? How did they, I mean, that one's not that crazy, but, like, there's a lot of stuff where it's, like, these guys just, the, the company that is doing the game just seems to basically be omnipotent and all-powerful and able to set up anything of any magnitude without, with no, like, nothing is even hard for them to, you know, they just can do anything. Which doesn't really, I don't know, it's a bit odd. Like, I mean, even right at the end of the movie, big spoiler alert, when he jumps off the building, he's on the roof of a building with four sides he could jump off of. How did they know he was going to choose that the, the exact middle of that exact side where the crash mat is? It doesn't make any sense. Like, there's no, you can't predict that. How did they know that he was, like, it's, it's kind of silly to, like, it's like Sherlock season three level of silly how how could you possibly know that he's gonna choose this very precise spot to jump off of the building he lands directly on the the middle of the crash mat it doesn't make any goddamn sense they didn't even check off the gun there was a gun in the movie that wasn't check offed it just shows up that's a, that, like a literal gun that's a weird one yeah, I don't know, that movie was kind of frustrating, because it's not like, the, the one of the big things that annoyed me about it is, is oftentimes, you know, in movies where there's going to be a central mystery, what keeps you watching is that you're kind of being drip-fed clues, right? But in this movie, you're not drip-fed clues, just, shit just keeps happening, and you never really know what the fuck is going on, until the very end, when suddenly the movie is, like, And now you must make a decision in your head. Which one do you believe? Do you think that this is really happening? Or do you think this is a part of the game? And you're like, I don't care at this point. Just get me out of the fucking movie. (laughs) Yeah, I can see why this one isn't as well remembered as some of David Finch's others. Uh, Yeah, I, I think the scene where... I think this is something that's supposed to be like... Like a something you catch on a rewatch maybe, but it's just really obvious is when 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 Christine tells the main guy all his bank accounts have been drained. So he calls up his attorney and his attorney is like, no, nope, they're actually not drained, they're fine. And then she's like, he's in on it. He must be in on it. It's really obvious that it's the other way around. Like it's so ob like, why would he be in on it and not the fucking lady who's clearly in on it and has been in on it in the past? There's a whole bunch of little plot holes like that, where it's like, I think the movie thinks that this is going to fool me, or is going to even be a a, a misdirect in any way, but it's just meaningless. There's never any doubt in your mind that everything is part of the game, because otherwise it would 
wouldn't make any sense, and it would be a shitty movie that was stupid. And then, by the end of it, nothing even mattered. There were no stakes. The movie has no stakes, because the main character isn't someone you want to root for, and I and he doesn't even really get better as a person. He just gets sort of mind broken. He just snaps. He just he just is pushed to the edge until he like kills himself. And that's the, the, the character arc for him is he gets to do that so that he can appreciate life or something. And then he's like more outgoing now because he's had to go through suffering. And then the ending happens way like the the post crash mat scene is just over in a fucking blink. It's just like, and all of his friends were there, and everyone clapped, and everyone is just, everything's just okay, none of it had any real consequence at all, because it was all just a game, and all of his friends are all just like, I don't really understand what's happening, but your taste in champagne is exquisite as usual, and you're just like, I don't fucking care about his millionaire friends, I don't care about any of this. Yeah, that was not a very good movie, I'm gonna be real with you, not a very good movie. I don't, I don't know why, Rod, I mean, Roger Ebert's fucking retarded. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know about that one. I don't know about that one, buddy. I think especially the third act is bad, but, but it's mainly bad because it, it, like, it's, it's preceded by nothing. Like, the entire movie is built on having a good third act that is satisfying and, like, intellectually interesting. So, like, you, the only reason you're even watching the rest of the movie is so that you can get to that bit. But then it drags on for so long without giving you any sort of break, any dubs for the audience, and then rushes through the ending so fast and so in such an absurd way that like stopping to think about it for two seconds breaks the entire pl- like premise. It doesn't make any goddamn. It doesn't make any sense. It's bad. I think this is just a bad movie. I think it's a a, a well directed, well acted bad movie. Okay, so after yesterday being not particularly impressed with the game um <clears throat> today we're gonna watch fight club maybe i should just watch every david fincher movie maybe that will be my my uh little project let's see i don't know why i'm checking again i already looked this up yesterday uh where, where's fucking wikipedia there we go uh because it's not too many right it's it like i'm not gonna watch alien 3 because who cares but I, I'm happy, I'm down to rewatch Seven, I watched the game, I watched Fight Club. Panic Room, is this any good? I'm definitely down to watch Zodiac and the Curious Case of Benjamin Button. I'm hella down uh, to do that. Apparently people, people like Panic Room. Looking, oh, who fucking cares, I'm getting ahead of myself. It's time to watch Fight Club and see if it holds up. So I just watched Fight Club. This is a good movie. You know what, it's a good film. It's definitely, uh, you know what, I need a little bit of time to, to mull on it. I don't know if I can, because I literally just, it, one, one single frame perfect input flipped over to start Audacity, so I'm gonna, okay, I, I let it mull in my brain for a little bit. It's a good, it's a good movie, I gotta say, it's a good movie. Um, I don't need to tell you about Fight Club being a good movie, you already know that. As for, like, how it, how it weighs up against my memory... I honestly kind of forgot the whole, like, first act of the movie. Like, I, I kind of forgot everything up until Tyler Durden shows up. Um, so that was a surprise, I guess. It was cool. That, that stuff's neat. Um, I think there's a bunch of really clever stuff the film does, obviously. It does a lot of sort of meta stuff. I think, you know what, I, I actually caught something in this rewatch that I've never caught before. Which is, the movie has, like, a cold open and then a flashback, right? Like, it opens up with the lead character with a gun in his mouth, right? And then the Tyler's like, do you have anything to say? And he's like, oh, roll, 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 because he has a gun in his mouth. And then he pulls the gun out, and he says, I can't really think of anything. But then, and then it's like, you know, freeze frame. You're probably wondering how I got into this situation, <laughs> you know, like, rewinds back. And then by the time you get back to that beginning scene at the end of the movie... When he pulls the gun out of his mouth, he, he says, I still can't think of anything. And then Tyler says, oh, flashback humor. I never caught that before. That's a pretty clever little thing. I like that. I like that little detail. That's fun. Um, you know, I think the movie would definitely play very differently these days compared to 1999. The big 
thing being that a good chunk of the movie is sort of dedicated to critiquing consumerism, or rather, like, you know, there's a lot of sort of elements I think you're supposed to relate to, of being sort of a young male who is sort of you know like buying stuff from IKEA. You buy shit you don't need with money you don't have or whatever the fuck, right? You. You still haven't watched the Joker. No, I haven't watched it yet. That's that's kind of. That's just like that same concept, except played into the modern culture of like media and shit. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because I was gonna say, it's like the difference is that this is like for the millennial generation, right? When they were like sort of young adults or whatever, in the uh, office jobs, like the office lingo is different. Like modern office lingo has changed a lot in the past twenty odd years, right? Like if it was made today. It wouldn't. It it would be very different. The whole office environment. It might even be better because it's it's like all the people who watched Fight Club and were like, "Well, we're not like this. We're gonna be a family. We're gonna make an open concept office." Yeah, an open open concept office where we're a family and you you have no privacy. Yeah, um, and we do tech mumbo jumbo or whatever. But um, anyway, what I was gonna say is this: the sort of consumerism, the shit you own ends up owning you, right? I feel like it doesn't hit anymore because none of the Zoomers have any money. <laughs> like all the, all of this, these problems that the millennials had in the nineties, right? Where it's like, oh, I have this like random fucking apartment, and then I just buy shit because I have nothing else to fucking do with my life. I just work, and then I just buy shit, and I work for no real reason, so I just may as well buy shit, right? That doesn't even exist anymore because no one has enough. The, <laughs> Wages are still the same as they were in 1999, and no no one can afford to just buy shit anymore. So I I feel like that that is like a pretty stark difference. Uh, you know, I think it's a it's a pretty big shift in the the culture. I guess it just goes to show that you're kind of fucked either way. You're fucked if you're buying shit you don't need, but you're also fucked if you're completely broke and can't even afford to buy shit you don't need. You know. But I, I don't know, the movie, yeah, it's just kind of the detail of when the movie was made compared to now that I think is a little not- notable, maybe, as, like, the differences between the, the crisis of masculinity in the, the millennial generation versus in the Zuma generation. You should fucking finally watch The Joker. I'll watch The Joker at some point. I, I want to watch it back-to-back with The King of Comedy, because they're basically the same movie as I've heard. Yeah, it's just a bunch of Scorsese movies in a trench coat. Yeah. Yeah. King of Comedy is a Scorsese movie. Yeah. About the Joker. About the Joker. The jokester. The jokester. I'm the jokester, baby. Yeah, everyone says the movie's about masculinity, and it it is, definitely. Obviously, I didn't catch this when I was a, a dumb teenager, but have since come to understand the cultural significance of it. You know right. what we need to do? We need, we need a fight club for femininity for women who have violence inside them. Stop. <laughs> All you talk about is beating women. You don't think about anything else. It's the only thing you ever think about or talk about is beating women. Yeah, I need a fight club. Right. Yeah. Tough. No women allowed. That's the We rules. need a fight club for women. Start one. Let's start a fight club. I'm not starting a fight club. I don't want to. No, I'm saying I'm going to start a fight club. Okay. I'm going to do it. Good luck. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um... <clears throat> Yeah, I think there's a pretty, again, another thing that is, I think, culturally different from when this, because the movie's in a weird place, right? Being 20 years ago, it's like before social media and like a lot of stuff that changed, and like the, 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 my general, the Zoomers, right? Like it's the last sort of big breath of the millennials, in my opinion, or maybe the first of the last breaths of the millennials, but as culture creators, I mean. But it's still close enough, right? Because it's it's right at the end. It's it's close enough that it's like very comparable to the current situation in the world. Wait, won't as well. that be fucking Gen X, not millennials? Is it Gen X? Wait, wait. Millennial. Like, when did millennials become like twenty-ish, like our age? Two thousand five. Is nineteen ninety-nine? So maybe it's like the beginning of that. I think it's. I think that's just like the tail end of Gen X. I don't think it's the tail end of Gen I X. I think it's literally the last Gen X thing. Maybe it's the last Gen X. I guess it does end with the Pixies. The Pixies are the Gen X band. Yeah. But I feel like it might be targeted at people younger than the main characters. I think. I think it, maybe it's just kind of both. Yeah, I think like if you're talking about like 
The last millennial fucking things. That was like the Dark Knight or whatever. Or something like that. I don't think that's the same thing at all. Yeah, but, but you, you know what I'm saying is like, I, millennials don't really have pro shit. That's the entire reason why G, like Gen Z is like, oh, we're, we're going to fucking get piercings at 10 years old. It's because millennials didn't do anything raw. What What are you talking about? You know Zoomers. I'm aware of them. They be getting, I like, am them. They be getting like their noses pierced at 10 years old. Everyone's done that for all of history. No, millennials didn't do it. Millennials didn't do Millennials definitely raw. did raw shit. They didn't do raw they shit. They definitely That's why did raw like shit. This. What do they like? They're like... You're, you're like stereotype of a 30-year-old is just a millennial. Yeah, that's a millennial. Yeah. Yeah. They like, don't do raw shit. But they've stopped that now. they figured out that it's cringe and they're getting... They're either too old to do it or... I don't know. They're weird. Yeah. Well, but they weird. don't do raw shit. That's why Zoomers are like we are. No, Zoomers don't do raw shit. Zoomers don't, don't do even s- have a concept of raw shit. We don't do raw shit that matters. Z- we Zoomers do, we just do superfluous No, actually, shit. you know what? You're the epitome of Zoomers. Zoomers lie in bed with a screen and say, man, I wish I was more fucking raw. I'm pretty raw. Yep. I'm literally an MMO addict who's getting fucking abused by the game. That is that is pretty raw. Yeah. Yeah. I can't not be raw. I'm broken addicted to an MMO and the need. I mean, the difference is... But the, the only difference between you and a millennial is that you're transgender. No, not really. That's the only difference, the only significant difference. No, like, millennial, like, all the millennials who, like, I interact with who play RuneScape who are, like, at the young end of millennials, essentially. They're, like, 27 to, like, 33 or something, somewhere around there. Like, none of them are, like, degenerates the same way that Zoomers are. Are, are Zoomers even degenerates? Zoomers are, like, so fucking pathetic and hopeless. I guess so, but I don't really, I feel like Zoomers are very, like... Zoomers are very politically active, you know, they're doing a lot of activism. They do it, they, they, and they, they don't really even have a concept of, like, anything. Like, they just, you know, scroll TikTok or whatever and do, do, do Fortnite dances or whatever the fuck. And take meth. And take meth. And get I don't know, I don't even think they do that. I think that's the millennials. I don't think Zoomers are interested in drugs. No, the like, Zoomers, that was Zoomers like, like, every single Zoomer I've met who's, like, a pathetic, degenerate MMO person... Has had the drug problem, like with all your stims. Yeah, like but that was way. like there was a there was a that that was like the 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 low peep era. There was like that sort of era where everyone was doing Xanax and shit. Yeah. And then it just kind of got boring, I think, or, or everyone just moved on from that. No one does that anymore. Yeah. I don't even understand. I don't know what people do. I have no. Why are we talking about this? We literally sit in our room all day. We don't interact with culture and we're about we're trying to define generations. Yeah, but millennials didn't do anything raw. I don't know if that's even true. The most raw you could be while being a millennial was like a That's not true. Fan. You know who you know who is fucking millennials? Who? All the motherfuckers of the old school 4chan shit. Those that's were true, all millennials. That's true. You're right. I I forgot. Yeah. All of the hacktivist stuff was all yeah. millennials. You know who did the Arab Spring? Millennials. Yeah, they kind of fucked up with that one, to that be honest. That was kind of raw. That was kind, that of, was kind of raw. You have to admit it. Yeah. All the fortune... The fortune millennials are the only millennials who did raw shit. Occupy? Was Occupy raw? No. Occupy wasn't raw? Occupy wasn't raw. It was completely undirected. And it was just like a... Essentially like a fucking... NGO corpo type thing. You think it was NGO corpo type thing? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I feel like it became an NGO corpo. But I don't see, think it see, this is this is how NGO. This is how it went... Millennial shit posters here to years two thousand and seven, to posting beheading videos online, and then we all grew up with that. Yeah. 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 So we, the Zoomers, we absorbed the rawness of the rawest millennials. I feel like only we absorbed that though. I feel like. I guess I've seen there's a TikTok trend. Yeah, I've se- I'm aware of these things. I'm aware of TikTok trends. Loser. I I, I want to kill myself. I don't like. I, I don't. It's not my choice to be here. Okay. Uh-huh. I didn't choose to be born. <laughs> I was forced into this world. Okay. And now you know TikTok trends. Yeah, and now I know TikTok trends. We should start a podcast. You know, I feel like this. <laughs> we have a good dynamic going Yeah. And what, what's the TikTok trend? So there's a TikTok trend where of like um, uh, <coughs> like uh, actor uh, uh, pretending to be shot in the head, and then they do like a. Oh no! I've been, you know, like uh, yeah. like how, how it would be in a movie, and then like, uh, 
people who grew up with uh, unfettered internet access and then doing the the real thing you do when you get shot in the head where you just sort of like you know you've yeah. seen you've seen the videos right no, I haven't. you've never seen someone getting shot in the head oh i have seen people getting shot in the head i haven't seen people trying to VK. oh no no yeah. like like you know how if you're like standing up and you get shot in the head you just sort of like your knees buckle and you go like Whoa. yeah you know and then like kind of like yeah yeah uh, the, the podcast can't see it but you, you're listening to this, okay? You won't, you've all seen live leak shit. You know what yeah. I'm talking about. Like, that's a TikTok trend. I see. That's good enough. Enough people know what it looks like for someone get to get shot in the head that that's yeah. become a trend. So that's why Zoomers are raw. But I feel like Zoomers aren't even, like, raw. You can say that Zoomers <laughs> are raw and superfluous space, but you can't say that Zoomers aren't raw. That's my I think. The problem is that we've talked about rawness, you and I, too <laughs> much to the point where I don't even know what it means anymore. A Japanese salaryman. Yeah, but how is a Japanese salaryman <laughs> similar to like, a, a, I don't know anything you're talking about? It's it's like a, it's like a desolation a tent of hope. You know? It's like desolation of smog. It's like a tent. Of, it's what happens when hope ends. When hope ends. That's rawness. Rawness begins. Yeah. Was Che Guevara raw? A hundred percent. He had hope. He was trying to build a socialist society. See, I've proven yeah, you wrong. Yeah, but that's a, that's, a, that's a different type of thing. That's like, there's a difference between hope and fire. Che Guevara had fire. Yeah? Yeah. And you know I'm going to say something controversial? Yeah. Kim Jong-il? Fire. Fire. He had fire. He had so much fire. He still continues to have fire. Uh, I don't think Kim Jong-il had fire. Wait, Kim Jong-il yeah. or Kim Jong-un? Kim Jong-il. Oh, Kim Jong-il. What about Kim Il-sung? Kim Il Sung was so pog. He was so raw. He was so raw. I don't know if I'd call him pog necessarily. No, he was pog. No, he was actually pog. I don't know anything about him. Um, he did a couple of genocides or whatever, but he was pog. I don't know if that's pog. I don't know if I'd call him pog personally. It was it was all during like the U.S. invasion and shit like that. So he was kind of pog. I don't know what that has to do with it. What? Like. A bunch of people died, but it was like the US killed more people, so like that doesn't make him? I don't, a guy to me. I who who like. can blame him? Uh, me, <laughs> I think I can blame him. Yeah, but he was raw. He was. I can give. I can give you raw. Yeah, he was raw. I don't know if I can give you pub, but I can give you raw. <laughs> yeah. Also, we can't fucking do a podcast because I never have anything to say. I don't have topics. That's fair. I only have topics. You have topics. I'm made of topics. I have like no topics ever. Yeah, but we riff. We riff off of each other yeah. well. But you have to bring every topic. And uh, you know, I like we can. The good thing about us as a dynamic is that we we have an intuitive understanding of of when when we should each play the straight man. <laughs> That's like true. we just switch up like that instantly, <laughs> yeah. and we just know. Yeah. Yeah. So Fight Club. Um, I I think another thing that's changed since this movie is Fight Club is like witnessing an alternate reality birth of what has become uh like alpha male culture right like but unfortunately the real version is like shitty and corporatized and it's like liver king and fucking andrew tate and uh what's that guy's name jordan peterson right where it's like because it like it is definitely a movie about the collapse of masculinity um which is obviously still relevant more relevant than ever um <clears throat> but but you know instead of starting underground fight clubs and destroying the financial system people were just like actually being masculine means having all the money yeah and then working the most corpo job which is kind of fucking retarded like the good the the yeah i don't know it's you know what i was thinking about while watching the movie is like how come the alpha giga chad community has picked up, like, you know, fucking Ryan Gosling and Patrick Bateman and the guy from Peaky Blinders, but yeah. not Tyler Durden, who is, like, the most that. The guy from Peaky Blinders is, is more of that. Well, the, but, the, yeah, I, I guess I haven't seen Peaky Blinders. Peaky Blinders is about that guy just losing everything that ever mattered to him and him going, like, this can't happen again and then making it happen again. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think the problem with Fight Club... But like, I don't know, it's not a problem. I mean, I'm I'm wondering, like, why... Like, they don't care what movie it's from. Like, obviously, Peaky Blinders and American Psycho aren't saying this is a good thing, right? Maybe it's just because it's not... Maybe that's the point, is that you can't hide behind a layer of irony if you're actually glorifying the thing that the movie also 
presents to you as being like desirable Mm -hmm. and it's like saying you desire like i mean the point of tyler durden is that he is the manifestation of the protagonists like how he wants everything he wishes he was so it's like maybe it's just too on the nose for them i don't know maybe they just maybe it's just random maybe it's just random they haven't seen fight club or something it's like but i but my actual personal opinion i think is that it's too anti-capitalist or at least anti-consumer like i mean the movie is about blowing up the credit card company so that the everyone's debt goes reset to, to zero like and i don't know these people are pussy ass corpo bitches they can't hack it man and also i mean obviously the movie is not i i think the the feminist interpretation of fight club which i've re- i'm sure we've all read too many articles about about how it's this big critique of masculinity i think is is incorrect i don't think it's a big critique of masculinity i think it's i, I don't know if it's necessarily critiquing anything other than mass society or <clears throat> like it's basically the zizek thing right it's the zizek taxi driver perverts guide to ideology thing you know there should be the outburst of violence and you should be directed at yourself that was the worst zizek impression ever when travis bickle mimes shooting himself right and then zizek's like yes there should be the outburst of violence right uh, to destroy what chains you to the ruling ideology and in the same way the protagonist shoots himself at the end of the movie to unchain himself from tyler durden i don't know it's kind of a nonsense film but it has a lot of good emotions to it i don't know what the fuck i'm even talking about anymore but yeah i just i wanted to bring up this how like it seems i guess when the movie came out it seemed sort of believably absurd that a bunch of disenfranchised men would start a fight club right but now it seems like we live in the post manosphere red pill culture where it's like actually all of these hyper masculine men that actually get fans and stuff are just fucking retards (laughs) who just want they're just scam artists like there's no noble tyler durden doing it for free there's just the fresh and fit podcast you know it's just these 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 dumbasses yeah and the other thing is like i think i think the thing is what what fight club didn't see coming was the 2016 election i i think people forget or maybe they just don't realize and maybe you're gonna say this is cringe or weird or whatever but i i strongly believe that you can't have anti-authoritarianism without atheism and not just atheism but like anti- being at least somewhat anti-religion. You can't be a liberal who is like, well, everyone has the right to practice their beliefs and whatever. I, I don't think you can do that. You have to at least challenge some of this stuff. I'm not saying to the degree where you become a cringe Reddit atheist or like anti-theist or whatever, right? And Or you go around Christopher Dawkins and, you know, all of that shit. I'm not saying you have to be like that, right? That's very, I, I don't know, right? That's not necessarily what I'm talking about. But you have to, you can't not be an atheist, is what I'm saying. And you can't not be critical of religion like you would be critical of any other authoritarian ideology. Religion is the ultimate authoritarian ideology because it proposes absolute authority. Um, So you you can't, you know, make concessions or whatever on that front if you want to be anti-authoritarian. And people who claim that you can are... Well, they're wrong, first of all. Uh, but but mainly they're they're not really doing what they say they're doing, right? Like there are some people who say only only God can be the real authority. In that case, what you're asking for is just an authority, you know. So if you want to claim anti-authoritarianism, you have to be an atheist. And I think people are confused as to what atheism means, mainly because a lot of atheists don't really haven't really thought it through very much. Because they think it's a matter of just disproving God's existence, right? Which you can, I mean, it seems pretty obvious to me that God doesn't exist. But it's also one of those things that you can never, you can't prove a negative, right? You, you can't actually disprove it. So most of what they actually spend their time doing is proving, it, I don't really know what atheists spend their time doing. It doesn't really make much sense to me. What it's really about is saying, I'm just because there's some guy up there threatening me with internal eternal damnation 
you know, you, you can't, you can't get me to do shit, right? Like you can't, this authority built on a threat, I just reject it. That's the point of it, right? It's to say, I have control over the here and now, and I'm not gonna give that away just because someone threatens me with uh, something bad in the afterlife, or just because you put me here against my will doesn't mean you have authority to tell me what to do, to join this church or to, to worship, right? That's the point. The point is to say, not just that, that God doesn't exist, right? Because that's kind of a useless thing to even talk about. I mean, not it's not useless to talk about, but the people who do believe in God aren't going to be swayed by that or you know, whatever. The point is just we don't need him. That's the real point, is that it's it's not about what happens to your eternal soul, it's about what happens to you right now, because you don't have any control over your eternal soul, no, right? The, even every major religion will say this, right? That like, you know, for example, in Judaism, either you're born to a Jewish mother, in which case you're a chosen person, or you're not, in which case you're not right? And you can fuck up if you're born Jewish, but most people aren't, so it doesn't even matter. In Christianity, uh, uh, only God can judge you, and every sinner can be forgiven. So there's, no one is guaranteed an entrance into the kingdom of heaven except for that one guy who was next to Jesus when he died. Uh, thief, that guy. So again, no church can tell you, right? And uh, I don't know that much about Islam. I won't go into it, but I'm pretty sure. Well, they they have um they have a different thing, right? They have like a a sort of it's not karma system, but it's basically like a points system, <laughs> points based system. That's what I know about it. Um, but I'm pretty sure even then, you know, they're not. No one's like sitting here like you are 100% going to heaven. You know, maybe they are. I don't fucking know. As what that that one that one sucks. The point the point being to that's bad. I thought I was gonna be really eloquent talking about this, but I've I've kind of jumbled. Anyway, I guess I'm watching every David Fincher film. So let's uh let's watch another David Fincher film. I think I might re I it might be uh might be time for seven. I've done the game in Fight Club. I'll watch seven, and then after that I can be in actually chronological order. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go watch seven. I remember watching Seven before, but as I'm watching this, I'm realizing the only thing I remember about the movie is the the what's in the box scene, because the rest of the movie is so unmemorable. I'm not saying it's a bad movie. It's a little, uh, <clears throat> I don't know how to explain it. It's a little, uh, is it, I don't know if I can call it forgettable. It has, it has, it, maybe it's just, it's, it's overshadowed by having one exceptionally memorable scene that you just forget the entire rest of the movie because there's just one scene that is just just over you know what i'm saying you know what i'm saying guys guys you know what i'm saying yeah guys yeah no thank you gang 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 you know what the fuck it is movies we watch movies here we watch david fincher movies we watch all of them for no reason bro i'm fucking dying I'm dying over here. My brain's getting infected. My brain's getting infected, but these people don't know about it. Everything's fucking trying to infect me, man. News. I gotta stop paying attention to this world. I gotta shut myself off from it. I don't I don't wanna know what's going on in the world anymore. Block every news organization, block every social media. I should just play Team Fortress 2 and uh I mean visual novels, you know. I want to read this visual novel called Girls, 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 which is about femboys or whatever the fuck we want to call them, traps. It looks good. The art's really good, but it's expensive and it's too new. Wait, I haven't checked in a while. I it, I literally checked the day it came out and then like two days later to see if it had been uploaded to any torrent sites we're far enough into this that no one's ever gonna know only the only the real ones only the real ones get this far in these videos i need to sneeze now bitch <laughs> there you go enjoy that enjoy that put that one in the sneezing compilation put that one in the sneezing compilation guys i know someone's i know someone's making a sneezing compilation 
Alright, I'm looking. No, it's too early. Nothing's nothing's there yet. Maybe I should ask my motherfuckers who who in like private torrent groups. <laughs> Asking. That was me asking. That typing. <clears throat> that was me asking. You know, I feel like maybe David Fincher only made one good movie. Because watching this, I'm like, Seven isn't that good. The game wasn't that good. Fight Club's good. Girl with the Dragon Tattoo wasn't good. And Gone Girl wasn't good. I haven't watched The Social Network. I think I might like that film. I'll have to watch that one to see if it's any good. Because it could be. That's the thing. It could be good. You never know. You never know about anything in this world. I was trying not to talk about Team Fortress 2 anymore in this video, but fuck it. It was going to stop me. I'm too good at the game now. I'm too good at the game, and it's no longer fun. Because <laughs> I just... I'm too good. It's too easy. That's not true. I'm exaggerating. But it's crazy to see... Like, I can basically... I would say 9 out of 10 games, I'm in the top 5 on the scoreboard, which I know the scoreboard doesn't really mean that much, but like, it used to be so pog if I would top score in a game, now it's like not even notable, you know? Which is not me bragging, because obviously I'm still going to be dog check compared to like, competitive players, but competitive isn't a real thing, you know? Competitive's a fake game for fakers. The it's a completely different game, right? It's not it's not Team Fortress Two. It's a Sixes is a, and Highlander is a completely different. It's not comparable. Being good at yeah, you know what I'm saying. Those guys are cracked, <coughs> obviously, but but that's not that's not what I'm talking about here, guys. It's not what I'm fucking talking about. Hey, you want to see something cool? I never mind. It didn't work. Uh, yeah, I'm I, I'm not that good at the game. I don't want to like pretend to right but man i just hit pipes these days it's crazy it's crazy the amount of pipes i hit it's actually insane how many pipes i hit <laughs> and then i'm like okay i'm bored i'm gonna switch to pyro and it's, and then randomly without even noticing i've suddenly gotten like a, a decent at pyro i wouldn't say i'm good because i lack consistency but there are some games when i fucking pop off as pyro playing pyro you know i'm get i'm i'm finally Getting better with these Axe Extinguisher combos. I, I fucking comboed a full health heavy today. That's the first time I've ever done that. I destroyed this heavy. Here's what happened. I'll tell you. I see the guy. I hit him with the detonate. It, we're, we're on final point. Holding final point. I'm, I'm defending final point on barn blitz. Heavy tries to, to peek through the choke. Right? No medic near him. I, 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 I see this as I go out. I'm just, I'm just fucking with people just to be annoying. I'm just showing them with the detonator to set them on fire for no real reason, right? Just to, just to be annoying to the team, the other team. But I, as I peek and I see him there, <clears throat> I hit him with the detonator. Then I, then I go back in, I jig, jiggle him, right? I see he doesn't have a medic and he doesn't have overheal particles. So then I go back out. I detonate to jump like over his head, basically. Not quite, but like beh sort of behind him onto the side to make my movement more unpredictable so he can't track me get right up in his face he's still on fire i hit him with another burst of flame until i see him turn around and then so just like a little bit of flame thrower right then pop him into the air with an air blast boom he's in the air in the air hit him with another fl uh, detonator flare hit him with another one then extinguisher him he the flame goes out and then I just switch back to my flamethrower, finish him off with the flamethrower. Like, 0.2 seconds of flame, he's done. He's done. <clears throat> I hit, I'm hitting better, I'm getting way better at predicting rocket timing for reflex. I mean, good soldiers are, know how to, how to debate me. Um, I, yeah, I, I got, I got fucking absolutely rolled by a, a direct hit soldier. When I was trying to push last on fucking... Oh, I don't even remember the name of the map. Whatever. I got rolled. I kept trying to predict his rockets, and I just air blasted, and then mistimed it. And he shot me, and I air and then I like tried to get close to him, and it, it was bad. It was bad. It was it went really badly for me. But I'm I'm doing I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay here. Yeah. I've also here's another fact, is that I've lost all my abilities with sniper. 
the longer I've played TF2, the worse I've become at Sniper, because I'm no longer brain trained about clicking heads. I have now been brain trained hitting pipes, and uh, that's mainly it. <laughs> so it my 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 head clicking abilities have gone down the drain, and uh, I've become way worse at Sniper than I was when I first started playing TF2, which is pretty interesting. I had that one game where I was like. It was me and this one other guy in a server, and I was destroy. We were doing sniper one v ones in in an empty server, and I was just destroying this guy's entire life. I was watching him have a mental breakdown in text chat. Right, I was just fucking demolishing him, and I felt bad, but I couldn't stop. And I was hitting these nutty headshots, quick scopes. I've never been able to pull off anything like that again. I I miss all of my quick scopes. Nothing. I don't know. My sniper abilities have gone, which is probably a good thing. Because you don't want to be a good sniper. Being a good sniper is like being Hitler, but worse. Um, yeah. I forgot what I was going to say. I was going to say something. I brought this up for a reason, but I don't remember what the reason was. Now, TF2 is not actually boring because I'm too good. I want to make clear that I was I was making a joke when I said that. Um, yeah, there's still... I think uh, there's still a whole bunch of stuff that I, I want to get good at. I mean, I finally unlocked the gunboats after like 10,000 years of playing the game. Finally unlocked the gunboats. Which makes me kind of want to learn Soldier. Because um, Soldier's pretty fun. So I'll see. Maybe I'll pl- try try learning Soldier tomorrow or something. I don't know. Good game. Good game, though. You should check it out. Play play, uh, play TF2. Oh, the other thing is... Someone... I think I, I convinced someone to, to watch Hidamari Sketch today in, in the game. Because they were like, who's Yuno? Because my name's Yuno Appreciator. Um, and I, I think I might have convinced them to, to watch Hidamari Sketch. Which... You should watch Hidamari Sketch, by the way, guys. Go watch Hidamari. What are you doing? Go rewatch it. Let me let me tell you about Edgy anime. Okay, you go you go on fucking you go on fucking Mal, right? You go on fucking Mal, and you go to fucking animes on this site, and some of them are tagged with like Edgy, right? And motherfuckers will be like, it's just this show's just full of fan service. This show is nothing. It's just full of fan service. And then there are motherfuckers on the other side, and they're like, no, no, it, it has good plot, it has a good plot, the fan service is, is really actually part of the, you have to look past the fan service, and it's got a really good plot. Guys, I just enjoy anime titties, just, what the fuck, I just wanna, I sometimes, I just wanna look at some fucking anime titties, okay, it does, I don't care. I don't, it's it's not like, oh, the fan service is bad, but the, the plot is good once you look past it. And actually, there's a reason for it to be there. And it doesn't need to have a reason. The reason for it to be there is because anime titties are a mole good in the world. They're, an, they're a fucking ontological good. They're, a, they're axiomatically positive force in the universe. And the, the, all of these people just act as if, like, oh, the show having anything sexual is necessarily bad and taking away from the show, or it's, like, something that has to be excused. No, it's just chill. It's just fine for that to exist. It's not bad that that exists. It, it can be in a good show or a bad show, right? But that doesn't have anything to do, like, so can any other aspect of any medium, right? Like, you can have... Like, a show like Prison School, which is one of the worst things I've ever seen. What did I give Prison School? I should have given it a 1. Oops, this is the the manga. Wait, is that what I'm thinking of? Is it Prison School? Yeah, I did give it a 1. Okay, good. I'm just double-checking. Yeah, that's one of the worst shows I've ever seen. It's not bad because of the fan service. It's bad because of everything else. It's bad because the fan service is bad. And the characters are bad, the art is bad, the animation is bad, the storyline is bad, the voice acting is bad, everything's bad. Like, that's why it's, it sucks. Not because it has porn in it. I, I, I don't understand why people can't just admit that they like titties. Well, is it that hard? Like, what's difficult about admitting that? Why can't you just say, you know, I like a bit of eye candy when I'm watching a show sometimes. Not all the time. You know, I'm glad not all anime is like this. Good thing it fucking isn't. These, I don't understand. What's wrong with people? Why can't you just admit? Why can't you just be honest with yourself? Yeah, Seven's a decent movie. I just finished it. I, I Again, it's like, it's really a, a movie that's overshadowed by its ending. 
being very memorable. I, I already said this, but just what having just watched the ending, it's like the only things I yeah, a lot of the beginning of the movie is just kind of forgettable. Like what are you supposed to take away from this film? I don't understand. I don't really understand what's special about this movie or what's special about this whole like serial killer genre, really. It's never I've never gotten the fascination with serial killers cuz like in real life serial killers are just like kind of idiots who just like murdering people and they just get away with it because police departments are bad at their job. Uh, like pretty much ev- there's never been a, like a genius serial killer. It's a complete myth made up by the media unless you want to count the Unabomber who isn't really a serial killer, serial bomber. But you know what I'm saying, right? More of a te- more of a terrorist than a serial killer. Um but like almost no serial killers are smart or you know have any particular motive like being ordained by you know it's like none of that stuff's real um and they only get away with it because the police departments are generally nowhere near as good at at doing their job as we would like to think being in a civilized society uh you know we like to sit back and imagine that the police departments are keeping us safe and catching the criminals when, in reality, what is it? Let me see. Uh, yeah, about about half of all murders go unsolved. That's what I thought it was. Yeah, about half. So, you know, in reality, if you kill someone, it's basically a 50-50 shot whether you get away with it, which I think you know, is is a lot better odds to murderers than than most people like to th- imagine that murderers have of not getting caught, right? So, like, in reality, police departments are incompetent, um, and serial killers are just violent assholes. <laughs> you know, they're not... They're not... Uh, yeah. And then in the movies, you have this entirely different conception where it's, it's sort of this game of cat and mouse. Um... And, you know, there's a lot of good movies about, uh, like, cat and mouse games between the cops and a, a killer. Uh, Heat comes to mind. Heat is an amazing fucking movie. Um, the, the, you know, there's lots. It's a pretty common trope. Uh, but it's it's never, like, the, the, I don't know. It just kind of makes me think about the, the Dan Brown, the Da Vinci Code. Like, this very, this very much vibes Da Vinci Code without any of the intrigue. And the Da Vinci Code isn't great. Don't get me wrong. But at least there's, like, puzzles to solve and shit. In this one, the police never... I mean, there's the, the detectives aren't particularly smart. <laughs> right, which I guess is maybe a good thing. I don't know. Like, what's supposed to be the draw of this movie? It's not just, like, a bleak and nihilistic depiction of, of like, the dark parts of humanity or whatever. Is that, like, what it's supposed to be? Because it doesn't give me... It doesn't leave me with that vibe. I'm not sitting here, like, man, humanity... I'm just, like... Damn, that's Kevin Spacey is one wacky guy. That's what I'm thinking. You know, I'm not sitting here, it, right? Like, what am I supposed to be? What I I don't understand. I, yeah, I don't know. This movie doesn't really. I I think it's well put together. There's a lot of attention to detail in the construction of it, as expected with a David Fincher movie. The dialogue is generally good. The 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 direct you know obviously the direction is really good. Um, and there's a lot of shocking. I, I guess it's supposed to be shocking stuff going on. You know, it's not that crazy to to me, I guess. But, like, inventive kills, you know, a, a, lo- a lot of strong performances. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why this movie has such a reputation. It's kind of a... I watch it, and I, I'm just like, that just, like, okay, <laughs> you know? I It's not a bad film, but this is the same thing that happened to me with the game. And I watch it, and I'm just like, okay. At least I uh, Fight Club, I guess, is similar even. Maybe this is like a... Th- Here we go. We've discovered a through point in David Finch's films. Films where the plot happens, and none of it really mattered, and it only happens to assholes, and the ending just leaves you like, huh, what was the point of all that then? You know? At least Fight Club has some, you know, commentary. It has like a worldview it's trying to comment on. Right, it's try. It has critique in it. It has opinions. I don't really understand. Like the game, I guess, is trying to be like a modern day Ebenezer Scrooge type of situation. Except I don't think it works. And seven, 
I don't even understand what the film's trying to say. It it what's it trying to say? Because it's obviously not trying to make you sympathize with John Doe and his 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 like. It, is it is it just crime is bad? It's bad when you murder people. Like this whole thing at the end, where it's like if you shoot him, he wins. No, he fucking doesn't. He's dead. There's no winning or losing. Like, what's this winning or lo- is it is it winning? If you take him to trial, what's the, what's different about that? What's winning about that? I don't understand. Why is that winning and shooting him isn't winning? What? The, none of this is winning or losing. A bunch of fucking people died. You lost instantly. No one. There's, but loss doesn't even play into it. There's not nothing. None of this even has any. It. There's not really tension for me because I'm not like oh he's if he shoots John Doe he becomes wrath and therefore John Doe win no. If he shoots John Doe, nothing much happens. He just gets, I guess, a brief moment of revenge for his wife dying. But if he doesn't shoot him and they take him into custody and then eventually send him off to jail, he has the same fucking thing. I guess the press might have a different opinion on it. Is that it? Is it that the press is going to have a different opinion? I don't understand it. Like, obviously, Brad Pitt's character is a guy who struggles with emotional regulation, right? Like, there's many times in the film where it's set up that he's not particularly great at regulating his emotions. And then at the end, he obviously can't regulate his emotions. I mean, no one could. I don't think anyone could be expected to in that scenario. Very, very few people. Or would even want to, necessarily. Meanwhile, John Doe has extremely regulated emotions. And he's the bad guy who does the murdering, but I guess he does have a bit of an outburst. But yeah, I don't, the whole movie seems kind of pointless to me. And I don't, I know that some people might say, well, that's the point of the movie is that, like, it's just sort of senseless violence and that happens. But there's way better senseless violence movies that have some sort of, like, worldview to, right? Like, some sort of nihilistic worldview. Um, Maybe, uh, I had a movie in my head. Maybe, like, like uh, like Crash, for example. That's like a shocking movie, kind of, right? B- bunch of senseless violence and weird, morally fucked up people. But that's a really interesting movie. I love that film. Yeah, I don't know. Just it, Maybe it's just not that... Maybe it's just this stuff, like, the, the murders are supposed to be... I mean, they are particularly gruesome, right? But they're also kind of comical. Because gruesome murders are kind of comical. Like, they just kind of are. And this movie doesn't want to accept that. Like, there's a reason why horror comedy with, like, insane levels of, like, gore is a, is a whole subgenre, right? There's a reason, like, it's, in, it's inherently funny. And this movie doesn't want to give you, it doesn't want to accept this. It's like, no, this is just evil and bad. And you're supposed to be shocked and horrified by the fact that this guy made, made a, a guy fuck someone to death with a knife dildo. But I'm just like... Yeah, that's pretty fucked up. But have I mean it happened off screen to characters we don't know, never met until they died. Well, one of them died. The other one you see for like two minutes when he's in being interviewed, being interrogated, right? And it's like also the premise of fucking someone to death with a knife dildo is kind of inherently funny. It, it, maybe not funny, but at least goofy, right? It's definitely goofy. But the movie doesn't want to accept like. It's just like, no, this is actually the darkest and edgiest thing ever. I don't have, like, I need emotional connection with the character to care if they die. You can't just be like, and random prostitute died. Okay. She, oh, but it was really painful and bad and fucked up. Okay, fine. And then the wife dies, but honestly, the wife dies off screen. And call me crazy, but I maybe I watched the movie wrong, but I didn't have a particular super strong connection to the wife either you know i'm not following i mean maybe i'm supposed to but it it didn't hit me that hard maybe just because i already know it's going to happen because i'm i'm I'm, the second time i'm watching it but no i i didn't really form a particularly strong emotional connection to the, the 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 dead wife and then it's immediately obviously i mean obviously any sense of tension in that scene is immediately undercut by 
what's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the fucking box? And then the goofy acting where he's like, he brings the gun up and he's like, Ugh, I can't do it. I look away. I look into the camera with my beautiful Brad Pitt face and my eyes dripping with fake tears. Uh, and I look away. I can't do it. But I look up and I point the gun and I look away. No, what's in the box? I, like, obviously any sense of tension in that scene is immediately undercut by that. Um... Yeah, I don't know how they they that that is bad direction. I don't I don't know. I mean, maybe it's not bad direction because it's by far the most memorable thing about the movie. Like, if you say what's in the box, everyone knows what you're talking about, even this many years later. So maybe it was good direction because at least it's iconic, right? I don't I don't know if it works as a serious dramatic performance, but it works as a cultural meme. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't get that movie. I don't get it. I am now going to rank every Team Fortress 2 map on the tier list that I have played. Um, starting off with D Group Keep, which is a bit of an odd one. Obviously, D Group Keep only available for the Medieval game mode. And I do like the Medieval mode a lot. However, I don't know that... Is D Group Keep actually a good map? It's, it's honestly a little uninspiring. I feel like... It could do with some more interest. I'm going to put it in a B. Even though I really like that it enables the medieval mo game mode to exist. I feel like there could be way more interesting medieval mode maps. If you know what I mean. Okay, Nightfall. I think I have played literally once. But I enjoyed it. Mainly because we, we steamrolled and I top scored. <laughs> so I'm going to put it in A. It might suck to lose on. But I wouldn't know. Uh, Banana Bay... You know what, I'm not going to put Nightfall in A. I'm going to put Nightfall in, in B, because I had fun playing it, but I don't think I'd put it in A tier. Uh, Banana Bay is a solid C tier. I am neither particularly... Hmm. Banana Bay is, a again, it's kind of a weird map. Very twisty-turny. Very, very vertical. Pretty fun to play Sticky Jumper demo. Um, kind of annoying sniper sightline directly into spawn. Oh, that'll be the, uh, would you mind elving out? Okay. Yeah, kind of annoying sniper sight learning to spawn. I also pretty... Are you recording it? Yeah. See? Pretty fun, uh, for pyro. Um, good for scouts as well. Not great for demo night. Not terrible. I don't know, I think I, yeah, solid C tier. Uh, Watergate I've also played, like, once... Oh no, wait, never mind. I, I, I don't think I've even played that one. Uh, Pipeline. Pipeline is a weird... I mean, all of the payload race maps are kind of weird. Pipeline can be absolute hell to play on. Um, but, funny enough, for the name, I feel like every time I play Pipeline, I'm being tested on my ability to hit pipes. Because it's really difficult to chase someone down with the sword on Pipeline. And so it's very much about like how well I can aim as demo. Uh, this, I think it's the second, like, section of Pipeline is basically unpushable as Pyro because there's a really long sight line where you have no cover. Um, so I pretty much always end up playing Demo on that one or Medic. Uh, but it can be pretty fun. Uh, I, I don't like the last stage of it. So I'm going to put this in a D. Uh, it's a bit of a goofy, not take it too seriously map. I will say there are some sections that can get held down a little too easily by a competent... Like, if the other team has three NGs and they're good, uh, you're kind of fucked. Hightower is, is great. I'm putting Hightower in A tier just for the, for the community of it, for the vibes of it. It's like the better version of uh, Two Fort, in my opinion. Like, if you want sort of a casual, like super casual experience, I don't think there's a better map for it than Hightower. Like, I've spent a lot of time on 24-7 Hightower servers. Um, uh, spent a lot of time jumping around in many different forms on that map. And it taught me how to deal with trollgers and market garden soldiers effectively. And most importantly, air blasting people off the edge of the Hightower is one of the most fun things you can do in the game. Uh, Thunder Mountain, which one's that again? <laughs> Which one's Thunder Mountain? Just to remind me. Ah, yes, this one. Uh, I don't really like this map. I'm going to put it in D. I don't find it very fun. Um, yeah, it just 
it feels feels kind of awkward to play. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't know what's bad about it really. I can't I can't I haven't played it enough to form a nuanced critique. It doesn't get picked very much because it kind of sucks. <laughs> um, there's yeah, it's just really weird. It's it's pretty easy to get spawn camped and rolled if your team is bad. Uh, it, there's also some really egregious sniper sight lines on this map, like really bad. Um, yeah, not 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 the best map, but it's not it's not hell when you're playing it. Like it can be fun, um, but but I I wouldn't pick it out of the list on purpose. So I'm putting it in D tier. Enclosure I have literally played once and I hated it. I'm putting it in E tier. I did not like playing Enclosure at all. Uh, Barn Blitz is a solid A. Barn Blitz is, is, is fun to both attack and defend on. Last can be kind of a hellish environment. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, last, last on Barn Blitz can be pretty hellish, but I like that. Like, I know a lot of people don't, but it generally feels pretty fair to lose on Barn Blitz last, in my opinion. Um, and most of the time... Yeah, I just feel like it's a pretty fun map. It can be, I'll tell you, actually, what might push this down to B. I, is it this, like, okay, that's the first, where's the, the first point's in that little hut. Then the second point is where the little turntable thing spins around. And then the third point, that is the one that's fucking hell if your team doesn't know how to deal with sentries. Like, if you don't have a, a spy who will just deal with this, like... You can, your entire fucking team can get shut down by one level three. And if you don't have like uber pushes, like if you don't have good medics and if you don't have good spies, like as a demo, it's just really hard to deal with that position where they normally put the the sentry. So yeah, that can be pretty fucking hellish. I've had some really bad hellish attack games uh, where, where you just never get past that point. Uh, it's also got, again, pretty egregious, like, that particular place gets shut down by snipers, and that's pretty frustrating to push. Uh, but m most of the time that doesn't happen, but it, it can happen, and when it does, it's very annoying. Uh, Frontier. Frontier is, is pretty fun. I think I'd put it in a B tier. You know what, I don't, I'm going to downgrade Night, Nightfall to a, to a C tier, because I don't really know that much about it. Uh, but yeah, Frontier, uh, again, pretty sniper-heavy map. In certain areas, I think it's kind of famous for being a sniper-heavy map. But honestly, it's I feel like it's not as bad as people say it is. Um, I I have a lot of fun playing pyro on this map, but I also have a lot of fun playing demo. Uh, there's a few trimp spots that are pretty nice, but uh, yeah. Also, I like playing flog pyro on this map for some reason. It, it, it works out really well. Uh, I've also yeah, I play this map quite a lot. I I say I, really, I quite like this map. Uh, it can be pretty frustrating to push last, but um, it also can be fun. Uh, and it's fun to hold last as well. I, I, I like playing NG on last on Frontier. Uh, it's kind of a like a fun, frantic kind of thing. Uh, like for some reason, I, I'll get to Upward later, but playing NG, holding last on Upward is really just just frustrating to me because it's like you, you just build level 3 and then it gets destroyed, then you build level 3 and it gets destroyed, right? And it's like, even if you win, it's not super fun. It just kind of feels frustrating. For some reason, the same, the exact same thing on Frontier is fun. I don't know why. Uh, the cart design is kind of a neat little gimmick on Frontier as well. I, I, I quite like the unique way you get to play around the cart. Next, Snowy Coast. Uh, Snowy Coast is a good hybrid night map. Really good hybrid night map. Lots of, lots of ability to chase people down. I've had a lot of fun playing Snowy Coast. I'm going to put it in B as well, but on the higher end of B. Uh, I have a pretty bad memory of getting shut down by a team. You know you know the, the situation where the other team has a flog pyro who somehow always has crits and has a pocket medic up his ass the entire game? I have a bad memory of getting shut down on Snowy Coast by that. Uh, but I think one of the things that, that makes Snowy Coast forgivable is that it's surprisingly easy to, like, sneakily push the cart over the edge of last, and that's kind of fun. Uh, but yeah, I, I like I like all of the, this map. I think it's all pretty well designed. Um, it's got a good mixture of everything you want. Like, the beginning is, like... it. Like, I, I, I think the, 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 the first 
point, like the way there's that big wall, it kind of serves to separate classes that can jump over that wall and classes that can't in a really satisfying way where it like gives different people different roles and divides the map up in a way without actually like shutting it off completely. Like I, if that wall had a big invisible wall in front of it, it would suck so much to push that. But the fact that you can jump over it, but only certain class, I don't know. It's pretty satisfying. The flanks are nice. Um, there's a whole, yeah, I, I think it's generally pretty good. If I had to critique it, I'd say, um, th pushing down, there's like a big down ramp into a tunnel that can be pretty, I mean, I like the chokiness of it, but again, depending on how many engineers the other team has, it can get pretty frustrating to push that. And I think holding in certain areas just feels impossible. Like there's not even any point trying, uh, you know, like it, it kind of feels like you just get steamrolled. Like there's, there's certain, there's some points where you can hold the other team back and actually win, but there's other points where you'd, you'd just guaranteed to never win. And it's just like, it feels kind of pointless, I guess. Um, last is incredibly chaotic. Uh, also kind of, kind of heavy, heavy, kind of a lot of heavy action on this map, I feel like. But overall, I think it's good. I think it's fun. Swiftwater. Swiftwater, uh, mm, I'm kind of mixed on this map. I think there are times when it can be really fun, and there, I just like everything. There are times when it can be really fun, there are times when it can be really frustrating. Uh, the last on this map is absolute dog shit. It has a really, really bad last uh, I, that I hate. It's not fun to push, it's not fun to hold. It's actually dog shit. Uh, it doesn't even work. It doesn't serve its purpose. It's re it's mainly boring. It's just badly designed. I, I really don't like the last on this map. The rest of the map is generally pretty good. There's also the part where you're sort of... I, I, I don't know how to describe it. I don't even... What point is that? Okay, you have first there. That's the first point. The second point is after the tunnel. It's the third point, I think, right? Because you have the... The first point is in the big open area next to the building, right? Then the second point is after the tunnel, and then, like, like there's sort of a, a slight down ramp, and the point's in the middle of the down ramp. And then the third point is a sort of a snaky bit, and the spawn is right there. Like, they spawn right there. There's always a level three in a really annoying place. Um, and then there's, the, the, yeah, it's that's a pretty chaotic and spammy part of the map that can get fucked. Like, from both sides, it can be just really annoying, depending on just factors. But the other parts of the map are really fun. I don't know. I, I think I'm going to put it in C tier, just because it has positives and negatives. I think I'm... I don't know. Frontier might also belong in C tier. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Okay, Upward, we're putting directly in S tier. I think everyone agrees. Upward is one of the best maps in the game, especially as Demo Knight. It has the most versatile trimp spots of any map, and those trimps will actually get you kills. They're actually effective for traversing. Uh, very open skyboxes. So much potential, so much to learn about this map. Um, and I know a lot of people think that the last is bad. I don't agree. I think that upward last is good. Uh, the best part of the map is the little tunnel with the the... Like, that's genius map design, the way that the tunnel splits people up going over and under. Like, I, I just, I think that part works super well. Um, no, I, I just think this is generally an amazingly designed map. There are so many different options. Uh, sometimes it can be annoying to deal with snipers, like, right out of spawn. Uh, but uh, it's also very much possible to deal with them if you just don't get in their sight lines and just sneak behind them. It's definitely possible. I do it a lot. Uh, so yeah, upwards is is fucking great. Um, good good to play. Good map to play engineer on. Good map to play demo knight on. Good map to play pyro. Uh, maybe less pyro. Like pyro is good towards like the second to last and last like to the towards the second half of the map. Pyro is really good. Pyro kind of sucks for the first half of the map. Uh, because a lot of the fights are going to be taking a mid range. Um, yeah. Again, I, I'm kind of only play demo pyro medic and ng, so I'm not super familiar with how good it is for the other classes but yeah uh gold rush gold rush is dog shit i'm putting it in d tier 
I think that's Gold Rush that I'm thinking of, right? Let me wait. There's two maps that look kind of similar that are kind of mixed up in my mind. Oh, Gold Rush is this one. Okay, I don't, I'm not going to put it in D tier. Eh, maybe. It kind of sucks. I'll put it in D tier. I don't enjoy playing it. Um, it's way too choky in a not fun way. The chokes aren't well designed. It doesn't feel satisfying to push through them. It just feels like luck. And then the problem is even when you do push through them, you can just get wiped and then the cart rolls all the way back and you have to push again. It's just not fun. None, none of it's fun. <laughs> yeah, it's just bad. Uh, there's a lot of like annoying sniper sight lines that are just way too open. Um, I, I feel like this map was way too much power to scouts to annoy people. Like, there's a lot of places where scouts can just fuck you and you have no recourse against them. Uh, the flanks don't work. That's the biggest problem with this map, I think, is that it has flanks and none of them work as flanks. Like, none of them actually give you an alternate, an effective alternate route. Like, all they do is just leave you... Like, once you leave the flank into... You actually get to the part that you're flanking to, you're just so completely open that they just... They don't function. It's it's bad. It's a bad map. Uh, but it's not as bad as Hoodoo, which I'm going to put in F tier. Hoodoo is absolute dog shit. It's Bizarro World Dust Bowl, but with all of the interesting stuff design of dust bowl taken out uh i fucking hate hoodoo hoodoo is dog shit not a fan of hoodoo uh borneo borneo has grown on me quite a lot uh i'm gonna put it in maybe maybe a tier that i i feel like the problem with borneo is the ga the games are very similar like there's not much variety to playing borneo like e every borneo game basically goes the exact same way uh, which means it's, it, I'm kind of like burnt out on it. I think that's the, the biggest problem with the map is that there's just not much variety. Every, it, it's, a, it's always the same game, but it's a fun game. Uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting dynamics. The worst part of the map is the push up to first. Uh, that bit sucks, but past, I, I don't know if I'd say it sucks. It's just not like, it's not as fun. Uh, it's kind of boring to hold, because uh, the the enemies like very spread out. There's not really you you sort of just feel like you're pushing off stragglers. It's hard to know if you're making an impact, and obviously it's first, so you're not really designed to win it anyway. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It's not super fun to hold, and it's not super fun to push either. You can get shut down by snipers very easily. They always, as a, like, tussling NG in the little building, which can just be really annoying to deal with. Um, there's it, some parts where, like, like that little building is just kind of frustrating to push. It always kind of just feels like a mad scramble, like, lucky if you actually get the car onto the point, you know? Um, but past that bit, I think the map has a bunch of really interesting design. Uh, especially the next point with the ramp. I really love playing the flank on that part of the map. That is, like, my favorite flank in the whole game. I don't know why. The big hill with the little, like, rocks and the health pack there. Like, that area is just super dynamic always. I don't know why, but I love playing in that little area. And then you get past that, the tunnel, which is basically pointless, just serves to divide the two parts of the map. And then after that, you get the big building with the walkways and shit. And that's always got, like, weird, interesting fights that are super fun. Uh, very good for Demonite, very good for Pyro, good for Heavy, uh, actually a bit later maybe. Um, and then last is kind of weird, um, but I like it. If It always feels like a struggle to take last, and it always feels pretty fun to hold. Um, so yeah, I think this is a good map. I'm putting an A tier. Even though if the first point is kind of annoying, I think once you get past that, it becomes a really fun map. It, it's at the bottom of A tier. Next up is Badwater. Badwater. I'm going to put this in A tier, uh, again, towards the top of A tier. I think most people would probably put this in S tier. Everyone loves this map. Personally, I don't think it's as amazing as everyone says. Uh, mainly because I don't like the second to last point. I think that whole section of the map kind of sucks. Where The bit where the cart kind of goes under the little sort of... It goes like down and then up again, you know, before you turn the corner into the last point. Like, that whole area just sucks to me. It's always... The, like the flanks don't really work flanks don't really do anything because they just take you back to the front line too early and even if you do manage to flank around you, you you don't end up anywhere interesting you end up in a kind of weirdly cramped building that nothing ever happens in 
so the, like the flanks are basically useless in that part of the map uh the the building has a massive invisible wall over it so you can't do any f interesting movement stuff like that's the main thing i think is that area of the map shuts down any movement like you can't really rocket jump you can't really st sticky jump you can't really trim like that whole area is just very there's there's no possibility for interesting movement in that area really i mean there's a little bit but it's obviously it's tf2 so there's always going to be some but it it kind of minimizes the movement expression and that's kind of annoying to me because that's my favorite thing about the game uh but that being said the rest of the map i think is great i think the first part of the map is one of the best places on any map like right outside of spawn with all those rocks and stuff is a super interesting battlefield with like loads of, like every time you play that it's different i mean maybe the ngs are set up in the same spot but I, like i feel like team composition changes the dynamics of that area so much in so many different interesting ways then you have the roof like i mean there's a reason why casual tf2 talked about this map for 12 hours straight it's just got so much detail to it like that whole roof section at the second point like the, the and the area behind the roof is so interesting like there's so many possibilities depending on who's holding that particular point it's such a powerful area of the map and and fighting for it is so in, like has so many interesting dynamics it's a great map it, it's it's almost s tier if it wasn't for that one annoying section, uh, I think it would be S tier. But it's right below S tier. It might even get moved up, depending. But yeah, it's a great map. Uh, Kong King. Kong King kind of... I don't know. I don't want to say it sucks, but it kind of... I don't know. I don't particularly enjoy it. I'm going to put it in, in D tier. It doesn't suck ass. Like, it's kind of can be fun to play. Um, but I think, like, the, the, the point is kind of annoying. It's kind of weird. Like... I don't know how to describe it, it just feels awkward. All the battles in that map feel awkward because it's built too much like a real place, not like a TF2 map. Like, there's a lot of geometry that isn't really cover, it's just kind of there. Um, there's not much verticality. Yeah, I don't know, it's a, it's a bit of a weird map. I don't hate it, but I, I don't particularly enjoy playing on it. Uh, next is Sawmill, King of the Hill. Uh, I quite like playing King of the Hill Sawmill. I, I like the point specifically. I like holding the point. I'm going to put it in C tier. I don't think it's a great map or even particularly a good map uh, because the rest of the map kind of sucks, in my opinion, unless you're a trolger. Uh, but the point specifically is pretty fun to hold and to take, uh, like the actual sawmill in the middle of the map. I think I think the, the moving saws with the, di like the dynamic cover they provide is provides in some interesting tactics and yeah it's basically just like a kill box but um there's enough dynamics to it that i think it's it keeps it interesting and fun uh so while i wouldn't say it's a good map like a particularly good map i i, I think that it's fine um what that is something i cannot say to sawmill ctf which goes directly in fucking f tier uh maybe i'll put it in e tier it sucks, because now you have to play the rest of the map entire. You have to only play the It sucks. It sucks ass. It's terrible. CTF Sawmill is fucking dog shit. I hate it. Everyone hates it, I think. It's so bad. It's... I don't... I'm not even gonna... It's just bad. It's just not fun in any way. Uh, I'm gonna go get some food, and I'll come back in a second. Okay, let us continue. Next up is Viaduct. Viaduct goes in... I think maybe even a C or a B. I think I'm going to put it in a C because it's pretty neutral to me. Like, I don't think it's good or bad. It's kind of a very much just kind of a, a sandbox type of thing. I will say, if you are an an NG main or you like to play engineer, please, please place a dispenser behind the rock for your team. That is... Whenever I play with an engineer and they put all of their dispensers and everything in the little cubby hole behind the corner, right, it, it becomes annoying. You put the dispenser behind the rock, suddenly you have a massive advantage fighting anyone on the point or approaching the point because you can fall back to this dispenser and be getting healed but stay in the fight. It's just, it's super useful. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I don't think there's much more, much more to say about Viaduct. Uh, it's pretty neutral. Uh, Watergate... Oh, wait. I keep fucking... Sorry. Uh, Badlands. 
Which one's Badlands again? Oh yeah, Badlands. Uh, Badlands, I don't know if I've played this enough to even make a comment on it, actually. I'm just going to not, not do that. High Pass. Uh, I don't particularly like High Pass. I'm going to put it in D tier. Maybe low C tier. There's nothing super wrong with the map. I just never seem to... I think the thing that's wrong with the map, I, I, I don't like the, the, the flanks. They're kind of awkward and tight, you know? Like, the, the central part where the point is is very open, but then the flanks are very enclosed. It's kind of weird. It makes it hard to, like, retreat in certain places, which is pretty frustrating. It means you can't extend... <coughs> Excuse me. You can't extend very far. You can't really risk, because you don't really have any opportunity to retreat if it goes wrong. So the high pass kind of ends up forcing you to play safe in a way that isn't super fun. Uh, it's also pretty easy to roll and to get rolled, uh, which is fun when you're rolling and not super fun when you're getting rolled. Um, also, engineers are a bit annoying on this map. Not too bad, not too egregious, just a little bit annoying, but that's fine. I honestly don't mind that. Um, <coughs> yeah, it's not not great, not terrible. Put it in C, put it in low C, not super fun, but I don't think I hate it. I might put it in... Could be a D, could be a D, we'll see. Harvest. Harvest is going to go in S tier for me. Best, best King of the Hill map. Super open, loads of movement options, man. So many movement options. Not just, I mean, for trimping, again, probably one of the best trimping maps. Um, But, man, it's just great for, like, every class. There's so many options. It does get annoying if the other team has really good snipers. Um, But, you know, other, and also... uh. Be motherfucking engineers who build a sentry on the point in Harvest, kill yourself. Like, you're just ruining the fun for everyone. That shit's annoying. But flying around the map from, from rooftop to rooftop, getting fucking sword kills or playing... Like, it's a map where pure Demo Knight is very viable because of all the trimping spots. It's just a great map for all the stuff that I want to do in the game. Uh, lots of potential for Pyro, in my opinion. Um... Especially detonated pyro with with the jumps. It's a map that really rewards mobility in a way that I really like. Lots of soldiers jumping around. You get you get very pog air shots on this map. Yeah, uh, when you hit hit the hit the soldiers jumping around with an air shot, you feel you feel good about yourself. Uh, not as good as upward, but definitely one of my favorite maps. Played a lot of harvest. Lakeside. Uh, I'm put lakeside in C tier. It's kind of a neutral map for me. Not particularly great or terrible. Uh, actually, I don't know. Do I even like this map? I feel like once again, this is a map where you have to hit a lot of pipes as demo. It's a very, very uh, pipe hitting test kind of map because there's a lot of open ground and a lot of places where scouts can just sort of buzz around your head and fuck you up. And uh, health packs are kind of annoying to get to or very open, very contentious. Um, and, uh, the, everything's, like, slightly too far away and slightly too open. Like, it's very hard to do a sort of charge in, uh, get a melee kill, and then charge back out, because <clears throat> everything's so open where people are actually standing and where people are going to be retreating. So even if you manage to get the, the melee kill, there's going to be five other guys who all can see you and can just fuck you up if you're extending into their, their side of the map. So kind of makes it frustrating to break down when I on. Uh, as for Pyro, the, the distances are too long and too open to close the distance effectively. Uh, it's not vertical enough for detonator jumping surprises to be really super viable. Um, and not to mention the, the map is super open for snipers. Again, it's a map that playing against a team with really good snipers is incredibly annoying. Um, it's even, I think it's even worse. It's one of the, one of the worst ones for that because it's really hard to like get close to the snipers because they sit in a little enclosed space with a roof on top of it, so you can't even like sticky jump or anything over to them really well. Um, yeah, that is pretty annoying. Uh, and the design of the central point, I think, is just a little plain. Like it doesn't normally lead to very interesting fights. It definitely demands a lot of skill of you because of this. Like as I said, it definitely makes you hit your pipes. Um, and I've also played Scout on this map a decent amount, and it definitely demands you to hit your meat shots. Like, it's very much a, an aim-centric map, like, not a super movement-centric or tactic-centric map. It's just sort of very much raw aim, which can be fun, but I think it's a little not super interesting. Uh, <clears throat> so I think I'm going to put it in C, 
maybe D. I know, I would never pick it, so it's definitely not in the positive sides. I would never pick it, but I don't get super mad if it does get picked. I'll put it in C. Alright, next up is Lazarus. Uh, which one's this again? Hold on, I need to look it up. Lazarus. Ah, uh, yes, this map. Oh, this map. This is a weird map. I haven't played it that much. I've played it a few times, but not a lot. It's kind of a weird map. I like it for its uniqueness. I think I'm just going to put it in, in maybe C. I'm going to put it in C. It's got some unique stuff. Not super movement heavy. Not not that many options for movement. Uh, good for good for playing NG on. Uh, yeah. I don't know much else to say about that. Brazil. Brazil sucks. I'm putting D. I don't like Brazil. I don't hate it. I know some people really hate it. Uh, <clears throat> very engineer centric map. I feel like lots of really powerful sentry spots. Um, the point is probably the most open Koth point on any map. Uh, you can pretty much see the point from anywhere on the map, and it's a uh, very hard to recapture. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of bad, kind of bad map. But there are some opportunities for a few Pog players, uh, just because the skybox in certain places is quite open. So they're boring, but not, um, might even, I don't know if I'd put it as low as E. Maybe I would. I kind of don't like it. There's a lot of enclosed spaces that are really boring to fight in. The point is way too exposed. Uh, way too easy to hold once you've got it. Yeah, I don't know. It, it might, might even be an E. It might even be a high E. I don't think it's as bad as CTF Sawmill. CTF Sawmill might even be an F, man. That that fucking sucks. Yeah, moving CTF Sawmill down to F. Brazil will be an E. Because it's better. It's, it's, it's definitely worse than all of the other D tier maps. Nucleus. I quite like Nucleus. I'm putting Nucleus in B. Uh, it's got a... I don't know. It's, it's got a lot of... I, I feel like Nucleus rewards m good movement quite a lot. And not in a sort of flashy way. It rewards good fundamentals of movement. Uh, very vertical. It's like surprisingly vertical. Um, lots of uh, opportunities to chase down individual enemies on the flank. Uh, the point is pretty fun to play around, in my opinion. It's not super fun. It can be a little awkward hiding from snipers on the point, but it's fine. It's decent. Uh, yeah, I quite like it. It's fun to get, like, you can get sort of near the enemy spawn, fuck someone up, and then run away pretty effectively, but not, like, too effectively to the point where it's annoying to deal with from the other, from the receiving end. Um, yeah, no, I like it. I like, I like, uh, uh, Nucleus. Pretty fun. Swedish. Look, I hate to say it, but Sweden's not a good map, okay? I'm going to put it in D tier. I don't think it works as a map. There's a couple of reasons. The geometry is super awkward to move around. A lot of the, like, railings, they have these weird sticky out bits. It's not smooth to walk on. It's just very awkward to move around. A lot of stuff is at really awkward heights. Um, and then a big thing, there's, like, a whole half of the map is just useless. Like, almost no one ever goes there. The part where the cliff is... Like, that, that whole part of the map is useless to anyone except snipers and people trying to kill snipers, it, which sucks, because that's kind of a cool... Like, I kind of like that area, but no one ever goes there, because why would you? It's pointless. Uh, the central point is just fucking annoying. Like, it's square, it, and then you have no cover from anyone at, on the, like, rafters on top. So soldiers and demos can just spam stickies and rockets onto the point and you really have very little recourse against them which just feels frustrating to play against and it's not really fun to do either like it's not fun to go up onto the rafters and just spam the point it's just kind of feels lazy and boring um <clears throat> and then one of the biggest problems is there are all of these trees that snipers can just hide in and you just get shot from across the map with no idea you'd have no even you don't even have a way to know where someone's hiding or who shot you and, and that's just annoying uh that's just like a little little rubbing salt in the wound um however Sweden does have one saving grace which is that sometimes you can convince everyone to go half zatoichi on this map and then it becomes fucking really fun because it's really fun playing against a bunch of other people all using the half zetoichi um and it's the only map where people that's sort of a thing that people do uh so if you can convince people to to go half zetoichi on this map and you're dueling them like a fucking kurosawa movie then the map is suddenly fun because you don't get have to deal with all the spam everyone's having fun enjoying themselves 
and you get to swag out with the insta kill. So yeah, that's good. But the map itself is bad. It's just the theme makes people do interesting stuff sometimes. Uh, next up is Freight. Um, I haven't played that much Freight, but I have not enjoyed what I have played. I'm gonna put it in D tier. It's kind of plain and boring mainly. Uh, well, last on well is absolute hell. Uh, it's just a, a terribly designed point. Um, does not work in my opinion. I'm gonna put it in D. I don't think it's bad enough to go in E. Honestly, I haven't played it that much. Maybe no one ever picks it because it's bad. Uh, but yeah, last is absolutely disgraceful. It's very easy to stalemate on this map. Uh, this is this the CP version of well capture point version of well? Um, yeah, I know. I uh, maybe if I played it more, I would have more opinions on it. But no one ever picks it, and every map I've played, every game I played in that, which is like three games, has been mainly boring, kind of frustrating, but not like egregiously so. So I put it in D. Uh, next up is powerhouse. Powerhouse is a weird one. Um, honestly, I, I think it goes in C. It's not super egregious. Uh, but I think it lacks, uh, a lot of the areas feel designed for aesthetics rather than gameplay. Um, like it doesn't have that much super nuanced movement or cover. Uh, it's not like chokey per se, it's just kind of boxy, right? Like it's a bunch of, each point is just kind of in a big box. You know, the, the middle point, is, if you imagine the sky is a ceiling, it is a big square. And then that all the other points are also just big squares, which is just kind of boring, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I just don't think there's that much interest to it. You know, there's not nothing particularly special or nothing that creates some, like, neat dynamics in the fights. It's just kind of big squares. But, you know, it's not bad, per se. It's not, like, got some big problem with sniper sight lines or, uh, you know, anything like that. Uh... And it can be fun to, like, and so, you know, I've had fun on this map. 100% I've had fun on this map. I think it's a, the sort of map that's fun as long as you don't take it too seriously, but I don't think it's got, like, super good potential. Uh, Metalworks. Uh, I haven't played Metalworks that much, I don't think. Let me just remind myself of what this map's like. Ah, yes, this map. Yeah, I haven't played this very much. I think I've played it only a couple times. I know it gets played in comp. Uh... Yeah, I'm not the biggest fan. Not the biggest fan. I mean, not the biggest fan of 5CP in general, but I'm going to put this in D. It's not terrible. Like, it's not the worst thing ever, but kind of stalemate -y. Got some good movement potential, but uh, I don't think it's super balanced for 12v12 casual. Um, probably good if you're a soldier main. Uh, next up is fast lane. Uh, I kind of put it in C tier. I don't hate it. It's Again, it's kind of boxy. Um, last is kind of fun. It, it's not bad. Uh, the second to last point, it being this big open arena, gets pretty chaotic, which can be enjoyable, but can also be frustrating and stalemate-y. Doesn't feel like a super, like, skill-heavy map. Feels like a very coordination-heavy map, you know? Like, you gotta have good team coordination to push each point and to hold, otherwise you're just kind of fucked. Which is annoying when you're playing with randos. Uh, next up is Foundry. Uh, is Foundry the one I think it is? Ah, yes, this map. This is basically the exact same map as Fast Lane, except slightly worse. So I'm going to put it in the bottom of C tier. Snake Water. Uh, not a big fan of Snake Water. <sighs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to say about it. A lot of awkward fights in corridors. A lot of like really big open spaces without like interesting cover or verticality to it kind of a one note map you know like everyone's kind of playing on the same level the flanks don't really work very well so everyone's kind of just doing the same thing not much variety to the gameplay you don't have much options other than to just push the cart um <clears throat> and uh definitely do not like last on this map so i'm gonna put it in d tier granary um I haven't played that much Granary in a 12v12 situation. Uh, I don't know if I've played enough to really have that much of a nuanced opinion on this, but I, I think it's fine. I, I'd put it in C. I'd put it in C. I, I don't have any huge problems with it. it. Again, I mean, it's it's got some nice verticality in certain points, but then other parts are, like, kind of boring and flat and closed off. So, uh, yeah, kind of a mix of stuff that I like and stuff that I don't like. So I'm going to put it in C. Uh, process... 
probably the best of the 5 CP maps, but not the biggest fan of it still. Also going to put it in C. It kind of depends on what team you have. Like, playing process with a good team is actually really fun, but uh, it relies a lot on, like, with an uncoordinated team, uh, it's just fucking stalemate heavy. You know, I might, I don't know, man. I, I, I'm not the biggest fan of this map. It has some interesting movement potential, and I like the mid fights. I like I like the second fights as well. Last is extremely egregious. It's got a terrible last. I, I actually hate it. Pushing into last is just impossible. It's either impossible or you just happen to have killed enough of them fighting for second that you can just roll onto the point and get it for free, which is really annoying because it feels like luck. Like, oh, I have a 20 second respawn time. I guess we lose. You know, it's fucking annoying. Uh, <clears throat> It's not really fun to hold on either. Like I've playing like defending last, you you. It's not even fun because you can't even push out. You're just trapped. It's so choky. Like the the exits and entrances are so thin doorways that you you like you just. It's just fucking annoying. <laughs> but the the consolidation is that it has a a way more interesting other points that are super vertical and move, have a lot of potential for movement. The flanks are actually effective on this map. I think is one of the biggest things. The fl flanks on this map are actually powerful, and there's a reason to go there. Um, so yeah, I may not be the biggest fan of it, but I can't say I hate it. Sometimes I do. Uh, next up is Five Gorge. Um, oh, this fucking map. Yeah, I do not like this map. I do not like this map. This map gets a, gets a D from me. Not a big fan. Very awkward. Very awkward map to play on. Sunshine. Sunshine's definitely one of the better 5 CP maps. Um, the last is way less egregious than any of the others, I think. Like, it's actually kind of fun to play last on this map. Um, uh, mid is also kind of fun. A little chaotic, a little, little scrappy. Uh, but I, I don't hate it. Definitely got some vertical mobility stuff going on. Uh, kind of interesting. Uh, not great for any close range classes like you know demo and pyro not not super good but uh definitely have a more of an individual skill impact versus like only being winnable with a coordinated team push i feel like like you can actually make it feels like you can make a tangible difference by hitting pipes on this map and the flanks are actually fun to play like the sort of valley area is actually fun to play in and effective the the i think they call it cafe area is actually fun to play in and effective um yeah and last is uh definitely way less egregious than the other maps i feel like it it, it feels fair like it feels like difficult in a way that feels fair although i don't particularly like playing on it uh mainly because of the second points like mid is kind of meh it is whatever last is also i mean it, eh, you know fine the second points with the sort of glass cylinder area type thing. Um, it feels a little weird. It's very... E I feel like it's very easy for, uh, like, sticky trapping demos to just fuck you for no reason. And it's very hard to, like, retake. Yeah, I don't know. It's not, it's not amazing. Not terrible. Uh, definitely movement potential, though, that rescues it from being dog shit. So I'm going to put it in C. It's definitely better than, uh, like, Foundry. Uh, turbine is ass. Turbine goes in E. I think we all know this. <clears throat> it can be fun if you, as long as you don't take it seriously. Like, Turbine's kind of a fun troll. No one ever wins. No one ever caps the intelligence. Way too easy for engineers to lock down the intelligence. But as a deathmatch map, it's, it is what it is. 2-4, honestly, might be controversial. I'm putting 2-4 in B. I know it's iconic, um, but I neither particularly love nor particularly hate 2-4. For the culture, though, it get it like it would as a map. Just judging it as a map, it's like a C, maybe even a D. It has a lot of really awkward areas, and I mean, everyone everyone's talked to death about how Two Fort is not a, actually a very good map. But I I like the fact that it has its own culture. It's not as good as High Tower for being sort of a casual deathmatch environment. Not even close. But uh, you know, Two Fort is Two Fort. It's it's iconic. For and uh, I think that deserves some respect, which is why I'm bumping it up to a B. I, <clears throat> I know some people really hate, like, the friendlies aspect of TF2 and this sort of, like, uber-casual nature, but I really like that about the game. So, and 2-4 is kind of emblematic of that, so I'm going to put it in B just for that. And uh, also, 
I think um, I I do think it's possible to have fun on this map. Uh, next up is Double Cross. Not the biggest fan of Double Cross. It's like two fort, but without the the vibes. Put it in C. Uh, maybe it could even go down to a D. But I'm gonna put it in C until something really egregious happens to me on that map, and then I get mad and decide it's shit, which has already happened. I had a really bad match on Double Cross that made me fucking triggered. But then I had a couple of good matches, and and it, I'm like, maybe the map's not so bad. <laughs> uh, I think I think the map has massive problems, but it's fun to fly around the whole middle area with the sticky jumper and uh, trimping around, like, Demonite charging around and stuff. And it's also pretty fun as Pyro. I don't know. I don't really like it as a map. There's a lot of, like, the whole sewers area is really awkward. The whole area near the intelligence just sucks in general. And the mid is fairly plain. Very sniper heavy. Kind of weird. Not super fun. Yeah, I don't know. It could go D, it could go C. I'm gonna put it in C. Um, Next up is Landfall. Let me remind myself of what map this is. Ah, this map. I have played this map literally twice in my life. And one of them was a scout... And it was uh, it was fun to play as Scout, and the other one was as Demonite, and it was not fun to play as Demonite. Uh, I'm going to put this in D. I am not the biggest fan of it for my main classes. I don't imagine it... I haven't played Pyro on this map, but did not enjoy playing Demo on this map. And Scout was kind of fun, but not great. I'm going to put it in the upper end of D. Uh, Gravel Pit. Gravel Pit, kind of ass. Putting it in D. I think we all know this. And now for a hot take, this is definitely a Marmite map, you either love it or you hate it, Dust Bowl. Dust Bowl, I happen to be in the love it camp, <coughs> uh, goes in A tier for me. Fucking love Dust Bowl. Big Dust Bowl fan, because I'm a demo main. Uh, it's just unique. It, no one's ever managed to capture the magic of Dust Bowl again. Like, it, the, the choky spamminess of it, it's hard to explain why it's amazing. It just is. Um... There's a whole bunch of bullshit on this map. This map can be incredibly bullshit heavy. Like, on the first section of Dust Bowl, defending, sometimes you'll just get back capped and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, and attacking Dust Bowl last is definitely the closest thing you can do to living in hell. But that's the point. The point of Dust Bowl is that it condenses all of the stuff about the game that is just chaos and doesn't make any sense. And no one would intentionally design a game like that, and if they did, it wouldn't be fun. Like, everything about this map is antithetical to everything anyone likes about TF2, except for the chaos. It's just spam. That's the whole map is just spam, and sentries on last. It's, just, yeah. There's nothing, no one would do this on purpose, but it's like, it's raw. There's no other word for it. It's raw. It's just got the, it's the rawest map. Like, there's nothing that gives you just the raw, unadulterated suffering of Dust Bowl, and in a good way. So I'm putting it in A, towards the top of A. Big fan of Dust Bowl. It can't, the only reason it's not S tier is uh, Lost. That's it. Lost is just a little too far for me. It's just a little, like, those little annoying 90 degree corner corridors, it's just a little too much. It's really annoying to hold against, like, sometimes you're holding a dust ball last and just feels completely hopeless. Like, you can't even do anything, and then you get hit with the 20-second respawn, and you just get fucked, and you're, it's just annoying. And sometimes you're pushing dust ball last, and obviously it's just impossible. You can never make any progress, no matter how many uber pushes you do. It just doesn't do anything. Uh, your medics keep getting killed by spam. It's impossible. Playing medic on dust ball... If you play Medic on Dust Bowl, you are God's strongest soldier. Because I have tried playing Medic on Dust Bowl, and it is hell. It's like, somehow they know when you're, like, super close to getting Uber, and then suddenly you die. It's Im I have respect for anyone who plays Medic on Dust Bowl. That, that, you know, that's insane. But, that's good. I like that there's a map like that that's actually good. It works. Something about it just works. I don't know what it is. I, I think it's because it's choky, but the chokes... And the spam, it's so pure. It's so pure. I don't know, it's raw. It makes you feel like you're alive. That's the thing about Dust Bowl. Playing Dust Bowl will make you feel like you're alive. That's, I have played more 24-7 Dust Bowl servers than any other map. 
in terms of 24 7 servers it just makes you feel alive and the thing about it is it's addicting because it has those three stages and so you feel like you're making progress there's this illusion of progress and i think the 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 second point on the second stage of dust bowl is genuinely well designed like that is genuinely a fun point to push and hold i don't know why the tunnels with the sticky spam i don't know it works it works for me egypt i'm putting egypt in fucking f tier i hate egypt i hate this map with a passion i i will actually leave a server if it gets picked i hate this fucking map i hate everything about it i've I, it never gets picked because it's terrible and when it does get picked it sucks it sucks for every possible reason a map can suck it's not fun it's not fun no even if you're winning it's not fun when you're winning it's not fun when you're losing it's even less fun it does it, it's meaningless the whole map is meaningless and badly designed it feels bad to just walk around the map it just feels bad to exist in the space it gives off negative energy to just exist in the virtual space of egypt the last point is maybe the worst in the entire game uh but all the points are bad they're just they're really bad actually they're they're extremely bad i hate this map i fucking hate this map next up is mercenary park i do not particularly like mercenary park uh but i also i'm gonna put it in d tier it's not egregiously terrible makes me want to kill myself but i do not like it um next up is moss rock moss rock is a weird one it's definitely a sniper heavy kind of map definitely a snipery map um but i quite like i i don't particularly like the first point on the bridge uh but i do like specifically holding last on moss rock moss rock is fun to defend last on i i don't really know why maybe it's the train so that kind of saves it from being a d to me because there is something about this map in a particular circumstance where i'm defending last no matter what class i'm on it's fun i've played ng i've played pyro i've played demo i've played sniper i've played scout i've played heavy defending last on this map i've always had fun attacking last i don't know if i'd call it fun per se it just kind of happens it's not super i don't know even when you lose defending last i think it's fun i i don't know uh next up is mountain lab we're almost done here only two left one of them is the penultimate mountain lab i like mountain lab again a very egregious last a terrible last actually one of the worst in the game but the rest of the map is good actually i don't know if i even say that it's a fucking i don't know why i like this map i shouldn't like this map i'm gonna put it in b tier because i i do have a positive experience every time it gets picked but i can't tell you why the the first point takes forever it, it, you always get it right you you almost never get like rolled on the first point if you're if you're attacking you always capture the first point but it always takes forever which is just a not it's just a time sink for no reason and that part of the map like the the sort of big hill is just boring to play on there's nothing really interesting going on there it's just kind of boring so like that part's kind of lame and then the second point is always super easy to capture you never get held up at the second point like the second point is a role for the attacking team the defenders don't even have a chance to hold the second point because there's a big slab of wood which gets in the way of their sight line into it so they have to push into it and then you have the high ground so all of their advantage holding the second point is just impossible so the second point is super easy for the attacking team and then last is a fucking insane choke it, it very dependent on whether you have good engineers with good teleports if you have good engineers with good teleports on attack it's it can be fun um again it's definitely defending it it definitely the thing about it is it always feels frantic it always feels like you're just barely hanging on even when you're actually rolling and i i kind of like that about it it has some good sniper spots that i don't think are overpowered but they definitely are empowering to snipers where it's not just useless um pretty fun to play engineer on no, on all the points really good map for engineer pretty decent map for pyro until last the first two points i think are pretty good for pyro uh last is pretty terrible for pyro still doable like it's not necessarily 
completely switch off, but I don't think you can really be like in a super attacking pyro. You but it, it more of a like support pyro, you know. But still fun, I like playing that role. Fun to play Medic on. This is a great map to play Medic on, both attacking and defending. I've had a lot of fun playing Medic on this map. Um yeah. I don't know. I kinda like it. I don't I don't think I should like it, but I kinda do like it. Like all of the I mean it does yeah. I don't know. And finally, CP Steel. I don't like Steel, but I don't hate it. I'm putting it in D. Um, yeah, I'm putting it in D. I, I, I don't... Any of the... All of the points individually, except for E, suck and are boring. Like the first... A, boring. You always win it. Almost always. If you don't win it, that really sucks, right? But that's just, like, unfair team comp. Uh, but, like, you always eventually get A... And you always eventually get B, and those are both boring. They're just sort of flat, nothing much happens. The B is really easy to take, really difficult to hold. And there's some interesting corridors where you can do some... Like, the corridors in this map are a good example of how corridors should be done. It's like, they're still corridors, but they're wide enough that you have, like... You can move around in them comfortably. I think it, I think the corridors in this map are well done, generally speaking. Um... Obviously, the big notable thing about Steel is the, the fact that you can cap E from the very beginning. Although it's basically useless. Uh, it's just kind of a gimmick. But yeah, I don't really like any of the, the... The big problem is that all of the points are boring. Like, none of the points are fun to hold or fun to attack. Every All of them are just kind of frustrating no matter what side you're on or no matter what's happening. It always just feels more frustrating than fun. The bits of the map around the points, I think, are fine. It's just the points themselves are just kind of boring. Like, there's there's not... They're either... They're mainly just too enclosed and too boxy. Anyway, that's every map in TF2 that, that I'm actually familiar with. Uh, ranked. Okay, okay. Guys, I know. A lot of TF2 talk. A lot of TF2 conversation. We're gonna... I know. It, I'm, I am hyper fixated. I am autistic. I know what to tell you. I know what to tell you. I have autism. Okay, I don't think about other things. I think about one thing, and that is Team Fortress 2. You know what? Right now, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make a thumbnail for this video, and you know what the thumbnail is gonna be? It's gonna be, it's gonna be you know, in in PL upward. That's what's gonna be. Um, I, I gotta find a good picture. So I'll do that while I talk because I just did the best thing, like the coolest thing I've ever done in Team Fortress 2. I just did the coolest thing I've ever done in Team Fortress 2 on my last game of the day. And the problem was, I wasn't fucking recording. I didn't have OBS replay buffer going. Do you know how annoying that is? I will just describe in words what I did. And you're just going to have to believe me. Dotesmite was watching. They can corroborate my story. But no one, no one saw it. I mean, everyone on the server saw it. But I wasn't fucking recording. Which is very annoying. Very annoying. I don't normally do cool stuff. Anyway, I will now describe what happened. So we were on Barn Blitz. Okay, we're on Barn Blitz. And I'm playing defense. I always forget, get it mixed up. Which one's red and which one's blue? I don't even pay attention to it when I'm playing. I just sort of don't even think about it consciously. Who, who def- I don't know. Anyway, I was defending <laughs> on Barn Blitz. And... I go up to, the, it's before the round start, so they're all in spawn, and I run, you know, to their spawn, and I go to the little side door. So on Barn Blitz, there's three exits from, from their spawn, right? Uh, I believe it's blue as the attackers, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It must be. So there's three exits from blue spawn. There's the big central exit right behind the cart, right? Then there's one right next to that, which is sort of on the side, on like a little sort of corner, or, or not like, I don't know how to, you know what I mean, right? Like you, okay, like to the, to the left, pointing out, facing outwards. When you leave from the big central spawn door, there's another smaller spawn door to the left of you. And then there's sort of a cubby to the right. There's sort of a cubby and, and around that little corner, there's another spawn door. You know the one I'm talking about? That one is where I was and I was there and there was a soldier on the other side of the door and we were just taunting back and forth taunting each other right we were just doing taunts as you do before round start and then a bunch of people from the other team all gather at that door 
watching us sort of taunting. And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to sit here and just not leave because I'm having fun taunting this guy. I'm having fun just hanging out, just hanging out, playing some casual TF2. So I'm just, instead of like doing the normy boring thing, which is, and then you run away to find a, a, a safe position when the round starts. I'm just going to sit here in front of this door and just, just try and, I don't know, just shoot fire at them and then hopefully run away, but probably just get instantly killed. Because it's fun to do that, it's funny, I don't know. So, the doors open, basically the entire team is gathered at this small door. It opens, a demo fires a pipe at me, which I reflect and kill the entire enemy team instantly. Okay, maybe it wasn't the entire team, but it was like at least six or seven instantly. It's the craziest reflect. I. It was insane. It was just a completely random. I wasn't even, I didn't even know that I was trying to do it. I was just did it automatically. I didn't, I wasn't, didn't even notice there was a demo there. I, I was just, I just reflected, ref, reflexive, it was a reflexive reflect. It was a reflective, reflexive reflect, right? And he shoots his pipe. I didn't even, not even a reactive reflect. It was a re reflexive reflect. And it, ding, 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 ding. And then everyone's going crazy in the chat. Like, what the fuck just happened? That was crazy. The Insta, it was insane. It was insane. You're just going to have to believe me. It was like at least seven, six, at least six people Insta deleted. I don't know how. I don't know why none of them, whatever. I'm not going to question it. It happened. And it was very cool. Oh, you know what actually probably happened now that I think about it? Is probably multiple people were sh shooting projectiles at me at the same time. And I probably reflected multiple projectiles at the same time, which is why it did so much damage. Yeah, that makes sense. Because obviously, as soon as the spawn doors open, if you're heavy, I mean, sorry, if you're a demo or a soldier, you're going to shoot immediately. So if I reflected basically immediately, it's pretty likely that I reflected multiple projectiles back. And that's why it did so much damage. Okay, that makes sense. Either way, it was pretty fucking crazy. And I wasn't recording. And I'm so mad that I wasn't recording. It was very cool. Okay, I managed, uh, I'm going to say a couple of things. Firstly, I ran into someone, for you this is just the last clip, for me this is two days later, but I ran into someone in TF2 who had a recording from their perspective of the Reflect Air Blast kill. It was actually a 5k, which is less impressive than I think I said fucking 7. <laughs> um, it was still cool though, I have their perspective of it. I'll probably upload it, I put it on Reddit, um, no one seemed to like it. Not that it really matters to me. I guess it's not that impressive. Probably more impressive if it was from my perspective. But, um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably upload that right now to IDMR, actually, while I'm talking to you. Um, just so... Oh, I don't know if I will. I can't be bothered. Whatever, who fucking gives a shit? I'm over this. The second thing I want to say is today I watched all of the... Evil Dead films. Oh, okay. Not the, the all the, the the I watched Evil Dead one, two, and Army of Darkness. I know there's like other ones, but I watched the the the, the original trilogy, as it were. I for the first time, my my real life friend who is known to the channel as Lil Crazy Bitch, uh, aka the Plot Hole Phantom, has been banging on at me to watch Evil Dead for years, and I've just never gotten around to it. Then today. I was watching the new um, Red Letter Media video about the new Evil Dead Rises or whatever the fuck it's called sequel, Evil Dead Rise, half in the bag episode. And I was halfway through the episode when I was like, I gotta watch these fucking movies. So I was planning to just watch like Evil Dead 1 and then maybe keep going. But I just watched them back to back to back. And, um,. So much, you know, like, honestly, I don't know if it was a really a, a good idea. Because, if you don't know, I think I'm the only person in the world that didn't know this. But Evil Dead 2 is not actually really a sequel to Evil Dead 1. It's more like a remake. Um, it's it's a bit odd. It's Yeah, it's kind of like a remake of Evil Dead 1. So, because they're, two, they're like, both sort of the same film, and the same things kind of happen in them... They've kind of blended together in my memory where I'm like, because <laughs> I watched them back to back, it's kind of like watching the same film 
twice with slight differences, like the endless eight in Haruhi or something. Um, so I don't know if that was really a good idea. Kind of, kind of mixed them up in my mind. I, I, I just watched them back to back. But Army of Darkness, obviously being quite different from the other two, stands out to me. But yeah, I mean, I liked the movies. They're all good. Army of Darkness was my least favorite. Um, although I liked it, uh, I thought there was definitely a couple of parts to the movie that I think didn't really work, where the humor wasn't really working for me, and the maybe the action wasn't really working for me. Like, specifically, I remember there's a whole sequence where Ash is like, I'm going to go off on the quest, I'm going to go into the woods. And he goes into the woods, and then you get the iconic sort of Sam Raimi POV in the woods shot. And suddenly, it's like Ash, who in this movie, in Army of Darkness, is supposed to be really brave and cool and badass, suddenly becomes as like really terrified, turns around and, and runs away desperately, like on a dime. And you never see what it is he's running from, because it's only from the camera's perspective. But then you do see shots of him running away from the front, where you'd imagine you should be able to see what's behind him, which felt a little awkward to me. But that's not really what I'm complaining about, because that's fine. That's just maybe like an artistic choice, and it, I, I think the POV shots are really cool. But he runs away, and already it's kind of weird and out of character. He goes and hides in this windmill, and then in the windmill, a really neat concept thing happens. And this movie is full of really great concepts. All three movies are full of amazing concepts, where he shatters a mirror and looks down and sees his reflection in all of the mirror pieces... And then his, the little tiny versions of him from the mirror jump out and start fucking with him. That's a great concept. However, this whole sequence where he's fighting like five or six little tiny versions of him, and it's very slapstick and very goofy, really didn't work for me. It was kind of, I don't want to use the word cringe. I wouldn't really go that far. It was mostly just unentertaining. <laughs> I I thought... It was supposed to be funny. I didn't really find it funny. Maybe it was supposed to be creepy. I didn't really find it creepy. It was just kind of a whole load of nothing. Awkward. I would, I'd say it was awkward. It felt oddly paced. The emotional content was kind of weird. I don't know. I didn't. I, that section was, was not very good. <laughs> and there's a few bits in Army of Darkness that I feel are, are kind of like that. Where it just doesn't really work for me. So when it works, it really works, especially towards the end of the climax of the movie. Fantastic, hilarious, action-packed, badass, funny, great. As for the first two movies, I, you, you know, Lil Crazy Bitch had been telling me to skip Evil Dead 1. He'd been saying it wasn't very good. Like, But personally, I watched it, and I really liked it. Uh, I th I I thought there was a lot of incredibly creative filmmaking on display, like really cool shots and ideas and concepts. It's it's very much like a low budget, high concept. Not high concept in terms of how people use that, but I mean like a, a lot of a lot of like throw everything at the wall and see what sticks kind of stuff. There's just a bunch of really memorable imagery and shots from the movie. Like uh, you know, uh, just thinking off the top of my head, there's a really nice like overhead tracking shot that's really cool there's a shot of a uh, a light bulb filling with blood that i thought looked really neat uh there's a really cool shot where the camera is like behind the the pendulum on a grandfather clock that was really cool there's just a whole bunch of like shots that are just very creative not to mention the very heavy use of pov which is obviously in part due to budgetary limitations to imply a monster's there, but it's really effective at creating tension, and also it's used in ways that I've never seen. Like, for example, there's a POV shot where the camera itself crashes through a window as as the monster's crashing through the window. That actually happens in both Evil Dead 1 and 2, although in Evil Dead 1 it happens towards the end, in Evil Dead 2 it happens towards the beginning. It's it, That's a really great shot. I mean, there's a bunch of just really interesting cinematography going on throughout all the films, and especially with these POV shots. Uh, putting the camera in weird, unexpected places, either to create a sense of, like, sur surreal like, surrealness, 
or offness or sometimes for comedy really good uh the gore is top notch in both movies but honestly some of the gore in evil dead one really worked for me especially towards the end of the movie there was some really good effective gore um that was pretty creepy a lot of the makeup in evil dead one is not that good but when it's good it's really good um a lot of the sound design in evil dead one was way more interesting than anything else in the franchise sound design wise maybe it would be maybe that just came as sort of an accident accidental result of the low budget but i i personally liked it it made it unique and stand out very interesting you know normally sound design is just sort of a background element that you don't even notice in films so the fact that there's like something memorable about the sound design I was like oh that sounds really cool i mean that was throughout evil dead 1 and 2 but especially evil dead 1 has a lot lot bunch of like synthesizer kind of sounds that i thought were really neat um evil dead 2 is more uh, evil dead 1 is also slower paced and has more i feel like tension building in it which sometimes works but i feel like it makes the first little like the kind of introductory segment of the film is a little bit of a slog I can imagine on a rewatch it's really a slog, um, but it was a little bit, it went on for a while. Uh, Evil Dead 2 is the opposite. Evil Dead 2 is like balls to the wall, no breaks, non-stop, right? Like even, it, it goes from, it's just extremes. It either goes like complete silence and tension to absolute, everyone screaming, everything is blood, there's zombies everywhere, everything's exploding, you know. It's like it has two two modes: either everything is happening or nothing is happening, and no nowhere in between. Uh, it's basically go 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 from the from 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 the second the movie begins. It's like Sam Raimi was like heard the the thing that the intro to the first movie is too long, and he decided to make the intro to the second movie as short as he could possibly get away with. Like it just basically drops you right in. You get like a tiny bit of exposition, and then boom, the movie started, and it just doesn't stop. Um, the makeup and a, a lot of the stop motion effects in the second film are way above the level of the first film. I kind of like the jank of the first film, but I also like, I liked both. They both worked for me. A lot of the humor, I feel like it's kind of hit or miss when it's funny. It's really funny, but mostly it's kind of like goofy, not in like a laugh out loud way, but in kind of a general atmosphere of slapstick, which I, it kind of reminds me of like maybe like the Princess Bride or especially Army of Darkness. It goes full in on like Princess Bride, um, Labyrinth. I got a lot of Labyrinth, like kind of fantasy, goofy, comic booky storybook kind of thing. Uh, but in the context of bloody zombies and horror movie stuff, I think it was pretty good. It was much less comedy focused than I thought it was going to be, given everyone talks about it as a horror comedy, but it's mostly horror with like some comedy uh yeah i don't know what else to say about the movies they're good they're pretty good i don't think they're gonna be on my top 10 but i'm glad i watched them i feel like i've absorbed a part of culture that i didn't have before you should be allowed to run over pedest no (laughs) not pedestrians protesters with your car if they're blocking the road i think so i think you should be allowed to they're blocking the fucking road people have fucking jobs to go to I mean, this is why you use public transport. Ain't no fucking just stop oil protesters standing in the way of my my tube train. My my trains not happening, Buster. But a lot of people don't have the opportunity in America, especially, to take public transport to work. In which case, run them fuckers over. Run them over. Just kill them. Just kill them. Lots of people need to die in this world. There are lots of people in this world who, frankly, are wasting oxygen for the rest of us. I might be one of them, but hey, they haven't stopped. They haven't got to me yet. They're trying. They haven't got to me yet. I don't know if they are trying, actually. I don't think I'm that important. Um, And some of these people are blocking the road. They need to die. You know what's interesting to me is America right now is is Florida, that weird bit. It's like a little dick sticking out of America. Florida's fucking weird, man. Everyone knows this. But right now, 
they've taken a very, you know, they got dis, disanct, they got Ron de Sanctimonious in charge, right? And they're passing a whole bunch of, like, right-wing laws, which the really egregious ones, in my opinion, are the anti-trans ones. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of news about this, like a shocking amount. Like, it seems like every other week there's some new right-wing law passed in Florida. I think the anti-trans ones are pretty egregious. The other ones, you know, mostly about, like, illegal immigrants. That doesn't really seem that egregious to me. I guess maybe I don't have good context. For, like, I don't really understand America's illegal immigration problem. Um, but I feel like, you know, they did immigrate illegally. They knew what they were in for. They knew what they were doing. <clears throat> maybe this is like, I don't know, maybe I should have more empathy for these people. But Mexico's not that bad. Like, what's wrong with Mexico? I mean, yeah, there's a lot of cartels. There's also a lot of gangs in America. I don't know. The, the, the cartels are only in certain parts of the country. There, there are places you can go. Anyway, I don't know that much about Mexico, but it can't be that bad. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It can't be, Lots of people live in Mexico and are fine. I, I, you know, what's wrong with Mexico? Nothing. Good food, good music, good people. Every Mexican I've ever talked to has been super fucking chill. Those guys are chill. There's not that many Mexicans here. But every time I've talked to a Mexican, they're so chill and nice. I don't know. And they make great food, strong families. I like them, personally. <laughs> so far. I'm not sure about the, the cartel ones, but that's not, that's, that's a minority. Anyway, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I wasn't, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I guess I'm from a first world country, so I don't really understand what compels people to illegally immigrate. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm sure I'm missing context here. Uh, but yeah, it's not like they're, you know, saying you get killed if you're an illegal immigrant in in Florida. Although maybe they will be saying that at some point. But I don't know. I, I, I don't think this... I, I want to clarify. I don't think these laws are, like, great. I, I don't think that this is, like, probably a particularly pressing issue. I think that I, I don't agree with <laughs> these laws. Like, I... I'm sure the the reasons for this illegal immigration crisis are, are a little more complex than like you can't just make life hard for immigrants, right? You gotta solve the root of the problem, which is probably way harder because it would probably require international collaboration, and that's annoying. But anyway, I'm not gonna here to fucking give a nuanced political take because I don't know anything about politics. Um. <clears throat> The point I'm trying to make here is I'm interested in this Florida situation because they're really, like, they've taken a pretty hard right turn. Like, America's already, in general, take like, especially the South, taken a pretty hard right turn. But Florida in particular seems to have taken a particularly hard right turn. Um, And I'm really curious just to see how this is going to turn out for them. Like, is this just going to... Because I don't really know, like, it's all social policy. You know, like they have, I haven't heard anything about like m massive tax cuts or anything like this. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. It's all social policy. I feel like it's basically just like, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just curious to see what happens to like Florida as a state after this happened. Like, like assuming they're going to keep going further and further right. I, I'm, I have no idea. I mean, my inclinations tell me that this is probably a bad idea for them. This is probably not in Floridians' best interest. But, you know, it's a complex situation. Anything could happen. And I'm curious. I'm ex I am ex—I don't know if I would say I'm excited, but I'm definitely curious to see how this goes for them. Uh, yeah. And today, you know, I ordered, ordered more Huel. Um, I got chicken and mushroom pasta, which is the best Huel hot and savory. Pasta bolognese, which I also think is pretty good. And I got a new one, which is madras, which I guess is like a curry. It's the the spiciest one they have. Which I'll be curious to see if it's actually spicy. Because they said the fucking green chili was spicy. Like, they have a chili scale of what, 0 to 3 chilies in spiciness. And the green curry was 2 
out of three chilies. And that wasn't really spicy at all. Like it had a tiny kick to it. It was barely noticeable. So yeah, I don't know. You know, I'm 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 neither a particularly huge spicy food guy nor someone who is like against spicy food. Uh but yeah, I'll be curious to see how that goes. Had oh, you here's an interesting thing that happened to me today. So I had to cancel an appointment today with, with the bank. Annoying, right? Annoying, real life, boring, really boring, ridiculously boring, fucking makes me suicidal shit. And I had to write an email to do it. And I was like, literally stressing, like, fuck, how am I, how do I write like a formal email about this? And then I remembered, we live in 2023, I can just ask an AI to write the email for me. So I did it. And it did an excellent job. It did a really good job. I just asked Bing. I just asked Bing to write the email for me. And it did it great. Thanks, Bing. Thanks, Microsoft. I love AI. These things are these things are great. <clears throat> so that was cool. Uh, let's see, what else? Played Team Fortress 2 today, of course. Played really badly. Got trick stabbed, actually, a couple times. Got trick stabbed and made me go fucking insane. Because I got, I got circle strafed, or, or whatever. I think it's circle strafing is what it's called. And um, normally I don't fall for that one. Uh, I don't know, my brain was just not on today. But it's really bad. Like, getting trick stabbed really makes you feel bad. In a, like an existential way. Not like, like dying to a, a, a crits flog pyro makes you feel bad, right? Because it doesn't, it feels like you can't really do anything to avoid it. If you just get surprised by, you know, or like dying to a a spy who you just had no idea was there. Like that kind of makes you feel bad. There's nothing really you can do to avoid it. Dying to a sniper from across the map. Yeah, it kind of feels bad. But di- like that, that feels bad in a like, oh, come on, that's not fair kind of way. Right. Which honestly, how not fair is it in all of those situations? I, you know. There's definitely an element by which game sense and situational awareness can save you in those situations, right? So how not fair actually is it? I don't know. Also, yeah, I'm still ranting about TF2. This is my podcast. I'm obsessed with the game. Uh, but that, getting trick stabbed is different because, you know, especially when you know, like, you're, you're not an absolute noob. If you're an absolute noob, I it feel, you know, you don't really know what the fuck's going on. But if you've played the game for a few hundred hours and you know how trick stabs work and you still fall for it, that doesn't make you feel bad in a like, oh, come on, there's nothing I could have done about that. That's so annoying. That's unfair. It doesn't make you feel bad like that. It makes you feel existentially bad. Like, am I just an NPC? Is my mo- is my behavior so predictable and formulaic? Like, am I, do I even have free will? That's, that's, that's the sort of thing it makes you feel like. Like, do I even have free will? How much control am I really in of my actions? But then I, then you remember, oh yeah, you just have to stand still. It's, it's actually incredibly easy to deal with trick stabbing spies. You just have to, like, overcome your muscle memory that you do with every other class. Every other class, you need to use your movement keys to deal with them. But a trick stabbing spy, you need to stand perfectly still. Which is, you know, just something I guess you just have to learn by repetition. And I'm also generally good at it. Like, that's the thing that's that made me feel bad, is that I guess my brain was just off today. Because normally, I, I, I laugh at spies. I laugh at spies because they're, they're so bad. They don't know how to deal with you when you just stand still and look directly at them. And that's amusing. Also, Demo Knight and Pyro are both counters to spy. So... That's, it's generally, I'm kind of a menace to spies, and that's fun. Uh, but today, I don't know, maybe this spy was just particularly good, or there were a few particularly good spies. My brain was just off, I don't know. Made me get a bit existential with it. Made me get it, I'm not complaining. It, it's good Good on them. It takes, it takes skill and practice to get good at trick stabbing, I'm, I'm sure. Um, you know, and it was definitely my fault. I know how to deal with it, and I didn't. That's not, not what I'm talking about here. I'm gonna say I got existential about it. I was like, damn, do I even have free will? So that happened. Uh, eating's been weird lately. Um, I've, I've, every time, weird, weird eating things have been happening with me where I'll get, it's like I'm barely eating or like I'm eating too much. I don't know how to explain it. But what happens is I'll get hungry, like after breakfast. I'll have breakfast and that'll be normal. And then, like, at some point, you know, 
four or five hours later or something. I don't really know how long. I'll get hungry again. And I'll make a normal sized meal. Like nothing crazy, just normal. And then I'll eat it. And then after I eat it, I'll feel way too full. But I'm not eating like crazy. Like today, my meal that made me feel way too full was just an egg sandwich. Not even crazy. Two slices of bread and two eggs and like a little bit of ham. That's it. Nothing even heavy. Nothing crazy at all. That's like a fairly small meal. And yet after eating it, I felt overly full. And this is like keeps happening to me. I don't understand what it is. What's happening that makes me feel overly full after eating these normal sized meals? And I'm theorizing it's because I was eating Huel, which had a lot of like fiber in it. And that, then I ran out. So I'm eating stuff that isn't Huel. I'm a bit confused. Don't really know what that is about. Um, yeah, a bit strange. Uh, but I guess I... I don't know what to do about that. Guess I just have to eat fewer and smaller meals. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, uh, no, nope, I got nothing. I got nothing. I don't know if I've talked about this before, but there's this weird phenomenon of like people who I used to follow from doing cardistry and magic who have then pivoted to becoming very successful doing other stuff on social media. <clears throat> the big examples of this. Uh, the sort of most softcore example, this guy called Chris Ramsey. Now, he um, sort of pivoted his YouTube channel towards doing these sorts of, like, puzzle boxes. Um, but he still also does magic content sometimes. So it's not like a hard pivot. Like, he still is very... He still does magic and makes YouTube videos about magic tricks and, and so on. Um, I feel really bad for this guy because his channel's, like, falling off and he's very open about this. He's, like... I guess the stuff I made has just passed in popularity. He doesn't know what to do. I feel bad for him. Because he seems like a really nice guy. <clears throat> um, but I love his... I, I'm not super into his his puzzle box videos. But he uh, he's, a, he's a really talented magician. And um, he's, uh, he, he's introduced me to a bunch of other really talented magicians. Uh, like, he likes to showcase lesser known talent and it's really cool so i i like chris ramsey he's a cool guy um <clears throat> i'm sure he's doing fun. uh but then there's others like the big there's a guy called pete mckinnon i don't know if he's still around um peter mckinnon yeah so this guy <clears throat> he's like one of the biggest if not the biggest like camera gear youtuber he's a huge huge camera gear youtuber um you you might have even heard of him but he was originally a magician, and he got into videography by shooting trailers for selling magic tricks. Um, so that guy's interesting. I, I think he doesn't even talk about magic at all anymore. I don't think he has for years. Uh, and he's really big. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. There's other ones that are weird. Like, for example, uh, there was a guy called Rick Lax. Um, I don't know if he still exists, but... There was a guy called Rick Lax who was relatively well respected in the man in the the magic community. Um, he, uh, you know, he he made a few original tricks and sold them as you do. And you know, he was like an advisor, and uh, I, some of his tricks are pretty good. You know, some stuff on Theory Eleven. I remember saying I I never bought any myself, but I think you know he has some decent tricks. Um, yeah, I mean, he was just kind of well, to relatively well, you know, well respected magician. But then he pivoted super hard to Facebook <clears throat> in the era when a bunch of people pivoted to Facebook video. I don't know if you remember this. There was a uh, a time when uh, Facebook decided to artificially inflate the view numbers that videos would get on their platform. And so a bunch of, especially companies, but a bunch of people as well, pivoted hard to Facebook video because it looked like they were getting really high numbers. In reality, it counted a view as just any time anyone scrolled past the post, um, <clears throat> which I think they've been like forced to change their policy on that now. Um, but they were like knowingly doing it and, you know, it's whatever. But anyway, this guy basically decided to make the world's most obnoxious Facebook magic videos that are, like, fake, um, like, camera tricks, really bad, <clears throat> like, five-minute crafts tier. Yeah, it's not good. 
I was like, I don't know how this, and he's he's even like had like looking him up now. There's like two Drew Gooden videos calling him out, which have five million views each, respectively. Um, <clears throat> and I I think you know a lot of people in the magic world they don't want to call him out on it because he's just trying to get the bag or whatever. But he's kind of lost all respect from everyone. He went from a guy that only magicians knew. Who was like, yeah, I guess he makes some neat tricks. Works behind the scenes in the magic industry, you know. To this guy who's well known for being extremely obnoxious on Facebook. And it would not surprise me if he's like pivoted really hard to TikTok now or something. Um, anyway, <clears throat> there's one more that I really want to talk about. And this is actually the big one. Which is a guy called Andre Jick. Now, if you look up Andre Jick right now um well you can scroll down and you can find this video called crazy cardistry by andre jick uncut and he was one of these guys who um was really big into pushing cardistry right like he was a a magician who got into cardistry and then really tried to like push cardistry to be you know, you know there was some in the early days on the magic forms and stuff there was there was a, a bit of tension between cardists and magicians. There were a lot of magicians who were, thought cardistry was just like pointless and showy and had nothing to do with magic, which it does have nothing to do with magic, but they didn't like that. They it hadn't really there was a bit of tension there. Like he was one of these guys who was really being like, no, cardistry is like its own thing. And it's super cool, and it's related to magic, but it's not magic. <clears throat> And, you know, he's he did a whole bunch of popularizing it and education, like teaching people cardistry and stuff. Everyone loved him. He was really well liked. Uh, but he's now pivoted to just the worst finance bro content I've ever seen. Like, I've stumbled across him. I, I didn't even, like, I, I got one, of, I saw one of his videos in the recommended. It wouldn't have even registered in my brain. But I saw his face and I was like, is that, is that Andre Jick? What the fuck? This was a while ago. This was like ages ago. And I clicked and like, holy shit, his videos are so bad. He was like a crypto guy. It's like a hardcore crypto guy for ages. Really bad. And oh man, his videos are so bad. Like he doesn't understand anything. I don't know if he's just lying for views. <clears throat> like he does a lot of fear mongering videos, which a lot of finance people, like if you go on his YouTube channel, it's all fear-mongering stuff, his recent stuff. It's all just the terrible fear-mongering stuff. It's really bad. Like, it feels like he's trying to incite a bank run or something. <laughs> I've also just seen that he reused the same picture of his face in three thumbnails in a row, which is really funny. Four thumbnails. That's And he, he, he edited the color of his t-shirt, but it's clearly the same picture of him. That's so stupid. Yeah, anyway, this guy fucking sucks now. Which is so sad, because he used to be a cool guy who did cardistry stuff. And he doesn't know shit, by the way. Like, I'm not, I'm not a finance guy, okay? I, I don't, I don't know much about, right? Like, I, I, I don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a super smart finance guy. But I know a little bit about, like, macroeconomics. A little bit. I know enough to know that a lot of the stuff he says is absolute horse shit. Like, he completely misunderstands how inflation works. But I don't think he just misunderstands. Like, he just lies to, to Fearmonger for no reason that I can tell other than, like, views. Also, that picture of his face, he's used it. He just keeps using this same picture of his face over and over again in his thumbnails. It's really weird now that I've noticed it. It's just the same. And this one, he's used the same pic two different pictures but it's the same picture but just flipped this is so bad these are terrible thumbnails man this fucking guy i don't know how you fall off that it's a that's a that's a hard fall from grace anyway <clears throat> um i have a zoom an important zoom call in a few hours and some time to kill and i decided to do a strange thing i've decided to do a strange thing which is it's been enough time now that the whole and listen I understand if you don't want to hear this. I understand. But there was this whole arc about Marvel movies, right? Which was, uh, everyone loves these Marvel movies. Then 
the pendulum swinging the other way. How can people like these Marvel movies? Martin Scorsese says they're not cinema. Everyone was obnoxious about it. It was the most boring debate to ever happen on the internet. It was stupid. Then, this was like the peak. You had you had Endgame, right? And then the Marvel movies themselves just got drastically worse. Um, yeah, I don't fucking remember which ones. There was like the Black Widow one. And then there was... Fuck, what's it, what was it? Doctor Strange one that was bad. Like, they just got... got they just... I mean, to me... Like, I don't like a lot of the ones that people like, you know, I, I, uh, whatever, I'm not here to talk about it. Like, everyone got really bored of talking about it. The movies got really bad for a while. They had, like, a series of really bad ones. And then people were talking about that and, like, is this the end of Marvel? And it feels like we finally reached the point where no one's even talking about it anymore. The culture has finally moved on from the Marvel movies. So it was, like, during the point when everything was falling off, it's, like, Now's the time we look back and we examine the cultural... Rele- but then everyone was doing it. But that was also part of the cultural impact of those... You know what I'm saying? What I'm getting at here is that I think at this point we're finally, truly past the MCU era. I think it's, I think it's truly over now. No one even talks about it or acknowledges that these movies exist to even to complain about them. It's so over. Everyone got bored of the discourse and moved on. And so now, I am going to watch Infinity War and Endgame today. Because I feel like now that the culture has all moved away from it, I can examine these movies for what they are. I don't know why I'm doing this. I don't particularly like, you know, I like some of the, uh, I've talked about this before, I think. I like some of the, uh, I, um, what's it fucking, I like the Guardians of the Galaxy 1. I thought that movie was, you know, decent, um... I I don't know which ones I liked. <clears throat> there was a lot of ones that everyone liked that I thought that I watched and thought was really bad. Like all the Spider-Man ones, everyone was like, "Oh, these ones are good." I I didn't think any of them were very good. I thought they were all pretty bad. Um uh the the Captain America the Winter Soldier, people are like, "Oh, that's just a really good like conspiracy thriller or, or something or whatever." I I don't know. I found that movie really unwatchably bad. Yeah, I'm not I'm not a big fan of Marvel, but I'm not a massive hater either. Like I'm not going out of my way to hate. I, I just never really cared about them that much. I kind of watched them kill time sometimes, but I didn't really care about keeping up with the chronology of them or whatever. I also really didn't like Black Panther. That movie sucked. It was I I it was really weird how everyone pretended to love that movie. That was a weird time. What was the deal with that? I mean, I we all know I can't say what the deal with that was, but we all know that that was a win. <laughs> that was a that was a pretty funny thing, when everyone pretended to love Black Panther, the world's most mid movie. Anyway, I'm gonna watch these stupid fucking films and see what happens to me, because I've just got time to kill. Holy shit! I forgot how fucking goofy these movies are. Why why was everyone so obsessed with these movies? It's so goofy. This is insane. I think the whole world went fucking nuts for a while. I guess they slowly built up to the goofiness to like acclimatize people. These movies are so goofy. Holy fuck. That opening sequence was so bad. Listen, I like some goofy from time to time. This is not the good kind of goofy. So bad. I remember when these movies came out and all the dumbass normies were like, you know, Thanos is a really sympathetic villain who really has a point. I shouldn't need to point this out to you, right? I'm sure you listening are all very smart. You, you, you can you can think about how wiping out 50% of the population on the planet would go. You, I'm sure you're, you're not 70 IQ, right? You can probably figure this out yourself. But just in case... You know, let me just go through this for a second. So we have countries in the real world with massively shrinking populations, right? Like South Korea and Japan and China. These countries are not living in a world of abundance. They're going through fucking serious economic problems. Because when you build a system to maintain a certain number of people and be maintained by a certain number of people... Cutting that number in half doesn't just leave you with twice the stuff. Because that stuff has to be made by people. 
infrastructure has to be maintained by people. Food has to be grown. You don't just get stuff for free. <laughs> stuff doesn't just come out of nowhere. It's obviously fucking stupid. Apologies for the uh, construction noises that you might be able to hear outside. Um, this movie's really bad. Like, there's... Fugs, there's loads of stuff in the movie that just is unexplained or doesn't make sense or is out of character. Like, instead of doing character development, they just have characters do stuff as if they developed. Like, when Doc... It's so stupid to even say their names as if they're real characters. When Doctor Strange and Tony Stark first meet up, and then Doctor Strange is like, if I have to choose between the the stone and your life... I'm gonna let you die every time. And then it's like made a point of, right? And then they hang out for a bit. And then he, when Thanos is gonna kill Iron Man, he's just like, no, don't do it. I'll give you the stone. And then afterwards, Tony Stark is like, why did you do that? That wasn't smart because now a whole bunch of other people are gonna die. What was the point of that? And he's just like, we're in the end game now. He doesn't even answer the question. He just says, we're in the end game now. And then the, then it cuts to another fucking location. I'm sorry. Why did he do that? I would like to know what his motivations were. Other than the story needs to happen. It doesn't make any goddamn sense. Why does he... There was... I mean, it's implied he did it because after spending time hanging out with Tony Stark, he has come to realize that he values their friendship. But that's never set up because they don't have any chemistry or dialogue that would imply that, really. It's a bit silly. I watched the fucking Avengers movies. I, I gotta be honest, man. The first one, the fucking... How, what did I already say? Cause I did... Okay, so I had forgotten in the previous section, I had forgotten how the movie goes in the next movie that it turned, he handed the stone that was on purpose because he he saw the future that the only way they win is by going back in time and he has to hand the stone over to make that happen or whatever so maybe, uh, you know sure fine whatever anyway infinity war was a bad movie i would say uh, maybe a five out of ten not like unwatchably bad but not good uh end game I actually liked it more than I thought I would. I've already seen it, obviously, but um, I think the first sort of... I think a lot of the movie holds up pretty well. Um, I think the effects looked better in this movie. I think uh, the writing was just generally better, a little bit smarter, a little bit um, more focus on sort of some level of characterization. Um, the music still sucks. The music's always sucked in Marvel movies. Um, and the worst part of the movie is the big end fight with, with Thanos and all of the fucking everyone, uh, because, because that's always the worst part of every Marvel movie. Uh, I don't know who keeps telling these guys to set their big fights in the most bland locations ev ever. Everything's just brown. It's just a bunch of noise. It's just brown fucking people not racially <laughs> i mean in terms of like their 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 color design like the color palette of these shots the uniforms right they're superhero costumes they don't pop they're all desaturated right and then there's just like fucking brown gray backgrounds with brown gray uniforms on characters and then every uniform is like way overly detailed as well so it's like just a visually no visual noise you don't really know what's going on the camera work is just like bland and uh the fight choreography is borderline non-existent like you have these are basically animated movies right you can do anything with a fight like this and they always choose the most boring stuff they never have anything interesting happen there's decades and decades of animated fight scenes that you can pull from uh you know that aren't overly cartoony and look amazing. There are so many anime fight scenes that you could pull from and, and make shit look good. And it's not like Marvel films are inco incapable of making fight choreography work. Shang-Chi did it. Again, they just can't... No one can do these large-scale fights. Marvel has just terrible fucking locations. Why set your big final fight in the least memorable place to ever exist? It's just a pile of rubble 
going on forever with no visual like there's no there's no the space doesn't exist you can't place anyone in space because it's just a pile of a vague pile of rubble and dirt there's no like sense of of the scale of the place or where people are in relation to each other or how like if you're having a big uh, um pitched battle the thing you need to know is you're fighting basically trying to push into the enemy territory right and they're trying to push into you so if you can't get any sense of like how far people are moving forwards or backwards you don't really have any sense of how the fight's going and the movie doesn't try to give you a sense of that it just focuses entirely on what's happening to these individual characters uh, but then the rest of it might not might as well not be happening what's the point of having these giant armies and everything if they're just fucking visual noise that don't do anything like what's the what are they there to do there's only one MacGuffin that matters it's just stupid it's a fucking terrible it's really bad <laughs> um the music's bad everything's bad the fight choreography's bad everything's bad anyway you don't care about fucking marvel movies why am i talking about this you know what pisses me off you know what pisses me off when people when people fucking pronounce flander scarlet as Flandre, okay, motherfucker from Toho. You know Flander, not fucking Flandre. In Japanese, it's Furandoru, okay, Furandoru, Scaretto. But also, that's just how that fucking word is pronounced. No one would pronounce it Flandre. It's Flander. Motherfuckers don't know how to read English, let alone read the fucking Japanese that tells you how to say it anyway. Furandoru. Flander. Flander. Scarlet. Flander Scarlet. Not, not fucking Flandre. Stop saying Flandre. Everyone's so terrified of automation replacing people's jobs. And then there's some people who come along and are like, well, there's two different counter arguments, right? There's, there's some people that come along and say, Oh my god, isn't it so fucked up and crazy that capitalism means we're scared of having to work less? Oh my god, we need universal basic income. Which, to be fair, I support UBI quite strongly as a policy. I think it's pretty good as an idea. But then there's also a bunch of other people that come along and they're like, I've read a book and there's something called the lump of labor fallacy. Uh, Therefore, when new technologies come along, it may destroy certain jobs but it produces a whole bunch of new jobs uh take a look at microsoft excel for example right like when excel came out 50 percent of bookkeeping jobs disappeared overnight but it created a billion new jobs you know a billion not being a real number in this example it created a whole bunch of new jobs uh and in the end you know it didn't actually displace workers it just forced people to learn new skills now there's a couple of considerations and stuff to, 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 to come along with this. So the first thing is, um, when technology comes along and automates some sector, uh, what it's actually doing, I think people have a hard time understanding this or really don't really think about it, is uh, it's, it's pushing the required IQ to exist in the world up. So um, you know, let's say, uh, you know, pretty much, I've been trying to figure out how much of the economy could theoretically be automated if, like, that was the only thing we cared about as a as a species, uh, right? Like, Im- imagine instead of a country trying to maximize its GDP, it was trying to maximize its automation index or something like that, right? Like, how how well could that country do? And I think uh, at least 50% of jobs could be eliminated. Uh, the main problem with automation isn't that the technology isn't there, it's that the technology isn't cheap. Uh, so, you know, for example, you know, you know, they have those uh, at McDonald's, they have those, those like touch screens that, that you select your order on. There's no reason why every single business where you interact with someone couldn't just be that. Uh, there's no reason why there should be shops instead of vending machines, not really like larger scale vending machines, you know, you could, there's, there's no... Cost is the reason, right? But in terms of tech, ignore cost. Let's just think of like technologically. There's no reason why going to the your local shop has to be walking through an aisle, picking up the stuff that you want, and then taking it to a checkout. Like 
it's already borderline. I mean, uh, you know what? I don't have to have hypotheticals because Amazon already did this. Amazon has these shops where you there's they're unmanned, right? You go in, you pick the items off the shop, and you walk out, and it automatically deducts it from your account, right? Like th- these sorts of shops don't have to exist, which means like that's a huge chunk of the economy um, because this isn't just you know your Walmart or whatever your local shop is. This is pretty much the entire service industry, no? Like there's Starbucks, McDonald's. Uh, you know, at all of these, pretty much every restaurant, pretty much everyone that serves food, anyone that sells you anything in person doesn't need to exist. And that's putting aside the fact that, you know, there's nothing really matters for perishables. If we're talking non-perishables, you can get that shit delivered online, lickety split, no problem, right? And that requires a delivery driver. Uh, and, you know, but obviously this is short-sighted because if you go back through the supply chain, eventually you need humans to manufacture this. Now, the problem is the further down the supply chain you go, you generally end up in less economically developed countries or China, uh, one of the two. Um, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens in China, uh, how well they've managed to, if they, if they even attempt to pull off mass automation. I, I don't really know what they're trying to do. No one really does. They just don't really tell anyone. <laughs> um, uh, but there's a, there's a in, like, assuming a near future scenario maybe not right now today but let's say uh you know the next 50 years uh you know i'm not super hopeful about self-driving car technology or anything like that. i i don't think for like general use and consumer use it's a very good technology however i feel like in a limited setting like for example a truck at a cobalt mine it's very doable i feel like that's doable today if not in the next 20 years, 100%, you know? Automatic mining, I feel like it's, do- you know, I, I am yet to see, I, I, I think it would probably require some o- human oversight, but Im- again, imagining we're not talking about cost here, we're just talking technologically. I, I, I think it's, I think most mining resource extraction operations could be majority automated, if not, you know, almost entirely automated, because you could theoretically replace a human overseer with a, an AI overseer, right? Like some sort of, you can replace quality assurance and, or like uh, these sorts of things, right? You can, you could have, you don't necessarily need a human overseer because AIs can do the stuff that human overseers do most of the time. Like, you know, if you, if you need to say sort of long-term planning, an AI can probably do that maybe even better than a human in terms of like how to run a mine. Uh, if you need like moment to moment, like, hey, let's make sure this truck is actually full and not empty. You can easily have some sort of AI to use some sort of image recognition technology to do that. Right. So I think most mining and resource extraction in general is probably very, like, this is the sort of stuff that is only not automated because right now humans are cheaper. Uh, mining is like the most complex one, right? But remember, people have been mining forever. You know, it's not, it's not a uh, a complex task it's just a laborious task it's the sort of thing that should be automated no one is no one in the world is willingly a miner right remember the roman empire had big mines because they were all slaves and prisoners of war right like the the mining has generally been one of the shittiest jobs you can have uh no one should modern fucking like cobalt and lithium mines and stuff are, you know these, these these things that they have massive labor problem, labor rights problems um like this is the sort of things that that should be automated because it's not dignified work that people enjoy doing. Um, it's just the fact that humans are right now are cheaper. But in a world where we're ignoring what's cheaper, uh, yeah, no, I, I think most resource extraction jobs. So not I, I've been focusing on mining because stuff like timber is just so easy to automate. It's not even funny. You could basically automate all deforestation projects in the world in an instant if you really wanted to. That shit's easy. Yeah, automated drills, automated, you know, self-driving trucks. I mean, a lot of the process is already semi-automated. It's right. Okay. So that's like the first, the first part. The, the second part is going to be uh, transforming the raw materials into usable components. Like let's, we're talking electronics here, for example, right? Like, cause this is like the biggest industry. Um, most of the work done in like fabs is done by machines simply because it's way too uh, complex and fine detail for a human to even think about doing we're talking stuff on the scale of 
fucking nanometers and stuff, right? Like, there's no, there's no universe where a human can do it. Humans are generally employed as, like, quality insurance, although already AI is taking those jobs. And to do uh, stuff like take a board from one machine and put it in the next machine, right? Like, a conveyor belt can do that. <laughs> this doesn't need, like, some crazy advanced AI thing. It, 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 could, it could be a conveyor belt if the machines were just designed for that. Um, I, it's just that these companies have done the calculations and they've realized that it's cheaper to hire some people to do it than it is to build up that infrastructure, design new fabs that are designed to be completely automated. But, you know, I'm, this is an incredibly complex process that very few people know how to do. I'm not claiming to be an expert on it. Maybe there are some, you know, elements of the, like, transistor manufacturing process, some of this stuff that I don't understand, that need to be done by a human right now. I'm not sure what they would be. You know, you could definitely have, um, I, I, I feel like if it's this sort of hyper-specific task, you could have sort of AI, um, like image models combined with robots uh, to do these sorts of tasks. And then obviously the machines themselves that actually do the majority of the work are already machines. Uh, and then you've got the supply lines, which has to transport those goods around the world to where different steps need to take place to complete the manufacturing. Again, a lot of that shit can be automated or already has been automated. Um, like aeroplanes basically fly themselves and have done for the past like 40 years. Um, uh, cargo ships also basically drive themselves. Uh, trains also are very capable of driving themselves. There's no reason, like, uh, it's just, it's again, it's just a cost thing, right? Like we have trains in London that are completely automated and have been since the 80s. Uh, the tubes are going to be fully automated, uh, I believe, by 2060 or 2050 or something. I forgot exactly when they say it's going to be. But they like the tube is eventually going to be semi or fully automated. It's already semi-automated. I mean, these are low-speed underground commuter trains, but high-speed trains can also... Like, there's, there's no reason the same technology can't apply. Uh, there's nothing specifically human that needs to happen. So that's, like, the majority of supply chains, right? It's, like, airplanes, trains... And boats, the only last thing is trucking. Uh, again, we're assuming in the next 20 to 50 years, self-driving car technology becomes better and self-driving trucks become prevalent. I'm. This is like kind of a big guess, but I feel like it's possible. There was a lot of money being poured into this. Uh, you know, it hasn't happened yet, but I think saying it will never happen is a bit naive. It might just kind of suck, but I don't know. Uh, it definitely seems possible is what I'm saying. And even if it isn't, let's say trucking remains as a human-only activity. Uh, again, we've automated the rest of the supply chain process, so that's still, like, only a small portion of jobs. Uh, okay, and then, you know, once it gets fabricated and assembled, you have your, your chips that are then assembled into some sort of casing. Uh, of course, someone has to program the operating system and the firmware, all of this stuff, which can be done by <laughs> AI right now. <laughs> Uh, pretty much. I mean, you know, you can design software with AI literally right now. People have already designed fairly complicated stuff like 3D games in ChatGPT or GPT-4. Uh, and, you know, very obviously this is going to become way more advanced very quickly. Uh, programming is something that large language models are very good at um, and they're only going to get better. So again, we assume a little bit in the future, uh, you know, you might need someone to you, you, you probably need some human programmers, but way, way fewer. Um, of course, I should clarify, the biggest job that would be easiest to automate in every single example that I've given is managers and CEOs. All of the higher, like, the people who are doing the labor are the hardest to automate. It would be incredibly easy to automate away the job of basically every CEO. You could do it right now with, with the level that GPT is at. Uh, so, you know, all of those jobs don't need to exist, but those are, the, you know, they're not going to let themselves get automated away. Uh, but yeah, AI could replace most middle management roles. Uh, again, most of them don't need to exist. You know, I'm sure you've read bullshit jobs. Uh, but, you know, and then, you know, it makes it way, the, the, say the smartphone or whatever electronic device has been manufactured, makes its way to a shop and that shop can be fully automated already. So... The entire production line, and you know, these are one of the most common and complicated supply chains that exist in the world right now. The same can be applied to pharmaceuticals, the same can be applied to, uh, you know, most things. 
I mean, the level of automation that's possible for farming right now is insane, right? Like the, the amount of people it takes to um, successfully farm any portion of land has dropped so drastically in the last hundred years. It's insane. Like we're talking like a hundred to one ratio, you know, like what would have previously taken a hundred people to harvest takes one now. Um, again, the big issue here is just cost, right? I mean, I've seen some really cool AI powered technology that uh, seems to basically eliminate the need for like um, herbicides uh, by using like computer vision to just like drive a truck over, scan the ground for weeds and then just rip the weeds out with a, an arm or shoot them with a laser or something. Uh, you know, like that technology exists. I, I've seen it. <laughs> I don't know if it's in wide scale use yet. I don't think it is. But, uh, you know, agricultural technology is massively advanced. There's a lot of money in it. Um, and, you know, all of the supply lines, again, most of that can be, as I said, a large chunk of that can be automated. So, frankly, the only, like, we could be living in a world of, like, near full automation right now. I, I think at least, I mean, how, how many jobs does, does fucking, how many bullshit... Oh, like, what's his fucking name? David Graeber. Uh, how many jobs does David Graeber think are bullshit? Because uh, I'm pretty sure he gives some, like, estimate for the percentage in that book, right? Give me a second. Okay, I think, I think he says that, let's say 37% of jobs are bullshit jobs that could be eliminated right now and nothing would happen. Because uh, that's like a YouGov poll. And then he says, no, it's probably higher, but you can't just make stuff up like that David Gray but you can't just say no it's probably higher because it's underreported uh you can't just you can't just guess uh, I mean yeah it probably is higher but you can't yeah you know we're talking like a good what 75 80 percent of jobs that either need to be taken away from existence because they don't contribute anything to society the sort of traditional uh, it's not traditional but the the what what the the bullshit job elements and then the rest can be automated like, who needs to work? Artists don't. I mean, writers right now need to work. I don't know. You know, a lot of this stuff doesn't need to fucking exist. I'm just being real with you. The only reason it does is because human time is considered to be less valuable than machine time, which to me doesn't make any goddamn motherfucking sense. So I think it just takes one country. I think, you know, uh, like Bhutan, you know Bhutan? You guys heard of Bhutan? You know Bhutan, they, they, they make a big deal out of this, even though it's mostly like a marketing strategy, but let's just imagine it's real for now. Bhutan, they, they, they have a whole thing about how like they don't measure their country's success in terms of GDP. They invented something which they call like a, I believe it's like the Human, cap, or human Happiness Index or something, National Happiness Index, something like this, where they, they run like regular polls and surveys and uh, like research to on various different categories that they've determined uh, like contribute to like happiness and that's what they try and maximize uh, like if you had a country that their whole shtick was automation maximizing that's our job we don't necessarily care about GDP we don't care about you know any of any like our main Min max is automation. I think you could get shit. I think you could like push this pretty fucking far even within one country. And one, once one country does it, they're obviously gonna see like a. I I think they're gonna see a large amount of immigration, right? Because w- once one country does this, people are like, you can come here, get fucking UBI. I mean, they don't have to like like let's say immigration doesn't have. Let's say they have strict immigration laws. I mean, they're just gonna pop off. It's just gonna pog off. There's no reason it wouldn't. Everyone there would just be fucking talking it up like crazy. It took one country, it took one city to be like, what if everyone just rode bikes all the time? And now there's like m- m- tens of millions of people in America and the West and in general who are like constantly activists about walkable neighborhoods and shit. Right? Like it just took like one YouTube channel to expose normies to this stuff. Including me, I'm counting myself as a normie in regards to civil design. It wasn't particularly one of my interests until it blew up. 
so you know I'm a normie in this scenario but I'm I don't think I'm a normie in automation I've read books I know books I've read I've read fucking uh, Nick Cerner Czech and Dalek Williams uh, I've read Nick Land I, I, I think it's dope. Listen, you know what I'm saying? I was trying to figure out how much of society could be automated. I think it's a lot. And I think, you know, there's this fucking guy on YouTube and he was sitting here like, oh no, a UBI is really bad. The problem is we don't have any demographics. We have aging demographics. There's no young people to work anymore. We don't need to be paying people not to work. The problem is we don't have enough people to work. Motherfucker, that's not true, <laughs> first of all. Uh, and second of all, automation is literally the solution to your problem. Like, there are, you know, automation is the solution to not having enough people to work. And if people aren't working, they need to live, give them UBI. No? It doesn't make any goddamn motherfucking sense to me. He, I guess he's like a doomer who's like very much likes to ignore the fact that technology exists. This guy's retarded. What's his name again? Look, I think he knows his shit when it comes to some stuff. Uh, fucking... He's got a Z in his name. Let me see if I can find him. Zahan. His name is Zahan. Peter Zahan. Like, this fucking guy just likes to pretend that, like, nukes don't exist, for example. He likes to pretend that nukes don't exist. He likes to pretend that automation isn't real or changing anything. He's, like, very big on this idea that, like, AI is, like, nonsense that won't do anything. Or that, like, I don't know what he thinks. But then he's all... He also... He pretends that nukes don't exist when it comes to, like, geopolitical strategy. But then he's also like, oh, and by the way, like, we're going to have enter a thermonuclear con conflict in 2024. Fucking, this guy's on crack. There's no universe where that happened. One thing that's never sat right to me about leftism, and when I say leftism here, I mean actual left, like, you know, lefty leftism, not modern, whatever the fuck gets away with being called that these days. You know what, I just deleted, like, fucking 20 minutes of me rambling about shit that cares about. You guys don't want to hear that. Let's be real. Let's be honest. Let's be completely honest with ourselves here. You guys aren't interested. Look, I'm not here. The last thing I ever want to do is defend Elon Musk. So I'm just going to start it off by saying Elon Musk is uh, kind of retarded. I think everyone knows this by now, right? Like... He's a, a a desperate boomer who, like, is obsessed with being popular and seeming cool. Uh, he has, like, a fan base of the most Reddit human beings on the goddamn planet. He's not particularly good at running businesses, even though everyone seems to think he is for some reason, or his fan base does, but he's not particularly good at it, right? Like, he, all of his businesses lose money. Tesla uh, is the closest to being a successful business, Except for the fact that uh, it's fucked now because they were doing really well and right now they're doing well still coasting basically off of brand recognition and early success being being first to market. But in terms of the products they're making, they're way behind. Uh, all of the sort of old school car manufacturers have pivoted to EVs and are already making significantly better and cheaper EVs than Tesla. Um, Tesla vehicles are known to have poor build quality, uh, from people who buy them, uh, poor, poor, poor quality control, and are just not as good technologically as their competitors. Uh, I will say what Tesla has done really well is invest in American EV infrastructure. That was a smart move for them. Uh, I wonder how that's going to pan out, I don't know, but <clears throat> Tesla is the closest to being a good company, but, um... You know, he obviously hasn't done a good job of running it since they lose money. Most of their money is funded by the American government anyway. SpaceX loses massive amounts of money and survives off of government money. Um, and the most retarded thing he's ever done is the Hyperloop, Tunnel Board, all of this boring company, that whole situation. I think it's, you know, there's a reason that everyone clowns on him and says just did the lol, lol trains, trains. Because they're right. Um, trains are good, trains are better than cars, and trains are better than stupid fucking tunnels that cars go in. Just build a fucking underground railway system, you absolute retards. Okay, uh, aside from that, uh, he's not very smart, although he tries to come across as quite intelligent. He, uh, which, to be honest, okay, I wanna, I wanna put this out here, right? Like, I wouldn't necessarily expect, uh, someone like Elon Musk to be really well-versed in 
something like I don't know, you know, science or, or politics or, or whatever, philosophy, because he's assumedly fairly busy doing other shit. That being said, no one told him to have an opinion on any of that stuff. On any of that stuff, he could just shut the fuck up. Jeff Bezos does doesn't go on Twitter and and ramble about his half baked philosophy ideas or po- political ideas, you know. And no, there's no reason for him to do it. He clearly doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. Anyone who thinks he does is absolutely brain dead. He he has he has no clue. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Now I didn't mention t- Twitter. Another big thing is Elon fucked up, obviously big time, in being forced to buy Twitter. Uh, it was a genius move from Twitter. Now, I believe Elon, okay? I believe Elon, and I think, honestly, this is where I am the guy who is, like, again, I, I will say I spent I spent some time shit talking to him, okay? I don't think he's a good person. I don't think he's particularly intelligent. I don't think he's even a particularly good businessman. I uh, think he's, you know, an idiot. Okay, Twitter specifically, I don't think he's done a bad job running Twitter. I know, I know, he shouldn't be running Twitter. He's, I mean, there's a reason he just hired some woman to do it for him, right? Because the fucking Tesla board and the SpaceX board are coming here like, uh, you're spending all your fucking time at Twitter, you have two other companies to run, what are you doing? Uh, but to be fair to Elon... I think he's done a pretty good job running Twitter. He fired a shitload of people. Everyone was like, oh my god, what a fucking idiot. He fired all of those people. Those poor Silicon Valley tech workers. What are they going to do without a job? Oh no, those poor fucking people. I don't give a shit about those people. They can lose their jobs. And frankly, Twitter is running perfectly fine without them. The way he fired them was dumb. But he, I believe him when he says... The company was bleeding money and they needed to cut costs extremely quickly. I believe him when he says that. He has no reason to lie about that. And they did it. I mean, he halved the staff and the company keeps running. It's like every leftist forgets about the concept of bullshit jobs the second that Elon Musk comes along. Right? Like, clearly, these people didn't need to be there. I'm sure some of them had important jobs and have been... You know, I, I, I am sure that the firing process was not actually meritocratic... You know, I, I, he fired people based on the amount of code they'd written. It was not a good process, He's, you know. But Twitter kept working. Nothing disastrous happened. And I think every major tech company could probably fire half of their workers and be fine. Okay. Secondly, a lot of people praise Elon Musk or say or hate on him around this whole free speech on Twitter thing. Let me be honest with you. It's not real. It's all a meme. It's all a marketing strategy. Nothing about free speech on Twitter has changed at all. The only thing he did was unban a bunch of people. That's all he did. A lot of whom got banned again. Okay, he no, nothing to do with free speech has changed. You still can't tweet the N word at Coca Cola and not get banned. You know, like nothing has changed. I don't know. This is all some sort of meme in people's heads. Like there's no, there's not more hate speech on Twitter than there was before, and. If you, you can't just, it's not 4chan, it, it didn't turn into 4chan overnight, right? And in my opinion, so what I'm saying is Twitter is not a bastion of free speech. It's honestly freer than it has any right to be. Like the fact that you could, that you can go on Twitter and you can find, uh, well, I don't know how, what to say about that, but you can find banned statistics that you're not supposed to talk about, right? Uh, <laughs> Elon tweets about, right? Uh, the, you can find this stuff on Twitter. There's no reason for it to be there, right? People don't benefit from that. But, so, but those things would have stayed up pre-Elon. It doesn't, you know, he's made zero difference on that behalf. And I think fundamentally, why do you care about free speech on Twitter? Like, it's not supposed to be, it's it's not supposed to be that. What, what do you expect? If you want to fucking say the N-words at people, there are a million different websites you can go to to do that. You're like... It's right-wingers complaining about this, and that what they're actually doing is, like, essentially the same thing that they complain about immigrants doing, right? Which, by the way, most immigrants don't actually do. Uh, but they're going into someone else's uh, cu- country, in this sense, Twitter, and then demanding it change to their culture. Like, well, in, where I come from online, we're allowed to call people uh, anything we want, so therefore you have to make change the rules for us, please. <laughs> Right? 
It's like, go back to your own fucking country. Not to the immigrants, to the right-wingers on Twitter who, who want to say nonsense or whatever. There are loads... I go there all the time. You have, like, a million websites where you can say whatever the fuck you want. You can say as many slurs as you like and do whatever. Like, there's no... It, it's not helpful or doesn't really matter if you have that stuff on Twitter or anywhere else. Um... And to the left-wingers, who are going to complain, actually, no, it's so bad that there are fucking Nazis on Twitter, oh no, it grow up. It's Twitter. What do you fucking ex- it's not the real world. It's not the real fucking world. Okay, I'm both sizing the issue here, I know, I'm both sizing the issue. Um, but, frankly, I just don't fucking care. Like, this whole free speech, hate speech issue is so fucking overdone in my mind, like, everyone's just constantly, all like, you know, all we've been hearing about for the last 10 years is, like, a free speech, hate speech on the internet, and I just don't think it fucking matters, I just genuinely am so beyond thinking that it fucking matters, unless the government is stepping in, which they do here in this country, and they do in Canada, and they do in Australia, right, to, to arrest people for their online posts, I don't think it matters. I think in the circumstances where the government is stepping in to arrest people for posting, that's cringe. I think a lot of people agree with me. A lot of leftists agree with me on this as well, especially anarchists. Right? Some don't, but, you know, whatever. Uh, that, like, as long as it's not that, as long as it's not the government arresting you for stuff you say online. Uh, generally speaking, I think there are some exceptions. If I'm being, like, completely reasonable, I think, like, if you're making real credible threats right if you're if you're like saying you're going to blow up a school or something and it's real real incredible and everything i think it's i think i i don't think it's too unreasonable in that situation if they send a cop over to knock on your door and be like hey 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 buddy what was that about i don't think they should necessarily arrest you instantly for it but uh you know i i think that, that that's like a very extreme example i i think other than in very extreme cases where there are real credible threats um and even then, I think it should be hard for them to actually get a warrant or whatever the fuck they need to do that. Um, you know, I, I think the government should never interfere with posting. <clears throat> but in terms of, like, platforms, or fucking platforms, who cares? The whole point of the internet is it's like patchwork. There's infinite land that you can, like, just just literally just make your own country. If, if, the, if the laws of your... Of your platform don't line up with you no one's forcing you to be on twitter people motherfuckers be like oh twitter isn't the way i want it to be bitch you you are the one that let yourself get addicted to their algorithmic recommendation feed stupid motherfucker you get to choose either you're addicted to twitter or you complain about twitter you don't you don't get to do both that's my opinion uh people say like oh you know we're forced to be on these fucking platforms no you're not you're not forced to be. I quit Twitter for like four months. I, I got sucked back in, but I quit Twitter for like four months. And um, frankly, it had very little impact on my life. The only thing that happened is that I had fewer funny meme images to share with people. That's literally it. That's the only thing that changed. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you you can just leave. And plenty of people do, if, you, if you're really that mad. Uh, but, you know, I think Elon has done a relatively decent job running Twitter. I think... The whole badges verification thing was retarded. Everyone knows that it was retarded. It continues to be retarded. Again, according to him, the company's bleeding money. They needed to, like, change their monetization strategy very quickly. I understand it, even though I think that the way... I mean, it's not just I think. Factually, the way he went about it was extremely fucked. Terrible. Very poorly handled. Poorly communicated. Poorly implemented. Just bad all around. I think we all agree on that, right? However... I understand the reason it had to happen if he's telling the truth about Twitter bleeding massive amounts of money. Uh, I think the way it should have been implemented is, uh, and maybe people disagree with me on this, but I think I'm basically a genius for coming out with this idea. Uh, I think it's very easy. Instead of having just a, a badge that shows you you pay for your thing and you just pay a subscription, I think there's a way better way to go about this, which is... Just make it CSGO skins. Make a bunch of different badges with different colors and patterns and various degrees of rarity and make them tradable. It's it's that simple. 
you just and then people will willingly buy these skins you just take a cut of every transaction it's a proven business model there's a reason every game has cosmetics people are okay with it because it's purely a cosmetic thing right like just let it happen the market will naturally evolve because that's what markets do right these user generated markets right like csgo skins are in insane value right you know what I'm saying? TF2 hats. Make make the Twitter badges TF2 hats. Make them tradable. Make some of them ex- like very rare. Um, you could even add loot box mechanics. You could even do that. That would be entertaining. I don't know. I don't know if he could get away with doing it, but you know, you can you can definitely make uh, badge trading into a real user generated economy. And obviously, I would never participate in it because I don't do that. I I've never. I don't buy tf2 hats or csgo skins or anything uh but i'm sure a lot of people would really like to do that and twitter would make a shitload of money off of it so that's what they should have done but obviously they didn't because they didn't put me in charge they forgot to put that's the problem with everyone in the world is they forgot to put me in charge uh which is a reasonable mistake i mean i understand they might not have, they might not have known that i'm the world's genius uh which is a shame really but yeah if they just put me in charge i would fix everything in every scenario um so the badges was terribly handled i think we all agree on that however uh i will say the community notes feature is the best thing twitter has ever done it is because so many normies are incapable of understanding even the most basic levels of like thinking critically about posts and even you know me i've seen posts that you know where the community note does add important context and i'm thankful that it was there because it's like even if i wouldn't even if if i saw the post i would have taken it with a grain of salt previously now i know what grain of salt to take it with i know exactly what salt to have right it's it's a genuinely really good feature it seems to work very well it seems to be democratic and require sources and it's good i think it's the best thing they've done uh and um what else is what else have they done the, the fucking for you uh, open sourcing the algorithm obviously as a fan of anything open sourced that's good uh you know it, it it may not necessarily be a massively important thing but it's still a good thing in my opinion you know i don't think they've done a bad job with twitter i think i think that it's been generally pretty decent you know it's not the best website in the world it's still fundamentally on a like design fundamentals level i think badly made uh or like poorly designed maximizing things that i don't think websites should maximize for but in terms of running it like a business and running it like a platform i think it's fine i don't think he's done a terrible job and now you know a lot of people again on the right are complaining oh he's gonna put this woman in charge who's like a fucking woke lib cuck whatever the fuck right and it's like there's no real difference in policy between any of these people they all want the same thing they just use different words to describe what they want i know i'm really sounding like i'm like both sidesing the issue here like i I, I really oh actually both sides are bad but it's true but but (laughs) all of these people are just rich people with who basically just want to be more rich they like what am i supposed to say so that's my vague that's my my extremely milquetoast uh Elon Musk defense is that I think that Twitter under Elon Musk has done okay. I don't think it's been a terrible disaster. I think people who pretend it's been a terrible disaster are doing so for ideological reasons instead of just looking at reality. I think more and more we're going to be hearing about uh, aging population because it's, you know, we, we if you're a, a fucking weeb like me, You've heard about the memes about, you know, Shinzo Abe and uh, Japan's aging population. The thing is, I don't know if I've already, if I already said this in this podcast, or I say this to someone in real life? I don't know. I don't know who I'm talking to anymore about anything. Uh, So Japan's population started aging like 30 years before the rest of Asia. Uh, They had their demographics problem like 30 years earlier than the rest of Asia, which means they've had a 30 year head start to actually like start to get on top of it. Uh, and right now they actually have the the least it's the least bad in japan uh of all of like north east asia um south korea's way fuck japan is actually one of the best places to have kids in the world right now 
you get loads and loads of benefits uh, for having kids in Japan. <clears throat> it's it's a it's a it's a great place to have kids. Uh, there there's there their, uh, their policies have actually worked pretty well. Uh, it's not perfect. They're still fucked, but they're less fucked than South Korea, and they're massively less fucked than China. China is incredibly fucked. They have the fastest aging population of any country in the history of the world that has been documented. Uh, China is over, in my opinion. I I I think uh, China is just done for as a as a fucking country. They they they're massive. You know, even Nick Land, even Nick Land has fucking rescinded his Sino futurism. Uh, at this point, Neo China arose from the future and it died instantly. Isn't that hilarious? Uh, but yeah, China is is fucked demographically. They're fucked economically. Uh, they're fucked geographically. They're they're just fucked. They're fucked politically. <laughs> they're fucked ideologically. They're just fucked. Uh, and so would every other country on earth be if the U.S. wasn't the world's reserve currency. Uh. So the America will be fine, and Canada will be fine. Their allies will be fine. Mexico will probably be fine because they're a big trade partner with the U.S. and Europe will uh, be a bit fucked, but not as bad as uh, China, in my opinion. Uh, however, you you hear people talking about this demographics problem, aging populations already happening in Europe, starting to become a big problem in uh, Europe, uh, and uh, the big problem with this is the the way we've built. We, we, there's no economic theory for dealing with this, right? Economic theory assumes that populations will be either stable or uh, growing for sort of the modern economic dogma to work. You always need more jobs, more people to fill more jobs. Uh, and um, I think the, you know, I talked about automation earlier, and I think that's a part of it, uh, a part of the solution here. Uh, but I, I think that the real solution is to have a, a better economic theory. And in my opinion, that better economic theory is deflation. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the problem with demographics, uh, with the aging population, is that uh, all of the old people, older people, keep working means there's not enough jobs freed up for the younger people. And even if those younger people can work, uh, they, you know, there's not enough of them to fill up all the jobs and it, it gets fucked. Uh, the thing is, most of those jobs don't need to exist. This is the thing that, you know, these sorts of mainstream commentators want to talk about. Most of those jobs are bullshit. You know, at least half of, let's say, half of the jobs don't need to exist. Even lower bounds, like 30% of those jobs don't need to exist. You know, I've already talked about this in the automation section. Uh, you know, those those jobs don't need to fucking exist. The problem is the economy can't continue functioning without them. So we need a better economy that doesn't require... Uh, these sorts of insane jobs to exist, where spending a bunch of money to hire a bunch of people to do something that isn't productive uh, is no longer profitable and good. And the way to do that is to make money uh, more valuable and scarce. Uh, and that's deflation. Uh, no one, you know, right now, it, it doesn't matter if you hire a, a, a fucking worker because you're throwing away money that is going to be worth nothing in 10 years anyway, because inflation is policy. Uh, if you have a, a deflationary economy where money is actually worth something, people are going to be able to retire earlier, so all of those old-ass people are going to get out of the fucking economy and going to be able to take care of themselves uh, because their savings are actually going to be worth something. The young people are going to be able to work a uh, few years and retire earlier as well. You know, you can work really hard in your 20s and 30s where you're actually productive and young and able to do shit. And by the time you're, like, you know, 40, you can fucking... 35 even... If you have a particularly good paying job, you have enough savings to retire for life because your money accumulates value, right? Um, and companies and people aren't going to be consumerist or massively overhiring. People aren't going to be spending money on all this trivial shit that they don't need or want. Um, <clears throat> and people will actually be able to save. Isn't that amazing? Uh, every second, here's something I want people to think about, you know. Uh, libertarians, they talk about how taxation is theft, right? Oh, the government's stealing your money with fucking taxation. The real libertarian argument of what is theft is is inflation. Because inflation isn't a natural uh, like economic phenomenon. Remember, the, the state and their, their, their national banks, uh, like the Fed, th these, they, they're the ones that control economic policy, right? Inflation is created by the Fed in America, right? They, they have this goal 
where they want inflation to be 2% and it's currently 10%, they manipulate the economy by changing interest rates and so on to try and keep the economy inflating. The more you do this, the you, what I'm saying is they, they are in control. This isn't just some system that is completely outside of government control. Uh, you know, governments have control over the economy, at least in some aspects. They get to decide how much money is printed. They get to decide who that money goes to. When they do sort of these big cash injections, they get to raise interest rates and so on. Uh, they have the power to create a deflationary economy. Um, and a deflationary economy would uh, fuck people in a lot of senses, right? Because that is that is what a recession is. A recession is deflation. Uh, it would fuck people in the short term. Uh, but in the, in, the, in the long term, I think it's the only way to deal with the... Uh, if you have fewer people, the money that they have has to be worth more. You can't have a bunch of fewer people with extremely not scarce money. The money has to become more scarce as well. And you can create, you know, it's very easy to take money out of the economy. Uh, people have done this a lot to deal with uh, inflation. Uh, you can, <clears throat> there's, there's a lot of ways to do it, but a very easy way to do it is to literally just take the money out of the economy. When people pay their taxes, just 25% of that tax money just gets destroyed. Uh, people have done this. This has actually been implemented in fucking, like, since the Middle Ages, people have been doing this. Uh, when people pay their taxes, you just destroy some of the tax money. It just it just gets burned. It just disappears. Uh, you can... that It's very easy. It's the opposite of printing money. It's destroying money. That makes the money more valuable that people have. No, it makes sense to me. This is why I'm, I'm just kind of nihilistic. I'm kind of nihilistic these days, politic-wise. I mean, I, I've called myself in the past something like an anarcho-nihilist. But these days, I don't even think I would say that. Like, I don't really agree with a lot of the stuff that anarcho-nihilists say, looking back on it. Or nihilist anarchists, as they sometimes don't like the anarcho-somethingist. I don't know why. But the nihilist anarchists, I've read their stuff. And these days, I'm just not so into it. Um... It, it just seems, you know, looking back on it, it seems kind of, well, it seems very loppy. That's the first thing. Uh, but the second thing is it, it kind of, it seems like it's making a lot of excuses for itself, right? It's sort of saying, it's it's like taking the, it's it, 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 it's, it's kind of like running anarchy in reverse, running anarchism in reverse. So like, you look at, like, you imagine... Like, oh, anarchists, they're doing cool stuff, like like bombing politicians or whatever. And then you think it through for, like, ten seconds, and you're like, is that actually really, like, helping get anything done, though? Like, is that actually going to do anything? And then the anarcho-nihilists, I feel like, sort of walked, walked backwards from, instead of, like, okay, well, we want to we wanna make an anarchist syndicalist utopia, uh, and so we should, like, bomb politicians, and then realizing it doesn't work. Instead, they were like, we want to bomb politicians, how can we justify this? <laughs> uh, which I kind of respect, you know, I respect it, but they won't say it like that, right? They'll, they'll, they just have a bunch of excuses as to, like, why it's like, well, nothing matters, so I may as well do X, Y, Z. But none of, firstly, none of them are doing shit, X, none of them are doing X, Y, or Z. Uh, and secondly, yeah, I think, I think a lot of their analysis is fairly weak, right? Like, looking back on Blessed is the Flame, for example, you know, like, they say, like, oh, we have to imagine that we, we are being led to our slaughter, right? As if, like, so, society as it exists right now, capitalist, modern, industrial society, is so bad that, like, anything is preferable to it. And, frankly, I just don't think that bears out in real life. You know, I think most people's lives are bad, but I don't think they're like that bad. I think that people seem to be generally okay with it. Uh, you know, I, I, I think generally speaking, you know, is, is, it, is it great for humans? No, definitely not. But what's the, like, do you know what I'm saying? What's the, like, there's not, there's a, there's a lot to complain about and a lot, a lot can be improved and changed, right? But I, I I don't know that I would necessarily say anything is preferable, especially because you know anarcho nihilists will definitely stop being nihilist the second that they that like anti fascism comes into the picture because they're like no 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 fascism is really really bad. And it's like well hold on a second what happened to being a nihilist? 
seems like you definitely have some principles that you're adhering to. Uh, you know, there's definitely a lot of stuff like that that just kind of rubs me the wrong way about it. Uh, but, so, I, I may, may not be a narco, I still think I'm kind of a nihilist, and what I mean by that is that I don't, I, I still, you know, I, I thought this when I was like 15 years old, then I spent like five years trying to figure out how I was wrong, and became a lefty, and, you know, fucking red theory, and so on. And in the end, came back to the conclusion that no, I was actually right when I was fifteen. Uh, the 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 problem is just too complex. There is no perfect way to organize human society. Uh, and though at that point I was like, well, what if we just don't have civilization? So I became like very anti civ, right? I I used to call myself unconditional post civ. But then you know, as the years have gone by. A couple of things have happened. Firstly, I've had to defend my ideas a lot more because I, 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 I got into political debates online more often. And it's, it was very difficult to defend post civ mainly because it's something that is very impractical to the point of being like w- not even worth talking about to a, to a large extent. It's not like, uh, you know, on the scale of politics, <laughs> you've got stuff that is like, uh, hey, how about we increase the minimum wage? Very practical, very doable thing that you can just, like, do right now, right? Versus, like, uh, fully automated luxury gay space communism or uh, abolish civilization or any of these things, which are, like, maybe one day in the, in the distant future could happen, but it's very hard to see, uh, like, it's, it's very hard to defend this as, like, a pragmatic or practical in any way politics. So that kind of forced me to move away from that and towards more stuff that seems a little more actionable, right? Um, but then, you know, all the actionable stuff, it's like, you know, when, when, when you see tankies or actually really any revolutionary leftists, a, a lot of them, tankies are particularly guilty of this, but a lot of revolutionary leftists have a similar rhetoric where they have this idea of, sort of like social democracy right like the the sort of low tier reformist lefty politics uh they won't they won't phrase it like this but this is basically what they mean and if you're one of these people you know that this is really what you mean right which is if you if you suggest something that's like a reform and i'm guilty of making the same similar argument as well if you suggest something that's like a reform that will make people's lives objectively better okay objectively is a strong word but you know what i'm saying like some sort of lefty reform that you should generally agree with that isn't full communist revolution or whatever, uh, they'll basically say, even if it does make people's lives better in some incremental way, the argument is basically, no, you're tricking people by making their lives better so that they won't overthrow the government, so that they won't do communism. Like, no, they want to make your life better, but it's just a trick. In reality... They're just, they're just making your life better so that you don't do a revolution. And in my opinion, what does it fucking matter if the, like, it doesn't really matter why. <laughs> like, this was a lot of lefties' uh, response to uh, social democracy, Nordic model, all these sorts of things, was like, oh, like, is, when it first started happening, you can read these sort of newsletters and, and papers and stuff from, from 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 like the 80s and stuff like that where leftists are sort of and, and especially after the fall of the soviet union um where lefties are sort of like communism is dead capitalism's just like integrated the parts of communism into itself that it needed and people no longer want to do a revolution because they can just be norway or, or finland or whatever as if it's this terrible thing or i don't know what it, i don't know if they're saying it's a terrible thing or a particularly good thing you know i'm not here to be a massive advocate for the the nordic model i think there's a lot of look you guys are politically intelligent i'm assuming right like we all know the details about some of the positives and negatives of that system why it's worked really well in certain places and might not be applicable to other places i think we all know the ins and outs of that by now it's kind of boring to talk about it's also very theoretical as well uh and, you know, other things that have just kind of, like, rubbed me the wrong way. I mean, I've I've been, like, pretty against leftism for quite a while. You know, as I said, I have been, you know, I used to call myself, like, unconditional post civ been very into accelerationism, I used to call myself post-left anarchist, or, uh, you know, all of these sorts of things, where I'm pretty skeptical of leftism. 
in large part because I'm pretty skeptical of Marx, like Marx's economics, uh, like specific, in particular the labor theory of value, but a lot of Marxian economics kind of, you know, doesn't gel well with me. And I'm, you know, reasonably skeptical of democracy, which is a pretty big fucking problem for leftism. And uh, a lot of anarchists get really mad at you if you don't like democracy, even though it's obviously not anarchist. So I don't know what the fuck's wrong with those people. Uh, <clears throat> so that that's, you know, sort of, I've ended up in a position politically right now where no one agrees with me. <laughs> There's not a single person on earth who, I mean, I barely know what I want. It's weird to know what you want. Like once you actually have like, I feel like once you've done research on a lot of different things, you know, and you're not, you know, 19 anymore, right? It becomes really hard for me to say, and all our problems will be solved if we organize society exactly how this particular book says to organize society. You know, I, I find it really hard to say that. I don't think many serious people can hold that belief, right? Generally speaking, a lot of people have like individual policy ideas that they're like, that would probably be good. Uh, or they have some like broad concept of like, well, this economic analysis seems to make sense to me. But they don't have like, you know, like people, I, I don't trust it when someone's like, has, thinks they can solve all the world's problems. I don't know. It seems like kind of, kind of fucking weird to me. Uh, a, a lot of people online seem to have this idea, right? That like, oh, if we were just a, uh, you know, a, a Christian nationalist society, everyone was a Catholic and uh, we just were strongly nationalistic and isolationist and, uh, you know, whatever, then everything would be fixed. And I, you know, that's obviously... Where, how does that follow? They don't really have many answers when you really drill down on stuff. Uh, and it's the same on the left. But it's also the same in a lot of ideologies that don't have anything to do with left or right. Like, uh, you know, primitivism, same fucking problem, right? Like, uh, primitivists, I, in my opinion, are pretty good at critiquing industrial society and not that good at actually explaining why primitive society is better, Uh you know, some of them, well, in large part, they just make shit up, right? Like John Zerzan, he just makes shit up, for example, uh, all the time. A lot of them are like this. Uh, transhumanists just make shit up. Like, all of these people, they just make shit up. <laughs> it's all, like, the, the, the whole, you know, so, socialism, utopian, and scientific, there's never been any such thing as scientific socialism. I know a bunch of socialists who also hate this idea of scientific socialism. Uh, like, the the... I think there's a good anarchist critique of Marxism, which is like, uh, you know, what this idea that uh, if you have a firm, that it somehow changes the nature of the the labor by just being owned by its workers, even if it's still equally an unpleasant work or something like this. You know what I'm saying? Like, it it doesn't really follow to me. Uh, to a lot of people, it doesn't really follow. Like, uh, I'm not quite sure what these people want they want better compensation for their work but they want a moneyless society where compensation for work doesn't even make matter or like eventually i guess but that's like so far from the future that it doesn't really make any sense to, to like practically think about it so there's a lot of stuff like this that i'm just kind of confused about so in the end i have a bunch of like desperate policy positions from all over the political spectrum that uh you know sometimes don't even make sense with each other <laughs> like uh, you know, so, sometimes these policy positions only work in a vacuum and don't fit. And sometimes, you know, I have stuff where I'm like, we could do this, all this. And they're two different suggestions from opposite sides of the political spectrum. And then there's also, you know, not to mention all the culture war stuff, which is just insane. It's just ruined everything forever for everyone. And then, and then these people have the gall to ask me who I'm voting for. Motherfucker, what are you talking about? I'm not voting for anyone right now. I don't know who I'll vote for in the next election. I mean, not the Tories is the answer. Uh, maybe the Greens, I don't know. Uh, but, like, you know, as time's gone on more recently, I'm like, you know, I used to call myself post-lefty or, like... But in reality, a lot of the stuff I believed is still very much influenced way more from the left side than the right side. And, you know, more and more... I'm like, it's not that I like the right side stuff anymore. It's just that I like the left side stuff even less. <laughs> so I don't know what that makes me. It just it, it makes me nothing. Because it's not like I have good replacements for these things a lot of the time. It's not like I'm sitting here 
like uh, poking holes in lefty arguments and saying, and here's a better solution, because I don't have one. And then the fundamental difference between me and uh, a lot of these people is the fact that I don't think that uh, human agency plays a very big role in actual social organization anyway, which then <clears throat> makes it hard to do anything. Because, like, obviously there are some times when individual policy decisions that are ostensibly vote, voted on by, or decided by someone, right, maybe some official who was voted in or some unelected official, right, like, there are policy decisions that happen and they seem to have some effect, right? They they do have some effect. And sometimes, you know, campaigning seems to do do some pretty good stuff. Or, like, but, but not good stuff, but, I mean, be effective. Like, for example, climate activism has worked really well, right? Like, there's... There's, there's people, people are obviously really fucking retarded about this. They're like, oh, they've been climate activists till the 80s and only now are people doing something. Yeah, of course. Well, that's how government works. Governments are slow by design. Uh, you know, if you want them to be fast, then you're, I mean, there's, there's a perfectly reasonable way to want them to be fast. I think, I don't think that's a problem. However, you need to understand that the argument you're making of wanting them to be fast is asking for more power uh, to be more centralized in the government, uh, in the ruling party specifically. You're asking for a less democratic government when you say that, uh, which is a fine thing to argue for, but I, you just be aware of that, right? Like, if you're, if you're saying, like, oh, why does it take so... Like, wouldn't it be great if laws could get passed really fast? Like, wh- what if we just had one guy who was in charge and he just said the law and then that was just the law with no debate and no, no process or anything? Wouldn't that, you know, laws would get passed super quickly. There wouldn't be any red tape. And, you know, next thing you know, you're arguing for a king, uh, which is fine. You know, if you want to be a monarchist, be a monarchist. Uh, just know what you're saying. Uh, but no, generally speaking, activism does work. I mean, there's, uh, I don't, I'm not going to give a bunch of examples, but it, it's like scarily effective, really, is the thing about activism. Is that it's like, it's a, it's, 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 it's scarily effective. The fact that like the groups of influential people, particularly in the media, can, can basically generate political change. Um, just by essentially being extroverts, right? Like autists who stay in their room all day are never going to have any capacity to to affect political change, right? Because the people who do are people who have connections to the media, uh, and it's always the case. It's every single time the case, right? Is that like when some activist group is successful, you always look at who started it, and they always have some connections to the media because that's how they spread their message. Uh, it's just about, you know, who you know, getting the right which rich people, influential people on your side, uh, which makes me very skeptical of everything. And, you know, this, this, that might sound like a right wing talking point, but this is just as perfectly equally the case across the entire spectrum. You know, it applies to fucking everyone because everyone needs power in some sense, you know, and like a lot, there's, there's cases where like, hey, maybe this is going to get me canceled, but we're like fucking 11 hours into a podcast right now. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll cancel myself. Like this 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 guy who uh, actually maybe I should keep that to myself. <laughs> I do I need to express my opinion about that in public or do I just vaguely say stuff? You know what? We're gonna keep my power level hidden. Um, but anyway, there's there's stuff that I disagree pretty vehemently with a lot of leftists who I think otherwise share policy positions with me, and I'm like, your shit isn't fucking working. Or uh, you know, there's there's stuff there's people that you see, there's a lot of stuff in, like, academia, where it's these, like, highly academic lefty types saying stuff that seems true, and then, you know, when you actually look at reality, the stuff they're saying may well be the case, except it's very self-interested, right, like, which is, I, I guess, expected, but, like, I'm, I'm being purposely vague here, which probably makes it hard to follow what I'm saying, but people in certain groups making certain claims about the world which are uh, you know somewhat true right but in a limited capacity whereas uh you know they're made out to be these these huge things or perhaps they're true but it's also more complex than they make it out to be 
It's just that one side is steeped in academia and the other side isn't. Uh, and this is a problem because when you're doing research on political stuff, you're reading the academic side of things because those are the people who have the most detailed opinions. And you're therefore you're just kind of getting only one side of things. And it's mostly the leftist side. And that is partly because mostly the leftists are right about a lot of stuff. But they're not always right about a lot of stuff. You know, I'm generally speaking economically lefty. Uh, like I'm in favor of larger social programs and, and so on. And stronger government regulation on large corporations. Right? Like I'm in favor of those things. I suppose that makes me economically left wing. Uh, you know, I'm in favor of a universal basic income in a lot of cases. Although I'm not 100% set on that. Uh, I, I still think that that we just don't have enough data on, you know, how well it works. But I'm definitely in favor of continuing to experiment with UBI. It seems promising, even if I'm not really, you know, I would have said a year ago, like, hell yeah, it's a great idea. We've got to do it right now. After doing more research, I'm like, well, there's a lot of cases where it seems very promising and I would definitely like to see it followed through. But I don't think that there's enough information of real world tests to, to show uh, you know, exactly how the best way to implement UBI is. Uh, and so, you know, that that means we need more real-world tests, not that it's a bad idea. It could be a bad idea, but we just don't know yet. And if it's a good idea, then it's a really good idea, and I think it's definitely worth following through with. Um, you know, like, all of this stuff is generally, like, lefty economic stuff. So, you know, I think... I don't know, I'm just, I'm just fucking... I think everyone's complaining about how everything's so bad. Except that most things are like, most things are bad in a very insidious way. Like the argument is really, the actual political argument happening in the world right now is not like, how can we make things less bad? The argument is just like, who deserves to be, how can we focus all the bad stuff on a specific group of people? Uh, Or uh, like, how can we like insidiously change the aspect of the badness, right? Like, I think everyone thinks they're going to magically eliminate suffering from the world by doing something or at least pin the suffering on the suffering on one particular group or another or uh, that they can somehow distribute the suffering across the population so that it's actually minimal to any individual um but you know i made a video ages ago called like why we have to suffer in weird ways or something like that just the, like none of us were ever meant for this like there's an environment for which we evolved and we live in this completely different environment that we are completely maladapted towards, uh, and we don't know what to do about it. Like that's a there's no there's no guide really for what does a species do when they they have ab- accidentally created an environment that they're maladapted for. There's no guide for that, uh, and yet <clears throat> you know we keep fucking with the with our environment, and frankly we're not making us we're not really taking it that much closer to what we're adapted for i mean in some cases we are you know i'm a big fan of the push current civil design push towards like walkable cities and cycling infrastructure and so on this is definitely something that's good in terms of creating a world that humans are more closely adapted towards although it's still nothing close to like it's a band-aid at the end of the day it's a good band-aid it has to happen it uh trains especially big fan of trains autism big fan of trains um Anyway, uh, but but no, we're we're very maladaptive to this, and so everyone's talking about like how can we change our environment in certain ways that will like, uh, you know, like fucking fix this. And frankly, I just don't think we can. I think I think it's too late to even be talking about changing your environment. I think it's got to come to the point where we're changing the human instead of changing the environment. Uh, and it's a two way street, you know. Uh, but yeah, and this is not necessarily a transhumanist argument, you know, as much as in the same sense, is it, is it transhumanism? The fact that you brush your teeth every day, uh, your, you know, your ancestors didn't brush their teeth every day because they had more important concerns than tooth decay, but we do because we, we apparently don't have more important concerns than tooth decay, which I don't know about, but you know, or the fact that you wear glasses or something like this, right? Like, it's not necessarily about extending or fixing human capabilities. It's about moving beyond this stuff to the point where human capabilities aren't even a, a question. And this isn't, you know, the idea that, like, this would make life better is, is not even relevant. 
it, it, it's not about whether it would make people people's lives better or whether it would make do anything like that the point is to get get outside of the realm of this question even being relevant uh because this is the problem with utopia actually this is like the, the we're actually getting to the point here of what i was trying to say this is like the, the problem with utopia is you don't want to live in a utopia i don't want to live in a utopia you do, none of us want to, like utopia sucks because we're sort of adapted for a, an environment that is challenging in a particular way we're, we're adapted to be continually dealing with a very particular type of environmental stress and be good at dealing with that and in fact we need it in the same way that like there are certain you know there are certain trees and their seeds only sprout after a wildfire and they tried to stop the wildfires and the trees started going extinct and then they started doing artificial wildfires in order to bring the trees back like even though wildfires seem destructive you know in the same sense uh you know utopia is like taking away all the wildfires we need we need wildfires we need the particular type of stress that we're adapted for in order to uh like function properly right it's like uh and the problem is that those particular types of stress aren't pleasant also it's not like you know let's say you have two choices you have one choice which is this like a, a sort of very typical modern uh stress uh which might be something like oh i'm worried about my uh uh house down payments or something like this right like oh in 5 years or in 20 years i uh, like what's my pension plan going to be you know these sorts of like very modern stresses that are just fucked or uh like oh i'm i'm on the internet and i'm being bombarded with information that that i can't tell if it's real or fake or um you know who every, everything every, all these corporations are trying to exploit me and the government's doing this this and that right like these sorts of modern stresses none of these are fun no one wants to deal with them right but you have plenty of food you have and you have a safe place to live or like a relatively safe place to live you have a house right or or somewhere to some sort of shelter you have warmth you have food you know <clears throat> the sort of those are the stresses that we're designed to deal with and yet you have infinite access to them because we those are the first problems you solve when you're uh, a, an intelligent species is you you look at the major stresses in your environment which are going to be like food scarcity and th- these sorts of things and you solve those problems at, at, as a priority and frankly you know it took like thousands of years to get to the point where we're at now where we have this massive overabundance of food right this is i'm i'm kind of obsessed with with food as a concept because it's like we flipped from all of our evolution was it was basically focused on food every 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 creature who's alive is focused on like on food in some aspect their their life is about food and reproduction uh and even to the point where we were like homo sapiens still most of our day-to-day activities are about food and then you know once in a while reproduction uh like you you're supposed to be quotation mark big quotation marks supposed to be wandering around all day looking for fucking food right and then even after agriculture was invented still most people's daily activities were based around manufacturing and producing food it was only very recently that suddenly in the west we have the exact opposite problem where we have so much fucking food that we never have to think about it really you know just look at like how diverse and how much how complex all of the different cuisines in the world are like humans could have gotten good at doing anything that that like matters for the the five senses right like you you could have been spending a few thousand years as a culture getting developing all sorts of complex textures to feel but textures were not biologically engineered to care about textures right but we do care a lot about food cuz that was our main concern for our evolutionary history and so as a species there we developed you know all of these millions of different types of cuisine because even once you've secured a stable food source that can keep you nourished your still brain is still telling you to think about food and so well we're sort of creative so what's next is to try and come up with different types of food to how how can the food taste better and so on now we thankfully we've solved food now because we have huel which is the final form of food but uh that aside you know and i think what i'm trying to get at here i kind of went on a tangent about food here but like 
these are the, the choices you have. Either you're concerned about some sort of modern stressor which we're maladapted towards, like, you know, the examples I gave before, or you're concerned about the primitive stressors, like, where's my next meal going to come from? How can I make sure I have shelter tonight? Is a predator near me that's going to attack me? Which, those aren't fun either. No one's willingly going to do that, you know, as evidenced by the fact that, that humans spent thousands of years of effort getting as far away from those stresses as physically possible, eliminating those stresses to the maximum amount. And people aren't, we're literally designed to minimize those stresses. I know, okay, designed, it's a strong word, but you guys know what the fuck I'm talking about, okay? You, you, can, you can use a little bit of thinking and, and maybe read a little bit of depth into my words and say like, oh, well, we're not really designed for anything or whatever, like, you can, you, you know what the fuck I'm talking, I've been trying to use the word, like, adaptive and mal maladaptive, you know what the fuck I'm saying, right? Uh, and so, you know, frankly, you either, you get to choose between uh, the, the terrible stresses that we're evolved for, which are not pleasant to experience, or the stresses that we're not evolved for, which are also unpleasant to experience in a completely different way. Like, no one's willingly going to start a famine. No one wants to go through famine, although famines were more of a post-agricultural thing rather than a, you know, agriculture was the thing that really created famines as a big problem or a more common problem. You know, they had famines like once every 12 years in the, the medieval period, uh, whereas in the pre-agricultural period, famines were much more rare. Uh, anyway, bit of a tangent there. It's all fucked is what I'm saying. Like, you don't, like, right now, is our best shot at utopia. We've solved a lot of these primitive problems, primitive stresses. We've solved them. This is our best shot at utopia, and you're miserable, right? Like, what gives you any indication that you got to keep chasing this dragon? I don't really see it. And, and a lot of the focus is on stuff that is, like, really inconsequential and blowing it up. Like, people are just making up problems at this point. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're problems, they're real, they exist, but they're not, like, as big of a deal as people make them out to be. Like, they just, if it, it, it feels like, you know, in the, in the 20th century, there was, the, there was a whole bunch of, like, revolutionary progress, and people are like, well, look, that improved our lives so much, so we got to keep pointing out all the bad things and revolutionizing it. And it's like, well, uh, hold on a minute, I feel like, you know, how much, it's a little, it's a little more, there's a little more to it than that. And I'm not saying that, that any of these, you know, I, I'm not sitting here like, oh, we gotta all go back to being fucking peasants, or we gotta go back to being hunter gatherers, because neither of those were particularly, you know, I, I don't think that they were particularly good lifestyles either. I would be dead if it wasn't for modern medicine, and I don't like being dead. I would have, I would have died in, as a, as a, an infant. Um, because I had pneumonia when I was born, and then my, my lung collapsed when I was, like, uh, like two weeks old or something, so I would be dead, uh, as well as, like, all of my friends would be dead, because, like, th well, three of my friends had, uh, pen what the fuck's, appendicitis, that would have killed them, uh, you know, I have friends who's disabled, and generally sickly, yeah, well, everyone I know would basically, be, including me, would basically not have survived, it wasn't for modern medicine reducing child mortality rates and it's like you know do i i can't even begin to theorize about a world where i wouldn't exist you know what i'm saying and if i am going to then i may as well start theorizing about worlds where humans don't exist and i think the fundamental problem is like there's no there's no we don't really have a good idea of like what is what we want, what, what is it, what is a good, th where's a good place for humanity to go, because I don't think there is one, right, there's just yearning, which is like some sort of inbuilt feeling, and, you know, at the end of the day, I kind of feel like it's a little bit like this, this, uh, this fucking spinal catastrophism book, where it's, or, or something, maybe even Nick Land, where it's like, we're just driven by these, like, out, outside forces, we're just, driven in some sort of giant incomprehensible game by forces by over which we have no control and we're doing something and we don't really know what we're doing we're just following these sort of very basic instructions. we don't know what we're doing any more than like 
uh, and any particular transistor in your computer knows what it's doing when it is like doing some sort of calculation you know like we don't it's just knows that it has to turn to zero or one i mean obviously knows is i'm pers- fucking personifying it here but like in the same it's the same general sense in which like two in the the perspective of whatever grand universal uh, you know if we're talking like physics thermodynamics thing is happening here or or maybe like lovecraftian whatever we're an ant on a circuit board who suddenly understand you know what i'm saying right uh was just yeah it makes it like even being an anarchist is pointless in that in that situation it, it, <laughs> i don't understand how you can be an anarcho nihilist doesn't make any fucking sense um i guess you know or whatever there's, there's, there's just fucking going back to anarcho nihilism even though it doesn't matter or, or like it's just something i brought up for no reason at the beginning but yeah like i feel like we all just got fucking memed into this idea that like there are actually there are uh really good ways to organize society and uh, really bad ways and currently we're in a really bad way except for like the few people there are not that many but there are a few people who like to counter signal and say well actually hold on a minute we're actually doing really well right and this is like very rare these days it used to be more common like 20 years ago 30 years ago to say actually society is really good the way it exists right now but these days a lot of people can't manage to hold that idea in their head it's too much cognitive dissonance uh so like most people are like actually society is kind of doing fucking bad and we have to do something about it obviously we can't agree what it is but we agree that we that something's fucked and we have to do something and there's you know very few people who are like and some of the other people are like actually society was doing fine until you people decided that it was fucked and we need to do something about it and in doing something about it you've made it way worse right like there's people who think that there's people who think all sorts of things people who think all sorts of things you know in this world there's people who think all all sorts of things and they're all fucking talking all the time and and they're all like arguing about this shit and they're all arguing about like all of this insane stuff where it's like on the scale of like one person or they're talking about like stuff that's like oh, there's, there's 50 million people are going to die in Africa because of this fucking disease, like, uh, uh, uh. it's like, at the end of the day, am I just lower empathy than any of these people? Like, I just don't really care. <laughs> like, I just, I'm like, oh no, people in a country that I've, you know, never been to or met anyone from or have any relation to are doing badly. Oh no, a hundred years ago, my country did something bad to another country and, and now they're doing badly and they blame it on us. Oh no, I don't, I say even us, it doesn't even make sense to say us, right? Because everyone's, a, I'm, I'm a fucking immigrant, right? We're all immigrants. Everyone's just moving around so much, it doesn't even make sense to say us anymore. And what is even us about a country? It's just really a government. And even the government is like a completely different apparatus than my, what might have been around. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no, it's all about like petty revenge. When you really get down to it, it's all about like this petty stuff and like performative empathy and and all of this like moralizing that just doesn't make any sense. You know, like all of these, like a, a, lot, of, a lot of people, they have these very strict moral convictions and zero justification for it. You know, like I'd rather if you were just a fucking Christian at this point. Like, honestly, like, I'd rather if you were just going to say, oh, no, this is the correct moral conviction because God says so. Like, I mean, actually, I wouldn't because that's equally nonsensical because there's, you know, even Christians can't agree, right? Like, there are all of, no one, you know, do you understand what I'm getting at here? It's like people have these really strong moral convictions about, and it's all, when I say moral, like, I, I, I'm, I, I've never read Nietzsche I've never read the genealogy of morals, but I've watched a couple of lectures about it, so I'm not going to claim to have read it or to fully understand it, but I'm going to make reference to it. You know, it's all slave morality, the 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 by far the the predominant sort of thing that things that people are moralizing about. It's all it's all of this sorts of Nietzschean slave morality stuff, which is you know just lame. <laughs> Like, frankly, it's lame. And it's also very hard to argue against because we're all indoctrinated into this culture. And uh, and the people who are doing the opposite are also bad. Like, they also suck. I think that it's just like an over... I think there's just like an overuse of this sort of moralism as if it's... as if there isn't another option. When, like, either you're strongly moralistic 
or you're like a full on like moral relativist, cultural relativist type of person, which I think I am closer to than any of these people. Right, like the like lefties have given up on this idea of cultural relativism, except when it's like very, except when it's randomly useful to them, like almost always Islam and nothing else <laughs> for some reason. I don't know why they're so obsessed with this. They're like, ah, yes, uh, cultural values are actually relative and uh, the hijab is actually liberating and whatever, which doesn't make any fucking sense. But, you know, they'll say that, but then anything that goes further than that culturally, they're not okay with a lot of cultural stuff. They're just not okay with, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. Maybe it's not the same people. Maybe I'm just, like, lumping people in. But, yeah, everyone, everyone's all these, like like, overly empath- empathetic, I would say, you know, and I, it might sound like I'm talking about the left here, like I'm being some sort of, like, anti-SGW, but the right is equally bad, if not worse, right, like, these people, they're like, oh no, they're, they're, they're cutting, they're cutting little boys' penises off, and they're sterilizing my children, it's like, who gives a fuck, kill yourself, who cares? Fuck off. Who cares? Who gives a fucking shit? I don't fucking care. <laughs> they can, like, oh no. They're, they're, they're killing all of these people. They're, and I'm not trying to say this to be edgy. Like, I'm just being real here. You know, there's a, there's a fucking, I've mentioned this before, there's a, there's some, like, post-left anarchist fucking thing. Uh, uh, like, 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 paper or whatever. Text. And I think it's called Where Was Luke Skywalker on September 11th or something like that. And, like, the it begins by just saying, like, no one actually cares about 9-11. And if you think you do, you actually don't really give a shit. Right? And I think that's, like, one of the most accurate things ever. Because it was written, like, right in the wake of 9-11. This isn't like someone wrote that now, because it's not that edgy to say it now. This was, like, 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 I think the same year. Or maybe the next year. Like, this was written right after, like, which is very prescient, I think, but... Um, you know, and I, I just find that to be the case about pretty much everything. Like, frankly, if I think most people are of this opinion that if it doesn't affect their lives, then it's not particularly important. And you've got these people, um, <clears throat> when it comes to moral philosophy, like this fucking guy, uh, hold on, let me find him. Peter Singer, right, who's like, oh no, you, you, if you're, if you're spending money on, Starbucks that you could have donated to charity, you're actually morally evil because distance doesn't make any difference in morality. And so everyone, uh, uh, almost everyone, if not everyone in society is actually morally evil because, uh, you know, this, you know, this meme, oh, oh, if you could press a button that would give you a billion dollars, but it would kill a random person or something like that. Or like, uh, you know, if you saw a child who was starving to death and you had the ability to, you had a sandwich in your hand and you walked past a kid who was starving and you didn't give them the sandwich, that would be morally evil. However, if that child is starving somewhere a a thousand miles away and you have the money to buy them a sandwich or whatever and you don't do that, that's considered just like, like buying that sandwich is considered like morally extra step. You're not uh, morally required to do that. But it's good if you do do it, but you're not worried. And it's, the piercing is like, no, 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 actually, distance shouldn't make a difference. And it's like, well, hold on a goddamn motherfucking second. Morality is something we made up. Like, there is no ultimate moral law in the universe. I think most people agree with this, unless you're religious, um, <clears throat> which you shouldn't be at this point. Uh, but yeah, most most people agree with the fact that, like, we have we have some sort of, most people have some sort of moral conscience, moral instincts, right? And then out of that, we've constructed... Uh, moral principles and we like moral principles only if like we test we make moral principles testable by instinct like we don't make one we don't try and modify our instincts to follow the principle we do the opposite right like people say stuff like when when you're trying to debunk a, a, a meta ethics like there's the 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 sheriff example in utilitarianism right like what if what if uh there's a sheriff in a town and uh uh, there's a, a man who's being chased by a mob and the sheriff knows that the man is innocent but he also knows that if he doesn't hang the man uh, the mob will go on a violent riot which will kill hundreds and hundreds of people uh, the sheriff by utilitarianism has to kill the innocent man in order to maximize or minimize the deaths of hundreds and hundreds of people but it feels morally wrong to kill the innocent man 
some utilitarians are just like no it's fine anyway, whatever like these are the I, it doesn't that particular example doesn't matter but the the point is those sorts of hypotheticals are used to test ethics right like where you you give some uh counter example and you say but that would result in this which we can all agree is morally bad and it's like you just know it's morally bad or morally good via your moral intuitions not via some intellectualized process um and so all of this stuff about like all of, all of the political moralizing that goes on in the world uh you know doesn't make any fucking sense to me because i've given up on trying to intellectualize moral intuitions and just accepted them as what they are which is just some weird psychological slash biological thing that goes on in people's brains that it's basically an expression of like approval or disapproval in terms of like opinion or taste uh it's a, it's just an emotional reaction like it which is fine like emo there's nothing wrong with emotions like people i say just an emotional reaction but you know everything is just an emotional reaction if you're starving to death or if you're being tortured right, oh it feels bad to be tortured oh you fucking loser just whining about your emotion right like everything's an emotional reaction that doesn't the point is pretending it's not is retarded and so i'm not gonna fucking sit here and and lie about my what my moral intuitions tell me uh, or a say they don't exist and pretend to be a moral nihilist or uh b say uh actually they do exist and they're highly structured and intellectualized so i can be consistent no they're just feelings they don't have to be anything more than that they're definitely in part culturally coded some of them are very or like close to universal but there's also they have an interplay with cultural taboo uh, you know but I something interesting about taboo which i think has really uh affected my thinking on this subject a lot <clears throat> which is the way taboo works is it's not actually about the act it's about the arena so like you know there, there could be the example of like violence is taboo unless it takes place in a uh, mma fight or a boxing fight where or wrestling, or American football, or like, uh, <clears throat> sexual violence is taboo, unless it's in the form of BDSM, or, uh, you know, there, there are many different examples of this sorts of things, right, like, where, <clears throat> uh, so-and-so thing is taboo, right, like, like, name-calling and shouting at someone is taboo, you know, but in the certain, uh, arenas, it's considered weird not to do that you know like these these are the sorts of things and what but i points out is that it's not that these are just exceptions to the taboo it's not just like oh this thing's taboo and then here's an exception it's that the whole point of taboo is that every behavior has some arena in which it's acceptable and some arena in which it's unacceptable and if you don't provide an arena where something is acceptable it's going to spill over into the places where you don't want it and so if you want to create a taboo which a lot of people do right now because they're moralizing very heavily. You have to create an arena which is acceptable. If you don't, it's gonna if people are not gonna if people are gonna be mad. People are gonna be very mad, and that sort of thing is gonna spill out, and you're never gonna successfully create a taboo, right? Like if if you're trying to create a taboo against certain language, you have to provide people with an arena in which it, that language is acceptable, and then you can say, look, you can go over here and do that. Like if you really wanna. You can go over here and do that. Just uh, you're in the wrong arena, and then people will be. It will be okay. It's like creating a containment board, right on 4chan. It's like, look, you can talk about that shit. Just go to fucking Paul and talk about that shit. We're right? trying to talk about video games here or something like that, right? Like, th that's it's something people really don't have any understanding of right now. I guess because they're they're not thinking things through. Uh, anyway, sorry, that was a fucking insane manic ramble. Something I think people forget about the days of the old internet is how fucked up a lot of these smaller forms are, particularly because of moderators and site owners and journeys and these sorts of things. Uh, that, you know how Discord servers, I, I know I, I have a lot of Zoomers in my audience who, you know, I only, I'm going to be honest with you, I only caught the tail end of this, right? Uh, so, but I remember it still. Uh <clears throat> You know how Discord servers have fucking power tripping Discord mods and, uh, you know, admins who would like, or, or owners who would just like nuke their server if people disagree with them or 
like these sorts of things happened all the fucking time back in the day. You'd go, you know, before every video game had dedicated servers, you would go on some random guy's community server, and if you killed him, he'd just ban you because he got mad. Like, these sorts of things happened all the fucking time. I think people forget about this. Uh, now, uh, what I want to clarify is, this isn't saying things are better now. We've, it's just that corporations are doing the same fucking shit that all of these people were doing before. Uh, there's, there's no difference. It's just fundamentally how the internet works, is that there's just this, this, like, tension between how moderation works versus how, like, the user base works. Um, the, like, power-tripping mods, they exist today, except they get paid a salary to do it. Uh, you know, in the past, they, they just did it for free. Sometimes they still do it for free on certain websites. They do it for fucking free. <laughs> they do it for free. Can you imagine? They do it for free. Johnny's do it for free. Oh my god, they do it for free. Anyway, uh, you know, there's there's no difference. Nothing's really changed except for the fact that, like, uh, it's just a corporation fucking you now instead of some power-tripping mod, right? Like, that's the... The difference and they they all generally speaking have the same sorts of power trips the same sorts of rules uh so it's not any better really uh the only difference is that like that's not why the internet is better or worse anyway you know people used to think that uh everyone would have a server that like computers were becoming cheaper and more powerful and that you know we moved away from mainframes where people just had terminals that connected to a mainframe, which was one powerful computer because com the powerful computers were so expensive. And then slowly people had personal computers that would connect to servers, and eventually everyone's personal computer and server would be indistinguishable because everyone would have powerful enough computers that would just act as a server. And uh, you know it would all be this this world where people were hosting their own shit and interacting with other people's shit. You didn't have to deal with this whole like connecting to a server which is owned by someone else just to do anything, which is really annoying. Except, uh, the internet became corporatized uh, and mainstream and adopted just before that could happen. Uh, which meant that, like, the user-friendly stuff became built around the client-server model instead of a peer-to-peer -peer model, which is just really annoying. Because we were so fucking close. And the thing is, the prediction came true. Every single person right now watching this video has a phone powerful enough to be a server, right? Like, you have a phone powerful enough to be a server, you have a computer powerful enough to be a server, right? You can, you, you probably have a computer with hundreds of gigabytes, if not terabytes of storage, right? Like, there's a, a, an internet connection a hundred times the speed of someone in the 90s, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's no reason, hardware, the, hardware wise, the dream has come true. It's just software wise, uh, it hasn't, there hasn't been this, this, really usable peer-to-peer -peer net and there's a couple of reasons for that uh why it's kind of impractical uh the first one is it requires your computer to be on all the time servers are on 24 7 for a reason it'll be really annoying if you were like you know, like oh i want to go watch a uh and a youtuber like let's say you have a youtuber you like i, I want to watch northern lion but northern lion is asleep right now his computer's off so i can't watch his videos because they're all hosted on his computer uh, now there is a solution to this uh, it's called fucking torrent, BitTorrent. It was they figured this out ages ago. Uh, you you just have to distribute that file so that it's on the BitTorrent protocol, and then it's like, oh, if I want to watch a Northern Line video, I just download the torrent of his video, which he hosts, and then a bunch of people download, and then you know it's fast, it's easy, it works really well. Torrent, BitTorrent is arguably the best protocol ever made. Okay, maybe not, but it's very high up there. Uh, you know. This is the sort of thing that could be happening, and some people have a attempted to make it happen, I suppose, but the problem is that, I don't know, I guess they're all just retards. They're just bad software engineers. Like, there's zero net. People, the problem is, like, well, there's a couple of problems. Uh, a lot of people are really into making this, like, a Bitcoin-y or, or blockchain-y. It doesn't have to be Bitcoin-y or blockchain-y, as is proven by the existence of fucking BitTorrent. It doesn't have to be Bitcoin-y. Or blockchain -y. you can just not have that be the case uh you know i think there's this the real solution is fairly simple if you it, it just depends what you're trying to host you know if you uh it's I, I don't know i i think i mean you you can host a simple static website 
on a Raspberry Pi that you just have in a headless setup plugged into your wall 24-7 with zero problem. I, I don't know why I haven't done that, frankly. I probably should get around to doing that. Uh, so, you know, anyone could be doing that. You obviously can't host, like, you, you probably can't get away with hosting a lot of video or, like, large file size content on that. And it's probably not ideal to do that either. That's why torrents exist. You know, the every time someone tries to make a YouTube alternative, like BitChute or PeerTube or a, a Twitch alternative or any of these things, right? Like, the the their problem is they're still recreating the fundamental architecture. Uh, I know BitChute claimed to be peer-to-peer -peer for a bit, but it isn't. Let's just remember that. Uh, you know, what? because people are obsessed with, like, uh, I guess, discoverability, because all of these algorithm-generated feeds have, have like, they, they feed us artificial views, and so we're, like, conditioned to believe that it's normal to get, like, thousands and thousands of views on everything we make or post. You know, I post on Twitter. Like, I make some random shit post on Twitter, and, like, this post has literally 300... I made a post yesterday. It's just pointing out bad web design. I just I found a post with some bad web design, and I, I quote tweeted it and said, if you make websites like this, there's a special place in hell for you. Now, what I actually wanted to say was, if you make websites like this, kill yourself. But I thought I might get banned if I said that. Um, so I said, if you make websites like, like this, there's a special place in hell for you. Right? This is not a this tweet didn't pop off. It has it has seventeen likes and two retweets. You know, this is like a a low performance tweet by anyone's standards. And yet, three hundred and thirty six people saw it. That's a lot of fucking people. Three hundred and thirty six people. Like I don't I don't even think I could even name half of that. Yeah, I I don't think I can name fucking like a hundred and fifteen people or hundred and twenty people or whatever the math is. Like. Hold on. 168 people. <laughs> I'm fucking retarded. Yeah, I don't think I could name 100... You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm fucking saying here? There's a lot of fucking people. But we're conditioned to believe that, like, all of this stuff has to be... That, like, getting millions of views on something is normal. Uh, and because of that, you know, no one no one fucking interacts with anything anymore. Uh, right? Like, you, you gotta... You know how scale works, and yet you're pretending you don't know how scale works. And I'm also doing it. We're all doing it. Because I'm assuming we're all in Discord servers with, like, five or six friends, right? No? Like, we know that having, like, some anywhere between five to ten people in a server together... Also, it's kind of obnoxious that they call them servers, because they're, they're all hosted on fucking what server. But anyway, we all have Discord rooms with, like five to ten people in them, which basically have enough conversation to to be perfectly, you know, operable pretty much around the clock. That's how many people you need. You don't need thousands and thousands of people, right? You're in a Discord server with a hundred people. That's massive. It's too fast. It's crazy. But because these social media platforms make content so frivolous and they algorithmically feed you stuff that isn't from people you know, but from like you know, the popular people and so on. Uh, you 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 don't interact with any of it. You see a random post and you're not going to, if you see a random meme video, you're not going to, like, comment on it and be like, hey, that was pretty funny or something like that or add something to it. Because, firstly, you're trying to play the game. You're trying to fucking get likes because you're retarded. You're like, oh, i, I got to say something funny so that it will get likes. Uh... And secondly, you're like, oh, no one cares. But if you were in a place that was just your friends, you'd post the same video and then people would talk about it. The scale is all fucked up here is what I'm saying. Anyway, we're all fucking poisoned and broken. And... Here's an example of the 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 weird taboo um, zones thing that I just thought of. That I just sort of noticed. I don't know. I didn't really think about it. Like, you can't... There are... I don't, I didn't think about this before because I don't watch these channels, but there are hunting channels on YouTube and they all get fucking demonetized like crazy and they have to massively censor their videos. Like, it seems really obvious, right? But you can't show yourself killing an animal on YouTube. You can't, you couldn't run up to a fucking deer, stab it in the throat and then put that on YouTube, right? But you can find a, a million videos of people cooking meat that's also a dead animal, 
obviously, what's the fucking difference? Why does it matter if it was killed 10 seconds ago or two days ago? It's still dead animal flesh. Either you're okay with it or you're not okay with it. Look, I'm just talking politics because I'm trying to avoid talking about TF2 because it's all I fucking do on this podcast is talk about TF2. I'm going to talk about TF2 very briefly. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some edgy politics. <coughs> Which is, I basic, you know, I got into TF2 because I wanted to play Demo Knight. And as time has gone on, I play less and less Demo Knight. Because, frankly, it's it's way less fun than I than I. You know, I got into TF2 because I saw the Demo Knight movement in, like, Solar Light videos being crazy. And, you know, as time has gone on, <clears throat> I've realized that playing Demo Knight is actually kind of boring. Because, the to me, I get way more dopamine, right? Like, it feels way better and more skill-based and exciting. Like, because I'm, let's say you're playing Hybrid Knight, right? You're playing Hybrid Knight. What feels better? What feels like a better accomplishment? Charging someone down and then swinging at them two to three times with a sword, which barely requires aim, right? <clears throat> Versus hitting, like, two to three pipes on someone. To me, it's the pipes. Because, like, hitting two sword swings in a row is, <clears throat> you know, other than getting into their range, it's kind of a matter of timing when you're charging in and picking your fight. But if you pick the right fight... Like, that's the skill. The skill is being patient and having good game sense and uh, choosing which classes to attack and when and charging in at the right time when they're maybe not paying attention or maybe kind of low. You can't really take a one-on-one -on -one fight with, like, a pyro, but you might be able to, you know, destroy snipers like it's nothing if they're not paying attention, right? Like, that's the skill of demo, right? Is choosing your fight. And ideally, if you're choosing the right fights, you should win every time because... There's no real, you know, there's no real recourse for most classes against you as the, the sort of premier melee class, right? Uh, but most fights you can't take. Like, it's kind of a, a black and white thing. There's not really a large portion of, like, well, I can go in and then rely on my deathmatching skill to get this kill as Demonite. You can't really do that because there's no deathmatching skill. You either catch the person unaware or low health or a light class, or you don't, you know? Like, <clears throat> and this is not just a matter of being a close-range class, because pyro is very different. You know, I can kill heavies as pyro, not every time, right? I have, like, a... If, if there's a full health overheal heavy, I have a low chance of being able to kill that heavy, but if I am really skillful, I can do it, right? With With... I can pump him with the fucking, you know... Set him on fire, air blast him, second air blast to keep him in the air, juggle him with the, uh, 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 a fucking flare crit, then <clears throat> wait till he gets down, axe extinguisher him, and use my movement so that he can't shoot me, right, and then p set him on fire again, air blast him again, and then, uh, another flare, and he'll die, or another axe extinguisher, and he'll die, right, like, you can, it's a very complex is like a fighting game combo it's like it's like fucking super smash brothers melee ass like combo you know and it, it takes a lot of skill to pull off uh, and a lot of times you'll just die but when you do do it it's fucking it goes crazy so you have to be very skilled to do it not the case with demo night you just fucking spam mouse one <laughs> like to be frank you just spam mouse one uh <clears throat> whereas hitting pipes is way more difficult then, because, like, you can, theoretically, if you're good enough, land, land four pipes on a heavy and kill them, right? And it shouldn't, theoretically, be that hard, although I am terrible at the fucking game, and so I always miss one. It's always how it goes. I always land, like, two or three pipes, and then miss, miss one of them, and then I'm, like, stuck there, like a fucking retard, reloading, <laughs> and the heavy just swings around and kills me. And I'm always overconfident, because I'm like, heavy, big hitbox, move slow, I can hit pipes. And then, you know, <clears throat> I fucking miss one because um, I, I read their movement wrong or something. But, like, hitting crazy fucking pipes where you perfect, like, hitting air shots or something, that shit feels way better than just spamming mouse one correctly on a weak target. It's kind of like picking fights with someone your own size. You know, as Demo Knight, you can only prey on the weak. You're just an assassin that goes in, 
gets a kill on some weak class and then gets out of there and it's like <clears throat> you know it's 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 not a lot of technical skill it's a lot of like well other than trimping which requires a lot of te technical skill but is borderline useless for actually getting kills um <clears throat> yeah, it's very very situational uh not to me it's useless but it's very situational uh you know fucking hitting pipes is you can you can theoretically you know if you're good enough at aiming there's no class in the game you can't take down uh as long as you have like insane deathmatch skill <coughs> so you know as time has gone on i've moved away from playing demonite and towards sticky jumper demo because i still really like the like having being a very high mobility class <coughs> I, like i i like the high mobility stuff but i'm i i you know the 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 being a, a more melee focused class it just means you kind of have to play really cautiously and even when you get kills it's not that fun <clears throat> yeah whereas playing sticky jumper demo you can fucking do insane you know the sticky jumper also requires a lot of skill and i'm slowly getting like better and better with it you know generally speaking i'm good enough with it where i can like jump entirely across the map and then you, you know put a sticky down to counter my full damage and uh, maybe get a kill and then get out. It's pretty fun. It's especially good for rolling out because that's the most boring part of the game is when you spawn and your MG's teleport has been sapped and you have to walk all the way to the front line again. Really fucking boring. Not boring if you have a sticky jumper. It takes 10 seconds. It takes 2 seconds. <clears throat> and then I've also been trying to get better with like stock demo, although I still kind of suck at stock demo, but I'm trying to get better. Well, when I say stock, I'm, st I'm st still kind of using the iron bomber more so than the stock grenade launcher. Um, although I do like the stock, and I'll, I'll switch to it. And the other thing is I've been using the, uh, you know what's the most dopamine, the most dopaminergic weapon in TF2 that I've found is, uh, the fucking iron, uh, no, sorry, the, the loose cannon. Hitting double donks is, <clears throat> you know, it's just a pure shot of fucking heroin in your, in your veins. When it, when it makes the silly double, and you can, like, if you're good with the, and I'm not good let's clarify i'm not good but if you're good with the 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 loose cannon you know that shit does 120 damage when you double dunk i'm pretty sure right let me let me double check that i'm pretty sure it does it does like 120 damage uh does it say as a wolf so put come on it explodes a half a second the enemy takes many quick damage from the explosion ignore explosive damage fall off meaning the total damage is 131 <clears throat> and you know this also hits and it makes this sound. Oh, never mind. Uh, but yeah, anyway. 131 damage, plus it has fucking, you know, some AoE damage from the explosion, so it's also gonna damage anyone nearby. You can be pumping out, like, insane damage if your double dunk timing is, is on point and your prediction is on point and you're also very lucky, because it's definitely a luck. It's, luck is definitely plays, in, plays a part in this. Plus, you have the ability to deny Ubers. Like, you, it makes you into the second class that can deny ubers you know your your fucking cannonballs can push people back like an air blast and it, it adds a ton of utility like denying ubers is one of the most useful things you can do as a member of a team no matter what you're doing you know like <clears throat> because the 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 game is very centralized around uber pushes to break stalemate so if you can deny an uber that's equally good as getting a med pick you know if not Sometimes even better, or maybe not better, but, you know, you're basically fucking the team, the enemy team. If, if you're pushing their uber push back, they, you know, that's, that's the, that's the big meta centralizing thing in the game, uh, right? That's how, that's how people break chokes and stalemates and so on. So if you're, if you're ruining a team's ability to do that with air blast or with the iron bomber, you know, you, you're of incredibly high utility to your team, uh, the only problem with the Iron Bomber is, yeah, if, if, it feels really good to get double donks, and, uh, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's, uh, it has the potential to be very powerful. Uh, however, however, uh, it's also really difficult to use. Uh, obviously, you know, you're, you're fucking, like, remember, the double donk deletes a scout in one, one hit. If your timing is correct, you literally delete a scout out of the game in one hit. <laughs> right, like, this shit is powerful. The problem is, 
it's a very hard weapon to use effectively. It takes a lot of practice. I am not that good with it. And even people who are, you know, it's the sort of thing that I think is, you would see it in, in like higher level meta if it was usable, right? It's just, the projectile is just slightly too slow, slightly too unpredictable. Like, it's just, it's just, and if you don't hit the double, you know, let's say if you only hit someone with the, with the, the cannibal and no, no double donk, or it only does like 30 damage, it's like, you're either fucking dishing out insane damage or doing basically nothing except pushing people around a little bit. Uh, but it is an extremely fun weapon to use if you're um, getting lucky or good with it. <coughs> Plus, that's not even to mention the mobility that it, they, now I don't take, you know, I'm using the sticky jumper a lot of the time, so I don't need the extra mobility, but it's there, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's fun. It, it's not necessarily practical because of how much self damage it does, but it is, uh, fun. So yeah, the, the, the loose cannon is a fucking great weapon to play with. Uh, and I've also experimented a little bit with the, uh, the lock and load and, you know, I feel like the lock and load has a lot of potential. I think there's no reason for it to have as few shots as it does. I, I, I like, in my experience, and maybe this is quite, there's a reason no one uses the lock and load, except, like, in very situational circumstances to, like, destroy buildings. And that's because it doesn't land on the ground. That is a, that is a huge nerf in itself. The fact that you can't shoot a projectile on the ground as, like, a little trap is a, is a pretty, you know, the fact that if you miss your shot, it does nothing, right? With the Iron Bomber, if you miss your shot, it sits on the ground, and you can, you know, <clears throat> like, if an enemy's strafing in front of you, you, you miss your shot to the left, they strafe right, you miss your shot to the right, they strafe back left, they're strafing into your fucking Iron Bomber shot that's on the ground, and they take damage from that, and they might get knocked up into the air, which makes their movement more predictable and you can land a shot on them right like it's the the fact that those the 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 projectiles land on the ground and explode is super useful it's like it it does chip damage and it it has it's it's a very useful mechanic it's not like some minor thing and obviously the stock grenade launchers rollers are very useful as well in a a lot of different circumstances uh, especially when you're like you know i'm thinking the chokes between mid on CP process, you know, when when you're f- facing a stock demo who's just shooting roller of, fucking crazy rollers after that, it means you can't retreat if you're facing someone because you're running away and their your their bullets are following you. You know, it's it's a crazy powerful utility. Even the iron bomber has this, right? Uh, although to a lesser extent, the fact that the lock and load doesn't have that. If you're escaping, you can't shoot on the ground to leave these little traps. If you're, you know, if you miss, you just miss and do nothing. That's a big deal. That's a big nerf. If you're fighting someone in a hallway, you know, like, if you're fighting someone anyway, it's a big nerf. There was, I don't see the reason why it has to have one fewer bullet in the clip. It means, you know, you have no chance fighting a heavy, for example. It means you don't have any leeway to miss one shot against soldiers or any, you know, higher or mid health plus, really. Um, it, it, the, yeah, it, it, it's a, it's a it borderline useless. Uh, it is fun to use, um, but it's the sort of thing where it's hard to justify practicing and learning it. I mean, it, 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 it might be better if I was using the stock sticky bomb launcher, because then, you know, I could rely on the sticky bomb launcher for, uh, you know, setting traps and more reliable damage, and then switch to the lock and load for... 1v1 fights or some particular circumstance where I need to shoot far away or something like that or obviously destroying buildings uh, might be more useful but you know frankly the lock and load doesn't really function as a side grade I think uh, <clears throat> I think it needs some well obviously obviously the lock and load doesn't function as a side grade because no one uses it I think it needs a little tweaking everyone knows it needs a little tweaking uh, okay so that's TF2 now let's talk about uh, politics uh, specifically, let's talk about the police, okay? Um, I'm thinking about this because of this absolutely fucking retarded, one of the stupidest internet dramas I've seen in a while. Actually, that's not true. It's just very petty. It's not the stupidest, there's way stupider, but one of the most petty internet dramas I've seen in a while. 
which who cares about this right yeah i'm not gonna bother sitting here and explaining the whole drama to you because it's just it's stupid fucking lefty infighting youtuber drama that's absolutely retarded and no one cares uh but there's there's been a uh particular disagreement between uh a youtuber called fd signifier and destiny fd signifier is like the the token the t- <laughs> he's, he's the 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 token black issues left tuber right you have like unlearn economics who's the token actually read in economics textbook you left tuber right and then you've got fd signifier who's the actually read a like black and african studies youtuber uh you know i i think he he makes a lot of good points in his videos i think his videos are generally well put together but i also disagree with a lot of stuff he has to say i mean i can say the same thing about destiny i can say the same thing about a lot of left tubers some of them are really good though but anyway it got me their their particular drama centers around a police department and a protest against that police department and i'm not going to get into it because it's absolutely stupid but it's got me thinking about the police and in my opinion you know <clears throat> maybe this is kind of an edgy thing to say but i think the main problem with the police and i'm talking about here this is another thing that makes me like not really watch fd signifies videos very much is they're incredibly america centric which is fine it's perfectly fine to make but he doesn't really clarify that fact but that's fine you know i i i don't think he should have to necessarily but it makes it very unrelatable because the the sort of issues surrounding policing and surrounding, uh, you know, black issues in America are quite different from specifically London, right? Like, uh, you know, he talks a lot about uh, how alienated white people are from black people's lives, uh, how like a lot of white people barely interact with black people in their day to day life or growing up, which is just not the case here. You know, I went to a majority black school. There were literally three white kids in my class. Uh, for including me, uh, you know, I, I I live in a black neighborhood. I've grown up in black neighborhoods. To me, the idea that like white people live in this bubble, like I know in America there were these like gated communities and all of this crazy segregation shit, it doesn't exist here so much. Generally speaking, it's very sort of you know there are certain uh, ethnicities who live in sort of enclaves, like there's very much. Uh, you know, there's sort of a Bangladeshi area, there's like, and even to the point within, like, uh, you know, black people, like, there's a, and this is definitely a difference between London versus, like, how a lot of America is, is that, like, in America, most of the black people were brought over there as slaves, and are, like, you know, there's a whole different thing, versus most of the black people here are immigrants, either, like, from, like, maybe three generations ago, max, Uh, like, like, for example, you know, Lots of Jamaican immigrants, lots of Ghanaian and Nigerian immigrants, lots of uh, Ethiopian immigrants, uh, you know, and uh, I I just think that the, it's, they don't have the same necessarily, uh, maybe I'm uh, wrong about this, but I think the relationships with like infrastructure and housing uh, and this sort of segregationist housing policies are just kind of different here because it doesn't exist so much or the way it exists is I, I, I don't know. I'm not going to go too deep into it because I don't really know that much about it. And obviously, I, I, yeah. But when it comes to the police and policing, um, you know, I think uh, the main problem with the police in general is uh, mainly that they're incompetent. Like, I don't I don't want to play defense for the police, right? Like, I, I, I'm not, the, I'm not a, a big fan of the police, uh, but... One of the main reasons for that is the fact that they don't they don't really do anything. They don't really like they're not effective. Uh, like it's not I'm 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 not these days necessarily of the position that they're like evil and they're like going around murdering black children or whatever. Because I don't think the data like bears that out. Uh, at least not here. You know, it might be the case in some other places, but at least not here. Uh, but the their whatever they're doing doesn't work. <laughs> whatever the Met Police are doing, it's not working. Uh, they, you know, if you get your phone stolen in London, uh, the chances of you getting that, of the, of, of that phone ever being found is, is 2%, is 2%. Like that is, that is a level of incompetence from the police department. That's just insane. You know, if you call the police up and you'd say your phone's been stolen, they just won't do anything most of the time. Like they'll just say, oh no, you can have the phone like on, you know, find my device. You can know exactly where it is. 
and they just won't do anything. They just don't care. They don't even try, you know. Or, for example, say something more serious. Murders. Most murders go unsolved in London. Remember, this is London, one of the cities with the highest CCTV camera per capita in the world, if not the most, right? I, I don't remember. At least it was the most at some point, right? We have a, a high level of surveillance in this city and in this country. Uh, and yet, you know, they can't even do basic stuff like follow a murderer and find out where they went. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the police department is completely fucking incompetent. And even when people do get arrested, you know, I, I, I've I seen with my own eyes, you know, they, they and there's definitely this sort of cycle where people get arrested and then they come out of jail, you know, a couple months or a couple years later and they just do the same shit again. You know, whatever they're doing doesn't fucking work. And I'm not talking about just drug dealing, you know, who, who cares about that? I'm talking about like, you know, the fucked shit, the, the stuff that everyone agrees is bad. It seems like whatever the police is doing, they just either don't care, it doesn't work, you know, you get something stolen from you, even if it's like a car, something serious, they don't even try. Or, or maybe, I don't understand. I don't understand how they can be so incompetent. So like, that's the big thing that makes me lose faith in the police. Is that like they just don't fucking do anything? <laughs> they they they're clearly not making anyone safer, or solving crimes, or catching bad guys, or anything like that. They're just very clearly not doing that. Now, are they like? And they're also violent, right? Like I've had, I've been at, uh, you know, I've been at protests where the police have been violent towards me, pushed me, hit me with batons. You know, like I've I've been at I've been at these situations. And to be fair, you go to a protest, you kind of expect that. Right, like that's different from being attacked uh, by the police in a sort of random situation. And I've definitely seen the police, you know, maybe not in person, but there's definitely been plenty of videos and reports where the Met Police have been violent, sometimes sexually violent towards women, and then covering it up. As there was a very high-profile case of that happening recently, you know, that was a fucking disgrace. Uh, the Met Police, they they've basically attacked people for doing random shit, you know, but, uh, well, there's no but, they're just ineffective, that's the big problem that I found, it's not necessarily, like, they're not even, to me, it seems like I can't even get mad at them for, like, you know, oh, they're, they're targeting specific groups of people, they exist to, like, uh, hurt the poor or hurt black people or whatever, because they don't even do that, they just don't do anything, <laughs> they just don't, they just collect pay stubs, like, they're just, like, they, they, they're too lazy to even be racist as a police department, you know what I'm saying, even though the police, the Met Police has been found to be systemically racist by multiple independent overviews, you know, uh, and also incredibly corrupt, it's an open secret that the Met Police is very corrupt at the highest levels, uh, just look at how they treated the, uh, the Boris Johnson case and covering up various instances of police misconduct. So here I am. All of that I'm saying, you know, my experience of not particularly liking the police, I feel like is quite different from uh, what FD signifier uh, and these sorts of people, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the American anti-police activists think, which is that in America, you know, the, these police are, like, massively militarized, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen here, you know, just recently, there was a video of the police, literally, with guns, and, like, a, a group of, like, five police, going up to some random guy, and just shooting his dog, for what I could tell, no reason, they just shot his dog, or two dogs, they just shot and killed his two dogs, they didn't even make, like, the, the dogs weren't even doing anything, really, they were, like, barking, but they were on a leash, you know, they just shot and then tased the guy. Like, obviously, after you shoot someone's dogs, they're gonna fucking be like, oh, fuck, and they're gonna try and run away instinctively. Then he just tased him while he was running away. He wasn't doing anything. He wasn't being aggressive or violent with the police. He was, he was just talk. They were pointing guns at him. <laughs> I don't know, man. These guys just seem to be completely fucking incompetent. Like, they don't know what they're doing. And, you know, the main thing is that... Their incompetence means they're not doing their fucking... Like, they're not doing their job. Like, I don't think it's a bad thing, necessarily, if violent people are treated violently. Like, if you go around killing people, I think you should get fucking violently arrested and taken off the streets. I don't have any sympathy for this, right? Like, I'm not one of these people who's like, 
oh, they're just a victim of circumstance. They can't help but, you know, go around stabbing 12 people. No, if, like, if you're, if you're, uh, uh, someone who's going around as assaulting or killing people or raping people or th- stealing shit from people, then, frankly, I don't really care what happens to you, you know? <laughs> maybe maybe it's crazy. I, th- I just don't have that much empathy for this. If you're going around, you know, fucking... There's this whole idea that, like, oh, it's just poverty and mental illness that, that causes all of this. Motherfucker, I know a shitload of poor and mentally ill people and none of them do this shit. <laughs> like, you know, none of them do, none of them do this shit, that's not an excuse, right, like, frankly, I don't, I, I don't care what happens to you if you're being violent, you know, th- this doesn't really have any place in, uh, society, right, like, I definitely have some, it doesn't help my personal agoraphobia, right, you know, I, I hate going outside, the fact that I go outside and I see literal gang members all the time when I'm going outside, like, it's not even subtle, they have a uniform that they wear, you know, it's very easy to spot roadmen, (laughs) right, the fact that I go outside and I'm seeing them in big groups, sometimes with balaclavas on, you know, you walk past them, you know, there's, like, big groups, they have knives, you know they have knives, you know, you know, and it's like, uh, even if they don't attack me, which sometimes they have, right, because London moment, the fact that I'm just like, why are these people allowed to fucking do this, like, how can they be so brazen and open about what the fuck they're doing they don't need to do it you know uh it's not just poverty let me clarify this it's not just poverty that causes this because black people are not the poorest group in london the poorest people in london are uh bangladeshi and pakistani people okay and yet they have a much lower instance of gang violence so it's a you know it's it's some sort of problem in the black community that I don't know, you know, it's a, it's a, a general, it's not as simple as just arresting the people on the street, uh, because they're often recruited when they're kids, and it's these higher up people that are really the problem, and it's generally hard to tackle this sort of thing, uh, but frankly, you know, I think anything would be better than what they're doing now, which seems to be absolutely fucking nothing, they don't even try, they're just completely incompetent, then, then they're, 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 I don't know, they don't even do anything, they don't even, the police don't do anything, they don't, they can't even be racist, because they're not doing anything, <laughs> I, I, you know what I'm saying, they, they're, like, this is a completely different level of, like, versus what, what, like, you know, the, the problems faced in America, it's a completely different thing, it's not that, like, oh, the police are these crazy militarized people who are going around shooting left and right, and arresting random people, and whatever, and, and like, uh, targeting black people, they can't even target black people because they don't target anyone because they're fucking sitting there doing nothing. They're doing fucking nothing, and there's like two of them in the whole of London. There's, there's, I don't know. Like this is this is like one of the things that I don't know, man. They don't, they don't, they they they, they don't do anything, man. They don't even try to like solve cases or or catch criminals. It's like you know, and this is important, right? This is like. What is a state? A state, in order to qualify as a state, has to do something called maintaining a monopoly on violence, right? Like, that's what a state is. It's defined as an entity which has, like, you you can't qualify to be a state if you don't have a monopoly on violence. Frankly, you know, the state here is not doing a good job at all of maintaining that, like, they, they don't qualify as a state. Frankly, you know, like, I may as well be living under like a weird anarcho syndicalism because the state doesn't have a monopoly on violence so it doesn't exist it doesn't qualify as a state right they're not even trying i don't know man it's it's not like you can just you know i'm not just sitting here like oh well it's because there's not enough police officers we need to put more police on the street it doesn't matter if they're not doing anything like what matters is that they they i don't know i don't know they just don't fucking do anything they're ineffective they're lazy they're incompetent i don't know why they don't do anything but they just don't, they just don't even do anything. <laughs> you call the police, they get there, like, an hour later, and they just sort of stand around and don't do anything. You know, like, I don't know what people, like, this is a completely different experience, this is, like, a very different problem than, uh, you know, uh, over-militarization or any of these sorts of things. That's the, that's the big issue, is that they you can't trust them because they're useless. Like, this this concept of like over policing targeting black neighborhoods it's like motherfucker i lived in black neighborhoods my whole life i never see police anywhere they don't 
they don't do it. They they don't. I don't know how to impress this upon you. They don't do anything. <laughs> you know, like there's a, a you know, uh, okay. So one of the sort of there's a high street kind of uh, kind of near me. It's not that near me, but like there's there's a big high street with a bunch of markets and bunch of shops and stuff like that, uh, right? Uh, and they have a big ass McDonald's. Right, they have a big ass McDonald's. It's like two stories tall, very popular big McDonald's. Right, and this is in in a very black area. Okay, that McDonald's fucking hires like five security guards to constantly stand outside because people keep stabbing each other in the McDonald's, like and getting into fights in the McDonald's at night. Like you go there after sundown, and there's like a massive security guard presence. Like, isn't this what you're, like, memeing about is the sort of thing that would be over-policed? We're talking, like, a place in a in a predominantly black neighborhood that is, like, you know, where violence is happening at a higher rate than normal, and yet even the McDonald's, who, like, you know, surely are, like, the capitalists that the police are supposed to protect, can't even rely on the police and have to hire a private security force to stop you know, to try and uh, abate this, this stuff that's happening, right? Like, this is, uh, this is the sort of situation I'm in. It's the opposite. It's not that, like, there's this crazy over-policing of black neighborhoods. You never see police anywhere. There's, they don't, they're not here. Okay, so I just truncated the silence on the rest of this podcast. Uh, oh, a, a notification, strange. I truncated the silence on this podcast, which means it was at like 12 minute, 12 hours and something, and now it's at 10 hours and something. So, but I'm not going to do that for the rest of this, so you might notice that the audio sounds different. It sounds like I'm talking slower, or that's not edited. That's what happened. Um, I guess I'm making this a 12 hour podcast, because fuck it. Uh, secondly, so actually the thing I want to talk about is, is vegans. I want to talk about vegans. I want to talk about vegans and their slippery, dishonest arguments. Uh, now, I, I've talked about this before, but it's something that I, I'm like, it, it's it, it's almost like I didn't care until they made me care. <laughs> or, you know, it's something which is like a lot of, you know, this is the way that a lot of like people who are centrists or don't really think about apolitical on any particular issue end up having a stance is that uh, they don't really care until like some you know some group decides it's not okay to just not really have an opinion and to be apolitical or whatever and then when that group comes and pushes them they always end up taking the opposite stance almost always if they're like capable of reason and thought right like uh, th- this happens a lot it's why I'm personally in favor of Letting people who are apolitical remain apolitical. Uh, but anyway, so obviously veganism has taken off massively in society and that sort of pushes it to the forefront of people's brains, makes you think about it, oh, maybe I should be a vegan. And then clearly, the more po- it's kind of a snowball effect. The more popular it is, the more it's in front of people, the more people are going to be seeing their arguments. And they're the ones that are pushing arguments, right? Most, there, there aren't, uh, you know, omnivorous advocates who are saying... Uh, hey, let's put up a big poster. Let's do a, 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 a some sort of protest event, or uh, let's all stand outside handing out flyers to like about why actually uh, eating meat is probably perfectly fine. Uh, because that's the only argument they're making. They're not trying to make most people make some radical shift in their daily life. Only vegans are trying to do that. So they're the ones that are going to be making you know. And the more the more I see it, the more. I get annoyed. Now, the reason I get annoyed is not because of veganism as a, a concept or people's individual choices. You know, I don't give a fuck what you eat. I think only vegans give a fuck what you eat. <laughs> like, I, I, if you don't want to eat meat, you know, just because you find it gross or something, I don't fucking give a shit, man. Eat whatever the fuck you want. Who cares? That's not the problem. Even if you, it's also, it's weird to me to try and convince other people of what to eat. But even that is like, Okay, they're just sort of doing their weird little thing. The thing that actually annoys me is how dishonest and slippery their arguments actually are. Uh, that's what actually annoys me about vegans, is uh, their, their, their arguments are, are, are really bad. 
uh, in my opinion, most of them. And the, that fundamentally comes from this root fact, which is that veganism is a moral position. It is nothing more than that. It is just a position on morality. It is wrong to eat animals. That is, the, that is what veganism is. It is morally wrong to eat animals. And yet, we live in a world without a strong moral foundation. Most people are some variation of, you know, moral nihilists or, or moral relativists or something like this. They're, you know, people trying to make a big sweeping moral statement without having a fundamental moral backing to prop it up. Right? And so they need to appeal to stuff which has a stronger moral backing. Right? They need to appeal to, to uh, pseudoscience uh, in order to prop, prop their, their ideology up. Uh, because uh, it's considered to be sort of good etiquette, morally good, to hashtag trust the science. Right? It's, it, and so, uh, oh, look, we're appealing to all of these studies and then it's also you know considered good etiquette to root for the underdog humans actually have a very strong bias towards rooting for the underdog at least in the west uh they haven't i don't know about any studies in the rest of the world but it, uh uh that like if you show them like if you if you get some people in a group and you say like here are two sports teams that are facing each other and they're just dots like red dots versus blue dots they're going to face each other uh, except that the red team is the underdog uh people in general will vastly root for the red team, the group team they think of the underdog, even if they don't know what the sport is, they don't really know anything about the other team, or the only information they need is that one team is the underdog and they'll support them, right? Like, this is the... It's a common human bias, and it's something that a lot of groups like to... Every single group that is trying to push an ideology tries to appear like the underdog. No one wants to feel like the overdog. It makes it hard to root for. Uh, but once you become aware of this bias, you start to see it everywhere. Everyone is trying to take advantage of it. Uh, so that's another thing that vegans appeal to. But the main thing is just by, you know, making shit up or manipulating data and not uh, just being dishonest. So, like, let me just address a few arguments right now. Uh, this is inspired by the fact that uh, someone I know went on my Discord and tried to spam it with, like, vegan propaganda. And I just went through and, like, debunked everything they said. Debunked. We do some debunking over here. Uh, so, yeah, the fundamental fact is that veganism is just a, a moral argument with no backing, because that's what moral arguments are without God. Uh, and then, you know, downstream from that moral argument, trying to find justifications for itself. Uh, so common justifications include, you know, the, the, fu the, the, the thrust of veganism, which is that, like, uh, killing animals is bad, actually, because animals have feelings, too. That's something that they, you know, here's various studies that show how... Uh, all of these animals actually have feelings, and uh, killing things with feelings is obviously bad, right? Uh, and then the second thrust is, um, uh, actually, veganism is really good for you. That's the second thing, right? And this is the, the, the worst one, the easiest to, to, to debunk, so I'm going to do that one first because it's really fun to debunk. Uh, it, re it requires doing a little bit of thinking or, like, noticing a, a bias in, in something, and so it's fun. Uh, but like veganism is actually really good for you. That's why you should become a vegan is that eating meat is bad for you. Veganism makes your body healthy and, and, and that's good. Uh, and then the next thing is uh, 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 the environmental impact. Like uh, actually meat is bad for the environment. This one's their best argument and kind of complex. I'll address it. Uh, so those are their main three arguments. I've also heard, you know, a whole bunch of other ones, some of which are absolute nonsense, like, oh, humans aren't evolved to eat meat. That one is so easily debunkable, it's insane. Uh, stomach acid pH consistent with other uh, scavenger carnivores uh, and zero herbivores. <laughs> Easy. Um you know, there's there's a, uh, also evidence of butchery going back uh, 40,000 years in human pre-civilization. What do you want to, like, what, you can't just make shit up. <laughs> you can't just make shit up. And so this is the big, uh, actually, that, that leads me on to one thing that vegans do that is very slippery and insidious, which is they point to stuff that shows uh, something positive being connotated with uh, less meat. So, for example, people in the past ate less meat. Uh, or like hunter-gatherer ancestors, they ate mostly, maybe they might say this, 
you know, it's hard to actually know. It depends a lot on locality, something they won't talk about very much, uh, you know. Uh, but like, hey, here's some evidence that suggests hunter-gatherers eating lots of grains and seeds and plants and not that much meat, right? Uh, which, uh, it, as if it proves something about eating zero meat, that there is a big difference between zero and less. Uh, a, a, a big thrust of the vegan argument is centered around the fact that the modern Western diet is really bad. Uh, most people acknowledge this. The modern Western diet is is not very good for you. We have huge problems with obesity and so on, heart disease, right? The modern Western diet, not very good for you. Uh, and uh, hey, if most people ate more vegetables, you would probably be healthier. No one denies this. The, that is not the question. The question isn't, would we all be healthier if we ate more vegetables? That is an obvious truth. Anyone who says that isn't true is uh, trying to sell you something. Uh, you know, that Jordan Peterson on his all-meat diet or something like that, right? Like, everyone agrees that most people need to eat their veggies, okay? It's not something that's in debate. That's not what we're talking about. That's just literally some completely different point. Uh, the point is not, would you be healthier if you ate more vegetables? And maybe, in order to fit those vegetables into your diet, less meat. May yeah, sure, fine, whatever. That's cool, that's chill, you know? That's not the same as... Cut all animal products out of your diet right now or you're a bad person. That is simply two unrelated arguments. Uh, there is zero, and let me repeat this for all the vegans in the audience or anyone who might have listened to their propaganda. If they tell you that eating no meat is better for you than eating meat, they are just straight up lying. This is not supported by any science. There is no study that has ever been conducted that has conclusively shown this. It is made up. What studies show, and here, this is, I'm going to address the thing that I said was interesting. There are lots of studies that show vegans are healthier than the average population, okay? Which is, they, they love this, right? Wow, vegans are healthier than the average population. Isn't that amazing? Now think about this for a second. Why might that be? Well, it's quite simple. Sampling bias. People who are vegan are also more likely to be health conscious in their life. Obviously, you, how many vegans have you met that are like slobs and lay around and don't think, you know, it's pretty clear, like vegans are more likely to be health conscious. And because they're vegans and they have this limited diet, they're more likely to pay attention to the nutrients in what they eat because they have to, because veganism is a very limited diet. If you don't pay attention to what you eat, you're, well, firstly, you're not going to make the decision to become vegan unless you're paying attention to what you eat. And secondly, once you become vegan, you have to pay attention to make sure you're getting all of the correct macro and micronutrients, right? Even though you can't actually get all of your nutrients from veganism. But, uh, you know, so of course you would expect that vegans are more healthy than the mean. Because any group that is doing a particular limited diet and is more health conscious than the average person is going to be healthier than the mean. Uh, what vegans don't talk about are the, st the studies which actually talk about various different uh, diets and compare them to each other of similar populations uh, in which veganism does not perform very well at all. Uh, generally speaking, the Mediterranean diet does really well in those studies. Uh, which, again, to clarify, the Mediterranean diet is in large part vegetarian for, for a lot of it, right? It's, it's, it's a... They, they eat dairy, and they eat fish, and they eat eggs uh, sometimes, and they eat, you know, some, some meat, but a lot of the Mediterranean diet is plant-based. No one, uh, that's a completely different argument than you should cut all meat out of your diet. It's just simply not the same thing. So, you know, uh, none of the places in the world with the longest uh, lives or highest health standards are have high cases of veganism, there's simply no evidence to support their claim that veganism is somehow healthy, uh, healthier than just any other form of eating more vegetables and paying some attention to what sort of food you're consuming. Uh, okay, so that's the first, that, do you understand how these arguments are slippery, right? They have to, because you, you, if you think about it for two seconds, you come to this conclusion, right? Like you, you obviously will come to the conclusion that, well, yeah, obviously eating more vegetables is healthier. And you think about it for two more seconds and you realize that one doesn't follow the other, that veganism doesn't follow the other. Okay. 
uh, so let's talk about. Uh, okay, so that's that's the health claims. I, I guess I should talk about the uh, the the sort of uh, natural law type of normative argument, right? They're like, uh, oh, actually, uh, humans weren't designed to eat meat. Uh, no one was designed to do anything, first of all. But secondly, uh, no, humans 100% definitely did eat a lot of meat. Hist I guess I already talked about this. Uh, but yeah, people uh, in the hunter-gatherer past were basically opportunists. They ate whatever was near them and in large quantities, right? Like whatever was available, they, they ate it. Uh, vegans point to other primates not being carnivores. I mean, some primates are carnivores, but also, uh, you know, there's a pretty big distinction between uh, humans and other primates. In large part, scientists, uh, uh, you know, associate the fact that humans have these larger brains to the fact that we started cooking and eating meat. Uh, so that's, that's something to, to think about. Uh, okay, next up is so one of the more tricky ones, the environmental question. Is uh, meat consumption actually bad for the environment? This is, this is quite tricky and nuanced. Uh, I think that there is a reasonable argument that uh, you know, a large portion of greenhouse gases come from the agricultural sector. Uh, however, it's not what, it, what this argument isn't, is an argument against eating meat. I think it, it's, it's somewhat reasonable to say that uh, certain people should eat less meat. Uh, for their health and for environmental reasons. Uh, should this be determined by individual choice or should they be, you know, petitioning governments and corporations to uh, create more sustainable farming practices? You know, I'll, let me know which one seems like it's actually going to create change more to you, but I'm pretty sure I know which one I would choose. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's also the fundamental fact that a lot of the stuff they say about this is is also nonsense so you know one thing is this idea that oh uh, actually all, the, all of the land that you have all of that land uh, using it to graze animals is actually really inefficient man because animals are, are you get way fewer calories per acre with animals than you do with grains or, or plants um, uh, vegans don't understand the difference between arable and non-arable land, and I don't understand why they can't figure this out. You, you don't graze animals on land that you could be planting crops on. People know this. You can't plant crops on a lot of land. They won't grow. Only grass will grow. Grass is made of cellulose. We can't digest cellulose, but cows can, and then we can eat the cows and get the calories. Cows are machines which turn cellulose, which we can't digest, into proteins that we can digest. How is this difficult to understand? It is way more efficient to make use of uh, spaces where edible plants can't grow and only plants with lots of cellulose can grow than it is to just let those spaces do nothing. It's obviously more efficient to do that. What are you talking about? Uh, you know, did, I think vegans think that the people who invented animal agriculture were just fucking absolutely stupid. Uh, to the like, I don't understand. If if grazing animals on a plot of land is that much more inefficient than planting crops there, why would anyone ever have done it? Do you think ancient people didn't realize this? No, they grazed their animals in places where they couldn't plant fucking crops. You know where people like raise sheep and and goats and stuff is in places like very mountainous, rocky regions, regions where uh, you can't really do normal crop farming or very dry, arid regions and stuff like this. You know where people uh, like graze cattle? Normally in places with large, open, uh, you know, plains where the soil isn't, is, is good for, like, grass to grow, but not necessarily good for, like, crops to grow. Like, a lot of America is like this. A lot of Australia is like this. A lot of South America is like this. Uh, you know... It's, it's pretty fucking simple to think about when you just put two seconds of thought into it. If it's that much more inefficient to graze animals, it, in, to rear animals in some particular plot of land, why would anyone have ever done it? If people were like, under a constant pressure of food shortage, why would any early agricultural societies have ever done it? Unless there is actually a really good fucking reason to, which is you can't grow crops everywhere. And there's a second really good reason, which is that, uh, uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, 
animal poop is really good fertilizer. You graze your animals on one field one season and they poop everywhere and fertilize the ground and then you rotate the crops into that ground and the animals into the other field the next season and so on. You know, it's actually very efficient. I don't know what you want me to tell you. Uh, uh, secondly, the, the, the carbon effect of, of raising animals is literally a closed cycle. <laughs> when animals eat grass, they digest the food, release the carbon, that same amount of grass grows back and then sucks up the carbon that it released. What do you want me to tell you? It's not like when you're grazing animals, you're not fucking giving them food made of plastic, you're giving them food made of plants which absorb carbon dioxide. If you are saying, you know, like, oh, having these big open pastures for, for animals to graze in is really inefficient. We could grow a bunch of soy and then use that to build up a, a big city on. What do you think is fucking more environmentally friendly? Having vast fields of grass sucking carbon from the atmosphere or having a city there? Uh, I don't know. It seems pretty obvious to me. Uh, okay, but, you know, that's not to say that the agricultural industry doesn't produce large amounts of carbon emissions and, you know, is damaging to the environment. Uh, it, it is damaging to the environment, and uh, there needs to be a push towards more sustainable farming practices. I 100% agree with this, and not just in the animal agriculture business, but also in the food crop industry, and also cash crops. Like, generally, agriculture is wildly unsustainable right now you know if everyone went vegan uh you know all of that food that we would need to feed those people would be these vast fields of sort of monocrop agriculture which is one of the worst environmental disasters in history every everyone agrees that monocrop agriculture is an environmental disaster it's it's fucking terrible for the environment you physically can't feed enough i don't know what you want me to say i don't know man People need protein during the winter months, and places that, ha that, that have dairy uh, can, f can turn that dairy into cheese. Places that don't have that dairy won't be able to get that much protein and fat over the winter months. I mean, there's a bunch of reasons historically why people do ag animal agriculture. Uh, you know, we're very much pinning everything on this sort of fragile industrial system if you want to move away from that. But, you know, that's kind of up to you if you decide that the, how fragile the system is. Um, so, you know, when you go and buy your plant-based Beyond Meat burger, are you, like, checking the packaging to make sure all the palm oil in that burger was, like, harvested ethically and environmentally friendly, and all the, the soy in that burger and pea protein was all, everything was ethical and environmentally friendly? You're probably not doing that, but maybe you are. You know, maybe when you buy your plant product, you're going through and trying to be like, okay, I want to make sure that this was grown in some relatively environmentally ethical way okay how is that any fucking different from doing the same thing with meat by going to the store and trying to buy meat that was grown in ethical ways or going to the store and trying to buy milk that was you know on a farm where the cow was let out to graze and not just shoved in like some tiny box and where you know there were some sort of environmental uh <clears throat> you know fucking considerations taken how is it any different? People were just going to make choices if you... Uh, I don't understand. So the environmental factor is definitely their best argument, but as you can see, I have just poked a whole bunch of holes in it, so it's not as solid as they like to think. Um, and finally, I'll talk about the, the actual argument that vegans really want to be making, but don't because it's so weak, which is uh, the ethical argument eating meat is morally bad because you're killing animals and that's bad. Uh, well, there's definitely a lot to say about that. Um, you know, uh, most people's response to this would basically be they're just animals, you know, who cares? They don't have feelings, to which vegans can pull out all of their studies that show that actually uh, worms have can feel, are capable of feeling love or something like this, right? They, this, right? Where they, they, what they basically point to is, hey, look at this. See this fish? We, we put a, an electrical shock or, over here, or like a mouse or something, right? Like, we put an electrical shock over here, we put some food over there, and it turns out 
the fish went towards or the mouse went towards the food instead of the electrical shock and it, you know it didn't like it therefore animals have preferences which must be the same thing as consciousness so, which is nonsense but secondly you know i want to this is where i might get a little more into my personal opinions because we're talking about ethics here you know i don't think consciousness plays a massive part in much of this like i don't think humans are conscious most of their lives you know, most of the stuff you do, you do unconsciously. I think there was a study that showed that humans are only conscious for about 10 to 20% of the day. Right? Like, how often are you actually consciously aware of everything you're doing? You know, you're driving, you're doing it completely unconsciously. Maybe you're playing a video game. Are you actually thinking actively about, you know, how much of the game you think you're actively... You know what I'm saying? Like, a lot of the stuff you do on a daily basis, you do unconsciously. And in fact, you might think this is some sort of negative. In fact, our brains are way better at doing things unconsciously than they are at doing them consciously. Take a look at uh, the comparison between like how an amateur chess player like me might try and play chess versus how grandmasters play chess. Uh, grandmasters are so much better at chess than me specifically because they don't have to consciously think through every single move. They're capable of doing it. And when they do do it, they're also way better at that than me. But grandmasters just see patterns that they've also already seen before because they've played tens of thousands of games, they've studied thousands of games, they see these board patterns and they've basically just trained the unconscious part of their brain to understand these patterns to the point where they don't have to consciously think through every single board position and how it might affect uh, you know, outcomes in the future. Uh, instead, they've trained the unconscious aspects of their brain to uh, you know, memorize these sorts of patterns, do that thinking for them, uh, you know, while also using the conscious part of their brain as well. They're sort of like, essentially, yeah, I, I really hate computer metaphors for the brain, but they're essentially multi-threading the process. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, uh, oftentimes stuff that you have to do consciously, uh, you know, you, you might think like if you play an instrument, you ever playing an instrument and suddenly you become aware of like the feeling of your fingers moving and you become like super super aware of like everything you're doing and, and then you become dog shit right you you're only good at playing an instrument when you're doing it automatically you're not thinking about it consciously that's why musicians spend so long you know practicing something over and over and over again maybe like scales or finger positions or uh, arpeggios or particular songs they want to learn, you practice it over and over again to the point where it gets in like quote unquote muscle memory. But muscle memory is really just unconscious activity, right? To the point where you don't have to think about it anymore. Suddenly you're way better at things when you don't have to consciously think about it anymore. So, you know, to that point, I think that that points to a lot of like the exceptional aspects of humanity not really being as related to consciousness as, as we think. Uh, I think they're much more related to sociality than consciousness, which means, you know, in large part language. And language actually is a lot uh, a conscious process. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, okay, that was a bit of a tangent. But, uh, so, you know, I'm not super, In the point of that being, I'm not super invested in the debate over, like, how conscious are animals, uh, and that doesn't really play that much into my personal ethics, because I don't really think consciousness is as important as uh, a lot of other people do. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, fundamentally, it's it's a pointless debate, right? Because you can't, we, we can't even really, we really struggle to even define consciousness in humans, like we don't even really know what it is. Trying to argue that it exists in other species is, is pretty uh, impossible. You know, a lot of what they show is basically just that, hey, look, animals respond to stimuli. Uh, I mean, you know, there are, there are fucking viruses that respond to stimuli. Uh, there are bacteria that respond to stimuli. And yet, you know, you can't not kill viruses and bacteria just being alive. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I don't think most people really want to make any arguments against killing bacteria. Um... Also, I said killing viruses, but obviously viruses, are they really alive? Who knows? Um, so can they be killed? Not really. But um, you know what I'm saying. You, you can prove that lots of different things respond to stimuli. You can even create very obviously non-living things that respond to stimuli. I mean, you can, you can just point to, hey, look, when 
when uh, I don't know when when something gets hot, this rock melts. <laughs> it responds to stimuli. Or when uh, when uh, if you create a, a, a some sort of electronic system, right? Like uh, you have a a switch on one end and a light bulb on the other end. Hey, when this switch moves, the light bulb turns on. It must be conscious. Or uh, you know, or okay, let's say we're talking about like uh, having preferences against doing certain things. Okay, you create a robot that uh, uh, moves away from light or something. You have some sort of light sensor and it's on like a track and it moves away from wherever you shine light to it. Is that now conscious? Should we not, are we morally, do we have a moral responsibility to never disassemble that robot and to keep it alive, you know, plug it into the wall forever? I think obviously not, right? Like a lot of this stuff is just kind of talking in circles to avoid the real problem, which is that, frankly, no one really cares about killing it. Uh, animals as long as it's not like too fucked up right like that's that's pretty much most people's moral intuition is that like we don't really want to do like really fucked up shit to animals mostly because we like to personify and uh, anthropomorphize them and so we sort of empathize a little too strongly with animals right like we no no other species does this like just to clarify this is a weird human thing like no other species empathizes with other species really uh, at least not, not that I've seen, or, or at least not that we know of, like not to the level that we do. There's no other species that forms these sorts of complex relationships with animals and will like sacrifice their own life to save them or put themselves in danger to rescue a dog or something like this, right? Like no other species does this because it's obviously maladaptive. It's, it's like some weird uh, evolutionary misstep from, I'm assuming, the development of complex human societies. Uh, almost no other animal does this. I will say dogs do this, but almost no other animal does this, right? Uh, so, you know, the fact that we just have this, like, over, over-protective or, like, over-activated empathy response to other species isn't really uh, a, a solid basis for an argument. Uh, and also, you know, still the vast majority of people eat meat and have eaten meat. In fact, you go back a couple of hundred years and the vast majority of people will have killed an animal or will have at least witnessed someone kill an animal. I'd say the vast majority of people will have killed an animal, yeah, or will have been involved in some sense in the, the killing or the butchering of an animal. Um, you know, most people didn't care back then, and most people don't really care back uh, or right now. The only reason, you know, you, you even can, the only reason that vegans can even hold this position is because uh, we've sort of distanced ourselves so drastically from death, right? We've We've pushed all the death in our society into these little arenas so that we don't have to look at it. Like, people don't die at home anymore, surrounded by their family. They die in a clinical environment, in a hospital, in a hospice, away from the real, you know, the real world, because we don't want to witness death. And all the animals, they don't, uh, you don't slaughter them yourself, you don't slaughter your pig at the beginning of winter. It goes on in a slaughterhouse somewhere far away from you, and then we offload all of the pressure of, like, dealing with that death onto... Uh, some poor doctor or some poor slaughterhouse worker who has to like kill 50 cows a day and then vegans are like look people who work in slaughterhouses have terrible like PTSD or whatever I mean of course they fucking do we, we should have a more ethical system for doing this that is not an argument against eating meat that is an argument against the modern agriculture which is a perfectly reasonable thing to argue against that's another thing vegans love doing they love reframing arguments about like how insane like modern agro business and, and stuff is into arguments against meat eating specifically uh you know like oh slaughterhouses you know they abuse their workers and all of these places rely on like cheap migrant labor and i'm like yeah we should probably be as a society more involved with the production of our food and not just offload it on like uh you know the, the immigrants and people that we supposedly don't care about like yeah, that's a that's a that's a good point. Nothing to do with not eat, nothing to do with the moral Ill, illness of eating meat, the morally badness of eating meat. Anyway, <clears throat> so yeah, uh, more about ethics. Is it is it actually wrong to kill an animal and why? Uh, well, it's we're starting off with the assumption it's wrong to kill a human, right? That's the first thing that pretty much everyone agrees with there are some circumstances where it's okay to kill a human though like in self-defense most people agree with this right like uh it's generally wrong to murder people uh unless it's in self-defense or sometimes uh, some people will say like oh unless that person is like particularly morally bad some people think that's okay too 
like, uh, or maybe maybe if you're in a war, you know, there are certain caveats as to when it's okay to murder people, or at least like less bad. Like it might not be good to kill people in a war, but if you've been drafted and you don't have a choice, you know, or if the the war is like particularly just, it might be like maybe not great, but maybe like about acceptable. Uh, or like if it's in self defense, it's like well, you know, maybe you should have tried to do something else, but uh, uh, might be acceptable. Uh, or like if someone's particularly morally bad, you know, like was it okay to kill Hitler? Probably yeah, probably good to kill Hitler. Oh, well, Hitler killed himself, but like it was good to try. <laughs> right um or uh, um you know uh a lot of communists would say we should just like kill all the capitalists or the landlords you know like that's okay or uh, you know there's there's a ton of places where people make exceptions as to when it's okay to kill humans but like uh and th- wait this this goes back to my my bataille thing that I was talking about earlier where it's actually the fact that it's not that it's like bad to kill humans except for these situations. It's really that like uh, it's bad to kill humans in the arena that isn't these situations. It's not that like killing people is bad. It's just that like there are certain arenas where it's acceptable and certain arenas where it's unacceptable. You know, there was definitely many societies where uh, human sacrifice existed and it was okay to kill humans in that arena as well. Uh, there have been societies where it's been okay to kill criminals or uh, you know, hang them. There have been societies where, you know, it's okay to kill lots of different people for lots of different reasons. Uh, to in order to prove to me that like it's bad to kill animals, I think you would have to first of all establish like some greater moral underpinning, right? So like, what what morality, what moral uh, system are you using under which it's bad to kill like why is it bad to kill animals because you value what because uh, like as far as I know you know there's there's very few major religions that ask people to be vegan I think some ask people to be vegetarian I'm not sure uh, you know there are some relig- religious dietary restrictions like the pork taboo but uh, I, I'm not aware of any major religions that require that all of their followers be vegan um, maybe you can enlighten me in the comments. But so you're you're probably not religious. Maybe you are religious, and that's you know, its own thing. Obviously, you can't prove the existence of your god as much as I can't disprove it. So you, at, at that point, we're going to have to just agree to disagree. But what other ethical frameworks might you meta ethics? What's your meta ethics, vegan, hypothetical vegan? I'm curious. What's your meta ethics? Oh, you're. Uh, Let's see, and none of them have an answer to this because they don't really think about it. Uh, but let's say they do, and they're like, oh, I am a utilitarian. Well, utilitarianism is one of the most whole-poked meta-ethical systems in existence, so you know, I could just point them towards any number of debunkings of utilitarianism where it seems to be kind of bad. Uh, they'd also have to explain why like, utilitarian principles apply to animals, where they draw the line on that, like does it apply to bacteria or plants, for example? They they love to eat plants, right? But plants also respond to stimuli and have preferences. So, or mushrooms even, big big deal with mushrooms. They definitely have a higher intelligence than plants. Uh, but I digress. Uh, so you know maybe they're a, a utilitarian, in which case they're kind of fucked. Uh, or maybe there are some sort of like Kantian, you know, categorical imperative. You should treat others uh, not as an end, but as a means within themselves. Uh, I, d- I don't believe that Kant ever said that should apply to animals. But uh, once again, you know, why don't you extend that to plants? Why don't you extend... Oh, that's another thing vegans like to say. So a lot of like anti-vegans who are retarded Redditors, they'll say stuff like, uh, oh, uh, plants feel pain too. How can you kill all those innocent cabbages? Right, which is just like a retarded Reddit anti-vegan argument. And then vegans will say, aha, you have fallen into my trap. We actually grow a whole bunch of food specifically to feed uh, animals. So if you really wanted to minimize the amount of plants that were dying, you'd be vegan too. And I'm like, well, hey, maybe it's a reasonable critique to say we should graze animals on fucking grass instead of growing a bunch of corn to feed them. Maybe that's a reasonable critique of the way that the agricultural system is set up. However, absolutely nothing to do with being a fucking vegan. (sighs) 
yeah, I don't know. Uh, they they're gonna have to just create a metaphor. I mean, okay, most people in the world are some sort of moral relativist or moral nihilist, moral non cognitivist, something like that, right? Like they don't. Most people in the world right now don't have some sort of really strict mor morality, ethical system that they adhere to. That there isn't one that is like widely agreed upon with society, and so. Uh, and the ones that people do agree with are like the the most popular ones are generally the sort of more relativistic or nihilistic ones, uh, or at least pessimistic ones, right? Like the, they might say something like, uh, "Well, there is morality, but we don't necessarily know exactly how it works," or something like this, right? Like there's, generally speaking, most people aren't like hardcore, uh, <clears throat> you know there is this one particular ethical system that is 100% true in all circumstances and uh, that is the case, right? And I can detail and outline exactly why that is and exactly, you know, like most people don't believe this. So, you know, once you get down into the nitty gritty of ethical arguments, you're going to have a really time convincing uh, me, or most people I think, but me, into, into like agreeing with your meta-ethics because you probably don't really have one, because most people don't really have one. You know, like once you get really down into the nitty gritty, if you just do the annoying thing where you just keep asking a why, eventually they're just going to fall apart because that's the problem with these sorts of prescriptive normative ethics, right? Uh, like if you, if you say it's bad to kill animals, why? Because killing animals makes them suffer. Okay, why is it bad for animals to suffer? Uh, because suffering is bad, but why Why is suffering bad? Uh, it just is, okay? That's basically how it's going to go every time. So, you know, I've just debunked veganism for the nth time. <sighs> they keep making me do this. It's fun. It's fun to do this. Uh, debate me. Listen, vegans, if you if you listened to me rant just then, and you were like, oh, this fucking idiot, he doesn't know what he's talking about, I would own him in a debate. Hit me up in the comment section. I will debate you on stream for free. Any fucking day of the week. Come at me. There's something that gets brought up on the internet. It seems like, you know, once every few months or so, someone remembers that this idea goes, is like, exists and everyone clowns on it for a while. Uh, you, you might have heard about it. You might not have. You know, I, I feel like it's... I say everyone. It's, it sort of happens in niche circles. You probably sort of pass it by. This idea that, like, oh, ancient people actually weren't really conscious. The ancient Greeks, they weren't really conscious. And then people clown on it. They're like, ah, the first line in the, the Odyssey or whatever is like, this guy was angry. You're telling me they weren't conscious or they didn't have a sense of self or identity or something like this, right? And, you know, I think very few people have actually... Maybe I'm the only one that sees this, but yeah, I've I've seen this concept be brought up and then clowned on. Like at least a, 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 a lot of times it happens like once every few months or like once a year or something, a couple times a year, I know. Right, and so I don't think people know the origin of this idea, you know? Like oftentimes if you hear, if you hear something like this, you should probably take it with a grain of salt. Like, if someone's summarizing some idea like this in so few words that sounds radical and insane, you know, unless it's something actually insane, like ancient aliens or whatever, you should probably think, like, I wonder if that's what the act that's actually what the person thinks, or if this is just, like, some oversimplification of or something, right? I don't know, it's hard to know, because... It's 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 hard to tell who's just insane and who's like got real ideas. But this this idea that the ancient people uh, weren't consciousness comes from a book, and it's a book called, I believe the book is called something like The Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. Uh, I think that's what the book's called. Something along those lines, and the idea in the book is that consciousness, as we experience it right now, isn't some innate property of being a human, 
but is rather something that we learn in childhood, something that we learn to do as an adaption or adaptation to our modern environment, which is sort of spread by language. It's a, it's a learned behavior uh, spread by language. And the author of this book, who I forget the name of, has a very specific uh, idea of like what is consciousness, and it's, it's very specifically introspection. Uh, which I guess, you know, kind of lines up with, like, Douglas Hofstadter's strange loop kind of recursion, self-reference thing. Like, clearly self-reference, recursion, introspection is some sort of very key element to what consciousness is. Uh, and so this guy who wrote this book, he's, like, this idea of, like, regular introspection where we sort of justify our thoughts and we think about our thoughts and do metacognition and all of this sort of thing are learned behaviors that we gain in childhood and they have not, it has not always been this way. It's a cultural adaptation. And that in the past, there were societies which did not do this. And um, the reason they did not do this, or the, the, the way that this works, is that your, uh, your mind is actually two minds. So you have a left and right hemisphere, which talk to each other. Um, but... Uh, in there are certain people who undergo certain procedures due to like medical problems or whatever called a split brain people where the connection between the two hemispheres of their brain is separated you might have heard about this it's quite a popular like pop sci thing to talk about uh you know i i definitely heard about this before i read a, read this book or read about this book i haven't actually read the book myself um the split brain people have a, a very particular experience because surprisingly, you know, they can continue to function, uh, but they, there's very particular stuff that happens with them because there are situations where it's like one half of the brain is responsible for language, whereas the other half of the brain might be responsible for like doing certain things. So, for example, a split brain person might, uh, you know, you might. Uh, they, they they might do something uh, and then they'll come up with an explanation for it afterwards. I was like, oh, why did you do that? Oh, well, because, you know, I wanted to do it or, do, you know, whatever. But in reality, they actually have no control over what that half of their brain is doing. They're just rationalizing it afterwards. And the idea is that people in the past didn't have highly interconnected uh, brain hemispheres like we do now that ancient people uh, basically just functioned uh, you know in large part on like instinct and hormones and sort of like did what they felt like doing without much direction and then uh, you know that's their sort of conscious or not conscious brain but that's their I, I forget which half which half it is I think it's the their right brain or something but uh, maybe that's the left. Frankly, I don't remember. But like, their one half of their brain control, you know, that's just sort of uh, compels them to, or not even compels them, but just they do stuff without even really, without thinking or in introspection. But then occasionally, the part of the brain that does introspection, which is the other half of the brain, right, the part of the brain that does that sort of thing, language and stuff like that, would basically come out of nowhere and be like, you must do this, you must do that. It would sort of command them and that they would perceive this as uh, being talked to by the gods. They would, they would perceive this as like a, they were a hallucination of like uh, uh, the voice of their gods. And I know it's a, it's a pretty insane theory. It's a pretty wacky theory. I'm not going to go through all the evidence here, okay, it's a whole book full of reasoning as to why this may be the case, I, if, you, if you're interested you should just pick up the book, if it sounds interesting, uh, I will say there is a surprising amount of evidence to confirm this, like there is, you would, it sounds like an insane crackpot theory, and it is one, but it is one for which there is a shockingly large amount of evidence. Like, a lot of coincidental stuff in multiple fields 
converging on this particular idea about the bichemical mind. And, uh, you know, so what this guy says, in particular relating to the Greeks, he thinks the Greeks were basically sort of the end point of uh, the, the, this time period where people started to become conscious. That in the gap between when the Iliad was written and when the Odyssey were written, people became conscious people. And it wasn't a smooth or instantaneous transition. It was a slow and painful transition during which people were aware of what was happening and didn't like it and frequently talked about it. Like, they literally said, I can't hear the gods anymore. And there were, they, you can hear them talking about this. And they were freaking out about it. Uh, like, this is fucking, it's crazy that this exists. Uh, uh, so, you know, do I actually agree with this idea? Uh, personally, I think there's, I, I, I don't, I don't know, obviously. I, I'm not 100% certain on either side. I'm a little skeptical of it. I think it probably gets at something that is true. Uh, I don't know if the exact way that the, this guy lays it out is true. In particular because, you know, he does pick a lot of historical... Uh, you know, stories and fiction and stuff which seem to have a shocking lack of introspection once you actually start to dig down into it. Like, no one ever mentions anything like this or, like, examples where it is mentioned, the language, you know, a lot of it is interpreted by modern translators to be introspective emotion, but if you actually look at the meanings of the words in their original language, they refer more to physical states or, like, uh, you know what I mean? Like, for example, uh, a, a word in ancient Greek in the 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 Odyssey, or so like the, you know the Iliad, which is translated as psyche. Well, if the Greeks had a word for psyche, uh, it's literally the word that evolved into the word psyche. Then, you know, if the Greeks had a word for psyche, they must have been aware that they had a psyche, that they had a, a mind. They must have done introspection. But if you actually look at how that word is used. It's used to mean, like, a physical thing. Like, there's literally uh, a time in the Odyssey where they say a guy was on the battlefield lying dead and his psyche was leaking out of him uh, onto, the, onto the, the, the field, right? And it's like, well, that's not really... That seems to describe a physical organ more so than a, you know, concept of what we think of as, as the psyche. So a lot of this stuff has just been reinterpreted. There's a lot of arguments like this. However, I think that there is a pretty strong counterexample, uh, which doesn't get, which is, a, like, shockingly missing from the book, which is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, there's plenty of introspection and talk about emotions uh, and self-reflection in, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is way older than any of this stuff. And the fact that that, have, that exists seems to kind of counteract a lot of this guy's book. Uh, so, you know, I again, I'm sure that some of the stuff in, the, in Gilgamesh can be explained by translation or the fact that the copies we have are like maybe more recent reproductions and maybe the original was different. But it seems like, you know, it, there is at least one. This the Gilgamesh presents some pretty decent counter evidence to this guy's argument. But, the point being, this isn't like a batshit insane theory with no backing that some guy on the internet made up. This is like a respected neuroscientist or whatever he is. I, I don't actually know where he is. Maybe he's a historian or something. I, I don't really know anything about the author. But I know he's like some sort of respected academic who wrote a book which has been like highly cited and influential. You know, like this isn't in, in academic spheres. This isn't some, like, rando on the internet making a forum post about how, like, what if the ancient Greeks didn't have consciousness? There's, like, a real theory that gets, like, actually discussed in various circles. Uh, and it's much more specific than just, like, uh, the Greeks did, weren't conscious. It's, like, this whole thing about the, the, the bicameral mind and how its breakdown of changed society uh, and what that what it might imply about the self and the nature of thought and all of these interesting things. It just gets dismissed as this wacky crackpot theory that doesn't mean anything. 
So you should keep that that in mind. Next time you're on the internet and you hear something that sounds insane, as if like, well, there's this theory. What that can mean anything. That can mean like, there's a well-respected theory by a, a, a expert in their field, which has you know been scrutinized by many of their peers and is widely accepted these days with plenty of evidence to back it up. Or it could mean some guy on a, on Facebook one day said this thing and I thought it was interesting. Like, th- there's a there's this theory is a very undescriptive... Uh, it, 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 it's not a very descriptive term, so you should be careful when you see stuff like this on the internet. We're getting towards the end of this 12-hour podcast. I hope you've enjoyed your stay so far. Um... You know, today I had what I think was maybe officially my first ever bona fide pub stomp. Where I had 20 points ahead of the next guy on the scoreboard. I was just invincible. I was hitting pipes like nobody's business. It was crazy. It was a match on Badwater, Uncle Topia. Um, now, it wasn't just me. Right, like, uh, so the other team was just kind of bad. They were getting rolled. It wasn't like I was completely carrying my team to, and I was just destroyed. Like, but I definitely was somewhat carrying my team and kind of destroying. And I'm playing sticky jumper demo. It's not like I'm stock demo rolling. You know, sticky jumper caber demo with the iron bomber, just hitting my pipes like crazy. Uh, yeah, it's like, you know, the, I don't know, I don't know what else to say. The mobility, I was getting in, hitting some pipes, take out one or two enemies, and then sticky jump back out of there, reload, get my health back up, sticky jump back in. It's like the optimal play style that I like to do, and it was just working every time. I don't know, the enemy team were just bad partially, but yeah, we were fucking rolling them, and I... I was stomping. I think it might be my first bona fide pub stomp. Of course, pub stomping and how well you do is definitely going to have something to do with luck, you know, how bad the other team is. And actually, speaking of that, you know, I feel a lot better about myself now because I found this video. I found this video of Banny. If you don't know who Banny is, he's he's often considered to be the best TF2 player in the world. Uh <clears throat> I found a video of Banny uh, doing MGE demo versus scout playing as demo with the Iron Bomber and the Stock Sticky Launcher. And he can't hit his Iron Bomber shots on a scout. Now, to be fair, you know, this scout is probably way better. Whoever's versing Banny is probably, I don't even know who the fuck it is. Ross, uh, someone called Ross, I guess. I don't know who that is. Maybe a pro I haven't heard of. Uh, but like, this scout is probably way better than the scouts I'm facing in right, random p- pubs. But, you know, it. Th- that being said, it's not just me. I'm happy to learn that I'm not just absolutely dog shit at landing pipes. It is just really fucking hard. That b- if even Banny can't do it, it uh, versus a scout. I'm, I'm glad it's not just me. Good scouts it just are too. It's just impossible. It's just a, uh, a really really difficult matchup. So I'm not just fucking trash. I'm actually. Just slightly trash, so that's nice. I've been reading, um. A visual novel called Shuffle, Shuffle, if you want to be a weeb about it. Have you guys noticed there's been a lot of, um, maybe I'm just, maybe this is just in my imagination, but it feels to me like, like there's a lot more, fuck off, there's a lot more, uh, pushback on otaku these days. And what I think it is, in my opinion, is that like a lot of people, um, a lot of people like anime these days, right? Anime's become much more popular in the west over the past few years and especially during the pandemic i think it was almost certainly more people got into anime so 
you know, anime has sort of blown up a bit in the West, or at least uh, has been steadily gaining popularity for years. And a lot of people, you know, these the sort of people who are watching anime, the sort of people who are watching, you know, like Demon Slayer and, uh, you know, the sorts of popular, just the, the popular shonens and stuff like that that you're going to see every year or every, you know, the, you know what I'm talking about, right? And I think that these people uh, like that sort of stuff and they really want to separate themselves. Like, they, they, they feel kind of guilty, right? Because they see this sort of stereotype of the, the otaku who's into, like, the cute girl stuff, like me, uh, as this, like, you know, exactly what I am, some, a neat who doesn't leave his room and lives in a house full of fucking trash and, you know, uh, is, like, socially inept and autistic, like I am, and they really want to distance themselves from us, right, like, they don't, they, they're like, well, yeah, I'm into anime, but I'm not, like, like, those people, you know, and fair enough, you know, they're not, like, they're not, um, you know, but I think that's really what it is, is I think that the, a lot of this, this anime pushback against Moe enjoyers, I don't know if you've noticed it, maybe it's just me that, that happens to see this stuff, but there's a lot of pushback against, like, and it's not even really the, the, the Moe shows in particular, because they're too obscure to even know about it, right? Like, I mean, the only one that's been popular recently is Bocce the Rock, and frankly, I haven't seen any pushback on Bocce the Rock. Uh, but, you know, the ones they, they sort of push back on are the, the, the mid-tier popularity, you know, the less hardcore, more mainstream ones. Which, to be fair, you know, the people who really obsess over those shows, I'm talking about, like, Nagatoro. You know, the stuff that's, like, it's a, it's a little more uh, otaku-focused than, uh, you know, your your mainstream shonens. So, like, those are, like, targeted at a broad audience. Then you have the, like, slightly more otaku-focused, normally targeted at, like, high school boys. Uh, kind of, kind of demographics, uh, like, like Nagatoro, like Komi-san, uh, just in recent memory, you know, these sorts of things, and also, you know, uh, a lot of isekai as well, and then, you know, you go beyond that, and you get into the, the truly otaku-oriented anime, your slice of life, uh, and your, your more hardcore stuff like that, I mean, it doesn't just have to be slice of life, uh, your hardcore mecha anime, your hardcore fantasy anime, uh, you know, the stuff that's targeted towards the, 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 you know, the otaku, like, that's the sort of stuff that doesn't really breach into the public consciousness, like, I don't think people really know about, like, Slow Loop, to name a recent one, you know, like, I, I don't think that most people who aren't in the space are even aware of those shows to make fun of them, uh, but you do see a lot of sort of like teenagers and annoying people on Reddit posting about the shows similar to Komi-san uh, or, or Nagatoro. You know, by the way, I, I want to point out, you know, I've I have read uh, the Komi-san and Nagatoro mangas, at least for a while. I, I dropped both of them because, in my opinion, they both kind of fell off. Uh, but like, I have nothing super against either of those properties, you know, I'm not, I, if I had to choose, I would say Kami-san is better, uh, they're obviously, I don't know why I'm even comparing them, they're, they're kind of different, uh, but I'm just picking them as examples, you know, I, I like, uh, the original Nagatoro Dojin a lot more than the, uh, the anime, or the, the, the manga that got continued from it, uh, if you know, you know, <coughs> But, uh, yeah, my point is I think that there's this, there's a bit, there's a lot of pushback because I think there's a lot of people who have gotten into anime, into the more mainstream side of anime, and they really want to separate themselves. Like, they feel kind of guilty and they really want to make sure that they maintain a strong distance because they see these shows and most popular shonen do have one or two bishoujo type characters, or at least, you know, something approximating that, and they find these characters appealing because they're good, you know, or that, you know that normal people who would find Bishojo characters compelling, and they kind of feel guilty about it, and they want to be like, well, look, you know, I like uh, Bulma from Dragon Ball Z or whatever, but I'm not, I'm not a freak, right? 
And so they're trying to counter signal. That's what I think is happening. And obviously there's, there's just ma- many more of them. But it's not like people like me aren't doing the same thing in reverse. It's not like we don't make fun of, you know, the, the Norman anime fans. So uh, I don't think there's anything particularly unnatural or strange about it. But it is it is just on a much larger scale than I think it's been before. Uh, because anime is much more popular than now and in the public consciousness. Uh and uh, yeah, it, it's right now it's kind of mostly joking, uh, mostly kind of lighthearted. But I've noticed it getting a little more abrasive recently. Uh, you know, there's, there's definitely a, a little more uh, people who will like uh, the the memes have have shifted very subtly in tone towards a bit more of an aggressive stance against the more otaku demographics. Um, you know, a lot of the typical jokes about calling them incels or pedophiles or whatever, just for liking Hidamari sketch, but they don't know what Hidamari sketch is, but you know what I'm saying, right? The typical insults, uh, but yeah, I, I like with, with a little more aggression now, and that might just be because of the natural sort of meme inflation where people are incentivized to make things that are more inflammatory as time goes on. Uh, or it might be because of a, a shift in the attitudes of people. Anyway, I just something I wanted to just something I've noticed. You know what doesn't make any sense to me? And call me crazy, call me crazy for this one. But I I don't really understand why people have uh, people vote against their best interests um, for like moralistic reasons as if those moralistic reasons are actually going to bear fruit so an example of this is there are a lot of americans when i say vote i don't necessarily mean vote i, I was just sort of thinking about that uh actually you know what since i said vote i'll give a great example brexit right brexit okay my personal opinion on the eu is that the eu is this neoliberal super state with like a bunch of unelected officials who have uh uh, a reasonably large amount of power over uh, the the sovereignty of its constituent nations, right? And that is, in some sense, problematic, right? That there are these unelected officials who really are beholden to no one. Um, they're supposed to act as a check and balance over each individual country's government, but they themselves don't have these checks and balances or anyone overseeing them, such is the case when you try and put a higher power over the higher power. That's how these things work. Um, so, you know, and they have some questionable economic policy in certain aspects. I think that the Shenzhen Agreement is one of the best things in, literally the best things in the world that any, exists in the world. It's, it's amazing. Um, you know, the free trade agreements are great, but in terms of, from a, like, broad philosophical moral standpoint, you know, I can sit here and say, you know what, I have some problems with the EU. I think that, uh, this sort of centralization of power is probably you know, questionable. But I would never in a million years vote for Brexit. If there was a second referendum today, I would be voting to rejoin the EU in a split second. Because I don't, you know, end of the day, doesn't fucking matter if I have some, you know, abstract philosophical qualms with the way that the system is run. It's give It gives my country, the place that I live, a, like, distinct economic advantage to be in this group. It is literally good for me. Food prices will go down. You know, anything imported from the, from Europe will be less expensive. This makes my life better. Uh, so, you know, I, I set those things aside in, in favor of practical reality. And I don't understand why a lot of people don't have this opinion. You know, there are a lot of Americans who fucking hate America. And for good reason. America has done some terrible fucked up shit and continues to do some terrible fucked up shit. However, you know... When it comes to stuff like foreign policy, not that who you support really matters because, you know, you don't really get a say in that, but it doesn't make any sense to me to, like, shout about how you, you, you know, oh, I, I want an end to unipolarity, I want, like, uh, you know, a rising power in the East to, to challenge the US's dominance and I support BRICS economies and so on. It's like, you realise... If, if the dollar loses power, you lose power. Individ- as a person, your life will get worse. Like, a rising, you know, alternative to US hegemony 
might be good in, uh, you know, some sort of long run abstract moral thing where you you're looking to challenge, uh, the the default state of capitalism. Like sure. But, in your actual life, I don't I don't see how this improves anything. Uh, you know, there's there's maybe some possible argument to be made about like competition, where it's like if there was some great power that could challenge the U.S., it would force the U.S. to uh, improve the quality of life of its citizens in order to compete. You know, perhaps uh, to to. Uh, prevent brain drain and these sorts of things. The problem being that that competition will be in favor of people who aren't you, because the U.S. doesn't really give a fuck what happens to you in that situation. It's trying to keep the corporations, it's trying to keep the billionaires, the people with actual power and influence. Those are going to be so. In that situation, you're going to be seeing more laissez-faire capitalism, more ta- tax cuts to the rich, and so on corporation tax cuts and etc you're not going to be seeing your life improve in that situation because you're not the people that the that uh matter in that circumstance right the only thing you can hope for is that you know you can do all your standard stuff like unionize and make sure that you as a working class people have some sort of bargaining power uh which is you know how much that actually works these days is questionable but you can you can do all of that usual stuff but you can't sit here and talk about how you want the U.S. empire to fail. You know that living in a dying empire sucks, right? <laughs> you know that if you if you're living in the place that's collapsing, it's not going to go well for you. Like I don't understand this. It does. I don't. I don't understand people's logic when they say stuff like this. Okay, so I have a bit of a problem, and um, <clears throat> that problem, uh, you know, it's something that has made me empathize a lot more with Americans. Uh, like, I understand now why Americans are all fucking fat. It's because of Mexican food. My whole life living in London, an ocean away from Mexico, there's been lots of great cuisines of the world here, right? London is a hub of restaurants in the world. But on the subject of Mexican food, we've never had it because there's just not uh, that much Mexican immigration to the UK. Until recently, when a few things have happened, there's been a wave of like Mexican restaurants opening up, uh, I think as part of just a general ongoing Americanization of the UK. Like a lot more American chains are coming here, and a lot more American culture is coming here, and this, you know, induced demand for Mexican food has appeared. I believe the demand was always there because Mexican food is way too good. So specifically regarding me, two things have happened. Uh, And that is, firstly, in this wave of American chains opening up in the UK, uh, we got Taco Bell here. We got Taco Bell here. Okay, now that fucked me up. And then, stacking on top of that, nearby me, a really, really fucking good independent, like, local Mexican place opened up that does delivery. And this place... I won't mention it by name so as not to dox myself, but it is by far the best Mexican food I've ever had. It is fucking incredibly delicious. And, you know, when uh, I first started living alone after my mom died, it took me a while to adjust to the situation, my new responsibilities and so on. And during that period, I was was ordering too much takeout, too much Uber Eats delivery type stuff, right? I was, I was doing it way too often. I was wasting a bunch of money on that shit. But after about, you know, a month, I was kind of in the first month of living alone. After about a month, once, the, you know, I'd sort of figured out a little bit more how to manage my money and, and organize myself, I cut down significantly. I try to keep takeout to once a week. Um, and I'm generally pretty successful at this. I'm generally reasonably good at keeping takeout for once a week. But that doesn't mean I'm still not spending too much money on this stuff. Mexican food ruined me. I got it under control. Then all these Mexican places opened up. You know, the the Taco Bell and this local place opened up. So it's like on the one hand, I've got the cheap fast food Mexican stuff. And on the other hand, I've got the higher end delicious ass Mexican stuff. 
and I honestly I didn't realize how much money I was spending on these places, right? But I realized I went through my I was going through my bank statement just now, and I realized that this high end Mexican place that I go that I get food from, as delicious as it is, you know, I get a meal and you know, I get a big meal. So I'm getting normally this is like it counts as like two of my meals for the day, right? I'm getting roughly. I'm getting uh tacos, which honestly are absolutely fucking delicious, but they only give you three tacos, and they're not that big, right? And then a burrito, which is like the heart of the meal. And that is too much food to eat in one sitting, but it isn't, <laughs> right? I do it, but then I'm full, you know, I have maybe breakfast in the morning, and then I have that, and that's all my food for the day. Maybe I have a, like a small snack, if anything, in the afternoon, but almost nothing, right? But, so it's a lot of food, but you have to pay, like that's sort of a lot, of, it's a lot of money. And I realized I was spending, you know, I didn't realize how much I was spending on this because these like delivery apps, they have a bunch of hidden costs. Like it says how much it costs on the menu, but when you actually go to checkout, they add like a service charge, a delivery charge, you know, uh, all of these extra fucking charges that you don't even notice are there. And it's like my eyes see them and I'm like, oh, that's extra money, but I don't really register it because they're sort of, I don't know, the dark patterns of the website or whatever. Whatever was happening, I wasn't really paying attention to it. So I, I didn't realize how much money I was spending at these places. And so, you know, just now, I went to the shops and specifically, this, is, this shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. It's, it's, it shouldn't come as a surprise to me intellectually, right? I, I know this intellectually that I'm spending way too much fucking money at, on takeout, like if I even get it once. But, you know, I spent about 20 quid at the shops just now. So 10 pounds less than this one and a half meals of Mexican food, right? Let's call it one and a half to even out, right? Uh, <clears throat> and I spent, you know, about 20 quid and I bought five meals <laughs> worth of food. So, you know, it's, if I assume I spend another 10 quid, I could probably have bought two more meals. So like seven meals for the same amount of money as this one and a half meal from a Mexican place. It's actually insane how much cheaper it is to just go to the shop and Here's the crazy thing is I'm not even buying cheap food. Like I didn't even, I wasn't at the shop trying like thinking to myself, I will purposely try and get deals and buy cheap things. No, no, no. I went to the shop and just bought whatever I wanted. You know, I didn't even, I wasn't even paying attention to the price really. I just bought whatever food I, I was in the mood for, which was actually Mexican food. So I just bought some ingredients for Mexican food and some other meals for the rest of the, uh, you know, the weeks and, and, and so on next few days I just bought ingredients basically and you know I'm literally spending maybe seven times less or six times less than I would be on one delivery like I know in my head how much I'm spending on this stuff but I, it like this I feel like I'm trying to get it ingrained in myself like if I'm actually ordering this stuff I need to know when I click that button this is seven meals worth of money that you're spending right now. You know, this is six, seven meals worth of money that you're spending right now. Is this meal actually worth that much? Is, you know, and honestly, I'm much better at it now because I have this Huel uh, Hot and Savory, which fills a similar niche to, the, uh, to, to what delivery does, right? Like, I, it's very quick food. Uh, that is, but in, except in the case of Huel, it is, you know, it's ostensibly healthy which is also a big plus, and way faster than waiting for delivery. You know, uh, shut up. Fucking notifications. But yeah, it's way faster, and it's healthier, and it tastes fine. It doesn't taste as good as delivery. That's the main negative. It's just, it tastes kind of bad. It tastes kind of mid. But actually, the main thing that I order delivery for is stuff that I can't make at home. Right? I'm never going to order pasta for delivery. And frankly, I very, very rarely order pizza for delivery because, you know, there you can buy frozen pizzas and they're, they're fine. <laughs> you know, if I really want pizza, I'm more likely to go to the shop and buy a, a pre-made pizza and just put it in the oven than, uh, you know, order it from some chain place. So really, the foods that I'm buying are stuff that is like too impractical to make at home, which is normally something deep fried, right? Because deep frying at home is a fucking disaster. Uh, or something 
it, which is hard, relatively hard to find the ingredients for, or relatively labor intensive, like Japanese and Mexican food. Like I can't really, I'm not going to go out of my way to find really nice fish to make sushi myself, right? I don't think most people would do that. If I if I'm really in the mood for sushi, which I very rarely am, uh, because it's like a treat, it's expensive, you have to order it. That's fine. I don't. I get sushi like maybe a, three or four times a year. Right, like that's fine. It's not a problem. The Mexican thing is a problem though, because Mexican food is very doable at home. I'm not very good at it. It's hard to find. Like while there's been an increase in Mexican restaurants here, there has not been any increase in the availability of Mexican ingredients. You know, this stuff is generally quite expensive. And what I'm going to make right now, you know, I'm not even going to disclose what I'm making because it is going to be the most shitty, fucking anglicized Mexican food in the world. It is going to suck. I think it's going to taste good, but I'm not going to disclose what I'm making because it is the opposite of authentic. And people in the comments will be like, British food, British food, British food, la 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 la. Because uh, that's like the funniest joke in the world to a lot of people. I don't really understand it. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I'm going to make some vague attempt at Mexican food, a gesture, a vague gesture in the direction of, uh, Mexico. <laughs> um, and, uh, it's going to be fine. Everyone's going to be happy. You know, Luke Smith, uh, the meme guy, the meme computer guy, who's now like a, doesn't make videos about Linux anymore. His new year's resolution for this year was to stop going to restaurants and, I don't think I'm going to stop going to restaurants or ordering takeout full stop. But, you know, frankly, with all the evidence laid out in front of me, I I have very little reason to do so. I mean, I'll go to a restaurant if I'm out with it with someone, right? Like if I'm, you know, last time I went to a restaurant, I was out with Young Sai. We went, we went for to this like nice Chinese restaurant and spent way too much money because the menu literally lied about how much the food cost, which I don't know how they can get away with that. Like, we chose an item on the menu and we were like, that that looks cheap for how much food you're getting. And then they came to the bill and it was literally double what the menu said it would cost. So I don't know how they get away with that. But uh, anyway, it was delicious Chinese food and they didn't skimp on the portion size, right? Like they gave you, I couldn't even finish it. It was a lot of fucking food. Uh, and I was hungry. So, you know, I, I can't really complain that much. Uh, I mean, I can complain that they lied on the menu, but whatever. Uh, you know, that's not something I'm doing all the fucking time, is going out with friends and eating at fancy restaurants. Not something I'm doing very often. It's like a very rare thing. So it's really the, this, these delivery apps that are ruining me. I, I say ruining me. Again, I want to clarify. I'm keeping this to like once a week, but and it's not like it's a massive extra expenditure on my budget. It's just unnecessary uh you know i feel like i i I, there's just no reason for me to be doing this (laughs) but then on the other hand you know i i personally think and i know a lot of there's definitely variance between individuals but as a species you know human beings just like every other animal our main two concerns that we've been evolved to pursue is uh, food and sex, right, and uh, uh, evading, avoiding predators. Those are our main biological concerns. And avoiding predators is situational, sex is situational, but food is a thing you have to be thinking about every day if you're uh, an animal, right? And so I, you know, I think the reason that there's so much food content on TV and on YouTube and we have all of these cultures around food with such complex things is because we're just biologically evolved to think about food all day. I know not everyone does. Uh, I, I know that there's a lot of variance in people's psychology, but I think in general, if you're really going to generalize as a species, people think about food a lot. And I am definitely one of those people. We no longer have to th- worry about the scarcity of food. So instead, we worry about the quality of food, the flavor, the experience. right? But we still, I think, are sort of bound by this animal part of our brain that's telling us to eat, like think about food all the time. I, I, obviously, all the time is an exaggeration, but often, right? Because it was, an, it was a strong evolutionary pressure, I, you know throughout all of our history, and it continues to be in some parts of the world. Uh, <clears throat> it was only very recently that we've gone from having a, uh, you know, this constant struggle for food to a massive overabundance of food. And that's why, uh, you know, I'm hugely in favor of new uh, hormonal imitation drugs like Ozempic, uh, 
the, the new generation of appetite suppressant uh, mimic hormone hormone mimic mimicking drugs like Ozempic, uh, which can sort of help alleviate that pressure so that we can be more adapted to the modern world. Uh, but until that moment, I have to use my willpower, and this is a problem. We're nearing the end of the podcast now, but I guess this will be the last thing I talk about. Is you know, for me, I have a lot of trouble doing stuff that I think for most people isn't something that you super struggle with. Like, you know, I'm sitting here right now looking out at my fucking kitchen that is just covered in trash. You know, I, I look, if I, it's embarrassing to have anyone come to my house. I don't record videos of my house anymore, especially not in this room because it's just, it's just trash everywhere. You know, there's just shit piled up everywhere. Um... It's hard for me to keep on top of stuff like that, even though it seems like relatively easy for most people. Um, you know, it's hard for me to keep up with like basic stuff. Like I, I feel like I do a better job of personal hygiene these days than I used to, but you know, I still struggle with that. It's still something I have to like consciously, constantly consciously think about. It's not I it I I never get into a routine with it, with any of this stuff. I never get into a routine. And I think that's the big difference, is that most people, they do stuff like cleaning and taking care of their personal hygiene and eating and all of this stuff as just a part of a routine. But for me, I never in my life have been able to maintain a routine of anything like this. It's it, There's never been a part of me that's slipped into routine with, well, really anything. I barely have any routines. You know, I'm like, I'm like the least autistic autistic person because <laughs> I, like, have some... Im- Im- it's impossible for me to get into routines like this. Uh, So, you know, keeping up with all of this stuff, right? Like keeping up with just the general factors of being alive, maintaining your house and your body and your things you're eating and friendships and all this stuff. And then on top of that, you have to worry about how much money you're spending, how much money you're making, uh, how, you know, keeping on top of your health, making sure you're getting exercise, making sure you're eating relatively healthily. You know, this is this stuff I feel like is for most people that's like above their base layer of concern. But for me, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe most people have to think about this consciously and I'm just retarded or unable to do this for some reason. But I don't want to offload it on mental health. There's definitely a part of it that's just laziness. Um But, you know <sighs> Executive dysfunction is I believe what this is called. Uh it's kind of depressing looking around my room and just seeing trash everywhere. And then something stops me from just... I, I try to clean it up. And it takes so... It's 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 such a long and arduous process. It takes hours and hours and hours to clean up. Last time I cleaned up my house, it took me basically a whole day. It took me like eight or nine hours. I was literally back in a week to being like fucked. I tried to keep up on I tried to keep on top of it. You know, you clean up and then you just don't make the mess again. It's just not something that's easy for me to do. So in that situation, you know, my, making sure that I keep healthy habits of not spending my money on Mexican food. <laughs> it's uh I think it's it there's a the it's it's something it's another thing to keep track of. Uh, it's like I'm just constantly fighting to keep my head above the water. It's like it's not like I'm just coasting as a neat, you know. I think most people as a neat, the reason they get bored and depressed is because they don't have to, like, they just float. But for me, I do the opposite of float. I'm just sinking and, like, fucking barely keeping up with anything. And even, you know, the more I keep up with one thing, the more something else slips. The more I exercise, the less I, you know, do something else. Uh, and so... Yeah, this I, I it's very hard for me to to build and maintain good habits. I feel like I feel like harder than the average person, but maybe I'm just making excuses. Uh, but you know, I go to that. I look at the average person, and they don't live in a house like this, and they don't eat like me, and they don't, uh, you know, they're not hikikomoris. Uh, they 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 do all this other stuff. So, you know, I. Uh, I think I'm, I'm making a safe bet by saying that most people don't struggle with this as much as I struggle with this, especially because exec, you know, I am diagnosed with autism and executive dysfunction is a part of that. 
and I believe that this is what executive dysfunction is. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, it's just, it's a. I'm not here for pity points. I'm not saying this to say like, oh look, woe is me. I'm saying like, uh, you know, there's just something that I have to deal with, <laughs> and it sucks. Uh, but I'm get I'm slow. I feel like I'm very very slowly, very 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 slowly making improvements. You know, like it might sound stupid, but in the past, you know, I would I would just not brush my teeth for days and days, right? I would barely brush my teeth. Now I brush my teeth every day. You know, it's and I I rarely forget. Some days I forget, but almost every every day I brush my teeth. Like to me, that's a win. For most people, that's like something you learn when you're a fucking baby. And I I did it when I was being forced to do it by my parents, right? Like that, like living on my own just remembering to do basic stuff like that and then actually having the energy to do it it's a, it's it's relatively a struggle for me even though it shouldn't be it's like that's a small win and then you know i feel like slowly you know again there was a period where i was ordering takeout once every couple of days even once a day right and nowadays i've cut it down to once a week hopefully i can cut it down to once every two weeks and then i think that's a pretty comfortable place for it to stay right like uh there's the stuff like cleaning i think i need to get into the, i keep saying this and not doing it but i need to get into the habit of the first thing i do when i wake up is i put away the dishes that i used yesterday i did that for like a month it was a massive improvement in my life i let it slip and i've never been able to get get back on it again sometimes i'll wake up and i'll be like today's the day and i'll do it and then the next day i'll forget or i'll make excuses to myself and it's like fucking annoying uh, so it's, it's, it's not, like, I think, you know, this brushing my teeth business, right, this, this, is a, this is a win that we've had. So I can take this as an example. It's not the brushing my teeth that's fallen into the background as a part of my routine. I still have to consciously remember every time. It's not like, okay, I'm going to go to sleep, so I just go through the motions. I gotta, no, no, I have to be falling asleep, and then I have to remind myself consciously, like, don't, go, don't do it, don't do it, go brush your teeth. No, but it's not even worth it. Who cares if I miss one day? No, no, no. If you miss one day, you'll miss another day. You'll miss another day. You gotta go do it. Like I have to consciously keep on top of this stuff, and it doesn't really get any easier. Uh, so you know, maybe maybe I'm just fucking retarded. I don't know. But uh, anyway, how much longer do we have left until twelve twelve hours? Fifty three minutes. Six more minutes. Um. I guess I'll just keep fucking ranting about how uh, I'm I'm incapable of doing basic activities. Uh, it like the problem that I face really I think boils down to the fact that I'm bipolar. On top of this this um, executive dysfunction stuff, so because the fact is that like if I'm in a hypomanic episode, I can, you know, I might have a ton of motivation to do stuff, but then you know a couple months down the line when it f- flips over to uh, depressive period suddenly I have no energy and then I let the stuff slip and by the time it flips back around you know it's left my conscious brain <laughs> I guess it's it, I've slipped out of the routine I've slipped out of the habit and I it makes it really hard to build sustainable long-term habits because I just don't have time um, and so I end up sort of flip-flopping where I'm doing either nothing or I'm doing everything all the time and it's really hard instead of just doing like a little bit every day, well, it's really hard to maintain a little bit every day because if you do that, you, I never get through my backlog of shit to clean up or, uh, you know, you can't, or exercise to do. You can't just exercise really vigorously for a week and expect to lose weight. You have to exercise a little bit every day. Uh, not that I'm like super, wor- I, guess, I guess I am We're kind of worried about exercise at this point. You know, I've, I've, definitely been gaining weight um i don't really know why my diet hasn't changed that much i think it's just lack of exercise um because i'm fucking hikikomori right i don't know how these japanese hikis are so skinny do they eat like one meal every 10 days or something i don't i don't understand it um but you know you see these hikis come in two sizes they're either obese or like fucking stick figures and nothing in between and I'm definitely on the obese side uh, 
like there's just very little you know i have all of this stuff already and then it's like pile onto it oh and also you have to take an hour out of your day to just wander around for no reason <laughs> just wander around and the benefits of that wandering around yeah you're not going to see them until like three years down the line just walk around in the world that i'm terrified of with all these terrifying people and scary people just staring at me you know and it's painful because i have these fucking ankle problems caused by my flat-footedness so like walking for a long period starts to really fuck with my ankles but sometimes it doesn't it's rng whether it does or it doesn't and i have no idea what causes it sometimes you know the other day i walked like fucking seven miles it was like a couple weeks ago i walked like maybe even further than that and had zero ankle problems i was really tired by the end of it my legs were hurting a lot but my but in a good way in the muscle way that you want them to hurt not in the painful ankle severe pain that makes it impossible to walk way caused by my deformed feet uh, so i don't know what causes that and so then i'm just like i gotta get a bike or something or an exercise bike and i keep thinking about buying an exercise bike but the reason I'm, i've not done it is because I'm worried that it'll be like everything else. It'll just sit in the corner and, you know, I'll, I'll buy it, I'll use it for a couple of days and then it will just sit in the corner and, and gather dust and I'll never use it again. Because, like, you know, how am I supposed to keep myself motivated to actually use that thing uh, regularly? I don't know. You know. I don't have a reason to do any of this stuff that's, like, right in front of me. But I feel like what I need is I need... I need... a some i need to be able to pay some guy to just break into my house every day and force me to go on the treadmill or something uh but i don't actually you know that's something that i don't actually want to do so you know those are my problems <laughs> those are my problems um but for now ugh, at least you know what i will say at least today, at least I'm getting better at Team Fortress 2 every day. Not every day, some days I have bad days, but... You know, man, today, I was hitting those pipes. I was landing those shots. The bink, and then the bonk, and then they deleted out the game. I played, played a little engineer, played a little demo. I, I got bored of Pyro. I was playing Pyro a lot for a while, and then I got bored of Pyro. Uh, but you know we do we we do some gaming, so at least that's happening. Hey, I don't find it hard to keep up a routine. You know I even do, I even do find it relatively hard to do that. But yeah, uh, I don't know why you guys listen to these, but well, this was well over twelve hours of content actually, because I hit the twelve hour mark, then truncated the silences to get it back down to like ten hours, and then an extra two hours. So this is actually, for you, 12 hours, but for me, this is 14 or so hours of talking, um, condensed into 12 hours. So, uh, you know, make of that what you will. Don't know what that, don't know what implications that has, but uh, time, time can be compressed like that sometimes. Um, and now I've got to talk for just over a minute to reach the mark, so... Uh, got to figure something out. You know, you know, I keep saying in these videos, which is probably really annoying when you're listening to it. Uh, I keep saying, "Oh, this time I'm gonna put this one sucks. I'm gonna post it on IDMR instead of my main channel." And this one, I really had planned to do that because, in my memory, at a certain point, like three hours in, I was saying I was gonna post it on IDMR or whatever. Because in my memory, all I'd done was talk about TF2. But then when I went and listened back to portions of it, I actually wasn't only talking about TF2. I was talking about a lot of other stuff as well. And I, you know, I think maybe one day I'll make one where I, I, the, I don't know. I, I was like, well, no one wants to hear me just talk about TF2 because most of my audience doesn't even play the game. Uh, oh, I did a poll and it showed that about 50% of you identify as otaku. 50% don't. So that's interesting. Uh, not sure what to do with that information, but it's there. So uh, don't forget to subscribe. Oh, Patreon! I have one of those. Uh, check out my Patreon. It has all sorts of benefits, and uh, I think you'd like it. But for now.